One sunny day, I, a guy, was sitting in my apartment looking at a picture frame, staring intently into his eyes. After all, five years later, the obituary wrote about his death. Their mother died three years ago. She was very sick, but at the same time desperately searching for her missing son. She's been sick for quite some time, but she's in a better world now. Everyone tried to calm the guy down, but as soon as he saw a newspaper with a missing person's notice, he immediately picked one up and squeezed it. Walking out of the room, the guy looked at the piece of paper he had clutched, dropping it on the floor. After all, it turns out he had already given up on finding his brother and decided to leave Korea for military service in Africa. The kid was well aware that he was unlikely to be able to go back to Korea, but that didn't stop him. Remembering all of this, the guy opens the box of his brother's found items that he always carried with him. The guy was surprised that his brother even carried pictures from the movies with him. But then, among the pictures, he noticed a pocket watch, surprised because he had given it to his brother to pass the entrance exam. Turning the watch to the other side, he noticed the engraving with initials and more. As soon as he saw the initials on the video, he immediately remembered that moment. It wasn't necessary, but he could still use the watch. His brother was overjoyed. He thanked him. My brother noticed that unlike electronic watches, such pocket watches are more durable and reliable than ordinary watches. The kid was glad he gave such a nice gift, hinting at his good taste. But when the brother turned the watch to the other side, he noticed the inscription. He realized that the first two letters were the initials of his name, but he interjected, and what does San mean? To which the boy did not understand the question, for it was his brother's surname. But my brother noticed that it spelled it wrong. Their last name is Sna, but it's spelled San. This made my brother very angry. He couldn't understand how such a mistake could have been made. He wanted to return the watch to the engraver at once and ask him to correct the mistake, but his brother said he didn't need to, since he was going to wear it anyway. Even if he has to sign somewhere in the future, his name will be spelled as San. Looking at that watch, the kid remembered the good times, but then something incomprehensible happened. He was surprised, for he thought the clock had been out of order for a long time, and out of nowhere came a voice that said it was a brother. The kid, as soon as he heard this, immediately jumped up from the couch, surprised. Then a voice said, Brother, if you're hearing this recording right now, I'm probably no longer on this earth. The kid realized that this was definitely not a hallucination. There are no other devices inside the watch. But then the voice spoke again. I'm sorry about him. He had a hard time. After all, he wanted to find a cure for our mom. He thought he'd be back soon, but things didn't go the way he wanted. On October 9, 2013, a strange message was received that went that, if he could climb all the way to the top of the obelisk, he could fulfill his dream. It immediately asked the question, do you agree to participate? With two choices for an answer, either yes or no. The kid thought it was probably spam, but other than the strange content, there are no other signs. They only ask for consent to participate. After all, were it not for the circumstances, he would have ignored such a message. But suddenly the image of her sick mother, who was now in the hospital, came to my mind's eye. So he clicked, sure, yes. From that day on, he started having strange dreams. For on October 12, 2013, what he saw then was not a dream at all. He was sure of it, for everything was so intensely realistic. He saw a creature that looked like elves and dwarves. It was a world inhabited by orcs, trolls, dragons, and other fairy tale creatures. There was also one tall tower. It is located in the very center and points directly towards the sun. The tower was very tall and they said that if you could climb to its top, you could become equal to God, but he was not interested in all this. He only thought of an elixir that could cure any disease. And on October 29, 2013, 
he assembled a team of like-minded people, otherwise climbing the tower. Over time, combining in parallel with his life, in reality became difficult. October 9th, on this day, he decided to leave home. He thought it would only take him six months to realize his goals, so he cut off his connection to reality, looking up at the tower. He was already geared up to go into it. On December 1st, their team became known as Ardia. They were the best at everything. And as early as September 7, 2014, because the process of conquering the tower was slowing down, they needed another year. On November 11, 2015, they had a disagreement with one of the higher clans, which was interfering with their plans. And already on February 31st of the 15th year, negotiations broke down, the war began, and after a while the allies of the hostile to them clan were completely defeated. And a year later, on March 4th, 16th, he had a loved one. And on September 19th, 16th, the war broke out again. On January 2nd, the war was still going on. They were having a very hard time. And on June 6th, a traitor appeared among them, and dissension began within the clan. Everyone began to suspect each other. And on July the 1st, 2017, his body became heavy, clearly poisoned. On October 30th, half of the people left the clan, and they continued to lose as his body slowly deteriorated. And already on February 28th, 2018, he managed to get the elixir, but he has no way to send it home as he was surrounded by enemies on both sides. Only now was he realizing the truth. There was only one person in this world he could trust. Despite all this, he wasn't about to show his weakness to his enemies. That's why he's leaving this entry here. If her brother hears her, he will surely find the elixir and bring it to mom. As soon as the kid heard this, he immediately clutched the watch in his hand. Staring hard at them, he decided to rewind the clock back a bit so that the recording would repeat itself. The kid listened to the tape for a very long time. The sun was setting. Night was coming, and at some point the kid, looking far away, looked up and realized that he would continue what his brother had started. After all, it was a power that could be possessed by people living in that world. The kid who had been smiling in his own time had already in an instant dropped to his hands and stared at the floor, remembering the bloody sword and how he himself was standing there, covered in blood, with only one person in front of his eyes. The awakening is complete. The process of information transfer is not yet complete. Body prep continues. Only 5% has been uploaded before the information is accepted. At this stage, receptor customization is not yet complete. The guy sat in front of the monitor, studying everything he could get his hands on, but the opportunity to fully unfold was only in the obelisk. His physical abilities were ready, features were recognized, and a skin was added. The kid wanted to find out what really happened to his brother. Who left him for dead and why, five years later, has he still not been able to return? What the hell happened in there? He sought to bring him home and destroy all enemies that stood in his brother's way. The guy looking at the graph realized that this is the status window, and really no different from the game. Upon completion of the awakening, the thing said that his body would be adapted to the game, but he was clearly tight with skills. Although there is a small plus, because the character is cold-blooded and in any situation will show imperturbability. He's completely immune to brainwashing, and it's really a character that's not that bad. There's also the art of dragon vision. This means that the dragon's eye can detect even lies without a problem. It can pre-partially see the skills of a person or object. Jin Wu reveals that he met the ancient dragon Kalatuts and formed a contract with him on the 11th floor. It's the remnants of that contract, he realizes. But there was still a heightened sense of five special sensations, greatly sharpened. He probably got an aggravation of feelings at the expense of his character. But it was the last skill that interested him the most, 
for its clairvoyance might be the point of the watch. The guy, having studied everything he could get his hands on, realized what was going to happen, as it would. The guy thought that his brother probably wanted a quickie so he could find the elixir and get right off. But he probably doesn't think it's that simple. A while later, Sergeant Cha was on the phone with the guy. After all, he wanted to call him for dinner. But something probably happened to you, the sergeant said. He thought he had something to talk about. But the guy apologized and hung up. The guy put his house on the market, clutched his uniform and backpack. Instead, I bought a new backpack, stuffed some clothes, food, and a few knives I had used in the army. And of course, the first aid kit. But the guy wanted to buy a gun or explosives at the black market. But if he continued to overfill his backpack with ammunition, it wouldn't end well, the young man thought. The first round has been going on for a full week now, Players who started later get some advantage depending on how late they joined. The closer someone gets to one player, the more points they can get. Plus, there's a hidden gizmo here that could help a newbie advance quite nicely, and that gizmo should show up any minute now, the kid pondered. And at some point, something incomprehensible started happening. Some kind of black cloud shot out in front of the guy, but then abruptly disappeared, and there was already a black empty door in front of him. The guy made the decision that he was going to find out who was on the other side of the door now and find out they had the wrong guy. From that day forward, he entered this game by walking through the back door. He said he was Jin Wu. The guy started the tutorial exactly from there, closing his eyes after which immediately opening them. He realized that this place was exactly as it had been in his brother's journal. After all, this tower was created as an entrance exam for players. It gave players a chance to become gods if someone wanted to climb the tower. First he had to prove he could do it, and the tutorial was the place for players to prove it. And higher up the floors the guy realized that there were people who were making his brother suffer. But just wait. Pretty soon he'll come to their liking, for he was very strongly aggressive toward those who brought suffering to his brother. The guy crouched down in front of his backpack, and after all, he realized that to get into the tower, he had to make a good score and brush up on his tutorials. He realized that what was needed was not just a good score, but a huge one. After all, worse than a first place did not suit him as well as hidden goodies scattered throughout the tutorial. He needed to gather as many of them as he could and improve his weak body as much as possible before he started climbing the tower. He should gather as many trump cards under his arms as possible while he's focused on that. And girl, he began his journey. But then some blue cloud appeared in front of the guy and said that it was already scared that it couldn't meet him and he would just leave. The guy stopped and immediately readied his knives for battle, but there was a goblin in front of him who told him that if he acted like that, he would hurt him badly. The goblin asked the kid to put his knives away. Smiling, the goblin greeted the kid. He introduced himself as the manager of Floor Zero and at the same time being a conduit for Ebulker. Perhaps the meeting was thus ordained by fate so that the lad could not applaud it. The guy realized that the manager's advice was pretty easy to ignore, but how he felt they should have at least listened. At the same time, the goblin realized that the guy knew something about them. He thought the guy was very shy because he'd been wearing a mask the whole time, but since he was already familiarized with them, they'd be much easier to handle. After all, the tutorial is divided into seven blocks from A to G, and each block has different weather conditions and tasks to complete. The young man must complete as many tasks as possible in the allotted time. Depending on the quality and quantity of tasks completed, he will get points. When all blocks have been passed, a tally will be made with the total score and it will be announced in which it is advantageous to get more points, because the higher the score, the better the reward. Goblin sure explained that part very well. The guy asked the question, 
How much time will I have? The goblin immediately replied that he would have thirty days between blocks to do everything. Such a thing is up to the player, but as of now the S round is already one week long. How does he wish to proceed? Would he care to join us next week? The guy realized that the strongest team was probably already too far away, so far away that it would be simply impossible for a rookie to catch up with them. But that's what he expected anyway. But the goblin noticed that it was recommended that teams of three or five men pass the tower. But based on the above, if he goes through everything alone, he can get the most points. And in Tower of Essays, players get as many points as they put labor into achieving them. Their score will be tallied based on what they did while completing the assignment, since he has nothing to worry about, because usually players like him take one of two paths. They either believe to the last in their own strength and go it alone, after which they simply die. Either they are doing something that the goblin is very much interested in watching. If this is his final choice, his ordeal begins now. Floor zero, the ordeal begins. A test for a newcomer trying to become a god to climb to the top of the tower. He has to prove that he has the ability to do so. He has to do it in the allotted time. There are 549 hours left. As soon as the guy stepped over the white line, he was immediately told that he had entered block A and he should disarm or destroy all the traps in that block. The guy immediately remembered that the journal had talked about the sheer number of traps in this block. Once, however, instead of finding information about these very traps, it was unknown to him. This information was not particularly useful, the guy did a nimble somersault and set his backpack in front of him so that any traps that triggered would shoot right at him. And it worked when he saw the backpack pierced with arrows made of metal. The guy then realized that he should press himself against the wall and try as much as possible to keep his body out of danger. But at some point, something didn't go according to plan. The arrow clearly headed for the kid's leg and then others for his shoulder and arm. The guy felt unbearable pain. His movement slowed down a lot, but thanks to the cold-bloodedness skill, he didn't show any signs of pain. He can now move around safely and has developed a tolerance to pain. The guy realized it was very dangerous, but I don't think it would be that dangerous. He could go insane if he does go on. Grabbing it with his right hand, he caught it in one tug, and it immediately began to pull it out, and after pulling it out, with a lighter and absorbent cotton, he proceeded to tamponize his wound. But as he was also exposed to fire, his movement slowed down. However, thanks to his cold-bloodedness skills, he shows no signs of pain, and he can now move around safely since he has gained resistance to burns. The guy continued on his way, but at some point he realized that all the arrows that flew in his direction flew out at a certain point, and on top of that, there was still some faint signal before the arrows were released. He realized he had to pick a good moment while trying to find the arrow with his eyes. It's simply useless here, because it's too dark. He needs to listen to the gears if he's going to succeed. He'll be able to tell where the arrows are coming from and where they're going. In that short period of time, he needs to catch the sound she makes so immediately he began to apply aggravation to his senses. By doing so, his hearing acuity improved significantly by 0.8%. With his sense, the lad sensed the signal, and raising his head, he discovered from where the next arrows would fly out. It was into this area that he threw his knife, and the knife fulfilled its role well enough, because the arrows sprinkled down. This is when the guy realized that it would be much easier to find these traps now. As he continues to progress through his challenge, different parameters improve depending on how he handles the arrows. For example, if he dodges a blue arrow, agility improves. But if you parry the red arrow, the strength will improve. But if you catch a yellow arrow, your stamina will improve. 
Our hero realized that the better he increased his parameters, the more advantages he would get in the building. Such a place is still to be found. But the guy realized that he was bleeding, and he realized that it was a shame that he couldn't increase his world resources. Even so, he can still take the opportunity to improve the skills he needs. In the meantime, the guy was being watched on camera, and watching him was the goblin, the same one he'd met at the beginning and muttered that he was getting more and more interesting to watch. After all, this guy clearly stands out from the rest. Oddly, he's far more interested in watching the guy in Block A than the people in Block B. After all, this guy is something with something, the goblin muttered smiling. And even if he pulls it off, he's got plenty more dangers on the way. But if he's smart enough and can handle the rest. Goblin realized that this was a tutorial that promised to be very famous, watching on the big screen all the participants who are taking this challenge. And while the goblin watched, the guy reached the end point. Looking at all his stats, he noticed that all the stats were pretty good except for Mana Resource, MR. After all, everything has improved except this indicator. And for working so much in the first day, he thought that was already pretty good, but that wasn't even really the point. After all, his physical strength, maneuverability, resilience, and destructive power all got much better before the challenge began. After reviewing his stats, he opened the door. The treatment and all the wounds he received during the ordeal were immediately instantly healed. Our hero realized that this is the exact place where players can take a break and the wounds they received earlier are healed. He realized he could finally exhale in peace. But as soon as he thought about it, he immediately lost consciousness. And when he started to open his eyes, he realized that he had passed out and there was a man unknown to him standing in front of him saying hello to him. But the guy wasn't expecting it. After all, he didn't know who the guy was. He was sure the heightened senses were still active, but then how had he managed to sneak in here unnoticed? But from his thoughts, he thought it was possible it could have been a merchant. After the guy stopped thinking, the unknown man approached him. The guy guessed it was a merchant, after all. And then he let slip that he loves customers. He introduced himself as a merchant and said that he was passing by, as he might appear between blocks in the rest rooms from time to time to supply players with necessary items for a certain fee. You could buy anything you could think of from this vendor. Food, potions, artifacts, and more. After going through such a difficult assignment, did the guy have a need for anything? After all, he is a salesman who can sell anything that exists in this world. If he needs something, all a guy has to do is say so. The boy began researching what could be bought from the merchant, down to jellyfish venom, golden goat horn, and Tiamat's left eye. These were all necessary and rare artifacts. There was no way normal players would be able to acquire such items, but right now, the guy couldn't rely on artifacts and skills, so he needed to focus on physical abilities. And at some point, he found what he really needed. It was a reset ticket. He could return to the point he chose. After the guy picked out the item he wanted, he asked the merchant what he could pay for the item, to which the merchant replied that he could buy him for his stats. That is, the item's data to be given to it corresponds to its stats. The vendors had a conscience, so they did not overprice the items. But our hero didn't think so, because mineral water for two units of strength is a lot. The guy immediately said it was a ripoff, but he'd still like to buy something. But what? The merchant joined palms and asked what he would like to buy. But our hero wanted to exchange all his points earned from the moment he passed Block A for a reset ticket of ability to return him to the beginning in Block A. The merchant interjected, did I understand correctly that the guy wants a reset ticket? To which the guy confirmed. But the merchant said he's the first to be interested in him. After all, 
People usually ask for something that would help them move forward, not backward. He's never had that before. But the guy didn't specify that he had some other things to do there. The peddler thought for a moment and said, That's great, member. Using a ticket, it's very easy to tear it up anywhere. The person who does this will be moved to the starting area. As soon as the merchant explained the rules of the ticket, he immediately said it was time to go, and he really hoped to meet him again. And as soon as he finished his speech, he immediately disappeared. Our hero felt all the stat points gained for passing Block A were taken as payment for the ticket. He began to feel the strength leaving him. Nevertheless, he still got his refund ticket, and as soon as he got it, he immediately tore it up to get back into the starting zone. After breaking the ticket, a yellow glow began to appear, which immediately began to transport the guy to the ground floor, where the tutorial and the challenge began anew. But our hero was cunning. He wanted to gain as many stats as possible as soon as he could. After all, he had already learned at what point and when the traps would be triggered. Using this, he gained as many stats for himself as possible. After all, this was his last run in the tutorial. Through training in the tutorial, he will reach the point where synesthesia will work in his hands like clockwork. And the Dragon Eyes art is a skill that allows you to partially utilize the eyes of truth of the ancient dragon Kautitz. When he first used the skill, he was shocked at how many new possibilities opened up to him. The whole color palette in his eyes just disappeared. All he saw was a white background and black lines that allowed him to see the outlines of objects. His brother called this phenomenon gel. And after a while, our hero reached the end point. Our hero spent only four hours on this. And that's considering the first time it already took him 34 hours for this challenge. That's pretty good, and his stats have gotten a lot better. Our hero realized that this would be enough to match some players, but the top players are probably almost at god level by now, and if our hero falls behind them even a little bit, there's no way he'll be able to catch up. It's about time we got serious about this race, and after that, our hero entered the room of Block A. He realized that he needed to clear Block B at once, so he set about the sweep, passing all his tests and fighting off the arrows with his knives. But the arrows were much faster than in the first challenge. He didn't even expect it, even though his stats improved by one point every time he fended off arrows, he was not allowed to slow down for a second. But then our hero stepped on a slab, which immediately collapsed beneath him. As soon as he saw the spikes below, he immediately realized that falling equaled instant death. But in that case, he needed to jump that trap, which he actually did. As he landed on the other side, his agility improved by one point. But then, looking up, he saw strong flames begin to develop in front of him. Almost approaching his body, he cut a path with his knife, and thanks to his coolness, he gained 15.6% resistance and was then able to pass through the fire. Immediately, large blocks flew at him, which he promptly dodged, improving his agility. With each passing trap, our hero's stamina increased, senses sharpened, and strength increased. However, at some point, our hero was punched by someone. When he looked at whoever did it, he saw a strange thing. It was a puppet copying the player's movements. It accurately replicated the player's every move and action, and was also capable of attacking within a certain radius. But our hero was ready for it, because his brother had told him about such a gizmo, capable of copying the player's skills using even more power. And if he can defeat her, he'll gain access to the boss room, but if he can't overpower her, he will remain bound by the sword chain. There are two ways to get through it. You can destroy it head on. Or he could have just jumped over it. However, he decided to go straight ahead using the dragon eye. And as soon as the ability activated, he immediately saw that he had a black blob in the middle of his chest. It was his weak spot. 
Our hero realized where he should direct his attack, but then he heard a voice coming out of nowhere that said that this thing moves due to its sensors, and he should find the sensor and destroy it. The guy was surprised at that voice, but he immediately realized that it looked like the guy he noticed when the heightened senses mode was activated. And our hero continued his attack, for he himself knew very well that they moved at the expense of sensors. Therefore, it was not difficult for him to destroy this scarecrow with a single sword motion. But the voice that told him about the censors was shocked, for such a thing seemed impossible. After our hero destroyed the obstacle, he immediately turned around, looking at whoever was telling him to do so after all. After all, it took so much effort to find out that he was using his censors for an enhanced version of his skills. This is a thing that the average player will never understand. How did he know about it? Our hero's interlocutor immediately asked what he would do with him, since he looked so weak. But our hero didn't understand what he was talking about, though he interrogated what he was going to do to him. But our hero's interlocutor immediately said that he didn't seem to intend to do anything. But how did he know the copper doll was powered by sensors? Our hero wondered how he knew that, but the guy said he could see magical threads enveloping the copper doll. Our hero thought so, he can see magic, which means he's very much connected to her, which is pretty rare even among those who can control her. The guy wanted to know how he saw and controlled magic. It interested him the most at the moment. He would be very grateful if the man would teach him how to do that. Our hero realized that if he could learn this technique, it would help a lot when it came to learning how to control magic. The guy was surprised, but our hero said he wouldn't ask to do it for free. After all, he realized that he was stuck for quite a while, and our hero wanted to help him get out of this place. And that would be a good suggestion, wouldn't it? Ask the guy. But the guy was shocked, opening his mouth, looking at our hero. At this point, the guy started to turn around, saying that he wasn't going to force him to do it. However, the guy asked to wait because he didn't understand whether our hero was telling the truth, that he didn't know how to control magic. But it wasn't clear to our hero why lie. It was just that the guy was pretty shocked that the guy couldn't control magic, even though he couldn't handle that thing. In normal situations, no matter how much skill and physical effort he used on him, he would be left with more than one scratch. But our hero dealt with him in a couple of blows while not being able to control magic. He didn't realize who was standing in front of him, but still decided to help him in return for his help. And the guy just now introduced himself that his name is Yule, and he immediately asked how he could be of service. Our hero said that he was about to open the passage and he should just follow him. But our hero was interested in one question. Why does he use this particular shell? After all, his current shell is a sham. He, with his skill, could see that the guy, judging by the shell, was about ten years old. He's quite small, but apparently the guy is not an ordinary person. So he asked him to remember to be polite because he would not treat him rudely just because he was a child. Passing the test, our hero time after time destroyed everyone who stood in his way, using his power and seeing weaknesses. And the guy who went after him was very shocked. To this, our hero said that they were almost to Boca B and that he should fulfill his end of the bargain. But Yule didn't know how our hero would feel about it. I know he's been seeing Manu since birth. But our hero was surprised at this outcome. After all, he thought this skill might be entirely dependent on his genes. After all, it's very rare. But situations happen where some unique and supernatural skills are inherited through genes. Usually such people pass on their special traits from generation to generation, and this skill is awakened in their descendants, giving them new opportunities after which they pass it on to their offspring. Yule told him that he was one of those people. Julia explained that the skillet he had inherited gave him the ability to see and feel magic. 
it feels like something is tying him to her very strongly. It helped him learn about that doll's sensors. At the opposite pole, our hero was the perfect adaptation. It was compatible with everything in existence, including mana. Unlike ordinary people of Earth, he had no trouble working with mana. Essentially, if he found and repaired a lost item, he could use it as if it were his fingers. He knew this because his associates told him how surprised he was at what he was getting up to, the only one who chose the ancient dragon Kalatuts. It was only because of his gift and the fact that he could commiserate with anything that he was able to inherit the dragon's core skill, while other people couldn't do it. Yule explained that technically these people are geniuses. He is not. He can visualize mana as a kind of river, the magic of water coming from the hills or a reservoir flowing through that very river. Our hero pondered his words, especially the tank, and, coming to the door, after he had brushed the side, as a solo player, he's got something that a lot of people have a pretty hard time getting their hands on. He was given extra karma and received 500 karma, so he had 800 karma. And karma was very important in Tower. It was the foundation of this game. Admins could give it out as a reward, and it could also be used as currency when exchanging it for items between players. Being a player, he needed to collect as much karma as possible. He's only past the beginning, but he's already amassed so much that people would be surprised to hear about it. But it still wasn't enough. He needed more, as much as he could muster. Entering Block B, he saw a very large number of people, both with tools and wounded. The guys standing around near the entrance immediately started asking each other, who is this guy? And why does he have a smear on his face? After all, it's been a week since the tutorial started, but there are still people out there. Plus, he also passed Block A solo. Our hero turned around and questioned the guy as to why he was standing there. Shouldn't we go in already? The guy finally mouthed. He finally did it. But then he glanced at the guys who were discussing our hero. They were shocked and immediately lowered their eyes to the floor. The guy got really pissed off when he saw their reaction. But our hero asked the guy if that was his team, to which he replied that they were, but he wasn't going to deal with them now. Turning around, they walked on. Talking about magic, all this to spare, our hero was surprised that Yule was quite knowledgeable about magic. It was rather difficult for him to understand, but he did get a general idea of magic. He now understood roughly what magic was, but how could he easily begin to control it? Here he thought for a moment and rephrased his question. He wondered what would be the easiest way to start feeling her. But the guy himself didn't know, honestly. He knew how to run it from the start, so it's pretty hard to explain to him how to do it. Our hero was upset at this answer but he realized there was nothing he could do about it. So he assumed that he would wait until the tutorial was over before going home and received an approving response. After that, our hero said that then, that's where their paths parted. After saying goodbye and waving goodbye, he walked on. But then something became unclear when the former teammate began to look at Yule, touching his sword slightly. Our hero sensed something wrong turned around and called out to the guy. The events that happened earlier are related to the Yule guys. An unknown guy came up and said he liked that flame in their eyes. Men such as these are born to accomplish great feats is Bild, the representative of Arendon. He will be waiting for them in the Boca B waiting room. So if they get to that place and decide to keep playing, they can team up after he said that. He immediately moved on, and the guys started discussing that they couldn't think of joining Arandan. After all, by joining them, they become part of an invincible group that has completely defeated Tutorial. And after a while, they got stuck on those very dummies, couldn't get around them. And then one of them realized they were in trouble. If they go any further, they will never be able to pass the Tutorial and leave it alive.
Turning around, he saw Yule beside him and realized that his ability to analyze the flow of magic wasn't that good or useful, and that included always standing behind him. So why not? Decided the guy who grabbed Yule by her clothes. He darted toward the dummies and immediately began yelling to his friends to run faster. They sacrificed Yule to make a run. The guy was really upset about how they could do that. Yule was very angry. For all the way to the Boca B waiting room, he hoped he would meet some good comrades. He didn't understand what they wanted, for they had nothing to talk about. The guys only tried to ask him how he was feeling, but Yule immediately interrupted and said it was none of their business. He really doesn't know what they want him to do, but he asked nicely that they leave. After all, they probably can't look him properly in the eye after what they've done. It makes him uncomfortable to look at them. The guy offered as if nothing had happened and they just didn't know each other. But then the guy who was talking to him immediately bowed down and started apologizing for what they had done. He's willing to do anything, but in return he wants to ask that you'll not tell anyone what happened. Not about the details because it's hard for him to explain anything, but he asks, please don't tell anyone about what happened. And after that, his friends also immediately started bowing down and asking him not to tell anyone. But Yule didn't understand what it was about or what they were talking about. He wished they would hurry up and get out of his way. After all, he doesn't want to see their disgusting faces anymore. Turning around, the guy thought, You can't leave it like this. After all, he had told Bill that Yule had sacrificed her life for them. If he tells anyone, he will lose the position he has worked so hard for in Arendon. Looking at his comrade, he hesitated. The first time was very difficult to betray him, but the second time won't be any more difficult, thankfully. They are in a place where no one usually looks, so stealthily getting rid of him won't be hard. Anyway, Bill doesn't even know what Yule looks like. Our hero could tell it was the casualty from the room of the group's boss, Arandon. Tutorial is directly connected to the Blue Flower Island, so they recruit newbies from there. But people from the Blue Flower Island are very capricious, which makes them feel out of place around people with a sad past. Our hero began to turn to the boys. Couldn't you handle what I've been through? The guy turned around in shock and asked who the hell he was. But then the unexpected happened that even Yule turned around. The guy started yelling, my arm, and his friends immediately started trying to pull out their swords. But our hero could have gone to Bach B a long time ago. However, after learning that Yule is high his own allies, he can't just stand by. After all, this situation with Yule reminded him of someone else. His older brother jumped into the back of the allies just the same. But the guys didn't realize how long he'd been here. None of them even noticed him. Our hero said that if they are going to stab someone in the back, they should be prepared to get stabbed in the back themselves. But the guy was already starting to say how dare he do that to his arm. He was going to pay for it. However, the attack of our hero was not successful because he simply grabbed his arm, wishing the best of luck in this, uh, he, in turn, helped him become. The guys didn't get the nonsense. I mean, they didn't do anything to him. So why is he meddling in their business? But our hero said he's like that and like them, just doing what he wants to do. To this the guy was very much surprised, and he told them to drop their weapons. After repeating this already, the guy our hero was holding immediately started yelling, Drop the damn gun! The guys did drop their weapons as ordered by our hero, but asked now to let their friend go. To this, our hero said that they are not very smart, and he proceeded to use his hold on that guy, dropping him to the floor and throwing a punch. But one of the guys immediately shouted out that that wasn't their deal. For this, our hero hit him hard enough in the jaw, and he fell from surprise. His friends were very angry about this, and they immediately began to attack our hero. Our hero also rushed to engage in a duel with them, 
but those didn't even expect him to be so strong and that he could deal with them so quickly by turning around. He saw them coming and threw two punches, after which they fell down. But then Yulia started yelling that she knew he was strong, but not that strong. Our hero, as soon as he heard this, walked over to Yula and said she was drooling. Immediately he wished her good luck in life and that she should be careful with her choice of people, but Yulia immediately started yelling at our hero's back. Acknowledgements and he promised to one day be as strong as our hero me. But at some point, our hero, I turned around and told him to stop by the flower garden in Persia sometime. After all, it will be of great benefit to him. And when he returned, he continued on his way. But Yulia wouldn't know what kind of flower garden Persia was. But he wanted to know. Here, on the other side, sat a guy who would have been surprised by the events he saw, Lying next to him was apparently his friend, whom he pushed, telling him to stop sleeping. The guy yawned, opened his eyes, and asked what else. I mean, he can't let him sleep properly. But the guy immediately asked if he remembered those, uh, kid boys who used to walk around pretending they were about to be accepted into Arendon. Looks like they got what's coming to them. But the guy noticed that there was nothing more to look forward to, because it was already clear that they weren't going to get far with the character. Yeah, they're not much different from the usual scum, but it's a little surprising that he defeated them single-handedly. The guy was very much surprised at such words that they were defeated alone. Yes, it happened exactly in God's waiting room, which all points to him mopping up as a solo player. But the guy was surprised. I mean, he was incredible. But boy did the guy sweep that one up and say he beat the guys because of Aranda. Doesn't that mean the people in Bio Blue will soon try to get revenge on him? But his friend replied to him that factually speaking, they were nothing more than candidates, laughing it off because that's what he was wondering about his opinion. Let's take him with us, the boy suggested. After all, he's a solo player, which means he has no friends or allies here. He's one of a kind. But the kid hesitated. They can still turn the people in Bio Blue on themselves. But the guy asked, Since when do you care about such things? He's going to take a closer look at this guy, and he asked him if he would go with him. To which the guy told Hen to drop it. After all, he must realize that he just loves doing it. So of course he will go with him. Meanwhile, at the same time, four passes have been started in the Block B test, and you have to pick one of them and mop it up. Our hero was faced with a choice of four doors. Doors are lined up by their difficulty. The more to the right of the door, the harder it is. Our hero's brother chose the blue door, second from the left, but he decided to make life easier for himself and his teammates, as Block A seemed incredibly difficult so he chose a path that would be easier for them. But after a while, he learned that he had made a huge mistake. As it turns out, in Block B, the quantity and quality of items falling out is highly dependent on the color of the selected door. So our hero chose the back door. But he needed Bathory's vampiric dagger. Our hero opened the black door and was given the task of traversing the pond and getting to the other end alive and yet the pond is created from the water released from giant Mimaru. Suddenly she died while carrying a pond full of critters into herself. Our hero kicked a rock that flew straight into the water and saw what happened to the rock. He realized that this was unusual water. Its density and pressure were completely different from ordinary water. An ordinary person would be instantly ruined by this water. And that's where our hero used his dragon vision. Our hero saw the black light, and by pressing with my hand, I opened the passage. He realized that's where he had to go. It was a hidden passageway. For finding the passage, he got another 300 credits. Entering the dungeon, he found what he was looking for. It was white moss, the kind of moss found in caves. It contains the spirit of the moon. A person who has tasted it may get a stomach ache. It also has an unpleasant taste. 
Though the back road is difficult, there are always tons of ways to overcome it, and white moss was one of them. White moss is a miraculous potion containing the spirit of the moon. Therefore, many people, not only animals, consume it as their main food source. But at the same time, white moss is incompatible with human diet, due to which the person who consumed it will not be able to extract the necessary substances from it. At worst, it can cause abdominal pain. That's why most people shy away from white moss. The secret, which the brother learned after some time, is that it must be consumed along with other ingredients from the creature's body. For example, insects and animals that consume white moss as their primary food source have evolved to stages in which they can artificially generate heat from their bodies. Because of this, they can feed the energy of the moon. Such radiation starts from the heart, which takes on the characteristics of a flame. On the other hand, the properties of moss are very similar to ice, which helps give it the traits of water. If he uses heart and moss at the same time, two completely different properties will be neighboring in him. Thus, together they form a miracle drug that enhances his body. The male human body is very fragile. It can easily stop functioning. But having strong muscles and a well-developed body will make it much easier for him to fight. To get these characteristics, he needs both white moss and an animal heart. The red millipede is trying to white moss as this creature lives in dark caves. Her eyes atrophied and other senses developed. She favors meat more than moss. At the same time, a secret quest has opened up, the essence of the quest, a room of ice and flame filled with unique monsters that are trying to reach the white moss. If they leave the dungeon, the entire ecosystem could be at risk. It is necessary to fight as many monsters as possible. The reward depends on the difficulty level and the number of monsters. The more levels and monsters, the better the reward will be. The millipede began to attack our hero, but he wasn't one of the easy ones. Even though she was very tough, our hero was able to resist her attacks. After our hero's house hit him, the one didn't even move for his shell was very strong. The previously thrown checker had affected her pretty well, but it wasn't enough. Not only could he not know how strong the red millipede was, he also didn't know the depths of the dungeon. It was necessary to deal with her as quickly as possible, and our hero immediately used dragon vision. And that's where the picture of the millipede changed. Our hero saw a weak spot, which he immediately discovered. He now realized where he should attack to defeat this creature. Our hero needed to find the right moment to attack, but the millipede was not going to stand still either, but tried to attack. But our hero turned out to be quite agile. Climbing onto the millipede with his knife, he swung, and he hit the millipede's weak spot. But he didn't expect that the millipede had another shell inside, and he couldn't penetrate it. Turning around, he spotted a mangone host trying to punch him. Still, the millipede reached our hero with a blow with its tail, and our hero felt great pain, from which he flew away for several meters. His internal organs were badly damaged. The red leg lymph had infiltrated his body. Our hero sat near the wall with numerous injuries, closing his eyes. But immediately... Thanks to the characteristic trait of equanimity, he remains conscious. Immediately his shock state is canceled due to the developed resistance to such a state and the cancellation of the poisoning. Carrying the skillet of resistance to lawful natural mechanisms, he gains profound insights into the spirit of patience and willpower by passing out in an emergency. However, the millipede wasn't going to stop. Our hero also received the battle urge skillet and immediately struck with his sword right into the millipede's pincers. The only place the millipede didn't have a hard shell was the abdomen. If our hero could disembowel him, he could win. And that's what happened. In the cave, our hero lay by the defeated millipede, looking at it. 
He has successfully destroyed the Red Millipede by defeating the invincible foe, and now he is given an additional reward. Our hero, having removed his mask, immediately began to scoop up white moss with his hand. And taking it into her mouth, she ate it. His stomach began to react, and after wiping his mouth, he immediately took out the heart of a millipede. The same guy who suggested joining Aranda showed up in the break room. You ask, that's what happened to them. But receiving no reply, he muttered that as soon as he had left his seat for a while, his subordinates had already been beaten up. He thinks they're tough enough, but knowing that Arconda cares about his members, someone still dared to do this to his men. That means they ignored them. But the guy said he was wearing a white mask. The boy wondered who it could be. The guy who turned around started walking away from the other guys. I realize we have to find the guy in the mask first, he said. Our hero successfully dealt with the red millipede, defeating an invincible foe and gaining additional fame. He ate the heart of a red millipede by interacting with the properties of white moss and was pleasantly surprised by the hidden effect. Broken bones were repaired and strengthened, and damaged muscle tissue was repaired and strengthened by half after defeating the monsters. Not only strengthening his skeleton and muscles through this mysterious corridor, but also gaining knowledge of the fire heart and ice seal through this experience. Although he only advanced by 11.5%, he was able to improve his physical strength, and with it, his energy recovery rate. The stats he received for defeating the Red Millipede were significantly higher than the stats he received after defeating the boss at the previous location. Despite his low magic resistance, MR, he continues to work on this flaw and find ways to overcome it. He would have to learn how to use more magic in the future, though. With each step forward, he realizes how important it is to strengthen himself as he progresses further. However, he realizes that this is just the beginning and that there are many more challenges to come. He has a particularly difficult time with the Dragon Body skill, which allows him to use the power transmitted by the Dragon Kalatutsoi to enhance his physical abilities. However, it requires a lot more magical power. No matter how hard he tries, he has yet to find a solution to this problem. As for skills that increase physical stamina, they prove most useful when taking physical damage. These skills help him reduce his opponent's impact by mitigating pain and utilizing his coolness skill. All the while, he holds on to the clarity of his mind despite all the hardships and trials. However, he still felt suffering at some points. This had certainly drained his spirit, and so by applying this skill correctly, he would be able to avoid situations like this from happening again. In cases of poisoning, burns, frostbite, panic, hallucinations, curses, and the like, resistance would also be justified. Although it is a skill of low importance, it can still provide excellent support. Accelerated thinking at the third skill level gives a 2% boost. In every circumstance, his determined spirit gravitates toward the fray. With his accelerated thinking, he is able to focus on combat and make quick decisions at the same time. This is crucial, especially in critical situations where quick decisions can save allies. But in the same case, it could also be the worst way to destroy them. In the fight with the Red Millipede, he was able to win thanks to this skill, improving two of his skills. That's far from a bad thing. Oh, and besides, it's hard to achieve even a D-plus grade in a tutorial. Our hero continued his challenge, and as he defeated the bats, he increased the number of his victories. And it already feels like he's starting to get used to it. Bat claws are white moss mixed with the poisonous blood of the red millipede. He prepared a special solution, precisely observing the necessary proportions. If you pour this solution on the fangs and claws of bats, you can get a powder containing the monster's fire properties due to their reaction. 
if you set it on fire, it would cause an explosion of unimaginable power. Our hero poured all that powder into his bag. Thus, he had already collected several such bags, and the next ones would follow in line. But then our hero noticed not bats, but blue nomadic ants. They range in size from 30 centimeter to 1 meter. About a hundred ants cluster around the mate ant and form a single colony. The peculiarity of an ant colony is that common ants are willing to risk their lives in defense of their territory. Fight a hundred monsters. This is crazy. But the problem is that Bathory's vampiric dagger is outside this room. The vampire king was one of the long-dead monarchs. It was said to be enhanced by drawing out the life force and even the skills of others, leaving behind a lot of destruction. However, there remain many players and even clans that have not sold out to this wave of destruction. The lower the rating of an item, the cooler it is. And since this dagger is a legendary item that belonged to a dead vampire king, its rating level is also low. After all, the rating of this dagger was 352. A three-digit rating means that this artifact is among the best, being one of the only and unique items in the entire tutorial and tower. Our hero realized he couldn't miss it. Therefore, fighting ants face to face will not work, but it is worth trying to use cunning. So our hero immediately started running to the blue ants using pre-prepared pouches. After scattering the bags, the ants immediately began to approach them, and our hero lit a lighter and threw it in the direction of the powder, successfully blowing up the ant nest. As a result of this, he received an additional achievement. Our hero continued to destroy some ants, and as he defeated one by one, he realized that most of those he managed to defeat were either baby ants or not yet hatched eggs of adults. There were still a lot of those individuals left, and those were the guys he could deal with after he got his hands on the vampiric dagger. And now our hero has decided that he should move on to a more dangerous endeavor. With a glance at his opponent, he took a couple of steps. There was a uterus in front of him. It was very large and very dangerous. But our hero, pulling out a knife, wanted to join the fight. It was the boss mad of ants. Suddenly, the boss of the ants, the uterus, appeared on the horizon. Not a moment later, she rushed to attack our hero. However, thanks to a quick reflex, our hero managed to step aside a bit. He knew there had to be a door somewhere in this ant's nest. The search was not in vain. Behind the uterus back, our gaze found a door that was literally a couple of steps away from her. Our hero continued to attack the womb, throwing knives at it. However, even from such strong blows, she didn't receive much damage. Realizing that this method of fighting was ineffective, he decided to take a knife in his hands and began to launch his own attacks, targeting certain vulnerable points. This strategy was much more effective. The uterus was forced to defend itself from different sides, and it paid off. Eventually, the uterus could not withstand such tension and collapsed, and our hero advanced calmly to the door without being injured. Opening the door, he entered the Vampire Queen's temple. The shock was unspeakable because standing directly in front of him was Bathory, the Vampire Queen herself. Turns out what he saw was a vampiric dagger, Bathory's. Vampiric dagger had a rating of 30. 352, and was classified as a one-handed unique weapon. Its description stated that it was the Vampire Queen's favorite weapon, which she used to suck the blood out of her opponents. Our hero has finally discovered a mysterious artifact that will help him cut a week's gap from the leaders. This item was famous not only for its outstanding hitting power, but also for its ability to impose a bleeding effect on the opponent with a special option, the blood mark. However, the real value of this artifact lay in its last option. Ignoring the queen's presence, our hero lowered his gaze and grabbed the hilt of his sword. He was shocked, however, 
when he raised the sword and noticed that the hilt had begun to be coiled with something incomprehensibly black. And then it became clear that if the choice did not fall to him, his spirit would be consumed by this dark entity. Well, among all the players who entered the tutorial, are there any who can master this blade? After much research, his brother found a way of handling this blade that even beginners could do. And maybe others will say our hero is crazy, but he's not. Raising his dagger upward, he pierced his arm with a single blow. Dagger was originally a skill, and it was pretty hard to figure out. The greedy vampire queen didn't want her power to fall into the wrong hands to the last. Therefore, she sealed her true abilities in the guise of this blade. The seal has been broken, and it is only now that the seal has been broken that the true vampiric dagger is available to our heroes. His rating was 66, and his degree of proficiency was at zero, which is zero percent. His true appearance remained hidden from view, keeping the powers of the vampire queen within him. This dagger is capable of taking the opponent's life force and absorbing their soul. Now that's a real vampiric dagger. The royal mark he inflicts deals lethal damage to the target and imposes a bleeding effect, robbing the enemy of physical and magical strength. The bleeding effect continues, dealing a certain amount of damage according to the strength of the blow. This unique skill was quite difficult to obtain even for experienced rankers of this tower. The dagger he carried completely absorbed life force and partially stripped the opponent of skill levels if the skill level reached its maximum. Accordingly, certain effects could allow even the opponent's Kayo to be stolen. It was a good fit for our hero, and once he got it, there was an immediate desire to try out new skills. Our hero continued to fight the ants, defeating them one by one. At some point, however, he began to notice one of them particularly closely. Then, as if some unseen force intensified his gaze on that ant, and it suddenly began to attack, climbing on his back. Noticing his hand aimed at the monster, he felt his power awaken. The voice that appeared from the depths told him only one thing, devour him, absorbing the monster's life force and energy. The skill level of the vampiric dagger skill has increased to 1%. Our hero prepared vitality and energy. The strength level increased by one unit. At this time, the boss uterus ant was destroyed and our hero received additional merits. The extra merit level has reached the 300 unit mark. The blue ant's morale level dropped and the ant nest was being destroyed at a rapid speed. However, there was some sound in the cave, as if someone was talking about the place in question. The voice said that there was a master capable of finding places like this. These were the same guys who wished our hero would join their team. They realized that this is where the answer lies. One of the guys told his comrade that he sounds like he really doesn't care about any of this. But strangely enough, it seems like he was constantly hunting monsters without a break. It's amazing how he was able to improve his skills so quickly. There was no way the guy could imagine that it could be the monsters themselves that suddenly became weaker, although that sounds pretty ridiculous. However, the guys from the lower floors, on the contrary, were getting stronger and stronger, in no way inferior to those who were moving up. The boys were amazed to see something incomprehensible, for it was far from looking like any kind of joke. The guys noticed the queen of the uterus. Furthermore, it didn't go unnoticed to them that their own energy was completely drained. But where could he find what they were sorely lacking? In the course of their search, they could not discover even the slightest hint. Was there really a hidden room in here? Perhaps even some secret skills or talents lurked here. If so, if he manages to detect them, it could be an advantage. In that case, the queen of the womb would have no choice but to try to recruit him to her side. However, while the boys were pondering this, they heard an incomprehensible sound. Turning to the other side of the cave, they noticed a swarm of ants running off somewhere. 
After marveling at each other, they began to speculate on what it could mean. The brown salamander has been destroyed. The number of monsters defeated is 1,000. The maximum allowable conditions of the quest have been met. All parts of the Fireheart and Ice Seal have been collected. Completion. Fireheart and Ice Seal affect our hero's body, altering it and strengthening the skeleton. Our hero, after being reinforced, immediately wanted to see the characteristics that were added to him with the teachings of the vampiric dagger. By doing so, he was able to absorb the monster's strength compared to before. His stats have increased dramatically, especially his new ability, Skeletal Enhancement. This fire energy fills his heart. His body fuses together. The properties of fire and water increase our hero's level. This makes fatigue accumulate more slowly. Our hero realized that the Skeletal Enhancement made his body stronger, and now he wasn't so easy to defeat. He also has increased recovery speed, which helps him reduce damage even in a critical situation. But there was another reason he needed this ability. After all, the physical shell was reinforced for an hour to restore lost hereditary abilities. At this point, the current state of recovery is 21.3%. The imperfect dragon body feature was changed to a low-level dragon body, this is enough to complete the restoration of the hereditary ability, but it needs a stronger shell and a reinforced skeleton. It's a must-have ability that will help him do that. The tutorial rating has been updated at this point. He was immediately asked if he wanted to register his name, to which he pressed no, because if he agrees, it will not give him any advantage, even on the contrary, because it will attract the attention of players. Therefore, the registration was rejected. Our hero's ranking climbed to 281st place. Sure, it's good that he's moved up in the rankings, but there's still a big difference with the players ahead of him. Our hero didn't understand what Zdora, Pant, and Khan were doing. What on earth they were doing, our hero obviously did not understand. But most importantly, he realized that he had to accelerate even further in his progressive development. But then our hero heard something behind him. Turning around, I was a little confused, for he had obviously heard something. It was most likely other players, but he hadn't seen anyone here before. Our hero immediately grabbed his dagger, for he thought that these were the same guys who had been following him and whom he had encountered when he was helping Eula. As he got closer and closer to where he heard the unexplainable rustling, he immediately swung his dagger. But the guys in front of him were no longer the same guys he'd fought to protect Yulia. The kid was so sudden, fell down, but Hay was protected by his friend who fended off the knife attack. To which our hero immediately asked the question, What are you doing? But our hero, I immediately asked, They're not from Arendon? to which I immediately received the answer that, no. Then a new question arose. Why did they pursue him? But the guy replied to him that you can't just suddenly attack other players like that. But our hero preceded them a bit, because what about going after people? I haven't explained my intentions. Of course, he couldn't expect anything good, since anyone could attack unexpectedly but the guys immediately said they really caught up to him this time and didn't even think twice about it. Our hero continued to stare intently at the guys, listening to what they were talking about. But then he wanted to know why they were following him, to which one of the guys shouted for him to be his comrade, pointing his finger. But the other friend asked that he stop, and it was embarrassing in the first place. Well, our hero didn't really want to listen to these guys anymore. He turned around and started to walk away. But then the guy started yelling, asking where he was going, since the conversation wasn't over yet. It wasn't until he grabbed our hero by the arm that he heard questions about what he wanted, to which the boy again interrogated if he would agree to be his comrade. Our hero immediately said that this is impossible, because he doesn't know who they are or what they do. Well, he's not interested in team passing in general. 
to which the guy was very much surprised and asked how come he didn't know him, to which our hero replied, no, and in fact, he should know him, to which the guy said, how can it be? He doesn't know him. It's impossible. He's one of the best in the tutorial. But immediately his friend interrupted him, saying that he was very good-natured, his flaw being his constant boasting. So conversations with him are sometimes long. But still, please, he's a very nice man. Well, this is where the guys immediately got confused again, because they should have introduced themselves originally. Their names are Doyle and Khan. Our hero immediately remembered that they were on the 11th and 3rd rank of the tutorial, to which the guy said he was embarrassed that they were still here even though they should have gone up to level E or F by now. But our hero immediately said he believed, using the dragon eye, although he had recently learned about it. But when you look at a person using the dragon eye, you can learn some useful things about them. If a person's mindset is barely noticeable, it means that their way of thinking is positive. And if negative, on the contrary, his aura will completely fill his body and will also be clearly visible. As for these guys, their aura isn't brightly colored, so they're not lying. Players like this. What is the reason that busy accumulation and point people came from the previous zone to ask me to join their ranks? Based on everything, our hero wanted to know why they wanted him to join them. To which the kid immediately asked if he was in any clans or teams. After all, if he's a loner, that's a very good thing. Truth be told, there is one artifact in the sector that they need to get their hands on. But this is only possible if the group consists of at least three or four players. But there's only two of them. Our hero also asked if they couldn't also find people there among whom they could find allies. To which I immediately received a reply that most of the players in Sector E had already decided on their membership in one group or another. Our hero immediately thought that it was quite difficult to find a person with abilities in Sector A. But why did they choose him? After all, he hadn't done anything of the sort in the Sector B hall, and he'd also picked up on the fact that his actions in Sector A when he'd handled Kain's group might have attracted attention. After all, he had caught his eye that way. But he was interested in what they said about there being an artifact in Sector E that was hard to obtain, even if players with ranks 3 and 11 couldn't obtain it. They need help to which the guy said that, unfortunately, yes, but they couldn't explain further. After all, they wanted Hargan's crown, the hidden lair that his brother's team had accidentally discovered. Since the master of this lair is the Lizard King, he is very cruel and powerful. It takes a lot of strength to win it. The reward for his victory is the crown of Hogan. It increases experience points and bestows a leadership skill. But he doesn't need it. Plus, his brother was betrayed by his own team that he believed in. It was a ruthless act. The only thing keeping him in the tower is his back, which is always vulnerable, not knowing at what point he might be attacked. There should be no excuse for abandoning your comrades or subordinates in such brutal conditions, but it can happen. With a couple people, it's just a way to get rid of someone, but the boys said they would not be indebted to him. If there is something he would like, they are willing to give it to him as payment. It seems like a pretty good offer to them. Still, this is a hidden reward, and our hero will be able to get some good stats, although he will spend some time. But this will not become a great detriment, and even on the contrary. After pondering, our hero said that he agreed, but he had one condition— all the rewards, except for the artifact they so desperately needed to get, would belong to him. But they too must make a decent showing of their abilities. To which the guy smiled and said that this seemed to be a meeting of fate, and they should introduce themselves to each other, extending his hand to our hero. Although it's a battleground, there's no need to reveal his real name, and our hero needed to come up with a name they could call him by. So he introduced himself as Cain. Our hero, 
I was going through the black branch of Sector B as my player very quickly. Then he got an achievement that is not easy to get. The extra points awarded were for merit. And then he also quickly made his way through Sector C as a solo player. People were very strong. They needed support, but they fit. The guy behind our hero pondered what was happening to him, because it was definitely him in Sector B. It's generally impossible to swing his skills so quickly. Our hero, me, opens the doors, goes through Sector D as a solo player, and then he goes into Sector E. The guys swept up in a lot of pain, and one of them said it was sad, because he thought it would be dark and he could sleep. But the tutorial is divided into two big areas, insides and outsides. In the inner part, players are mostly judicious in their abilities, moving from Sector A to Sector D, trying to pump up missing skills faster. In the outer part, you can't pump your skills. This means establishing yourself in zones E and G based on previous abilities. At some point, the zone E challenge began and our hero received a token. In due time, tokens are hidden all over the sector. Found tokens can be exchanged or passed to other players. You need to collect 99 tokens to validate your abilities. And the guy, looking at our hero inspecting the tokens, muttered that it pissed him off. These words also mean that you can forcibly take that player away, well, or steal all the tokens. They are very well hidden, which will make the other 98 very hard to find. And it will be much easier to take away from other players, so it's pretty obvious that players will choose to go that route. Our hero's brother said it required a significant amount of effort, but he may have already collected enough tokens before he returned with the return ticket to Sector B, or he may have collected all 99. Our hero said he had gotten the assignment and now it was time to act. Didn't he say there was a hidden room? We need to get this over with quickly, and he'll collect the tokens at the same time. But the guy said, there are some differences here, so it's going to take quite a while. Sector E is much larger and more extensive than the previous four. Each zone has a different landscape and environment, and each forms a unique ecosystem. To the east rises a pointed black rock, and to the west stretches the plains through which the rivers flow. There are high hills in the south, and dense forest spreads in the northern part. Also in the deepest part of the northern part is the Baltic area. Therefore, the types of monsters living in different zones are very diverse. Outside the forest is mostly inhabited by smaller monsters such as goblins and kobolds. But if you go deeper into the thicket of the forest, you can already find large monsters such as trolls and orcs. The swamps are home to lizard-like creatures. Both orcs and sandworms can be found in the western and eastern territories. Fighting everywhere with these monsters, you can find hidden tokens, as well as more dangerous players. Avoiding them is worth it to save your tokens. It's all very important. And so, their main target is the north. They head toward the swamp, passing trees, going where they need to go. At the same time, the two men were discussing the fact that the rogue who had broken up Kane's group had joined Kane and Doyle. But why? Aren't they supposed to be in Sector E? The reply was that they themselves do not have the exact information yet, but that they will try to find out in time. They didn't see them in the sector. There are eyewitnesses who say they saw people who looked like them in the waiting room of Sector B. The man heard this and got very angry, because he knew about it. But the man didn't even think these two could be in the rookie zone. But there seems to be no doubt now that they're here. The man interrupted him and wondered what to do now, for as far as he understood, they wanted to take their team of the guy who broke up the group. To which, the man replied that he assumed he did. La, the truth is, that includes us, Khan, and Doyle. And this guy in the mask is making it worse for himself. After all, they ignore Erandon and the Blue Flower Island too. Thinking for a moment, the man asked to summon all the members of the organization, but in response he heard that they were all already here, waiting outside. 
to which the man said they were following a masked man. Plus, sometimes their talent for rapport that they display in battle is astounding. But it seems like they learned it separately, especially during combat. Khan functions as the physical attacks, while Doyle acts with his mind and regulates the situation. Because of this, they can anticipate how and when the enemy will attack. It looks like they are very much used to each other. I don't think they met a couple days ago. They've obviously known each other for five to ten years, if not more. The fraternal relationship between the two is not so simple. They trust each other in their lives without even thinking about it. This would not be possible without sufficient trust in each other. But what kind of relationship are these two in? Only one thing is certain. They are not siblings. They are so professional and it's not easy. Unfortunately, he couldn't know the reasons why they had become so close, but it was very apparent. They look good, but he doesn't think he wants to learn more about their relationship or get closer to them. Just the sight of them reminded him. The deeper the night, the more useless emotions appear. He was going to get rid of all these confusing thoughts, but on the contrary, there were even more of them. Well, that's when our hero heard a rustling. It was a guy doing pull-ups, and our hero asked what was wrong, for his turn on the watch was not soon enough. To which he heard the reply that something was noisy around here and he couldn't sleep, and at the same time the other guy woke up. But it was already a little annoying because he wanted to go over and straighten them out himself, for which I apologized if I woke you up. But hearing that, it's nothing. It's okay. His whole body was stiff anyway. Sleeping in the same position, it looks like they'll be able to stretch out properly now. Asking their friend, did these people know he was here, or had come by chance, having stumbled upon them, it didn't make much difference. Upon delivering his sword, he mouthed that all that mattered was that he had his sword, and in one motion he struck one of his opponents. Hell, how did they know they were here? At this, the group immediately began to focus, for it would be more dangerous if they gathered in a bunch. But the guy wasn't deterred by that, and he already wanted to take the fight. The guy immediately attacked one by one, defeating everyone in his path. But our hero noticed some strange insects. It was an ability. Another guy's insect decorating talent. After all, it's a difficult talent, as you have to deal with insects that have a low intelligence level, and they've pelted their opponents, and didn't give him even the sleetest chance. But then, some sounds came from the bushes. The kid, hearing this, turned around and saw two enemies approaching our hero but he knew they couldn't make it work, because even if they get close, Fran and his team are the sector's most active scavengers. They are very much enjoying the job. They use tokens that can be taken away as an excuse, but in addition to them also stealing players' possessions and artifacts, and thus they have raised their physical power levels considerably. They can also transfer taken away tokens for a high price to higher ranked players. In addition, there are places that need the players themselves as resources, consumables for experiments, just labor. The goals may be completely different, but the seller doesn't care. Are there even better ways to trade and even more so, these villains are preying on low ranked players like Khan and Doyle. The thing is, Nothing is known for sure about how many tokens these two have, or what artifacts they have. Trying to attack our hero, he didn't even notice how in one move the guy was already behind his back. And literally, in one hit, he struck it, to which the boss's underlings immediately started yelling, How come? And after they got angry, they immediately wanted to engage our hero by attacking him, but our hero was already prepared for it, so, as soon as they approached him, he immediately started attacking them one by one. And even after dodging the attacks of his opponents, he would immediately deliver his crushing blow. 
everyone who was standing immediately turned around and started yelling for everyone to run away. After all, our hero was very strong for them. He estimated that only 21 people were defeated. But he only collected 81 tokens. But the guy made the point that they spent quite a bit of time in Sector E and they probably sold most of the tokens. And these were just stock. This sector included over a thousand people, some of whom they may have encountered repeatedly. No wonder they collected so many. After all, they are most likely scavengers, which is why they were able to collect so much from the bulk of the players. The number of tokens does not exceed ten pieces. As they say, the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. Truth be told, there is nothing left to do in Sector E but to be a winner. A minority of strong players takes tokens away from a majority of weak players. Yes, and the weaker players have no choice but to give everything to survive. Otherwise, they'll just get pinned down and have their tokens taken away by force, no matter the method. They do, still strong players get those tokens very quickly without much effort. Conversely, special players are always short of tokens, and the higher their ranking rises in tournaments, the more striking the difference in player strength. Either way, they were squeezing the most tokens out of the players, regardless of the method. It's also not bad for pumping stats. Also, if the encounter is with a mystery merchant, it can be used as currency too. Now, take all the tokens you've received, they're yours. After all, they still haven't paid the down payment on their deal. So, you think that's what she is? Don't they need tokens? Our hero asked, to which the guys said they weren't worth worrying about. After all, they have a fair amount, so it's all good. But really, the best place to get extra points is Sector E. Plus, what he wanted to catch before he even entered the tutorial. It had to be somewhere around here, and he absolutely had to catch it. So now he should increase the amount of magic power he's missing, and he can also complete the recovery of the inheritance skillet. And after they deal with the Lizard King, he'll go after her right away. Under the moon, the guys immediately started building a fire again, throwing in wood realize that they will now have enough trouble with their opponents and should be on their guard. Well, here at some point our hero noticed a superb phenomenon. A guy set a fire with his insects. And it was amazing because they are fire insects. If there are predators that intend to settle, they will spontaneously combust to set the enemy on fire. The guy assured me that there are a lot of amazing insects in the tower. And apparently, there are things in the tower that Junu didn't even know about. And after some time in the same forest, our hero continued to fight the lizards one by one. At one point he started pulling something out of the lizard, to which the guy inquired as to what exactly he wanted to get to which he replied that the eyes from the eyeball of a humanoid lizard could be used to create an artifact that would give a special buff with a powerful effect. A giant with dozens of eyes and hundreds of arms is a weapon called Kisu. When you make a humanoid lizard eyeball eyeball, you get a very important material. But at that moment, one of the guys noticed something curious and called the other guy over to take a look. After all, it looked like someone had been here before, as indicated by the footprints going the other way. Our hero touched the footprints and realized that not much time had passed at first. Five hours of combat. No, probably six days. A hidden room. That's the value of a hidden room. It's hidden. They are hidden throughout the tutorial and play a very important role in boosting player morale and conveying the incentive to compete. Did these people make it through? Therefore, the hidden room found can no longer appear in the current round of the tutorial. If other players have already found the hidden lair room, it means that Can and Doyle's attempt, who needed to guard the crown, was in vain. Our hero said no, for there are tracks leading only one way, but there are none going back. It looks like the people who came here weren't looking for this place 
but the kid didn't understand what he meant, to which our hero told him to look it up. After all, the footprints show that someone was schooling someone on the ground, and it was most likely a humanoid lizard dragging some sort of bait and luring players here. Monsters aren't just prey for players. There are times when, on the contrary, they become predators whose target is the players. This is monster territory, and they know it much better. Of course, you may encounter all sorts of traps from time to time. You can't go anywhere without it. Seems like this situation is better resolved as we go along. The guy was freaking out, but they couldn't be distracted. Our hero thought it would be easy, and yet equanimity remains equanimity. To which he immediately noticed that the other of the guys had gotten angry for some reason. Our hero noticed that the guy was looking at the whole thing with an embittered grin, but then, as soon as he saw that he was being looked at, he immediately smiled. But immediately he heard himself being addressed with the realization that they had not discussed everything about their case. But since he's still pretending he doesn't know anything, it's best to keep it that way. When the guy started to say that this was where Hargan's lair was, they had already massacred a bunch of humanoid lizards on the way here. And as for their chief, or rather king for that matter, whoever he is, he inhabits the place. Our hero realized that he must be stronger than the guy responded. After all, even he, with his friend, couldn't handle him. To which our hero interjected what would happen even if he intervened. Things should change a bit then, but it's pretty clear that it's going to be quite difficult. In addition to the male of the interior of the den, there is also a female. No matter how much they get out of their own way, the three of them still don't, but only go at it themselves. But as for our hero, he asked, What are they supposed to do then? But the guy said they wouldn't even have to, because they will take the artifact. They plan to lure the female outside and keep the female inside while one of them distracts the male. So our hero should quickly rush to the female. At that moment, Doyle removes the crown from her head. But our hero noticed that he needed to come up from behind, to which I heard the answer that, of course, if he wants to steal something, it is better to approach from behind. However, the female is very strong and there is nothing he can do alone so under no circumstances should you engage her. We just need to distract her. Our hero, for what it's worth, performed many tasks on the battlefield. In Africa, he did not rely on chance. Then he was a soldier who had to obey orders from above. But now he is effectively a mercenary working for pay. They should start already. The company entered the battlefield. A new area has been opened up. Our hero got 500 extra points. In front of them stood the lizard-like creatures defending the lair. But as soon as our heroes approached, the lizards immediately noticed that the humans were already approaching, so they reacted immediately. However, our heroes were prepared for this. They had a definite plan. After one of the lizards threw itself at them, they began to act according to their plan. The hidden boss, Hargon, appeared in the moment. Having spouted off about how people dared to invade his territory, they should expect no mercy from him. In Sector E, there are five kings who rule the forest. Hargon is one of the most powerful among them. King, a humanoid lizard ruling the northern part of the swamp. Our hero will have to defeat Hargon and his underling guardsmen, to which Hargon immediately rushed into action, attacking the men, and our hero was gripped by a tension so intense that for the first time, even for him. After all, when he got into the learning task, tutorial, he didn't feel as stressed as he does now. Our hero had a feeling as if he was on a battlefield in Africa for the first time. However, such feelings now made him cringe, looking at his opponent, and his opponent in turn looked at him. But immediately at that moment he did not rush at our hero, wanting to defeat him. Our hero followed the plan. After all, one of the guys, me, took the hit, deflecting the lizard's attack. 
to which the lizard immediately reacted by saying that this guy was no match for him, but the other guys thought otherwise. After all, he was no longer the same as he used to be when the fight first started. The lizard attacked the guy, but he was surprised at what was happening. After all, the kid just stepped away, much to Lizard's embarrassment. Their own lizard men, on the other hand, didn't realize what was going on. But at the same time, our hero and the other guy were already making their way inside the lizard's lair, where two guards were standing, which our heroes eliminated very quickly. But as they looked at the lizards, they heard a voice shouting for them to save them. Despite the source of the voice, they saw people who were locked up. They were asking for help, all screaming together to be rescued. Our hero realized it was probably related to the abduction marks they had seen at the entrance. Now he understood where they were being held. In short, it's a dungeon with humans in it, sort of like a vault to feed these things. They can come here at any time if they want to eat. If we release them, we can't take the crown from that female. She could show up at any time. They should hurry up and find her, and we need to hate, our hero told the guy. To which the guy asked, isn't he angry in the slightest? However, the guy didn't understand what the hero was talking about, to which the guy immediately said that doesn't he feel anything while looking at such a sight. But our hero realized that this was possible because of his young age, because he was also a human being. Just because he's not angry doesn't mean anything. But then how can he be so cold-blooded? And now Khan can be. It should not be forgotten that he is now in a fight with Hargan alone. He won't be able to handle him. The longer we stall, first and foremost, they should make a decision. If they don't prioritize, it won't work and he's out of here. It's unclear what will become of them. Our hero and the guy met gazes, looking at each other. But then at that moment, the guy turned his gaze away, and turning back, apologized, for he hadn't thought of it. And here he was already telling them to hurry up and get started, because Khan was waiting for them. However, our hero stopped him, for it seems that the female is using this dungeon with humans to feed her cubs. And what if we try to use it somehow, our hero thought. After the guy asked what that meant, our hero said he had a good idea. They can tweak their plan a bit, and if all goes well, they can save these people. The guy was shocked to hear all this, but immediately our hero went on to say that the insects he had used during the night, they would need. The fight continued between our heroes and the lizards, the lizards don't understand how humans could just show up at their lair, but then the queen shows up and orders her subordinates to protect her children at all costs. But then our heroes noticed that there were lizards over the queen. Our hero A stood in front of the queen, looking straight into her eyes as if trying to convey that she might like fireworks. But the queen didn't understand what it was all about, and as soon as our hero dropped the sack, she immediately rushed to her children, shouting about it. The queen grabbed the bag and scattered the powder that was inside the bag. Surprised and perplexed, our hero explained that it was the same powder he had used on ants, and that's where he'll need it, his fire insects. Immediately, the kid started directing the fire insects toward the powder. Our hero scattered. The queen, covering her face, immediately started screaming that they were pathetic. But then she saw our hero standing near her children, holding one of them, at which point the queen began shouting loudly for them to let him go, and expressed bewilderment at how they dared to barge into their lair at all. But since the queen did not consider those they held to be human, he took the lizards one by one. After all, she should have realized that she herself could become like them. But the queen wanted to protect them, so she lunged at our hero, but at some point she noticed the very powder under her feet. And the moment she realized it, there was an explosion. Thus, our hero was able to defeat the queen, for which he received additional merit points. The spirit battle of the humanoid lizard diminished. Hargan's lair plunged into a state of panic. 
our hero realized that humans and monsters could not coexist together. So he wanted to finalize things with the queen as quickly as possible, for they needed to go to Kanu's aid. Just then, the guy took the crown off the queen's head. The guy looked at the crown and mouthed that they were finally able to take it, but then they heard some unintelligible noises. Turning around, they saw Hargan. As he approached the queen, he didn't realize what was even going on, and one of the guys was also surprised as he didn't understand what had happened here. But at that moment, Hargan became very angry, and at this point, the lizard started doing something. The guys didn't realize what was happening, but the boss used the saturation skill, and he successfully absorbed the power. An attempt at transformation became available in Phase 2. The boss has become much stronger than he was before. Raising his sword, our hero ordered the boys to dodge. The boss struck the ground with his sword, causing a strong red aura to erupt. Even though he was weaker than the boss, he was able to become the ringleader with his skill. It was a hurricane of fire. Our hero realized that if he froze for even a second, he wouldn't even be able to pick up his bones afterwards. If they're here, at least they can be knocked out. So it was, it wasn't. But then he got a little hesitant. Can you hear me? He asked the guy. To which the guy replied that it is a transmitter insect. It transmits the thoughts of its host. In any case, he has any ideas. To this our hero interrogated whether he could thus, having received an approving response, that he could easily do that. Well, the lizard was very angry and yelled for our hero to come over to him, because if he doesn't come out, he'll come to him. To which the guy finally came out of his hiding place and pointed his finger to approach him. The lizard rushed to attack our hero, but our hero realized what he was doing and activated the dragon eyes. He saw the weaknesses, and as soon as the lizard struck with his sword, our hero was able to defend himself against this blow by piercing the sword blade and pushing it, causing the sword to promptly fall to the floor. And as the blade touched the floor, our hero screamed, Now! And as soon as the dream touched the floor, our hero screamed, Now! And at that moment, Kang appeared, who, thanks to his sword skill, delivered a devastating blow. Just then, another guy appeared and targeted the boss with his insects that ignited when he attacked. With the combined efforts and power of Hargan, the strength of the attack gradually weakened. Harkon was not one of the easy ones, talking about how they dared and how he wouldn't forgive them for what they didn't do. But if they lost control even briefly, that would be the end of it. They need to get a grip. The boss wanted to use Fire Hurricane, but our hero was ready for it and prepared his yacht again. He swiftly attacked, slicing through the boss's sword. And while our hero was fighting the boss sword, the guys on the other side kept attacking him with their abilities. To which the boss yelled very vehemently, How dare they do that? He shouted, How dare they do that? Taking a little breath, he promised to punish them for what they had done. But our hero explicitly said, Now! And ducked right to his feet. He didn't even have time to do anything but crouch to his feet. But as he turned back, he felt a hand on his head and immediately heard our hero uttering for him to give up. At this moment, the skill level of the Empyrean Dagger had risen to 5 and 4% life energy absorption and power absorption. The boss started screaming, demanding to be let go. But our hero didn't even think about it. Staring intently at his opponent, he continued to do what he was doing, and the guys standing nearby were shocked by everything that was going on. In the intense fire, the boss shouted that he would still take revenge on our hero, but his strength was fading with every second, and at one point he had already let go of the sword. The boss was defeated and each member of the group received extra points according to their contribution. Our hero successfully absorbed the opponent's main skill with Empirical Dagger. He then has a new skill, Fire Hurricane, which helps him stand in front of his opponent.
Due to the low skill level of Bathory's vampiric dagger, the absorbed skill will be changed to Fire Wrath. At proficiency level D of the personalized form of Horgan's special skill, the hero can translate flames into any desired form. As the skill level increases, the temperature of the flame will gradually increase with the accumulation of skill. It was unlikely that he could increase the level of the Fire Hurricane skill due to his lack of skill level, but nevertheless, it was already a great success. Our hero realized that he could translate the flame into different forms, and he would have to try it out later. However, at one point our hero grabbed the mask with his hand and the guys immediately ran towards our hero, catching him. They asked if everything was okay and if he should sit for a while. After all, they didn't know how badly he might have been hurt. Our hero replied that he was fine and they shouldn't worry, except that it was a little difficult for him to move. Yeah, huh? That should pass with time. He really was fine, and the only thing he wanted was for those to fall behind quickly. He didn't want to be worried about him. But then one of the guys asked, What about those people in the cage? They don't seem to be doing well. As soon as the guys approached, they immediately heard thanks from the people they had rescued. One of the men wanted to thank again, because they were able to save them by tilting their head. But one of the guys said they just did what they had to do. The man immediately started asking, uh, if he was conned by any chance, and the man next to him, not a bald ponytail, wondered. To which the guy smilingly said he'd like to keep it a secret. And about the perfume, he realized he wanted attention so badly, even at times like this. However, the guy immediately said that Hargan's capture was not solely to his credit, and he was only just helping. After all, if it wasn't for that guy, it's even hard to imagine how the people they saved might have looked at our hero with an angry look. After all, when they were in the cage, they saw this guy in a mask, to which the guy asked what happened to them, why they got angry, but they explained that when Doyle first discovered them, the guy told him to drop them and go after them. That statement might be too bold, but they couldn't see any good in that guy. To which the guy said that was a very bold statement indeed. Stepping closer to him, he added that what had gone before had passed. Whatever the original reason was, he still ended up being the one who saved them. He's also their comrade, and in the boss fight he was hurt the most. In fact, they got so stupidly caught with that lizard and barely escaped. The implied question is, isn't he afraid of that man? Is he going to continue with this kind of nonsense knowing all this? Immediately the guy wondered if he might dare to hit him. And why did he let his head go so scary that now players like them look like them in his eyes? None of the people they rescued understood what was going on. But then the man bowed his head and apologized. The guy didn't respond, so the men repeated again. But the guy said to apologize not to him, but to the guy who saved them, to which the man approached our hero and apologized. After all, he has behaved wrongly and he hopes our hero will forgive him for his words. Strong and weak, within the tower itself, the relationships between people are based on the same principle. For when they were caught, they also needed him, and he took a risk for them. Whenever they needed anything, he was always ready to help. And now the situation has gotten more complicated as everyone is avoiding him. But then one of the women turned to the man, to which the man asked what she wanted, but she apologized for not being able to support him. However, he too must understand, for he knows what their lives and lifestyles are like. But the man said he didn't know what she was talking about and asked her to leave. But the woman asked him to wait a bit and listen, because don't they need tokens and artifacts? When the man heard this, he didn't understand what it was about. But the woman explained that these people are like a whole treasure trove of artifacts and tokens. Doesn't he want his share? He looked at the two guys. They were discussing their actions. The man didn't realize what kind of nonsense she was talking about. 
but the woman said it was all for their survival. The man asked again if it was for survival, and she replied that they would have to destroy their saviors to do so. To this the woman said that no one would touch them and there would certainly be no questions. Anyway, they've lost all their stuff, and he knows the circumstances perfectly well. They've already tried just going through Sector E and almost died. Isn't that right? So they can only take so much to become independent. But the man was shocked. What if they get caught? The woman said it seems like they have no other choice either way. To this the man agreed, but asked again if they had plans. After all, they can't just recklessly attack them. But she assured me that there was one person among her acquaintances who had plenty of tokens and was a pro at it. The man, upon hearing this, was pleased, but asked her to tell him more. The guys at one time told our hero that, while they were here, they should distribute the trophies and according to their treaty, they will take Hargan's crown for themselves. To this our hero replied, for them to take away. That made the guys happy, and he knew from the beginning that the guy was a good guy. Turning to his friend, he told him to pick up, but our hero, for some reason, wanted to punch him once, though even if he did, there's no reason for him to do that, because he's just a little weird. Turning around and looking at the sword, he heard one of the guys say to take the blue scale sword and the rare relics as we agreed. He mostly used short blades, so this sword doesn't fit him at all. After all, the classification is two-handed weapon, grade D+. The description was about the Yadagons Hargon used. It carried the power of fire due to its high strength and ability to destroy anything. Still, while he doesn't know if he'll need the artifact right now, they might be useful in the tower, and on his list were items such as a redskin helmet, an axe, a pickaxe, and a solid crystal X3. Still, he had something useful. It was a one-handed D-discharge weapon. The description of it was a dagger used throughout the life of an unknown warrior. It was originally a simple weapon that wasn't hard to find, but gradually it absorbed the qualities of its master and became stronger. Supporting the warrior as the skill level of this dagger increases, the strength and speed of the attack will increase. After all, our hero has already dulled blades, and this dagger is just right to pass the tutorial to the end. But one of the guys, in spite of our hero, questioned what was wrong with him. Didn't like any of the artifacts, to which our hero said that there is nothing particularly useful, but it will not be superfluous, so they should not worry. Or, better yet, look over there. The kid looked up and saw a blue circle. Our hero asked if he was tired of hiding there, but what he heard the answer from the circle. There is a little, but playing hide-and-seek is not to be caught. He seems to have a knack for it, doesn't he? After all, he just wanted to surprise them. One of the guys asked our hero if he knew the mystery merchant, but our hero said he was only slightly familiar with him. The merchant interrupted them, saying that was a mouthful, for he would call their relationship special. Besides, Khan and Doyle he hadn't seen in a long time. This seems to be the first time they've met since they bought return tickets from him. One of the guys wondered how much they had given him back then, and it put him in a bad mood. To get close to the mystery merchant, you need to be in the top ten of the tutorial rankings. However, as he looked at our heroes, he realized that it was our hero who had been personally chosen by the mysterious merchant. Still, next time you better pretend you don't know anything or it won't be interesting. To this our hero replied that didn't anyone think it would be too easy. It seems to have been read all the way through. Our hero offered to sell him the right to his word. I think he wants to bargain. If he wants 150 grand, he immediately heard 160 tokens. But the merchant couldn't help himself, and as soon as he said he couldn't, he heard the price of 180 tokens. The merchant tried to say they should pay an equal price and immediately heard 200 tokens. 
However, he went on to say that he thought that at that price a bargain was possible, and our hero said, 300 tokens. And the sooner the better. If they procrastinate, the price will go up. And if they don't agree, they're left with nothing. And then the merchant warned that all the crystals here would disappear, to which the merchant replied that they were easy enough to find anywhere. But our hero turned to him and told him that it was simply impossible to find magic crystals of a sample that was greater than 70 units. He didn't know it himself. Well, I guess we'll just have to get rid of it all. So why is the reward for the Hargon's lair quest so small? And why does it convey the right to your own word as a reward? The tower is where rewards are given out according to the achievement obtained. Aohova Hargana is an area where you can add high-grade magic crystals. These crystals are the primary means of preserving and transmitting magical power. They perform the same function as when the waterman is on the ground. The higher the sample, the higher the efficiency of force transfer. Therefore, they are usually expensive, especially those with assay values over 70 units. That's why the mystery merchant had the eye of the tax authority. However, the merchant swept up that nevertheless 300 tokens for magic crystals was too expensive, so he got 400 tokens. Our hero realized that there was no doubt that there were such expensive magic crystals. Yes, and the higher their assays, the harder it is to mine such a crystal, but since he has the opportunity, why not whip out some extra tokens? To which the merchant, raising his hand, said, You've already started saying, okay, okay, stop it, please. I'll settle for that amount, just don't raise it anymore. After all, at this rate, he's sure to go bankrupt. 405 tokens, 5 grand for wasting his time. But the merchant first appeared to be a man who was even more cruel than he was. Our hero sold the Sword of Blue Scales and the ownership of the tax authority, getting 405 tokens. And now our hero had 498 tokens. But the merchant thought he'd been duped by a player. After all, he has nothing left. But immediately our hero asked the merchant to linger. Merchant Perry asked what else you wanted to buy, to which our hero replied that he didn't look like a bandit. But it didn't matter at all because he wanted to buy something. The merchant was already excited and asked what he wanted to buy about. But our hero said he wanted to buy the same mask, because his mask had broken. The merchant said he had plenty of such masks and would sell for four units of strength, to which our hero agreed and handed him the right amount. The guys who were watching the whole picture were surprised, because it was the first time they had seen such a thing. Oh well, thought our hero, and canceled the deal, for he didn't care. The merchant, on hearing this, swelled with anger. It looks like he's worked hard and is now offering as a special. If he, the peddler, continues to do such outrages, he will not come again. Our hero has been given a white ghost mask, helmet classification grade E, plus the mask is linked to several spirits. It creates a strange look and hides the face. This mask is not as easy to remove or drop, and damage taking is reduced. Our hero, while putting on the mask, the merchant was already moving away and it felt like it was stuck to his face. But he liked it, because it's not easy to take it off and it also protects it from damage. Our hero turned around and thanked the merchant, to which he heard the reply that he seemed to know what true gratitude was, and by the way, he was recklessly brave, selling off the magic crystals. Just then he asked if it was because he knew about that situation. But our hero did not understand this situation, and he interrogated what it was all about. And since he didn't hear a normal answer, the merchant immediately began to walk away, saying that he seemed to have misunderstood. Magic stones with high assay have become the basis of high-paying artifacts. They make up a certain layer in the market, so they have their own price. But the mysterious merchant so strangely agreed to buy them even though the price was high. This means that 
the demand for them has suddenly increased. This is unlikely to have been due to the rise in the number of rankers. Clarification comes when it becomes clear that within the tower, the rivalry between clans and rankers has intensified. Here one of the guys asks our hero, what are they going to do now? Our hero interjected, what are we talking about? To which the guy said he meant their future plan of action, to do something about it. After all, he has collected enough tokens, and now you can move to Sector F. He was originally in a 150th place, but has now moved up to 52nd. However, the difference with first place is still large. He has one more thing left to do, to defeat the boss dwelling in Sector E, the most prominent hidden part of the tutorial. It was time to go after him. Our hero replied that he wasn't going to move to Sector F just yet, as he had one more place to go. The guy interjected, where does he need to go? To which I heard an affirmative answer. However, the boys would like to truthfully ask him, would he like to stay together with them? However, if truth be told, the guys wanted to know if our hero would like to stay with them. Upon asking the guys again about staying with them, they said, yes, until they passed the tutorial, and even after that. Honestly, they've already talked about it a lot. They could make a pretty good team, even better than they could expect, especially if you make a three-man team. To which our hero said no, he couldn't. The guy, however, interjected, why? To which our hero replied that he still had things to do. The guys suggested that if that was the case, he could wrap things up and join them a little later. But our hero was not interested in finding a team from the beginning, because he doesn't like to be associated with anyone or anything. The guys were upset about that answer, but it couldn't be helped. After all, each person has their own nature, and they can't force them to be with them against their will. However, they still wanted to get out of here together, since it looked like they were already expected outside. After all, the swamp where such lizards dwell is very vast. Therefore, it will take a long time to leave it. Our hero made the decision that he would encounter many lizards on the way back, so he decided to go with the boys until they got out and went through the whole swamp. Players would gather in groups and follow the guys together. If they enjoy being here with this group of people, they can get into difficult situations. But our hero interrogated what they were going to do with these people. The guy said, there's nothing that can be done yet, but they have to get them out of the swamp area. But our hero pointed out that you can't fiddle with them forever. To which the guy replied that he had a sense of humanity after all, and couldn't just abandon them. That sense of humanity is always with him, despite their poise. They're too kind, because people by nature are like that sometimes. One of the men asked the guy for some food, to which he only apologized for not being able to give more. Nevertheless, he did give, and the man thanked him. Our hero realized that even if he talked about it, they probably wouldn't listen to him. Either way, he'll be out of here soon. A woman who had previously hatched her plan met with an acquaintance. He brought her what she asked for. After all, she in turn has already gathered quite a few people. After all, it's just a matter of survival. They can take a little away from those three, but that's just the first stage. After all, taking away tokens and artifacts will attract attention. But will it be enough to just take it away? After all, our enemies are Khan and Doyle, the third and eleventh ranking and the guy who defeated the Lizard King. But after all, if you take everything away from these guys, first place becomes pretty realistic too. There's something creepy about that guy though. When she watched him, she doesn't know if he's doing it on purpose or not. But when their gazes collide, it's like a white mask or a cold-blooded stare. He's like a demon that changes into your form. He's already giving me the creeps. But suddenly, a man came up to the guys and asked them to stop, because some people were not feeling well. As they got closer, they heard those asking them to go a little slower, because they were having a hard time. 
they needed to go to the bathroom, and some complained that they couldn't walk anymore. They have nothing left at all. Even if they get out of here, they still can't do anything. One of the guys thought maybe we should give them some tokens and leave them here. The girl thought exactly now. The man turned to one of the guys, asking if these men had been incarcerated all this time and he thought they were mentally exhausted. He knows the three of them are very busy, but can't they get some rest somewhere nearby? At the same time, the woman thought to make it all happen quickly for they were already expected. Hiding in the shadows, a group of scavengers consisting of a few dozen people waited until they reached the designated spot. The trap has slammed shut. Here they are in our hands. The girl only thought that it would be very easy, but immediately she turned her gaze and our hero was standing in front of her. She didn't realize what was going on. After all, he was watching before bed, but then something happened that even the guys didn't expect. Our hero threw an averted punch, causing everyone to go into shock. But our hero's target was the players who were with this guy. He immediately began attacking everyone involved in the conspiracy. Thanks to his keen sense, he was able to pick up on the changing environment, for that gleam in his eyes as he looked at Khan and Doyle the look in his eyes as he looked at our hero handing out some instructions to the other players, and the way he avoided other people's gazes, and even the way he conducted himself in business. It was obvious he was hiding something, so he used his own sense, preparing for any surprises. So soon he realized that there was some group of people sitting in ambush somewhere around here, and those people could only be scavengers. Our hero made the decision to be the first to remove them before they started moving, but one of the guys stopped our hero by yelling at him that he was doing something wrong. Our hero immediately replied that the one was weird. After all, if he doesn't notice or understand what's going on. The guy, for his part, didn't know what he was talking about, but our hero said that until the situation is resolved, all he has to do is sit tight. It was only at this point that he nodded his eyes at everything going on around him. I couldn't even think of such a thing. The garbage men had already surrounded them on all sides, but one of the men immediately started asking those people what was going on, to which he received the reply that they were caught, after which he immediately attacked the man since they didn't need him anyway. The guy didn't understand what was going on or who these people were, our hero realized that these people who created those dungeons, because usually scavengers aren't the only ones who do this sort of thing, among them are those who make packs with monsters, becoming bait, pretending to be injured. They trap the players, the monsters get their prey as the players themselves, and the scavenger takes the artifact and tokens. And most of the players imprisoned in that dungeon are probably gone, at the same time, the guys were discussing, is it really Bloodblade and the foxes? And the tail? Wouldn't it be cool if they could catch them? Not counting those crazy siblings Pantu and Adora, they're actually the best team. The mere fact that they crush them would be suspicious. And they must have a lot of stuff. One of them wanted to take the sword of dragons that Bloodblade carries. But one of the guys immediately started yelling that because he was the first one to say he was going to take it for himself, and there was conflict between them. But they came to the conclusion that whoever takes first is the boss. But they realized they had to calculate everything, so they should stop fighting. Better to think about what they would do with the bounty given for the Lizard King. But one of them realized that something was going wrong, and one of them also wanted to try to contact the other one, but he disappeared somewhere. One of the guys ordered the other to go see if he was in place, but at some point they fell silent. Even though they just argued over the Sword of Dragons, why aren't they responding? After all, in that case, there was going to be an attack, even though they are 15th in the top players, but judging by their ability, they could be in the top 10 at all. So why couldn't he see the signs of the attack before everyone was gone? But what he saw shocked him.
Standing in front of him was one of the guys, me, who had just mouthed for the guy to run. But at some point our hero was already too close to them, and at the same time the boys saw that they were from Arendon. And what do they even allow themselves? They consider themselves vigilantes who keep the tutorial under their control. But before he could even think anything, the guy was surprised at the outcome of the events that took place just a second later. Several guys were already lying defeated, and our hero did it. He continued to launch attacks on anyone who dared to attack them and already the guys also started to show their abilities to defend and attack against the other opponents, so that just moments later, the others started shouting for them to stop. After all, the notion of scavengers in them was shattered when they first showed their true faces. They immediately started making excuses that they were only doing what they were asked to do and had nothing to do about it. After all, they had no choice but to take their side in order to survive. The guy immediately asked them how they were different from the Hargan, but after a moment he was already very angry and asked again how they were different from the Hargan who was taking people away. Hargan, at least, cried when he saw how his wife had been struck. You're no better than he is, muttered the lad. After all, he was born with the son of one of the greatest hunkers in the tower, and, having refused his father's influence, he had accomplished everything on his own. Such a person just needs to be recognized. But after a couple minutes, our hero was already watching as the guys sat annoyed. After all, he still thought he was rescuing people who had been captured by the Lizard King, and it turns out that everyone has been doing the dirty work and were just prisoners. The only ones left are the ones who ran the whole thing. It must have been a big shock. After all, in Africa with our hero has happened to our hero more than once, but the guys faced it for the first time. Now he had to doubt people and have complicated feelings about them for quite similar matters. There was no getting rid of that quickly. All that remains is to wait and put your thoughts in order. The guy asked our hero if Henna was even there, to which he got the answer that he was used to it. But the guy didn't realize what was wrong and what his life was like. He couldn't even imagine. He asked questions about all the people in his world being like that, to which our hero replied that if everyone became like him, that world would go crazy. The guy, hearing this, took hold of his head, lowered it down to the floor, but at one point, he asked to be honest. What is it that frightened you bloody pretenders posing as victims so much? But truth be told, they're also a little afraid of our hero. After all, how can he remain cold-blooded even in such a situation? Most likely he suspected them from the beginning. Well, or he just doesn't trust anyone, and that should also apply to him and Doyle. Though they all call themselves players inside this tower, so it's best not to trust anyone. The guys have built a team on trust. It would be hard to end their relationship in any good way, but they trust each other especially. For them, the realization that here relationships are only built on their own benefits is a big blow. If you think about it that way, they don't consider each other strangers. Smiling Kang and good-natured Doyle, they have a lot of human feelings and emotions. Anyway, they have a point of view, and our hero has his own. So he made the decision that he wanted to break up here. After all, they're not exactly the same, so they're better off apart. Turning around, he started to walk away. But one of the guys jumped up abruptly. But the other one told him to sit down. The guy wouldn't settle down, he wanted to know. After all the guy had done so much good for them, how could they just split up like that? But the guy repeated again to sit down, looking at him with an angry look, for that was the best option. The guy was very much surprised by such words. His smile vanished from his face. But the other one said, Can't the other one see? One of the guys said it was the best option, and the other guy didn't know what he was talking about to which the latter turned to him and said, Doesn't he see what's going on? Whereupon one of the guys, 
I turned my gaze in the other direction, and the other guy also looked in the same direction. They saw a sword that stood in the ground, and on its hilt was a key ring. The boys immediately realized that it was the same keychain Aaron Don had. I mean, to tell you the truth, the whole thing was kind of weird. Why people from Arendon? No, probably not. From the island of the Blue Flower, without much benefit to themselves, keeping order in the tutorial, suddenly such mayhem. After all, behind Aranadon is the island of the Flower God. Such large clans within the tower can be counted on one's fingers. Of course, there are a lot of candidates to join, so they only select the ones they like best. Blue Flower Island was created by Aaron Don to control the tutorial, but many clans and ranchers still doubt his true intentions. But for lack of any evidence, there's nothing left to do but just leave it at that. Or is it all just a cover for a spectacular king over the garbage men? One of the guys thought that the fact that Blue Flower Island suddenly decided to create Arandon was also rather odd. After all, the artery had already completely destroyed the group of scavengers inside the tutorial, but another guy pointed out that they probably needed a more robust system for the whole thing. After all, that's why he didn't want to drag our hero into all of this, and it seems that he does have a case that he absolutely has to finish. But suddenly he realized that he probably didn't want to get in the way of our hero ending things. Here the friend began to apologize to his comrade, for in any case he must see that scumbag build and solve this problem, and he should go forward to the place where Bigrid is. Bigrid is another hidden item, and it was to get it that the guys needed the Hargan crown. She can help them turn things around in their favor and overpower Pant and Edora, who has superiority in points. After all, this is the sword they want to end up with in the tutorial. But one of the guys didn't understand what was being talked about. After all, he'd like to face that guy too. After all, he was very curious to see it. But no matter how much he pretends to be smart, he always ends up doing something really stupid. At the same time, our hero was walking down his path, and at one point, as he stopped, he turned around. After all, he seemed to guess where those two guys were headed, and what they were thinking after such an unexpected parting of the ways. Still, he needed to go east to finish the business he had planned. After all, when, if not now, he won't get another chance. Well, if our hero had not on the eve of their parting asked to go with him, would they have just as dryly refused as he did? Closing his eyes, our hero turned around and proceeded onward. At the same time, in the office of our former acquaintance, he questioned his subordinate that he was helping and that the second group had also been destroyed. What's the first one? Because he's helping that culprit again, that guy. But he was outraged because they couldn't catch that guy. I didn't pass up that chance. And that's not counting the fact that they lost their organs. He didn't understand why they couldn't do it themselves. Pass that. Why? He should do it himself, to which he received only an apology and was told they could not say anything, to which the man said to get the first group ready. But the lad wondered, for was it them he meant? After all, it's a unit called the Valor Squad in Arendon. After all, these are special players raised on the island. Why does he want to send these three into action? to which he heard the reply that the three of them outnumbered the second group and were capable of taking out Blade Fox, Tails, and that guy in the mask. After all, they have to take into account all the details. But then the man said he felt like he should go with them too. But the guy was very much surprised. Considering all the losses they had suffered, they might have some difficulties. For the Blade and the Fox Tail, they know what to expect from them, but they don't know anything about the guy in the mask. After all, he could be someone secretly planted, and that's too suspicious, the man reasoned. The only thing left to do is to act as covertly as possible and turn on them without leaving any clues. For after Artie's disappearance, the world that was once set inside the tower is slowly being surrendered. 
It's no surprise that at any moment things can just fall apart. But first of all, they needed to stockpile a powerful force so that no one would know about it. But while the man was reasoning about it, there was an immediate alarm because someone began to intrude. The man immediately asked what was going on, to which one of the men who came said the man only asked who they were and heard it was a blade and a foxtail. In a moment the guys were in the boss's office, standing in the passageway they had destroyed. Well, here. After the guy noticed the man, he immediately threw himself into a rage, angry at everything. His eyes seemed to turn white. He was very angry and quite strong. But then the man smiled, pulling out his sword. After all, it was a joy for him, because somehow it became boring in the tutorial, and here is such an opportunity to have fun. To which the man swung his sword and muttered that he wanted to have fun with the son of the lion, to which the guy also raised his sword and began to approach the man. And while the guys had a fight going on in the other part of the tutorial, our hero made it to the orc habitat. Although there were many of them, our hero literally dealt with each of them with ease. The orcs were surprised, for they did not realize who had come to them. Our hero approached one of them rather quickly, and after capturing him, he immediately heard the orc saying that the man was very strong and he wanted the man not to touch him. But our hero only wanted to know one thing. Had he seen a hunter's camp here? After all, they could be hiding in the mountains. The orc replied that he hadn't seen them himself, but it seemed that, yes, the companions had said that. When they went scouting, they had seen a strange house. However, they said it was very high up, and they couldn't get in. Our hero realized that he had found what he was looking for, after all. After all, this was supposed to be the location of the informant, who knows where to find the hidden boss snake Akasha. This boss appears at a certain time in a certain place under certain conditions. He can't find it without this man's help. After realizing this, our hero immediately asked the orc where it was. The Akasha snake periodically goes outside to breathe air and at the same time to fill its empty stomach. After all, our hero's brother didn't know about it and decided to go after this boss. As he approached, he met this man, a man who had also helped his brother and Ardia in a critical situation. The first teacher is Chonu, Galliad. Our hero stood in front of the house, realizing that this is where it was. Moving closer, he knocked on the door, but at some point he heard a voice from the side. As he looked around, he heard the question of who he was. Galliad is not human. He is one of a small number of elves, and even among them, he is considered a dark elf with hostile abilities. Our hero immediately introduced himself, saying his name was Cain. The elf said he didn't care what his name was, because he didn't understand why he was hanging around someone else's house. Our hero replied that he had heard of him from an acquaintance, and he had one thing he would like to purchase. He asked if his name was Galliad. The elf only looked at him, and our hero continued. I want to find Undine's tear. The elf immediately asked from whom he had heard of it, but our hero replied that it was from Braham. After all, Braham is Elf's longtime friend and Chonu's second teacher. Although they didn't know him by sight, it was unlikely they would ever see each other again. And what did it matter in essence? The Elf took his hand to his face and mouthed that he had told him to be quiet, and he spoke again. Turning around, he added that there was nothing more to be done, and our hero could go in to see him. The elf, upon entering his apartments and putting down the loot, said that he really needed Winda's tear. To this I received a positive answer, because it is an artifact that contains a large amount of Akasha energy. This could be good fodder for her, but the problem is that only Galliad knows how to properly manufacture a tear. The elf asked our hero if he knew what was necessary for this condition to which our hero replied that, in general, he understood what he was talking about. This was a very good thing, 
for they could take their time and get started as soon as possible. The number of people who have been able to pass the Galliad test in the last few decades is less than five. But if they were all successful, they would have gotten their hands on the technique that Galliad possessed. This technique is lightning step, a special skill that, since antiquity, has been granted to dark elves only to the victor. This skill makes the body as agile as possible. It also hides marks. This skill is perfect for our hero, but quick builds aren't his only virtue. He may be the key to one of the best earth compression skills. It's hard to know what is meant so far, as it's not revealed what the skill is yet. The trial has begun, and in this challenge, the elf is hiding and our hero must find him and touch him, but time is limited. Only 15 minutes are given for each attempt. The elf gave the advantage, for there was a great difference in skill between them. Therefore, our hero will have a handicap, and the elf will only use one hand and will not use any other skill other than the move skillet. The trial began, and the elf immediately disappeared. Our hero realized that indeed his movements were like wind. Catching them with the naked eye was impossible, but however, our hero had the enhanced senses of a dragon's eye. Using his dragon eye, he was able to spot a line that led along the path of the elf's movement. And after only a moment, he saw exactly where the elf was headed and immediately rushed towards him. He struck the elf with ease, to which the latter was forced to respond. However, the lightning step has one major drawback. Its movement leaves streaks behind it and it was obvious that our hero's eye would not miss a wave, and he immediately saw that this time the elf had gone west behind that dried-up tree. The elf didn't realize how his dagger could have flown close by, but then he felt something behind his back. Turning around, he saw the hand of our hero, who had already gotten too close. The elf tried to escape, but our hero Vavka grabbed his arm to which the elf only looked at him very much surprised, for he touched it, and the first attempt was behind our hero. Our hero was able to catch the dark elf seven times out of all attempts. All attempts were successful, and as a reward he received Undine's tear. But he could get an additional reward, for that he needed to appeal to Galliad. But even the elf couldn't think the one could pull it off so easily. The elf wanted to know, for it seemed our hero had a special technique, but it didn't look like it could be mastered so easily. But that was our hero's secret. I, the elf, realized that there seemed to be no way to find out the true face of this young man, but there was nothing that could be done. Once inside, the elf immediately started rummaging around and pulled out Sonia. He immediately said he could have her. But our hero was a little perplexed. For if someone wanted to take such a valuable thing, it would not be as easy as if he kept it in that corner. Our hero immediately opened the bag and saw Undine's tear there. The elf noticed that the one had to be very careful with that. After all, if the energy gets out, it can end badly. But our hero knew this, for originally Akasha was something that cannot manifest in the material world. If you try to materialize that energy, there could be a big explosion. And then there's this. Rapid body movement temporarily increases the speed of a hit while affecting a target by five seconds. Movement speed is doubled, and critical damage is increased by 7%. Our hero has mastered the skill of lightning step. The moment he felt his body became much lighter in this position, a quick jump became available to him his senses sharpened, and his ability to form became more developed. The vessel was ready, all that remained was to refill it. But of all the stats, he still lacked magic power. He could only replenish it by catching this snake. On Elf, I noticed that there are a lot of amazing players in this tutorial, and that includes him. After all, he wondered if, over the hundreds of rounds of tutorials, someone would show up who would take a chance? And now he's met someone who can take the risk after all. 
Our hero asked the elf if there was anyone else besides him, but the elf replied that there were two people and it seems they were brother and sister. Both got Winda's tear as he did and mastered the lightning move. Our understanding of the character is probably the first and second tutorials. Their names are Zdora and Pant. To gain such skills, this is where they had to be. But the elf's interest, where will he go with it? After all, he doesn't look like a magician or an alchemist. He means why he wants Winda's tear. But his answer shocked him. Our hero said he wanted to go to Akasha's snake. It was clear from the look on Elf's face that there was something wrong with Elf saying that she had already won. And she was defeated by the two he mentioned earlier. Our hero traveled to the scene of the event. He was very surprised, for how did they know about this place? No one knew about him except Ardia. Over the course of the tutorial, it could appear about once every three days, and you can tell from these traces that it's been about a week. But then our hero noticed something incomprehensible. Turning around, he was very surprised at what he saw. When our hero saw the snake, he thought they may have taken only the most essential parts of its body, and it was poison and her energy. After all, it seems that even if dozens of players pounce on her at once, it won't be that easy to catch her and how they managed to do it together, our hero did not understand, and it seems like he has no idea how powerful these people might be, or if they have something they could impress her with. Taking off his mask, our hero crouched down, not realizing what he should do now. After all, he's bound to push on and break into first place. However, time flies very quickly, and even if he does his best to climb at least to 11th place, he will be in eighth place at best, but far from first. Besides, he would only be able to recover his inheritance skillet if he had the energy of a snake. All his plans were now tangled. Well, here our hero looked again at the snake and noticed something incomprehensible. Looking closer, he didn't realize what was there, but after looking around a bit, he saw the impact marks. He began to realize that they had wanted to extract something from the skull, but couldn't anymore, and there were apparently several of them. Judging by the footprints, there must have been someone else here besides the two heroes. They're probably orcs, but what they needed, our hero had to go over and check it out. The remaining tutorial time is 150 hours and 43 minutes. Meanwhile, in another part, one of the men was approached. It was a rank six tutorial. He was being summoned to hunt. After all, that was Mr. Build's instruction, to gather the entire first group. The man waved his hand, saying, I said, let him send someone else. He's spending all his energy right now trying to maintain his ranking, and he should pass it that way too, because he needs to get into the top five. Then he can get recognized on the island when he gets to the tower going this far because of some bunch of guys who weren't even in the top ten is weird. But the messenger said that this was a special instruction from the Lord. Those who refuse to fulfill it will be suspended, to which the man looked surprised. But he interrogated what this special assignment was, to which he received an affirmative answer, and, moreover, he would personally lead the first ranks. He also said he'd give him all of Arendon's tokens to whoever brought those guys in. He appreciated such a gesture on Bild's part. After all, all of Arendon's tokens are several thousand, and it all has to be done by one person. It is, after all, a chance to boost his ranking one ranking at a time, and it also means that Bild will rely on that person in the future but he also added that you have to be as careful as possible as those people completely beat the second group. To which the man thought, if they beat the second group, didn't that mean they took all their tokens? In that case, he could have risen even higher than the fifth ranking. This pleased the man, so he immediately agreed to go on the mission. In the other direction, our hero had increased his stride skill to one or two percent, and at some point he noticed that there was something incomprehensible here. 
There was a place like this, but what were they going to do here? Taking a step, our hero entered the snake's cave. Just then he marveled that there was another place where she lived. It's possible that this could be the cave where her cubs or male are, but the fact that the orcs have so carefully brought her brain here indicates that something is amiss. Even if not, there is something here that has to do with snakes. Walking deeper, our hero was shocked by what he saw. The sound of a drum beating caught his eye. He saw that there was a very large number of orcs standing around, and on the table were the brains of a snake and one of an orc. At one point, the older of the two began to say incomprehensible things in their language. After he finished speaking, he immediately lit a torch and pointed it towards one of the orcs. Our hero thought this was not normal. At some point, the brain that was lying on the table began to show black smoke. But then suddenly, there was an explosion, and a snake immediately came out of that clot of smoke. It was a hidden quest, a rite of resurrection, a creature created from the body parts and spirit of a snake. If endowed with enough Akasha energy, it can be resurrected. The orcs are going to resurrect Akasha using an ancient ritual. Stopping the Miyu's resurrection ritual before she grows up is the goal. Our hero realized that Akasha could be resurrected, and maybe the result will be much better compared to what it should have been originally. The longer the resurrection lasts, the bigger her body gets, which means that the energy hidden inside her also increases. After all, the main ingredient for resurrection is, of course, energy. Likewise, with an Empyrean blade, the more it absorbs energy, the more powerful it becomes. But in this case, she needs even more feed. And the more it grows, the more it will want to absorb energy. But where to find so much food for her to fill her up to capacity? For tears will not suffice for that. In that case, there is nothing left but to bring her more sacrificial food. Elsewhere, at the Lizard Folk base, they discussed not being able to report that their king had died. After all, if the orcs found out, they would immediately attack, and they should be extremely careful. One of the lizard men, Chapter 21 Krarok, held his head up, not sure what to do. But at some point there was a bang. It was our hero who knocked out the lizard man with one blow and tossed the orc nearby. It looked like the orc wanted to attempt an attack and the lizard was the resistance. But both ended up passing out. Our hero immediately started using fire rage. Although the skill level of this skill is still lacking, it is enough that he can start the most common fire. As he left, he heard the panic in the lizard folk base, who immediately began shouting that it was an orc attack. But our hero already had his next target on the west side. We needed to throw more wood on the fire. And because the kindling of the flames in the western jungle was small at first, but the flames gradually encompassed the Kubilda village and burst into flames. It gradually spread to the immediate area and greedily devoured everything in its path. Kobaldine and Goblin had to forget their home. Large-scale immigration began. As a consequence, a conflict with the monsters living in those territories began, but in the end, even they were forced to leave the territories to escape the fire. This mess spread throughout the entire sector like a domino effect. One of the goblins is an overlord. The overlord immediately heard that he was not just an overlord, but a king. But the goblin immediately shouted that trouble was happening. The king asked the orcs about them showing up. One of the goblins replied that yes, and they had a great many casualties, for the orcs had been discovered in the village. Orcs, they didn't know the target, but goblins would never forget a grudge. The goblin turned to his king. Word had come to them that the organs would be avenged with them together. After all, they wanted to announce it to everyone, and they wanted to face it. A separate tribe came in, saying that the orcs were their worst enemies and they had defeated their leader. In return, they will retaliate and stand with the goblins against the orcs, but immediately they said that they were not alone, 
for the ogres and trolls were also attacked by them, and all must temporarily unite. Here the goblins said that they wouldn't just wait, for even the lizards had declared war on the orcs. The valiant goblins can't stay in the country. Raising his axe, he shouted for them to follow him. After all, they wanted revenge for all that the orcs had brought them. She's also a hero because she instigated a war between monsters. She'll get extra points. Sitting in a tree, he watched the whole thing. The description of monsters was among the creatures of a sector whose unspoken law was the integrity of their territory. However, this rule was broken and war broke out between the monsters. We needed to end the war. As a reward, he would receive the title of Monster Hunter, the eyes of a goblin king, a five-colored dragon stone, and extra merit points. And that was fine, because everything was going the way he'd planned. The more energy, the faster the snake's resurrection process goes. It turns out that it started with the lizards and went all the way to the Battle of All Monsters. Maybe the new snake will be much more powerful than in all the previous tutorials. But now the cup is full. He could just sit quietly on the sidelines and only come out when necessary, and that was enough for this situation, watching the monsters. And while our hero was watching all this, a group of people were already looking for him, passing through. One of the guys said he noticed there were too many people, but the other didn't think so, saying he didn't know what he meant. Here he looked at whoever had said it and wondered why he was staring at him like that and what he could even do to him. To which he heard the reply that perhaps he had expressed his emotions too explicitly. He may not think about the consequences. But the man was still pondering, for he could realize its implications right now. But then there was a conflict between them, and the other stopped them, telling them to stop their arguments. Vatim, every minute is important now to get the target down quickly, and they must realize that. After all, their goal should be near the last of the orcs, and they should be quicker to deal with that and get back. But then one man heard something, turning his gaze. He didn't get it. Ask your acquaintances the question. They heard what he was saying, but they didn't understand. And then, at some point, it started to shake. Stone looked into it. They didn't understand what could make the ground shake like that. But then they saw something they were definitely not thrilled about. It was a horde of monsters running at them. As they looked at it, they realized that it was impossible, and there was no way it could be. Turning around, he immediately ordered everyone to retreat immediately. But the monsters didn't care about that, and they wanted the humans not to block their path because they wouldn't stop. But the men didn't have time to move back, so they took the fight to them. But they still didn't understand how it was possible. I mean, it just can't be. After all, a guy's dream is to become the sword of the island, the island of the blue flower. I mean, it could just get destroyed by some monsters. And then the guy noticed one of the monsters swinging at him. Turning around, he saw the one trying to hit him, realizing the monsters were fast enough. At the same time, the lizards started a war. They had already crossed the northern barrier. The Norks didn't understand why the lizards had suddenly started a war. The king tried to ask his subordinate, but the subordinate didn't know why this was happening. After all, they were saying something weird about their king being drilled, and they were trespassing on their territory. They needed help. But after the king heard this, he became very angry. After all, how dare they attack them, and why in the middle of a resurrection rite? But then the king got the idea that they could take advantage of it. They can direct more food to the goddess. And realizing this, the king rejoiced. He immediately asked him to tell the shaman that they would have plenty of food and to be careful, but the monsters were already near, the orcs should have been held back, driven out of their way. But the goblins continued to attack the orcs, and at some point they managed to break down the wall that was blocking the path to the orcs. But then the king noticed another king, and it was already the goblin king, who addressed him about how they hadn't seen each other in a long time. 
But the orc king was already in a fighting mood, and he wanted to engage in battle, just like the goblin king. The lightning step skill level increased to 12.4%. Our hero kept moving around. By doing so, he moved very quickly between different locations. Entering the half-lit snake cave, he looked around. He realized that he now had to fight two monsters, the Goblin King Cranum and the Orc King Park. Truth be told, if you compare these two to Argon, they are every bit as good as Argon in this battle. It will be quite difficult to determine a winner and a loser. Plus, it's just a setting and everyone's amount of destruction will increase. All that energy needs to be channeled into the snake as soon as possible to satiate it. On his way out, our hero noticed a snake and orcs who were worshipping it and talking about it being a goddess. Well, then the snake started attacking the orcs, and they thought it wanted to punish them, but they didn't understand why. The snake had already gotten close enough to one of the orcs, but our hero thought so, for she is enticed by the taste of food. Plus, it hasn't been that long since she was resurrected, and she's experiencing a lot of hunger. But if she gets outside where the war is going on, won't she go crazy? But then the snake swung its tail sharply, and the ground around it shook. Our hero climbed down and realized that she was heading northwest, just in the direction where the battle with the monsters was currently taking place. And that was a very good thing, because hidden parts of a tutorial aren't called that for no reason. There's definitely got to be something more hidden here. Snake initially has a difficulty level that is not available in the tutorial. There should also be a reason why it is in that particular location. Not even Galliod, who had pursued her for so long, could recognize this reason. Even so, there's definitely got to be more to it than that, and it can't be something insignificant. There must be a place where they can get to or rest from the outside environment. For a moment, our hero felt the sharp chill of the wind, and looking straight ahead, he still found what it was all about. It is called the Spirit of Spiritual Essence Discharge Spirit, and plus the Spirit of Ginseng, one that has been trying to influence the soil envelope for hundreds of years. That way he looks like a little kid and gets confused with a real person. And the Spirit of White Ginseng is one of the rarest spirits. The ones that have been created can be counted on the fingers. If you crackle its energy, it can greatly increase its magic power, but the amount of magic power received is different from the amount he can internalize. The way it's lost is also quite complex, and even a very well-chosen effect can be complicated. Such spirits can really be counted on the fingers of one hand. I mean, this one could only be here, specially kept in this place to cultivate the white ginseng spirit. Judging by its size, it's been cultivated for about 300 years, but it should take about 500 years for the best effect. Of me should have been expected all along, but our hero apologized, for now it would be his. As he got closer to the spirit, he opened his eyes, flew up sharply and began to attack our hero, who realized that he was fast enough, but it was not enough. Attack But our hero immediately bounced away from him, which left the spirit shocked, but our hero said he's hunted the likes of him many times before, so he shouldn't have any trouble. To which the spirit was very much surprised. But at some point, raising his head, the spirit saw the attack. Jumping away from her and turning around, he noticed our hero and his hand reaching for it. But he didn't have time to react, as our hero boiled him down and is said to have gotten caught. But then suddenly the spirit began to turn into something incomprehensible, and after it did turn into some glass semblance, our hero, taking off his mask, absorbed the hidden white ginseng spirit object. Our hero was overflowing with energy, his magical abilities much more amplified. 92% of the energy stored in the white ginseng spirit was transformed into our hero's soul, his body completely siphoned off that energy in just a moment. 
Our hero had increased his magic power by seven points, and at this point, he could already start restoring inherited skills. After all, his inherited characteristics of a low-level dragon body had changed to a partial dragon body. Thus, he had obtained the magic chain skill. But our hero still couldn't control her as he should. However, he could now feel the magical power overflowing his body, and it couldn't help but make him happy. In the meantime, a guy from another group came to his senses. He didn't realize what was happening or where he was, but the only thing he did realize was that the place all those monsters were heading to was exactly where our hero was. The guy realized that our hero was up to something, because he must be looking for some hidden object that no one in the tutorial had been able to find so far. Whatever he was up to when he got what he wanted, the guy wanted to catch him off guard. Plus, if he makes it to this award, he'll have a chance to match Edora and Pant. The guy wanted to get to our hero as quickly as possible to finally achieve what he had longed for. Our hero opened the locket and saw a picture in front of him. It shows him himself, for it was a picture of the Galliod family. Apparently, he had once hunted this snake for some unknown reason. However, he was not leaving on his own. He was providing the people who called themselves hunters with a reward for the challenge. If the reason was because of the memories associated with her and his family, then it is understandable but there was definitely no mention of his family in the diary. But it looks like that's what he was looking for. Our hero made the decision to give it up after all, so he put the medallion in his pocket. Then he put on the mask. It was already time for him to go hunting. After all, the battle with the monsters was still going on. The battle was between the orcs and all the other monsters that had gathered together to oppose them. The Orc King and Goblin King were fighting amongst themselves, but then something incomprehensible happened. For the goblins, something crawled out from the ground, turning around. The goblin didn't realize what kind of monster it was. Such a mink returned, wondering why the goddess was here. And indeed, it was their goddess who looked at them with red eyes. Her red eyes showed her unfriendly intentions, which she actually demonstrated because she wanted to eat. None of the orcs understood why she immediately started attacking everyone, and even them, since they served her. No one realized what was happening while the snake attacked everyone in its path. But the goblin, looking at this, realized that things were bad, so he immediately wanted to run away, to which the orc began shouting where he was going, for he must take the fight. The goblin replied to keep quiet, for the welfare of his tribe was more important to him than jousting and honor. After hearing the auroch, he turned around and immediately ordered his underlings to be quiet and respect the goddess. But the snake did not want to stop there, because it was very hungry, and already the goblins began to help the orcs to subdue the snake from all sides, including from the air. However, the orcs themselves were not left out. They, too, sought to subdue the goddess, so they began to attack her. At this time, our hero was already on the hill watching the situation, for he realized it was a mess. But it seems the result was even better than he expected. After all, the number of monsters has already been reduced to 10%. This made the snake larger than its original size, about one and a half times its original size. Still, the two kings stand on the front lines and drive the snake to one side, and the remaining monsters are still trying to fight valiantly, but it won't last long. The goblin king and the orc king are already badly exhausted. Our hero realized that it was already time to finish, so using the magic chain skill, increasing it to 0.7%, and after that already to 15%, he landed on the snake's head quite quickly and was about to do his thing. And after our hero touched the snake's head with his hand, the skill level of the vampiric blade began to increase quite quickly because it sucked completely all the energy out of it. By doing so, he was able to defeat her, and the hidden quest, Resurrection Ceremony, was completed, and the sudden quest, Monster Attack, 
was also completed. For this, our hero received 5,000 points. The snake was originally about the size of his fist, but as the snake became saturated, the size increased a great deal. Therefore, our hero immediately used the skill of empirical blade, and it pleased him. He even smiled, for now he could absorb it, and our hero felt the rush of the snake's immense energy. Turning this energy into magical power and overcoming a huge amount of anger into magical power energy would require a corresponding amount of time and stamina due to the imperfections of the dragon's body features. It is impossible to perceive all the magical energy because of what began the process of restoration of our hero's body and the properties of the change were applied. However, he was advised to use the magic power in a safe place because outside influence would cause a slowdown or deviation, which would increase the estimated time to 15 hours. But then the Orc King and the Goblin King looked at each other. I mean, there's no way that could have happened. The Orc looked around, glaring at our hero, and saw something strange. For those eyes brought him into shock, for they were the eyes of a predator. But our hero didn't stop there. After defeating the Orc King, he realized that there was still a Goblin King who also wanted to fight our hero. He realized that he would not be able to defeat our hero, and that's what happened. The Goblin Boss was defeated and our hero got another extra merit point. The remaining monsters only had two options. The first was to fight to the end, but the second was to flee, of course. And even if they decide to flee, our hero will not pursue those who flee, for there are only weaklings left, and he doesn't need them. But there were still those who wanted to fight, and those who tried to resist our hero in battle. After all, our hero was sinking his sharp teeth into them and absorbing their energy. The more energy he absorbs, the stronger his body becomes, as well as the recovery rate of the inherited skill increases. His desire and lust for absorption grows by the second. He could have done anything to get even stronger. But at some point, our hero took on a face, realizing he was a little tired. After all, he had fought countless hundreds of monsters. He's been wanting to take a very long rest in a quiet place for a long time. Our hero just asked the question, why him? To which the man replied that he should not pretend, because he understood perfectly well that he could not even move a finger. But looking at all this, our hero only said, Okay, but I'd like to hear the answer to my question. On the other hand, he wasn't actually here alone after all, which the man didn't understand what he was referring to. But then, suddenly, turning around, he heard that he was indeed not alone. Our hero only watched all this, but then out of nowhere appeared someone incomprehensible. It wasn't until our hero looked up that he saw it was an elven woman looking at him with a hard stare. He immediately said that he heard something very noisy in the woods and wanted to see what was going on here. However, he still wanted to know if it was his doing or the hands of another. The transformation speed of the characteristics intensified just as Payne said. Our hero really didn't have the strength to even lift a finger, but the elf appeared just in time to interest him. But it's either fate or just a fluke. Now it was possible to get some rest. Our hero turned to the elf, for he had a gift for him. Taking the medallion out of his pocket, he showed it to the elf, to which he was a bit stunned. And after only a moment, our hero began to fall, from which the elf saved him by holding him up. But the elf didn't understand what he was thinking, and he could never understand our hero. But it seems that this gift was the payment for everything. The changes have been successfully completed. The reinforced skeleton feature was changed to an iron body. 94% of the snake's energy had successfully transformed into magical energy, and the strengthening of the physical shell was confirmed. Our hero became stronger. The recovery of the inherited skill accelerated. The current state was 92 and 
Our hero opened his eyes and felt the dragon's partial body being changed to an almost perfect dragon body. But our hero realized that he had absorbed such a large amount of energy, but the restoration of inherited abilities was not yet complete. But how powerful is the dragon body skill if it requires such a large amount of energy to complete? Results and features. One of the best achievements is the development of the magic chain skill. Our hero, lifting his hand, felt an amazing sensation. They were both varied and familiar at the same time, as if there was something new in his body. It seemed like it was meant to be. He could also feel the difference when using magic. Now he could use magic however he wanted. Perhaps we need to do some research to figure out how to use it in combat. But the feeling still threw him off, for it was very similar to the feeling he had experienced when he first used the feeling-enhancing skill. Besides, the sensation seemed to be familiar to him, like Undine's tear. But while our hero was pondering, an elf entered the room, and our hero noticed him too. The elf said that it looked like he had recently woken up, and he should lie down to recover. It takes him a while. And then the elf said he had examined him, but our hero did not understand what the latter meant. But then the elf added that you should have strengthened your body, but still, you need to find a safe place. That's why he asked for his help. But at some point something went wrong. Our hero wanted to know a little more detail, and the elf explained that he was referring to the snake's immense energy, asking if he has ever absorbed such a thing, because even if one eats just one such thing, the incomprehensible will be digested, or the energy received will not be absorbed properly. And if one continued to absorb such things, then, while our hero's body might well be able to withstand it, he didn't know for sure, either it had absorbed all the energy or it couldn't. In Russian, some of this could have happened at any moment. Our hero had a rough idea of how the elf could help him. After all, if he left it like that, he probably wouldn't have made it. And for the energy to be properly assimilated, something had to be done. The elf was a fairly famous hunter, even among the dark elves, but he wielded several mysterious magics, so it was nothing strange that he could help. The elf immediately said he had to put his hand down. Without that much magical power, everything would be fine, but otherwise, there might be a misunderstanding. Anyway, if something like this happens in the future, there's no need to be so desperate to devour everything in a row, because he won't be able to become a real dragon anyway. Our hero realized that the desire was due to the power of the dragon. In vain he tried. After all, he could acquire an enhanced skeleton, start the process of restoring the inherited skill, and thus he could also complete it completely. However, the elf doesn't know that. Besides, it gave him back the thing he was looking for, and he's grateful for it, and it's better to just leave it at that. So our hero asked the elf only because of this question, what did you do to the magic by changing its circulating flow? The elf said that he used a similar technique that was used to make Undine's tear. Besides, to put this powerful flow to sleep, one had to use his innate abilities. The elf remarked that our hero probably doesn't even realize how much strength it takes, but what came out of our hero's mouth was only thank you. The elf was not thrilled, for he would pay him with only the usual gratitude. But our hero assured that later, when he had the opportunity, he would definitely pay. To which the elf was told not to say such a thing unless it was sincere. Even though he's acting a little rough, it's still okay. However, he completely forgot to say, thank you, big time for he's grateful for the one who gave him back the locket he was looking for. The magic the elf was talking about is called Undine's Divine Water. He applied the ability he used in making the tear, but in a human body. He said you can apply this technology and fill the body with energy. As a result, while our hero slept, unsuspecting, 
His body assimilated the magical power much more easily and his senses sharpened. It was an accidental benefit to him. Our hero was about to leave, but the elf assured him that he should rest for at least three more days before departing. But our hero didn't want to hear that and immediately started on his way. To which the elf said, well, since he has such a high recovery rate, he can go. After all, he was seriously injured, and now he is already moving at an incredible speed because he is very suitable for such a way of traveling. He was like that from the beginning. Thus, our hero realized what sensations appear when using magic. After all, all it takes is simply channeling magical power into your feet, and it's incomparable to what it used to be. It only takes a little over 1% to notice such a big difference. Well, or all the skills he knew before were just ineffective. His inheritance capacity is now at a 92% recovery rate. If he completes the remaining 8% in the future, what will be left with his body? Our hero approached one of the dots quickly enough, opening the electronic graphics. He realized that he had completed two quests before he passed it out, so he made the decision that a hidden quest would begin. After making the decision, he received a black bracelet. The classification was a wrist gear, the description of which is a bracelet that was very dear to the owner. The snake misses its master and hopes he will return someday. So she always carried this item of her master with her, but it is impossible to identify the name. But subjugating the souls of the dead is not a good thing to do. The souls of the dead turn into ghosts. They lose their former memories and powers, retaining only hatred. It looks like the owner was the demon's receiver. This artifact covers the surface, and you can cast a curse when striking an opponent. This artifact is unique and is part of the functionality of the suret. It could only be accessed if one had certain qualifications or met certain conditions. If this artifact is unique, then it definitely has good properties. Our hero realized that it seemed that here must be hidden the truth about the power of the black bracelet, the power of its only owner. But then the black bracelet abruptly started emitting these black fumes that enveloped our hero's entire body even the parts our hero couldn't expect. After all, when he interacted with the black bracelet, he gained the ability to see the souls of the dead. The ability to fuse his skills with Eyes of the Dragon skill level increased to 13.5%. Our hero immediately began to see souls. And after all, there must have been these monsters that he slew or were eaten by the snake, and all this time they were wandering around. Our hero realized that this was very surprising, for he had not received any curse. But then he noticed the two spirits looking at each other and then turned their gaze on our hero, angered. But our hero wanted to test what this artifact could do, so with one swipe of his blade he took one of the souls. After that, he wanted to try the black blade, activating the dark magic power ability. Such magic is famous for increasing the wielder's damage and casting a curse on the enemy. This can be a major attribute in a battle. Our hero wanted to test what this ability could do, so with one hit he activated it. He was paving the way for the curse, and it was better than he could have even imagined. The curse seems to penetrate to the very depths and promote decay. And since this bracelet has such power, what happens if you combine it with other skills? Our hero wanted to get busy, so with one swipe of his blade, he was able to gather five souls and immediately began to manifest his ability. He wanted to test how the fire powers would behave without causing hostility. The fire struck him with delight, for it flared up sufficiently to strike a crushing blow. Such an explosion could easily destroy almost everything around it and our hero realized that he was only using five collected souls and had achieved such an effect. What would happen if he tried that with all the souls here? That was exactly what he did, as the number of souls collected increased by 850 units. 
Our hero wanted to see if 150 souls was the limit or if he could gain many more, but it would be enough. In any case, there were so many ways to increase your power, and it was time to check the rewards for the quest Battle with Monster, because there were definitely four rewards mentioned in the quest window. Monster Hunter. This title is given to a player who has destroyed many monsters while hunting them. The holder of this title can deal powerful blows. Monsters struck by the holder of this title become ghosts and cast a curse on the player. It was only now that our hero realized why those ghosts had followed him then. He also received the Eye of the Goblin King as a reward. That eye stayed with him to keep track of his fallen opponents, even after their deaths. Just by putting it on, the player can get different effects. For example, Cranum's hate can have a negative impact, but if managed correctly, he can be a good fit for players. Our hero looked at the eye and realized that it enhances damage and protects against curses. It should go especially well with the black bracelet, since both use fury. Fury and curse increase the effects of dark magic, so the damage will be even higher. He also likes the next reward as it enhances several characteristics. Eyes, ears, and nose are additional to his enhanced sense, and his arms and legs complement his lightning-fast stride. It's like this artifact was made just for our hero. If a person doesn't have that history, they simply can't leave their peaceful world and start passing the tower. But then the elf wanted to say something else. Because before he leaves, he wants him to take this. Because it belongs to the guy he was going to fight. The elf thought it should be a pretty good weapon, so he took it. Our hero thought that if the sword came in handy, he would use it, and if not, he could just take it and sell it expensively later. After all, a medium-weight sturdy blade is comfortable to hold. No doubt it's a good sword, but our hero usually uses knives or short daggers so he can hold in one hand and has a short blade. But as the elf said later, he would be able to sell it to a secret merchant for a good price, so it was better to take it with him. But the elf also said that if he was feuding with Arendon, it wouldn't be easy for him to meet them in Sector F. But our hero didn't know what he was talking about. To which the elf asked in surprise, Isn't that one feuding, but with Arendon? After all, the green trinket there by the sword is the symbol of Arendon. It was only now that our hero realized that it wasn't just a group of garbage men. Was it Arendon? Blue Flower Island is a faction of scavengers that was destroyed by our hero's brother and Artia. The unexpected appearance of Arendon. A well-organized dungeon with players, as well as the two guys who had so unexpectedly gone after the scavenger faction, stewed Arendan. All this time they have been deceiving other players by saying they care about safe tutorials. If the two guys realize this fact, they could have been captured. But since it is, they are quite capable of standing up for themselves. But if we're talking about Arendon, that's another matter. It's not clear how many players there are and how strong they are. Plus, behind their backs is Blue Flower Island, which is one of the eight strongest clans in the tower. Would two people be able to match them? They had already faced Artia once before. Looks like the caution will be even stronger. After all, if Khan and Doyle had massacred Arendon, rumors would have already spread throughout the sector. But so far, our hero has heard nothing of the sort, which means they've probably lost the battle. Our hero, closing his eyes, pondered, friends or just strangers, whether he wanted to step into this or stay out of it. Remembering the moments when they were together and their joyful smiles, our hero opened his eyes and thought, should he be thinking about this? Besides, his brother was a hero to him, and he hoped he would remain one even after he was gone. These are the last words his brother left in his journal. But the answer was obvious, for there were five swords thrust into his brother's heart. Three of them belonged to those he called the Lords. One belonged only to him because he loved him, 
and the last belonged to his friend whom he trusted. Our hero came out of the bar with the elf and said something to the effect that the elf was going to break up the fight, but our hero didn't understand how he could know, to which the elf said that at one time he was a warrior who fought for his kind. He was a strange one, believing that the whole point was the battle, and our hero is the same. The elf said that he and our hero are very much alike in this regard. After all, he can see the glint in his eyes now, which means he's ready to unleash the fight. He felt it back when he met him for the first time, then like a fighter and also ready to challenge the whole world. But things seem a little more serious now. If he can be wrong, then perhaps his intuition is failing him. But then he suddenly offered his help, and our hero wondered. After all, as an elf, everything should go smoothly. He's one of those with rancher-level abilities. Our hero didn't know if he could destroy Arendon if he went it alone. However, our hero refused and said it was okay and it was his battle. After all, the goal of our hero is not only to find two guys, but his main goal is to destroy one of those who ruined his brother, Blue Flower Island. He couldn't trust it to anyone else. No way. He must surely unleash this fight with his own hands, said it would be hard enough, to which our hero replied that nothing comes easy. After which the elves wished our hero good luck in the battles to come, and our hero turned around and started walking, pondering why the island of Blue Flower was setting up multiple dungeons. What is the reason for such actions? After all, if you look at it that way, it's a pretty inefficient build if their goal is to catch common players and artifacts. Regular dungeons would have sufficed, but why would they set them all over a tutorial that's hard enough to manage? And why did they rebuild them even after Artia destroyed them? There had to be something that couldn't be detected from the outside, something that could be their most vulnerable spot if he was lucky enough to find out about it and take matters into his own hands. This would become his advantage, and with it, he would be able to destroy Blue Flower Island. After all, the eight clans that crushed Ardia and struck his brother, including Blue Flower Island, have a man who stuck a sword into his brother. In all likelihood, the battle would start even sooner than he expected. And in that case, he already knows what to do. He must finish everything that was prepared before the battle began. When he opened the P.O. box, he wanted to know how much time he had and saw that there were 88 hours and 25 minutes left. That's about four days, 3.5 days to be exact. Somehow, there's not enough time to destroy Arandon and finish the walkthrough. He has to make sure they don't have time to realize anything and attack without respite. And when they run out of strength, break through in one go and get rid of them entirely. Arandon base, leadership, and all. Our hero made the decision that he would finish it all in one day. Sector F of the Arandon base, its location. They still can't find him. The whole sector has been scorched, and where he is, something is bound to happen, the man said. One thought about the fact that after this unforeseen battle of monsters, about 70% of their lineup was eliminated. He was unable to contact the first group of participants who were to become valuable recruits of the Blue Flower Island and the scavenger organization that had been so difficult to rebuild after the defeat of Artia had been completely destroyed, and with it, the entire Arendon network. Spreading throughout the tutorial physically means the destruction of Arendon. All the stuff accumulated over the last few years has disappeared entirely. It feels like a sentence. To avoid this, he must restore Arendon. There's about three days left. It is virtually impossible to rebuild Arendon in such a short period of time. They'll know everything at the end of the tutorial, and then he won't get off with just a punishment. Well, if he does, he can move up in rank. This person also persisted in asking him to finish with it, even though it was quite a complicated matter and he still couldn't complete it. He had his reasons for using players and monsters as materials, 
but then the man opened his eyes and realized that he seemed to know who would be a suitable victim for him, and it was the masked guy. After all, he'll want to catch them off guard somehow, and besides, he definitely has a closer reason this time. But then one of the men said they checked the direction of the guy in the mask, and apparently he had entered Sector F. But that's just a guess, to which the man said to bring him to you, even if they had to search every nook and cranny of Sector F, and to do it much faster than they could. Watching one of the men leave to carry out the order, the man realized that he needed to finish gathering the remaining materials first. And then a man began to enter the dungeon, asking how they were doing. And then we were shown the blade and the tails of the foxes. These are the same guys who helped our hero. But their appearance was shabby. One of the guys asked the question, What else is there for him to say? Is it enough for me that they don't know that? To which the man replied that he had something to say to them, for they would become expendable stone. To which one of the guys said, I'm a little confused. What kind of rocks are we talking about? It's a thing to be created by bringing players captured by Arendon, the consequence of a foul experiment, something that shouldn't exist. The man said that originally they were going to slowly draw the energy out of their bodies, but unfortunately now they have to hurry up, but they should be happy about it. The two men standing nearby turned and looked at each other with glances, and my head immediately began to go. But the guy realized he didn't care. But if it was because of his reckless bravery, here was one he couldn't help but feel sorry for his friend. He couldn't think of how Doyle had been subjected to the same circumstances, and he was sorry he had led him down the wrong path. After all, this guy who left his home trusted only him, and he led him down like that. The guy thought about how he could release it, not realizing what to do. After all, he was powerless in this situation and it would happen again this time. But then, something incomprehensible happened from above. One of the wardens looked on, musing that the place had been purposely placed so that those inside would be protected from earthquakes. So, what was going on there, he didn't understand. But then one of the guards came running to the man, talking about how there were invaders outside. Bild became very angry, for why now? but there was already a huge explosion outside, and the guards who were standing immediately ordered everyone to defend themselves. After all, they didn't understand where he'd come from. But then our hero began to appear out of the smoke. He used all his possible strength, and his gaze was determined. He used his goblin legs to move quickly and attack, quickly approaching his opponents to deliver crushing blows and the Goblin King's eye detected an unseen danger nearby, so he immediately jumped aside and saw three balls land nearby where he was standing in the ground. But then there's our hero, and to which the people who were standing around were shocked. Our hero then activated the Black Blade ability, heading towards his opponents, getting bigger and bigger each time. The guards, however, realized it was not human. It's something stronger. And how is it possible for someone to be as powerful as this guy in the mask? Well, here, a red fireball appeared near one of the defenders, after which there was an explosion, and no one standing there understood how this was possible. But our hero saw no obstacle before him, and the men who looked on were very much shocked. But our hero realized that if he himself does not go to him, he will come to him himself. But then our hero heard a voice yelling at him to stop. Looking up, he saw Bild, who stood with his companions and only glared at our hero. Bild looked down on our hero from above with a hard stare. But the subordinates who stood below, immediately seeing Bild, rejoiced greatly, for at last someone would save them. But the man, seeing our hero, wondered again. After all, he felt bad that he had been hiding all this time somewhere and didn't want to join the fight. And now he's got the nerve to show up at their fortress. The man was very annoyed by such an act, 
But our hero looked at the man and immediately realized that his energy seemed very familiar. But couldn't he have known such a powerful aura? Perhaps he had seen this man before. But what is it? Looking at it, he immediately remembered that the swords that stabbed into his chest were only five. Three of them were from what he called the hordes. One was from his, and the last was from someone he trusted, calling him his friend, Leonte, a man he considered a friend and could safely trust to cover his rear. However, he betrayed. Next to him were the other players that Leont called brothers, and among them was another man who only grinned after stabbing his sword into his brother. And it was Bild, our hero prepared to attack. He thought it would be the first gift for him. Preparing his daggers, he glared at the man below, near the mountain, those he had already defeated before. But the man immediately ordered the guy next to him to send a message to the Blue Flower Island and tell them that Arundin had been attacked by a strange guy. The man immediately agreed and was ready to go to send the message, but then suddenly there was an explosion and the young man fell unconscious. At this, Bild looked on as he suddenly collapsed. Our hero also started yelling at him to stop this useless nonsense. If he wanted to attack, he should do it right now. It was good for our hero that he wasn't going to run away. At which Bild looked intently at our heroes. After that, with one hand I began to draw my sword, saying he would do it, and our hero wouldn't be raging here if he didn't have a trick or two to spare. Afterwards, stopping with his feet, he immediately jumped on our hero to show him how useless his worthless skills were against him. At one point, Bill tried to hit our hero, but our hero was able to block his blow with his blades. Afterward, nimbly returning, he attempted to strike a blow, but to his great regret, he failed to hurt the man much. After all, Bild was one of those Flower Island players who focused on grappling and finding himself in Arandon, which is centered in the tutorial. Arandon, the scavengers of the dungeon with players including Bild and the one behind him, Leon, have entered the Blue Flower Island at the cost of our hero's brother but he was unhappy that he never got to be the head of the island. If he's up to something, the best cover for his plans is Arendon. Almost everything matches. The fight continued between our hero and the man, but at some point our hero jumped up. The man thought it was impossible. For how could it be? To which our hero only kicked him in the face, from which he shot back. Players who entered the tutorial are only now struggling to gain their pitiful abilities, but this guy was very strong. The man realized it, taunting against our hero, but he didn't understand how he was able to hit him. But our hero under the mask smiled, for he understood what to do and how to do it, for the one did not know how to fight at all. But the man didn't understand why that was so. Our hero used to think he could fight properly, but it seems his skills have dulled in the time he spent among the newcomers. But the man thought he knew him and what his true identity was. He didn't realize he needed to use magic to its fullest potential. But what happened next, no one could have even expected, much less build. After the hardest blow, the man was already on one knee on the floor and holding his hand, not realizing what was happening. But then our hero began to approach the man, as he came closer, he looked down at him already from above, as he had done earlier. But two guys immediately got in front of our hero and started yelling at him to stop. They wanted to protect Mr. Bild. But our hero immediately used the power of the Black Blade, defeating the guys who stood in his way with a single blow. There were quite a few of them, but still with one blow he was able to put them all down. But the man immediately began shouting to his subordinates to approach our hero. He shouted angrily, but no one standing near him wanted to do so, for they were all afraid. But then, Bild said vividly. Immediately, the people standing nearby seemed to change their faces and started walking forward. Bild utilized the marionette skill. He had never used this skill until now, but now he would have to do so. 
After he did so, he immediately turned around and started running away, leaving his subordinates with our hero. He shouted that he needed a rock, needed a rock very urgently. After all, if he had it, he could end up with the masked guy. But our hero was not so simple. With a steady gaze, he watched Bill run away. Our hero began cleaning up after everyone who stopped in front of him along the way. And after all, he had already virtually wowed everyone except one person. That person was Bill. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, the guys didn't realize what was going on there. Why so loud? They wanted to do a good thing and ended up here. How could they have been so unlucky? But then one of the guys told them to have a clean talk about how he's the loser, not the guy. After all, he was just following him and was in this situation. But the guy got angry too, started saying what he was trying to say, since he was sitting here with him. Why is he lucky then? To which I got the reply that it just wasn't his day, but he's kind of a mean guy today. Long ago, he had made a promise to himself that if they were to perish, he would contradict his friend at least once before doing so. But the boy was puzzled, for he speaks as if he had always fulfilled the role of obedient younger brother. Well, here the guy suggested that they should stop because nothing good would come of it. But then the guy asked a question. What does he think is going on with Cain right now? To which the guy replied that he didn't even know, because he was probably fine without them. After all, he's already headed for Sector G. That's probably true. But then the guy mumbled that if he had known they would be in this situation, he might have told him about that hidden part and he could have used that instead of them. But then the guy heard someone say that he might as well tell it now, much to his surprise. The door opened and then the guys were shocked because they saw our hero who stood in front of them in his mask. Our hero releasing the guys, he said they looked so-so, to which one of the guys was overjoyed and asked how he got here. But our hero teased that he was passing by and accidentally ran in. But one of the guys remarked that he was rude at the moment of their parting, but he still thanked our hero to which he immediately heard that, if he was really grateful, he could also tell him about the hidden part of the tutorial. But the guy, outraged, said he was crazy, because he wanted to make a deal out of it. But afterward he smiled. After all, uh, one way or another, his whole body ached, and whether he would be able to escape from here in this state, he didn't understand. But in such a state, they will only become a burden for our hero, they just won't forget it. He was very grateful that he had come, but right now it would be best if he left them alone. After all, they'll take care of the rest. But our hero said that all the members of Anadana are defeated. They need not worry. But the guy immediately wondered, how is that possible and what is it saying? But one of the guys still realized that our hero had handled himself, to which I received a favorable reply. He's still standing here, after all. But the guy pointing his finger got angry. For why did he answer his question and ignore it? I mean, he can't even hit him. But still, Bild had gone somewhere. But the guy also asked if he had gone downstairs. Our hero realized that the man was hiding something, but asked what was downstairs. To which the guy replied that he didn't really know much himself, but however assumed that they were up to something. After all, they had definitely resorted to something obscure and wanted to manufacture some kind of stone. A moment later, the boys and our hero descended into the lower cellar. It was a dungeon, and they were very good at hiding the place, our hero realized. There's blood everywhere. How many people did they keep here? And from the looks of it, there were definitely people here just a couple days ago. Did they really decide to do a sweep during that time? After all, among the ingredients that can be used in alchemy, the most precious is the soul. Not only is it inhumane, it's also very dangerous. That's why it's forbidden in the tower. Regardless, they were going to do something with the help of many souls. Everything they've done from start to finish has caused a lot of problems. One way or another, Build was trapped. 
Our hero saved Khan and Doyle after all. All that's left is to catch up with Build and get it over with. But then our hero saw again the souls that are visible to him. Our hero realized that these souls of players who were here wanted to help him. Walking into the shower center, he immediately said he had one condition. Do they want to hear this condition? But at the same time, Build had already entered one of the rooms. Walking to the back of the room, he walked over to some rock talking about how he had spent a great deal of energy on this rock trying to take it. For all this time, while his comrades were climbing the career ladder, he was patiently waiting and putting his all into this gem. One day he was going to give this thing to his master to help him be reborn as a true king, but as he picked up the stone, he realized that he needed this stone more than he did right now, so he immediately bit it off. Lyant said that if you swallow this stone, it could generate immense magical power within it. But he also warned that there could be two different outcomes. Either the body couldn't handle that much magical power and would burst, or it would take it dramatically and change. However, if the stone is fully completed, the first option for the outcome falls away. The man could only hope that he was complete. But here, eyes downcast, the man didn't realize what was happening. After all, there should have been an immediate reaction. Something had gone wrong. Perhaps he had missed something. The man didn't understand why this was happening. Gritting his teeth, he heard someone address him that he wanted to escape to this place, but didn't understand why. Suddenly, he felt someone standing behind him. The man turned around and faced our hero's gaze, but our hero said it was the very stone he wanted to create. But he doesn't look like much, because it looks like something went wrong. But the man didn't understand why there was no reaction. The man looked angrily at our hero. He didn't understand why he had come here and what he had done to him. After all, why is he antagonizing them? It's not like they have anything in common. Why is he invading their territory? The man wanted to know what he needed. But then our hero took hold of the mask and began to remove it, throwing it to the floor. He said that now he thought the man would understand why he was antagonizing them, whereupon he threw off his mask, saying that such an answer would suit a man. But the man saw the boy's face, and he didn't understand how it was possible. The man leaned back and didn't understand how this was possible, because it couldn't be. Our hero, coming closer asked him a question he didn't even seem to realize how much he missed them. But how did Cha Chong end up here? While our hero was asking questions from Build, he learned a great deal. After all, after Ardius was no longer his brother, entire alliances of the eight clans disbanded, and the tower underwent major changes. The distribution of power changed dramatically, and former members of Artaya had to be scattered on different roads. Now each of them could take what they wanted into their own hands, but someone's path was halted halfway through. What our hero didn't realize was that if either of them had a little pinch of connection, he and his brother were just having a routine affair. But then the man turned to our hero and asked that he finish after all. Our hero, looking at this, did not understand how to be, because he immediately remembered the fairy tale about the frog, who did everything the opposite. Now he understands him perfectly well, for there are so many other people besides him who would like to see him. Our hero stood up, stepped a little farther away and snapped his finger, and then the spirits he had met earlier appeared. The evil spirits bound to the veterans were released with the help of a black bracelet. The souls that became the ingredients for this stone were so eager to take revenge on the man that they even became our hero's servants. After that, our hero began to walk away, and the spirits surrounded the man. But the man immediately started yelling that he had told him everything the way he wanted it told him. Why is he doing this? He asked him to finish, but our hero just started to walk away. Our hero walked out of the building, looking at it, he realized that he needed to blow up that base and those evil spirits. Looks like they've already finished their business. 
but then he noticed something under the rubble of the base. This, in all likelihood, would be the same man who was so anxious to get out of here that he was able to crawl out halfway. Our hero was looking at the man and suddenly noticed some obscure stone. As he took a closer look at it, he realized it was unidentifiable and impossible to identify and use. The items are usually classified as Category F items. How many souls were spent for the sake of this experiment? After all, there's nothing left to do but throw it away. Though it is better to take it with us, and then surely there will be a use for it, thought our hero, taking the stone in his hand. Immediately it began to glow and Hero didn't realize what was happening, watching as it seemed to dissolve into his hand. He didn't understand what was going on. It was as if the stone had become part of his magical chain, even though he didn't want it to. Luckily, he could learn more than he could before, but all the notes were blocked. And even that was all he could learn about this stone. This artifact is unique in the entire tower. There are no stones like it. An item cannot be identified by quality, class, and capability. This artifact has not yet been completed. Our hero needs to complete it and access the hidden information. Well, at least one thing has come to light. It's not a defect or a low-quality item. It just hasn't been finalized yet. But it requires a special procedure to complete it. Our hero has no choice but to keep him near his heart until the very end, and still, so far, it has no effect. It was a little unpleasant for our hero, though, and looking back, he realized that it was all over now. Going into the rocks, our hero said it was over and they could come out, whereupon the lads looked out of the sub-circle and approached our hero. One of the guys said he always felt his level was really different from theirs but our hero didn't understand what that meant, to which the guy replied that he meant that he had caused all this chaos after all. He even wondered what they had done to him, that he had decided to destroy an entire clan. But our hero only shook his hands and said that it's still just a mystery of some kind. The other guy asked, what about build? To which our hero replied that he was finished, the guy, as soon as he heard that, immediately smiled and said, Okay, Blue Flower Island won't let that happen, the boy pondered. He'd like to straighten Build out with his own hands, but he's not that brave. It's just his recklessness to vent his anger. He needs to build up his strength first, and that he will not lose from now on, no matter what those enemies are. But the other guy, just approaching, immediately fell to his knee for he crashed just a couple steps away, he got worse. The boy immediately turned to Doyle. The guy said it seems their journey ends right here. The guy, upon hearing this at first, was shocked, but immediately replied that, whatever the case, he felt that way too. But then the guy asked our hero a question. Where are you going to go now? After all, it looks like it's likely to be in Sector G to which our hero replied that it was exactly there, because now it is possible. But then a guy handed over a baggie and told our hero to take it with him. Looking inside, our hero found that there are a lot of tokens, because this is all that the guys have collected for all this time, something they used and something they didn't. But our hero said that if they were trying to retaliate with that, he didn't want it and they should keep it to which the guy said it was okay because they were going to leave the tutorial. The guys have made the decision that they are retiring from tutorials. Our hero didn't understand what it was all about, but they actually had a chance to talk things over seriously while they were sitting there. After all, they can't go to Sector G in their current state. Yes, their rankings. They won't be able to hold it properly when, by the same token, they'll find themselves caught by other players again. They didn't want to, so they decided to quietly quit this round so they could try again next time. Because frankly, there's no point if they can't move up in the rankings to first or second place. Players who can climb to the first place will receive a corresponding prize. That's why our hero tried so hard to accumulate more points, 
but he was shocked at what he learned. After all, he didn't know it was possible to drop around and start it again. But the guy wasn't surprised that he didn't know. After all, players who have attempted the tutorial several times have initially had a lot of struggle until they are allowed to enter the tower. But our hero had thought all along that one could only enter here once in a lifetime, and there were no special notes in his brother's diary. I mean, all this time he's been doing so many unreasonable things, even though he might not have done them at all, and at this point he was angry enough at his brother for not telling him it was okay to enter the tutorial a second time. However, there is no particular period to open a tutorial. The tower itself opens it when the time is right. While it is possible to try again next time, no one knows how long you'll have to wait. Which was fun anyway, because he even managed to grab Build. Smiling, he realized another fact, because he was able to meet good players. Just then, our hero interjected that they wanted him to take it all away to which one of the guys said that it would be better one way or the other if someone could use it than just throw it away. But then his mood changed, for he wanted our hero to defeat Pant and Edor. He'd really like that. But then the fellow turned to the other, who now looked quite out of sorts, to which he heard only the reply, to keep him quiet. But then one of the guys asked the other a question, that is, if he thinks that since they can't match them, you can just blame it on Cain. But the boy didn't see how else he was supposed to do. But our hero has heard and seen these names many times before, and every time he checks the third tutorial, these names adorn the tops, and besides, he has to face them in Sector G. Our hero wanted to know what kind of people they were, so he could more easily understand how to fight them. But the guys immediately started saying they were a monster, because they had tried so many times to outdo them, but it was all to no avail, because they were just some monsters. And so our hero must take this on and make sure to get to the first place. Basically, they cede their place to him. Our hero, hearing this, smiled a little, for he is willing to do this for them, and he will try very hard. To which the guy said that's exactly what he was waiting for, because that's exactly what a man should display on the battlefield, friendship and a competitive spirit. It was exactly the kind of picture he'd like to see. Smiling, he said, for our hero to use it with pleasure. After that, our hero began to look at the two guys, who began to pour with laughter. I mean, the picture was pretty funny. And our hero in this crown looked quite funny, which made the guys laugh. But there's only a little bit of time left, just over 24 hours, and the last sector. He had to get through as quickly as possible. The hidden part of the tutorial that requires Hargan's crown is in the deepest place in the lair of the Echidna. This our hero was told about by Khan and Doyle, and also explained to him how to get there. Our hero gradually descended into the lair, destroying everyone in his path until he reached the last Acanthus, where he faced the boss. It was a strong monster, comparable in strength to Akashi's Snakey, and who knows, if he didn't have Hargan's crown, no one knows if he would have survived or been destroyed by this boss. Our hero fought to the last, and after his victory he saw a sword standing in the stone, which was illuminated by a bright light. Stepping closer and grabbing the hilt, he began to pull it out. It was Vigrid, the final piece that Khan and Doyle were preparing for Pant and Edora. Our hero still managed to get another artifact, but he was watched by the goblin that appeared in front of him at the very beginning of the tutorial. For no matter how one looks at this man, indeed, he is greedy. Having dealt with the serpent Akashea and even to Arendon it came down to this. And now he's gotten to Wigrid. Even though he had entered the tutorial a week late, he still took possession of this hidden object that seemed to be waiting for him and the lesson that had shattered Arandon. And the more he watches it, the more interesting it gets. After all, there are no more than twelve hours left until the end of the tutorial, 
what else will he be able to show in that time? After all, this show should be even more interesting. After all, only the goblin knows about all this. But only moderators of the highest office can restrict access to this post. Among the moderators, there are also those who by their commitments make various deals with players, so avoiding bad consequences. After that, the goblin wanted to see what would happen next. Our hero has entered the last area of the tutorial. It was Sector G. He finally got here. This is Sector G. The last stage of the Sector G test has begun. This challenge is similar to the E and F zones where you have to collect tokens. In this sector, he can steal merit points from other players. To do so, he needs to defeat them in a duel. Our hero should show what he can do by defeating the maximum number of players and getting the maximum number of points. But compared to the previous sector, here too the confrontation between players is open. Because of this, chaos reigns this month and everyone fights in the fiercest of fights. Our hero's brother had only two things to say about the place, and that was the battle royale and chaos. It's a place where battles between the best players take place, but it's also a place where things change quickly. This is where the most unexpected turns of events can occur. Our hero stopped at one point and felt a very strong aura, but they understand what it is. The two guys were talking amongst themselves about how they were just monsters, and is that really possible in a tutorial? But then our hero saw two guys who were standing in the center fighting with other tutorial players to which the guy muttered that it was so funny to see them struggling to fail. But there was someone else behind the guy's back. Our hero took a closer look. The guy had a protruding sharp fang, purple hair, golden eyes, and a horn right on his temple. And then our hero realized that they were one and the same, Pant and Edora. One-horned, among all the creatures of the tower, they are the only ones called the epitome of martial arts. Pant could throw his opponents as far away as possible with a single leg kick. Our hero realized that he had found them after all. But then Pant began to address players' misunderstandings about what they were doing. Didn't he come here to grab him? They should attack, because he doesn't want them standing there idly, or he'll attack them himself. But the other players who tried to fight the guy couldn't do anything against him, only defending themselves. Pant had already gotten too close to the other players and swung his fist and threw a punch, shattering the shield of the guy who was trying to protect him. He said that he had created a shield that was too weak to withstand his blows because he would be unstoppable. One by one, he only pushes them away with punches. After all, with that kind of power, he wouldn't even be a match for a garden scarecrow. The other players watching were shocked by Pant's power. In an instant, he turned around and spotted them, looking intently at the players who were trembling with fear. Smiling, the guy only mouthed to them not to stand like pillars while delivering crushing blows. After all, he wanted them to do something. Our hero, who was watching all of this, realized that he was very powerful and it was no wonder they had massacred Akasha so easily. But in addition to the guy, there's also her, Edora, the younger sister of Pant, the unrivaled top-ranked con player. She told our hero something about Edor. Can said Pant is strong to the point of insanity. It creates the feeling of a huge, undefined mountain. But Edora, a different matter. She's a little softer than Pant. It's completely impossible to read up on her. When you see her, it's like looking into a bottomless sea. That's why it's intimidating. Even if you have a high-stakes game in front of you, you'll still be able to see the top, but seeing the seafloor isn't so easy. It was only at this point that our hero seemed to realize what he was talking about. It's like she's hiding something, something huge and terrible. But what is it? At one point she turned her eyes on our hero, looking intently. Her calm gaze caught up with our hero, but she had something lurking inside her, watching our hero. But then the girl smiled and our hero realized that he had been noticed. 
However, he still wanted to observe the situation for a bit longer. Apparently, it's time for our hero to stop watching them from afar. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. Our hero began to move closer to the girl, pulling out his backpack. But from his backpack, he pulled out a baggie that the two guys handed him. After all, all that was left to do was to show off by stopping in one place. Our hero immediately dumped the entire bag of tokens on the floor. The other players watching didn't understand what this guy was doing or why he was scattering them. Were they really going to give up after their defeat in front of the Panthers? But then the girl, noticing it, realized it was a waste because he could just give them to her. And even Pant turned around, thinking about how crazy he was and how much he had thrown out there, apparently a thousand or even two thousand tokens. But here our hero said only one word, conversion. And at that moment, all the tokens collected in Sector E and F were successfully converted into merit points and added to his main account. But then the tutorial rankings updated, and our hero I rose to the top spot, ahead of Pant and Adora. After all, he had 50,000 points more. The girl, as soon as she saw it, was very much surprised, for it could not be. Since this round of the tutorial started, this is the first time she's seen anyone make it to the top spot, but our hero, I, took the bait. Now he wanted to try out his new sword. Taking it out of his backpack, he was enveloped in bright blue energy. It was Big Rid. The classification was closed, the discharge was closed, but there was only a description. In this forgotten Silver Age, there was a holy sword that all the greatest heroes of the time wished to possess. However, this sword, after passing through many heroes and absorbing a huge amount of energy, eventually transformed into a demonic weapon. Even after passing through several eras, this holy sword could not regain its original form. In order to restore this weapon to its former appearance, a special condition must be met. Most of the abilities are hidden, and you must have certain qualifications or fulfill special conditions to unlock them. The other players who were standing nearby were blinded by a bright beam of energy. They didn't realize what kind of artifact it was. Such a powerful weapon actually existed. But where did he dig up this artifact? Everyone immediately started talking about his score in the rankings, and even if they split that tidbit between them, they can still move up in the rankings. Plus, all the players standing around realize that this was a solo player who had no team. This means that if they capture him, there are no repercussions, even if he is as strong as Adora and Pant. As strong as he is, will he be able to stand up to such a huge number of players? Big Rid was originally called the battlefield where divine beings and heroes fought. However, his current available ability is quite impressive. Big Rid's first ability was to bless the sword, for the hatred of previous owners was absorbed into Big Rid, changing his divine powers into a curse. Demonic energy was accumulated on the sword blade and increased in proportion to the strength and number of opponents, which also increased the chance of critical damage. At one time, Khan and Doyle paid special attention to this particular ability, for they realized that Big Rid's power would increase in proportion to that of Pant and Edora. But one of the guys remarked that he could match them in strength. Kang said it was one of the easiest ways to overtake the prominent Pant and Adora in the rankings, but our hero only has to pass the last sector because it is necessary to accumulate demonic energy in advance. So first our hero needed to straighten out this little thing. After all, the players also wanted to take possession of all the points, so they were considered potential opponents. Our hero immediately started attacking everyone who stood against him, to which the other heroes realized it was very dangerous and they should defend themselves. But our hero got too close to the players, delivering his devastating blow and striking everyone in his path. At one point a cloud of sandy smoke rose, 
and one of the Hiroars realized relief, for he could not be hurt, but after the sandy smoke developed, our hero was already standing, preparing to strike next. Even though Khan and Doyle mostly talked about the ball, the ball actually has another pretty good ability. Players who noticed the other guy lying in a completely green shade didn't realize what it was or what was going on. They didn't like this outcome of events. That much was obvious. The players were shocked as the blessed poisons began to take effect on everyone in the vicinity the moment the final blow was dealt to the enemy. The curse in infected players reduced defense and movement speed. Therefore, all players who stood nearby were absorbed by the poison infestation, due to which our hero could approach them quickly and efficiently enough to hit them without exerting much force. But at some point, our hero realized that he seemed to be done with these players by turning around. He saw the girl, and for that was the next target, Idora. But then suddenly, in front of the girl, Pant came out, clenching his fists. He was smiling a player worthy of his power, for he had waited a long time for this. He wanted to actually fight someone who could fight back hard enough, after all they were with those players who couldn't do anything about his power. Turning around, the guy asked the girl a question. Could he go and fight the masked guy? But the girl had picked up on the fact that he didn't need her permission at all, to which the guy got a little embarrassed, but the girl also said that she wouldn't tell their father anything and he could still fight. But the guy got very excited and just wanted to go, but the girl immediately asked him to leave the two balls, to which the guy turned around and said he hadn't forgotten about them at all. Handing the girl the orbs, who accepted them, he immediately picked up the tutorial rating. He was upgraded, and at the time of Edor, he took the top spot, beating our hero by a mere 10,000 points. But with this picture, the other players didn't understand how this could be, because even as close as they were, they weren't even that close. But it's so easy to just give away 60,000 points, and without those points, everybody in the tutorial, everything they have, they're willing to give away. But here the guy said they shouldn't compare them to these dogs, because they have different levels. And as soon as the guy turned around, looking at our heroes, he immediately thought about the fact that he was very much hoping that he would fight at full strength. It was only known to his clan of unicorns, for they have hereditary combat skills and hidden techniques. Pant immediately used the Thunder Fist technique and immediately lunged at our hero in a fight, for he wanted to take away all of his points. But our hero was not so simple. Using Big Rid's skill, he counterattacked the guy, from which there was a violent explosion of two elements. And once the smoke cleared, Pant said his opponent wasn't that bad and he liked it. After all, this was even more than good, as he already wanted to get into a serious battle sooner. But our hero didn't want to just stand there and talk. With a swipe of his sword, he immediately formed the strongest force field, which with instant speed hit Pant, who was seriously injured. After all, this can't be, the guy thought, because having been born into a royal family, he had learned many battle techniques. But he had absorbed the snake's energy, and now he was overflowing with incredible magical power. After all, he can't lose that easily. Taking a hand to his face, he immediately stared intently at our heroes. Afterward, smiling, he said that he might lose, but who should become king? Our hero looked at his opponent and was a little surprised to see him smiling. Pant, in his time, could not back down, for he had learned this from his father, and it was his true strength. Pant remarked that this is very interesting, because he didn't even think he could meet such a player in this place. Preparing to strike, he tried to attack our hero, but he was able to block all the blows with his big rid. The girl stood back and watched, watching with her intense gaze with her yellow eyes. They were certainly very beautiful, but also very dangerous. 
While Pant was trying to deliver a crushing blow to our hero, he had already jumped away from him and raised a sudden whirlwind of dust that covered his entire view. And at this point, our hero could not recognize Pont's movement, because he could not even see him and could not do so, but at the same time, he also could not notice our hero's movement. But while our hero was pondering this, Pant was already behind him. Sensing this, our hero turned around and immediately received a blow to the body, followed by at least four more blows, from which he immediately lost consciousness. Afterward, Pant, moving slowly downward, would swing his fist and say that the tale was over. But this was supposed to happen a skill our hero has never used until now. It was foresight. The last time he had checked this skill was before heading to Sector G. But after that, he had left this skill for a long time and didn't remember it. Allows you to see a certain moment in the future. The time of possible foresight depends on skill level and magical power. After using this skill, the player may feel dizzy due to the sudden change of reality, and our hero's skill level was pumped by 0.5%. It allowed you to see a certain snippet of the future, but was it that simple? After all, while on the battlefield, he had seen countless souls cut short in a matter of seconds. It seemed to him that if only this man could foresee even a couple seconds of his future, he would be able to preserve himself. He would be able to use this skill for a very short time, but it would require a lot of magic power. This skill gives him the ability to anticipate for only a few seconds. The more magic power he expended, the more he would be able to see. The fee for using this skill is very high. To use it even once, you need to expend about two-three of its total magic power, but at the moment he can only use it for five seconds at most, and perhaps the biggest problem is timing when to use it. After all, he cannot accurately guess when his soul will be in a duel with his opponent. Situations change pretty darn fast, so three seconds of movement may not be enough. You also have to have time to analyze the situation, and it sounds kind of simple, but it's actually crazy. However, predicting the future, will he be able to exceed the limit of his abilities? And of course, if he fails, he will immediately perish. But it seems that in giving in to the excitement, he's gotten a taste for it. In the end, it didn't work out too badly, and time immediately reverted back to the moment Pant attacked him, and our hero jumped over the guy in a moment of defense. After that, through foresight, he recognized his future. For now, thanks to the dragon eye, the urge to duel, and the enhancement of his senses, he would be able to refine his body and the guy behind him wasn't so unexpected anymore. Our hero was able to dodge faster, and after he uses a lightning-fast move, our hero will be able to catch his opponent's arm and be behind Pant's back in an instant. After that, he realized that he should use his magic power to its fullest. Pant thought that still victory would be on his side, and swinging his fist he tried to strike, but still he missed for it was the end for him, and already our hero had begun to attack. Pant, as soon as he saw this, immediately changed his view. But our hero immediately seized the moment and, just moments later, delivered a blow to his opponent that immediately staggered him. After that he started to fall, but there was already the next target for our hero, and that was Adora. As soon as our hero approached the girl, she immediately drew her sword. And as soon as our hero tried to attack the girl, she immediately put up a block with her sword. But in response to our hero's invasion, Idora counterattacked. And then comes the most important part of the fight, because if everything goes as predicted, she must now fall. But the girl was able to repel the attack of our hero's dagger, which flew several meters away from her. Our hero was amazed, for she was able to repel the blow. But he didn't make any mistakes. How on earth could she do that? But then he realized why the vision hadn't come true. Her look gave her away. 
The girl immediately tried to attack our hero with a punch, which he was able to block. And immediately after the blow, smoke followed, which literally after a moment had already dissipated, but the girl recognized that the guy in the mask was very strong. But then he saw her eyes, for that was what Idora had hidden for so long. She was able to penetrate his vision. After all, the potential skill allows you to see the essence of objects through. Pant, at one time, possessed the thunder fist skill of the Changnam family's secret technique. Idora, on the other hand, was also able to master one of these techniques. However, because the process of learning this skill is incredibly difficult, only Adora was able to match it. It was this skill that helped the twins reach the first and second ranks in the tournament. Potency gives the ability to see through reality due to this skill. She can determine the thoughts and actions of an opponent. Hence, block almost any attack. The predictions of our heroes were simply covered, and the time for predictions has expired but the girl immediately asked if he was going to continue, to which our hero replied that it's time to call it a day, respect your sword, back behind my back, to which the girl rejoiced, for it was a good decision. He was fighting so many players at the same time, including her brother, and it really impressed the girl, because it was the first time she'd seen the likes of him, and she'd like to concede first place to him but they had their own good reasons, too. But our hero didn't understand, because it was strange. Why would she think he was going to give up? After hearing this, the girl was a little shocked, for she didn't understand what it was all about. But then our hero took four balls out of his pocket, and the girl saw them. She was shocked, for it was her talismans that hung from her belt. And then she didn't understand what had happened, or how he had been able to take her talismans. But then the guy said that her eyes apparently have limitations, because she can only anticipate what is in her field of vision, right? Asked a question. For while one of the daggers was falling, it cut the rope on her belt holding the golden crystals. Only now did she realize that she had only been focused on significant attacks, so she had overlooked it. Our hero immediately said he would take care of them. And already at that moment, the tutorial ranking was updated and our hero got 510,000 points. All the players nearby who were there couldn't believe it, because this couldn't happen. Even if he took away from Adora, he'd still take the top spot. And it was the player's own gain, absorbing everything in their path. But when the girl realized this, our hero used a lightning-fast check, immediately hiding farther away from them, to which the girl also started yelling, Wait! But she couldn't do anything, for this was her first defeat in the tutorial, and it was a complete rout for her. He actually turned out to be very cool. And after literally five seconds, the tutorial time has already expired, and all players will be moved to the holding area. Be careful. Our hero realized that so much time had already passed. Standing up, he moved to the waiting area where there were already quite a few players, all of whom were discussing amongst themselves that the tutorial was finally over. But then some of the players noticed our hero, starting to say that this is the same person who took the first place. Talking amongst themselves. I mean, he defeated a one-horned brother and sister and that was impossible. What is his true identity? Everyone wanted to see. Our hero understood that rumors had reached even those who were not in Sector G. He didn't think he'd attract so much attention. And there was only one way to get Zeus's key. Basically, there were two places he was bound to go to when he entered the tower. The first place is the home of the Artia clan, and the second is the treasury of Olympia. It is the place where the ancient deities stored treasures, and the key of Zeus is one of the 19 keys that open this treasury. But apparently, Khan and Dolly are already gone. After all, they said they were going to leave right away. It's kind of a shame we can't meet them. But then someone started calling out to our hero from the crowd. Turning around, he heard it was him. 
And then he heard a guy saying that he heard that there was a masked rookie in the tutorial, and he immediately realized that it was talking about our hero, and he wasn't wrong. Our hero remembered this guy and realized that he had become more cheerful. After all, it looks like what he found in Frisia's garden, to which the guy said that he found it by chance in the waiting room of Sector B. In this garden is a spirit that you can contract as a Yule enchanter, possesses outstanding abilities. Our hero believed that if he could learn the element of magic, it would be a great success. And it seems he wasn't wrong. Using the dragon eyes, our hero saw that this was no longer the same Yule that was before when they first met. He seems to have made great strides. He found some more hidden items and asked the guy a question, to which the latter replied that he had met a mentor. But our hero should not worry, because he is just like those people. He's really grateful to him. But the guy still wanted, before he left, to find him and thank him. Bowing, he said, Thank you so much for being able to change my mindset and meeting a good mentor. After all, we are sure to meet again someday. Our hero only had time to look at the guy before he disappeared in an instant. He seemed to be one step closer to the tower. Our hero did not expect it, but then some kind of glow appeared, and it spoke out that it was glad to be able to see their faces again. It was the goblin who met our hero at the very beginning. Oh, man! was happy to welcome the esteemed players. After all, he is the admin of the tutorial, Ibelker. It was as if by magic, all the players showed excellent dexterity in this round of tutorials, and their ability to make decisions in different situations was amazing. Goblin hopes they continue to display such wonderful qualities as they move forward through the tower, and now he would like to provide all players with the results of the tutorial, once all the players saw that our hero had 510,000 points, everyone was in great shock. After all, the tutorial leaders usually got between 50 and 100,000 points, at best. It could have been maddening, and the players thought it was impossible. Everyone wanted to know what happened in Sector G. And at this time, while providing the results behind our player, there was a brother and sister standing behind our player. The punt was very much our hero's zone, but the girl was smiling, saying that she was congratulating our hero, but he didn't understand what she was talking about. But as soon as he used the dragon eyes, he immediately saw from the aura that this greeting was sincere. Rivalries, right? How was he able to make a good impression on her? Why is that? But then the goblin started saying that a player with an unknown name had taken first place with 510,000 points, the highest score, not just for this round, but in the history of the tutorial. And of course, he'll be rewarded for it. Our hero immediately opened the table and saw that he was invited to place his name in the Hall of Fame, a place where only the people with the most points at each level of the tower could place their name. Undoubtedly, such an honor is an outstanding achievement. It is something that any player craves for. Our hero, however, had other interests in the matter, so he declined to register the name, but any time he decided to, he could change his mind. The goblin mouthed that he did have a unique character, but still, he sometimes got people like him. Having outstanding abilities, they don't flaunt it. But our hero said, I just didn't want to give my real name. It didn't make a difference anymore, though, because it was time for the award to be presented. In our hero's eyes, there was no man yet. It looks like a Class F item. But in reality, many first-place players thought this key was useless, so they either threw it away or lost it somewhere. But later these players found out about the true purpose of this item and regretted this omission very much, because in order to complete this key, you need to collect 11 more items, and it is already clear that all remaining items are hidden. No doubt getting the rest of the keys will be easy, but he is obliged to open the treasury of Olympus, despite all the difficulties. 
Holding this key in his hands, he gets the feeling that now it's finally over. The goblin immediately laughed. They say that's where they come to an end. After all, everyone did their best. He'll be glad to see them again. Players who have earned the right to pass into the tower receive separate notifications. If they don't get them, they can try their luck another time. The exit is at the bottom of the room. And our hero in due time received a message that said he had proven he had the ability to enter the tower. They hope that he will continue to try his best to become the deity of the tower. Does he wish to enter the tower? But just as our hero wanted to enter the tower, he heard someone addressing him, shouting for the masked man to turn around. Turning around, he saw Pant. Our hero didn't understand what he wanted here, but Pant asked him to come over. After all, what happened in Sector G, he used an artifact, didn't he? Pant suggested we drop the whole thing and fight one-on-one. -on -one. His eyes felt like they were on fire. I mean, if he's a fighter, how can he say no? But our hero looked at it and made the right decision, raised his hands and said he was giving up. To which the guy was puzzled. What's going on? But our hero immediately said he was staying and that one won. For now, he would not fight someone who had surrendered. Turning around, he said that was it and started to walk away. But the guy, angry, reached out and started yelling that he wasn't done yet, but the portal had already closed and our hero had moved into the tower. A new recruit appeared in the tower. As soon as the tutorial round ended, rumors spread through the various tower communities at an incredible rate. The person in first place, having scored 500,000 points for the first time, has simply achieved an unimaginable amount of points. He swept through Sector G and took possession of everything he could, the one who had crushed the one-horned twins. That's why he was nicknamed a jack-of-all-trades, literally translating it as a man who capitalizes on himself. Of course, a lot of clans had their eyes on him, all of them trying to find out about the true identity of the new recruit, but no one had ever been able to find information about him. After all, the recruit wore a mask at all times, hiding his name, and didn't even register for the Hall of Fame. In the end, the identity of this recruit was completely shrouded in mystery, with various rumors and speculations piling up like snowdrifts. At the same time, our hero was already looking at the tower, for it seemed to him that such a thing could be seen only in a dream. And what immediately caught the eye was the tallest tower located in the middle of the vast city, the Divine Obelisk Tower. Inside the tower were top players, top clans, people who were related to his brother. They were all the ruling elite of the tower, and all of our hero's brother's actions seemed like a challenge to them. So there was nothing more he could do. But now things are different. For our hero will look at them through his brother's eyes, speak to them in his voice, and give them back all that they have done to him. Now that's the real beginning of the story, and our hero was already in the center of the city. As he approached, he realized that this was the place that was in the picture. After all, these appear to be the same neighborhoods. Turning around, he realized that it seemed to be here, as he opened the door, he didn't apologize, causing concern, though he noticed that it looked like something had happened here not too long ago, for everything was destroyed, but there wasn't a single spot on the weapons, and all the items were of high rank. Heneva's metallic black helmet is a B-grade. The helmet was made by the yard blacksmith Heneva. It conceals its wearer particularly well. Battle Bow Description made by the dwarf blacksmith Heneva, made of minotaur horn and sinew. It has a strong bowstring and mere physical strength will not be enough to pull it tight. A high-grade sword is a two-handed weapon classification, grade C+. The iron sword is made by Heneva, very durable and long-lasting. But here our hero noticed a dagger, the classification and description of which were closed. Reaching out to it, he thought, 
Two items here he couldn't recognize, even with the help of the dragon eye. What kind of mess was going on here? And it seems that some of the weapons here are so high in that he can't recognize them. Turning the dagger, he appraised it, but then he heard someone come through the door and addressed him. Who is he and what is he doing here? Asking a new question, because that's a problem. But the gnome immediately began to resent it, declaring that he should stop and get out of here soon. But our hero insisted that he was seriously here to buy a gun. The gnome wouldn't stop grumbling, telling him to move his ass out of the way. And in general, he wasn't selling weapons anymore, and for our hero to get out. Just then, passing through and pushing our hero away, but then he had a question. Is the gnome not selling weapons because of the dissolution of Ardia? The dwarf was shocked as soon as he heard this, but as he turned around and looked with a sullen look, he realized that this guy didn't know what he was talking about and didn't know, to which our hero was only convinced that he was indeed right. Heneva was originally Ardia's blacksmith, but he was not a member of the group, for he was not a player. But he was very close to the members of Ardia, so one could consider him one of them. For thanks to his marvelous weapons, Ardia came out victorious from many battles, and there was only one reason why, despite his superb skill, he would not sell his weapons, and he spoke it immediately. They were trying to get him to join the other clans, weren't they? Questioning the dwarf, to which he replied that he had told him to keep his nose out of other people's business. But our hero continued, because judging by his character, he does not believe that he succumbed to their pressure, and perhaps it was these clans that attacked customers who bought weapons from him because it did not allow him to continue working as a blacksmith. And it doesn't require deep digging to understand. But as soon as the dwarf tried to speak, our hero immediately interrupted, saying that if that was the reason, he shouldn't worry, because he just wanted the man to sell him the weapon. The gnome, as soon as he heard this, walked over to the table and threw the billets on the table and said he would sell. After all, if the one really wants it, he should say what he wants to buy. But our hero the same grabbed the dagger he was considering before and said that's what he wanted to buy. The goblin looked surprised, closing his eyes and immediately questioning if he even had any money, to which our hero replied that he could at least take it out on credit. And as soon as the goblin heard this, he immediately became angry. I mean, what the hell was that guy doing out of his mind? He should stop bullying him. But our hero immediately said, of course there is. After all, he just wanted to make a joke, pulling the pouch out of his pocket and immediately dropping it on the floor, to which the goblin paid attention and realized that he had gotten it from the dark elf, to which our hero replied that it was from him. For just as he thought, he knew it right away. It's not that easy once you could have gotten it. After all, this dark elf would never give this thing to anyone, admit it. About that skinny and tall as a pillar elf, though he has a terrible temper, but it is worth admitting that he has a keen eye. He'll sell, but he should show the stuff he got in the tutorial. But he warns that his stuff isn't cheap and it will live up to all his expectations by raising his hands. Our hero immediately began pulling out bags that contained artifacts. A goblin's tooth and jaw, a lizard's eyeball and an orc's ribs. Oh, and of course, the troll brain. The gnome, seeing this, began to look closely. For these things may seem like trash individually, but they are used in the base of that artifact. If you look closely at these artifacts, the stuff he carries with him is too good for a beginner. When he saw the sword, he realized that he had a sword that contained both holy and demonic energy. Under normal circumstances, such a sword simply cannot exist. After all, there is only one reason why such a thing exists. The sword was originally sacred, but was later cursed and turned demonic. He also needed to get a better look at that black bracelet on his arm to get the details, but he was more than sure that it was a very powerful artifact, 
and he really did get it all in the tutorial, the gnome thought to himself. But when he looked at the things our hero was offering him, he immediately became angry. After all, the one was supposed to be mocking him, but our hero didn't understand why he was saying that, and the dwarf immediately said that he could not tell, for the one must have some idea what the thing was, to which the guy replied that he certainly had a clue, but here he pulled out an item worn by the Lord of Beasts. It was the helmet used by the Beast Lord. In the past, it disappeared for unknown reasons and was made from the skin of a mythical beast, a lion. But he immediately pulled out an ibis egg. After all, the egg was laid by the demon Ibis. It can only hatch under certain conditions. Once hatched, it will follow any creature it sees first. The Beast Lord was one of the prominent lords. He ran the tower with the Vampire Lord. Items belonging to the Beast Lord may be of lower quality than Bathory's vampiric dagger, but that doesn't mean they are completely useless. And the Ibis Egg was also a priceless item. After all, hell beasts that reside deep in the jungle, the process of incubating such a creature is very difficult. But considering the perks of making such a creature your pet, it's worth it. Beast Lord item and Demon Egg, if one person uses both of these items, he will definitely become one of the most outstanding players. The Goblin was confident in the weapons he was creating, but his swords were nothing compared to the stuff this guy had. After all, he is unequivocally bullying him, and why the hell is that yokel looking down on him? But our hero said that if these things don't equal the price of a dagger, he can place an order. And the gnome immediately asked if he was referring to the Eye of Guys. But our hero said that's exactly what he meant. Guys is a giant who has a dozen arms and hundreds of eyes. The artifact named after this monster is definitely worth the two things provided. The gnome realized that this was his original goal, not that he blamed him for it as there are only five blacksmiths capable of creating such a thing, and he is one of them. Our hero had heard that he no longer creates artifacts, and because of that, such a tasteless method was the only way to bring it to him. Bowing, our hero apologized to the gnome, but the gnome said the guy didn't know what that meant. After all, he is seriously asking him to create such a thing, but our hero stated that, as he had said before, he would deal with the rest of the clans, and the dwarf need not worry about it. After all, all he has to do is focus on creating the Eye of Gizi. But here, spreading himself out, he muttered that, of course, if he was afraid of them, he couldn't do anything behind them either. But we immediately got a shout-out that he understood and he was going to do it anyway. Dragon's eye skill level increased by 5.5% with Henova's magical dagger. A B- discharge is a dagger in which Henov put his whole soul into its creation. It took three years. It was originally created for someone very important, but with that person dead, this dagger absorbed Henov's anger and rage. Because of this, the dagger became so sharp that it could safely cut through stone, a dwarf's dream, a magical dagger attempts to emote the emotions of the wielder. The stronger the emotion, the faster the blade becomes. Blade of Fury Dagger inflicts an effective bleed, slowly sucking out enemy souls if the target's health is less than 20%. There is a chance that the target will get the effect of ice poisoning. It's an artifact thing of the growing type. An artifact can increase in strength with its owner. The rate of growth depends on the awareness and effectiveness of your interactions with him, for he turned out to be much better than our hero had envisioned. After examining the dagger from all sides, he realized that it fit very well in his hand and felt as if he had found a precious thing that he had lost long ago. It was originally created for someone very important, but with that person dead, the dagger absorbed anger and rage. Because of this, the dagger became so sharp that it could cut through stone with ease. Our hero wondered who this dear person mentioned in the description was. 
our hero looked at the clock and saw that one month, because initially the hand on the clock did not move, but now they are moving, even if at a very slow speed, but this means that they are gradually starting to wind up. Putting the clock under his jacket, our hero realized that this should be enough. But using the dragon eyes, our hero saw a tail following him. When he counted them, he thought there were 15 of them. But then he saw more and it turned out that there were 17 of them because they had come for his artifact or to try to intimidate him. Perhaps they are weak, but later will begin to push hard if he does not deal with them now. Then in the future will be worse turned our hero turned the alley from what the guys who followed him did not understand what he did, they did not see anyone looking into the distance. But our hero hid behind barrels and boxes, listened to the guys, talk about how they don't understand where he went, they can't lose him. Going into one of the rooms with our hero said hello, throwing a bag of money to the man, our hero said that he wants the top floor and he wants a table on the terrace. Going up to the top floor terrace, the man who had escorted him began to tell him that he was very lucky, as he could see their terrace is known for its stunning view and is very popular among their clients. Their regular clients had just left the place. And then our hero started ordering that he wanted nutty coffee, no syrup, and he believes they use artificial beans. Sitting looking in the distance, our hero thought that his brother often went to this cafe. After all, our hero Ya has already walked quite a lot of nearby places that his brother mentioned in his diary, and many players do not consider the outer areas particularly interesting. But Chonu had many memories of this place because the places he recommended in the past have always been good, but our hero was curious to know what he was thinking in those moments when he was in that room. Laughing with your friends. Think about it. Our hero tasted the coffee, but he didn't like the taste because it was bitter, and that's because there's probably no syrup. Still, after leaving the cafe, our hero was already in the afternoon approaching the blacksmith's shop where the gnome was already working in full force. The dwarf, as soon as he saw our hero, immediately turned around and asked him why he had come here again, to which our hero said that he dropped by on his way here because he was bored, and he also wanted to check on the progress of the work because he handed him everything he needed yesterday. Didn't he ask the question? Maybe the dwarf needed something else, he just had to say, because he thought he had already started working on it, and he would be here to keep an eye on the dwarf just in case. He thought that for the past few days he had already realized enough that this guy is a tough nut, but the important thing that he does, he never listens and does not get angry. After all, if he continued to be nervous about it, only nerve cells will be wasted about mumbling something incomprehensible dwarf further continued his work. After all, he just had to concentrate and just imagine that he is not here. Our hero used dragon eye melting slowly, melting the metal inside the furnace. Cast. Poured liquid metal into a mold for the dagger, forged the metal into the desired shape, and finally sharpened. Watching Hanova work, the process became clear, and one word came to his mind, artisan. After all, thanks to the artifacts created by Hanova's skillful hands, our hero's brother was the wings of heaven, it means the kind of things that were created that he used. But then the dwarf, approaching with surprise, shouted out that our hero was asleep, to which he immediately received the reply that didn't he say he was bored. But the goblin got angry and started yelling that how dare the man fall asleep when he said he came to watch him while he worked here. After all, if he is asleep, what is he even here for? Just then the gnome turned around and ran to the stove, and as soon as he ran, he turned around, telling our hero that if he was bored, let him sit here and smoke something, and let him stop getting on his nerves. Our hero, picking up a hammer, also said he would do it, but there immediately followed a question from him as to how he should light the stove, for he must teach him to do it properly. But by all appearances, the gnome wasn't thrilled about it, 
and as soon as our hero saw it, he immediately said that maybe he had high blood pressure and whether he wanted the man to bring him medicine. To which the gnome also started yelling that if he shut up, she would go down, so that one should just shut his mouth. Our hero immediately agreed, but still asked him how he could light the stove. After all, he seemed to understand why Chan liked this gnome so much. And at the same time, at Arandana's base, one of the men approached the flag, bent down, and took it in his hands. At the same time, our hero asked the gnome if he was really going to teach him. I mean, he's serious about it. He doesn't care if the one only teaches him the basic stuff, because because he really wants to learn it. The gnome, as soon as he heard this, turned around, leaning over and asking our hero what he needed it for. But our hero immediately replied that there was something he wanted to repair, and the gnome immediately asked a question about the repairs and what he was going to fix. But our hero only asked for forgiveness, for he can't show it to him. The clock was already broken and in poor condition. When they returned to him, but because there were magical devices inside, he couldn't take them apart on his own. Of course, if it was Heneva, our hero thought he would be angry with him, because he asked him to train him for no reason. To which the gnome said that at least he knew his request was not a joke, and that now, complete zero, when he had to ask for something, for he must forget, if he didn't want to tell him, he wouldn't ask. After all, players are leaving their worlds and trying to climb to the top of the tower. Who doesn't have a story of their own? He probably has one, and his mask is listening, clear evidence of that because of his order. He doesn't have time to teach and he can show him the basics, but the rest he has to figure out by watching him work. To which the latter replied that if he thought he was going to teach because he liked it, he wasn't, because he was just bored. Our hero immediately smiled as soon as he heard this, for despite how he looks, he is a rather shy gnome. Near the forge building, players passing by could hear the sounds coming from the forge itself as well, where they shouted, What? Something's doing wrong! And the sound of a hammer falling. At the same time in the smithy, the dwarf, pushing our hero, only shouted anew. But a moment later, as our hero continued to work, the gnoma, smoking a lilka, turned around and thought that he wasn't so bad after all. Usually when people first start using a hammer, they either can't adjust the force or make a lot of mistakes, but he understood the basics and started doing pretty well. And it's quite impressive because it feels like he can see the place to hit with how much force and how many times to do it. Our hero kept banging on the metal with a hammer. At the same time, he thought about how he was a proficient blacksmith, but every time a mistake was pointed out to him, he learned from it, and now he was no longer distinguishable from any other average blacksmith. It was the first time the gnomi had ever seen learning so fast. Lighting a Lille cigarette, he muttered, What? or the second one. And then I remembered an old event where a young guy sitting in a chair holding a hammer and tongs, telling our gnome to teach him. After all, it looks interesting. And in that seat already sat our hero instead of the young lad. The dwarf looked at this and wondered how he was getting old to be thinking about such useless things. Knife in hand, the cradle he immediately threw to our hero, saying he told him it was the wrong corner. Already at night, leaving the blacksmith's shop, our hero thought about the fact that it had been two weeks since he had started his training here, and this road already seemed familiar to him. Remembering the events, how he learned to make swords, how the dwarf questioned him if he was doing well, shouting at him to repeat over and over again. Busy he grumbles and resents the mistakes our hero makes, but always repeats, Is he getting everything right? And now I see why Chonu said he reminded him of his father. Heneva is a really nice creature. He thought he had lost everything, but he is glad to know that he still has those who never betrayed him, and so he cannot let Heneva perish. 
You can't involve him in your problems, our hero pondered, because it's already enough that he knows who Henova is, and once the Eye of Gizi is ready, he will disappear from the forge. And thinking about it, our hero raised his head and immediately started looking somewhere. It was a tower and he wanted very much to be inside this tower, for here he would be able to delve into his brother's past and even meet someone he was close to. But now he had one last thing left to do. Climb to the top floors of the tower and meet those top ranchers. They are the ones who occupy all the upper floors, the outer neighborhoods and the lower floors, the place where the scum live, too pathetic and unworthy to be around the best of the best. Therefore, our hero needs to become stronger as fast as possible, as only being on the same land with them, he will be able to avenge them for his brother. But then some people began to appear near our hero, and with every second they became more and more. One of them was holding a leaf. Despite our hero, he'd say it's a white mask and cape, and it seems they've come to the right place. After all, this guy had ignored their warning and was hanging around Hanova's forge. From the looks of it, it must have come out of the tutorial recently. And what made him think he could ignore their warning? But our hero immediately realized that these were the same guys who kept pestering Hanova, and he wondered why they hadn't shown up all this time. Subordination by the eight clans. Actually, the eight clans don't really care what happens outside the upper floors, but there are many small clans here that have the protection of the eight. They need to act tactfully so as not to fall into disfavor. Henova's oppression seems to have been one of those actions. One of the guys saw our hero start laughing and immediately, angrily started yelling that he shouldn't laugh. But our hero was no longer up to jokes, and he only told him to stop annoying him and get out of his way. But the player decided to do as he saw fit, pulling out his sword. He wanted to attack our hero, and already everyone was ready for it, but then a moment and our hero disappeared, appeared behind the back of one of the players, and made a crushing blow. Jumping back, our hero took his blade and with quick movement struck another player, after which he began to fall. And others didn't realize what was happening or how he was doing it, but our hero was too fast. He would disappear out of nowhere in an instant, reappearing and delivering crushing blows, to those who dare it stand in his way. Our hero had already dealt with some of the players, but two of them were still standing there with swords in their hands, thinking they were going to take him on now. But our hero immediately threw one of his blades at the man who was attacking him. The one was shocked, for the blade had pierced him, and one of the guys only had time to watch another member of their team go down. And in a moment, our hero was already near one of the opponents. His gaze was quite angry, for it was impossible. How could he create such a thing? After all, it was a rookie, and could it be that strong? Our hero stood in front of one of them and said that if he hurried and took his friends to the healer, then they would have a chance to save themselves, if he could, of course. When he turned around, he immediately began to leave, but one of the guys did not want to calm down and began to shout in the back of our hero. How dare he? And after all, he has no idea about who he got in touch with. After all, he'll be just like Henova once they find him. But as soon as our hero heard this, he immediately approached this guy with instant speed, grabbed him by the throat, lifted him up, and told him to say again what's up with Henova to which the guy said that if he let him go, then that old man would not be spared. And the players who were standing around didn't realize what was going on. Our hero put it down, threw it the other way, and started asking what they had done to Hanova. But the guys apparently didn't want to answer, to which our hero only said he only needed one of them to get an answer. And as soon as one of the guys heard this, he immediately started saying that their boss told them that if they left Hanova alone, it would ruin their reputation. So he sent another group to tear apart his forge. As soon as our hero heard about it, 
he looked at that guy and immediately told him to show him the way. Our hero, entering the forge, saw that everything was destroyed and Heneva was only sitting on the floor, looking down. Upon approaching the gnome, our hero immediately started asking if he was okay, to which he apologized. After all, they took all the things he had, even the things he ordered. He doesn't know how he'll be able to pay. But our hero only said that, fortunately, he didn't seem to have any serious injuries. He'll take care of everything, so the gnome should recover his body and get some rest while he sorts things out. Heneva, taking our hero by the hand, asked only one question, what he was going to do, to which our hero replied that he was going to go and get back what they had taken, and the dwarf was very much surprised by this. The Night Watch is a rather powerful clan among the underworld in the outer area of the tower. There is a rumor that they are related to the Red Dragon, one of the eight great clans. Because of this, no one wants to mess with them. Henoa, holding our hero's hand, immediately said that he said he would go there, but he in turn could not allow it, for he would not be able to ask for himself if anything happened to him. And our hero only at this time said the name of the dwarf, Hinova. But the gnome immediately remembered how the guy had addressed him, calling him an old man. He glanced at our hero, and he was suddenly immediately gone, slumped to the floor, and wondered why he kept remembering that guy. And our hero was already dragging one of the guys he had caught and asked him what his name was, to which the man replied, Will it? But our hero also told him that if he salamed him, he would end him. As he approached the place, he only wondered, is this it? But immediately he activated dragon eyes and realized that judging by the number of his ears spread out here, it had to be this place. And our hero immediately said they were coming in. But the guy was shocked, but still, he opened the door and started walking in and the guys who were sitting at the tables immediately started telling him what he was doing here at this hour. As they approached him, they immediately asked the question, What happened? Why are you so quiet? That doesn't sound like you. And as soon as one of the guys extended his hand in his direction, our hero immediately caught it, looking intently at him, and a moment later he threw it in the other direction with one throw. The other players who were in the room immediately got angry because they thought the guy was a traitor. But our hero had already approached one of them, striking and grabbing his arm. And holding one of them by the arm, he waited for the other to run at him. And breaking his arm, he threw the guy back at the other. The player squatted and didn't realize who he was because he was alone and needed to be stopped. At the same time, the player, looking at his hand, immediately cried, for he saw his friends being massacred one by one. But one of the men immediately started yelling for them to fight, as he was the only player who had only recently come out of the tutorial, and as soon as our hero heard this, he immediately threw a glance at the man who was shouting and started to approach, but he too shouted to be stopped. But the players still kept attacking our hero, even though it was a waste of time, because he defeated everyone who approached him. And as he approached the man who was screaming the loudest, he had already reached out, grabbing him by the throat. And the players who were sitting at the table with their backs to him were shocked, because he was even able to defeat Saya. Just then, our hero felt a sound happen that activated in his ears. He, too, began to determine whether they were above or below. Looking with his gaze, he immediately noticed someone trying to escape through the secret passage below, but he couldn't let that happen and lifted his foot. With the foot he had raised earlier, he hit the cook, which caused a huge explosion. The players who sat at the table were shocked at such an ability. He was able to break the floor where one of the players was sitting, who didn't understand how this was possible. Our hero watched the player, who began to take out various artifacts and gold from the safes, trying to hide them in a bag. 
but our hero didn't want to let him go, so after taking out his blade, he immediately headed towards the player. But he noticed a dagger that was lying quite nearby, and, taking it, immediately aimed it at our hero. Immediately he shouted, struck a blow with the sword he had previously grasped, but our hero dodged and immediately conducted his attack, after which the sword began to crack, and after a moment completely destroyed in the hands of the player. And only when he tried to think about what just happened, our hero immediately attacked him. Whereupon our hero looked up at the very players who had been watching all this and who were shivering in due time, and muttered that if they did not wish to perish, one of them must come down here at once. Some time has already passed and one of the players has brought the coffee our hero asked for. But then he wondered if he had poisoned him. However, the player immediately replied that he wouldn't have dared to do such a thing, thinking about what hole this monster came out of, since their guild was always intimidated by newcomers starting to seek out Heneva because of rumors of his abilities. But this guy? No wonder he has such powerful artifacts. After all, they would never have thought that he was the same greedy devil and what he had forgotten here in the outer district. They didn't expect it to be so difficult to deal with. Even though he didn't break the tutorial record, it's a curse to believe themselves that this is the end for their clan because they'll likely start a sentinel suspension. But as soon as our hero set down his empty cup, he immediately said they should talk about compensation. The guy didn't know what he was talking about or what he meant, and our hero began to list what he demanded compensation for, money to replace the things they had destroyed, payment to repair the building that had been blown to rubble, and all the money Heneva had lost because of the blockade of his business, payment to treat his physical and psychological wounds. That's quite a list, isn't it? But if they have a problem with that, he can just use that thing that's attached to his neck. Now, they need to bring our hero all the contents of the safes. I mean, they're going to rebuild Heneva's forge, right? He should make sure he brings in everyone responsible for the pogrom and intimidation of Heneva. After all, they will be repairing the forge on their own, and from now on he is responsible for protecting Heneva from the blackmail of the other clans. And our hero didn't care what the clan had to say about him or Heneva. After all... It's quite possible that that's what will make the difference, isn't it? The player immediately lowered his head and said he was clear. And as soon as our hero stood up, he said fine, because then he would leave the rest to him. And until it occurred to the player, he immediately said he would start everything he just said. And already leaving the room, our hero wondered if he should have made them do more than he asked. After all, it would be nice to use them as an example, but there was already a gnome sitting in front of him, scratching his chin and only thinking about what was going on. But our hero, approaching him, called out to him, and the dwarf, turning around, wondered where he had been, to which our hero only threw his bags, from which all the artifacts and everything taken from the dwarf fell out. But he immediately said he shouldn't have gotten into such trouble, Either way, he's not the type to listen to him. At least he came back alive. So just bring it all inside. And as soon as the dwarf stepped back, our hero under the mask smiled, for it pleased him. But at the same time, in another part, someone hitting the table with a glass of beer asked what he was doing in the outer neighborhood. And they were acquaintances of ours, brother and sister. And the man explained to them that all was right for it was the same greedy devil who had been successfully hiding until that moment. And it's likely that he was with Master Blacksmith Heneva in the outer neighborhood the whole time. The Master Smith was constantly attacked by the nearby criminal clan, but he took care of them. Then there's the guy, thinking about the outer neighborhood, but the sister seems to have heard the name before, as Hanova. And after a short time, our hero together with the gnome stood in front of the shop, and our hero immediately asked Hanova what he thought about it. Heneva didn't understand what he was talking about, 
to which our hero said, isn't Forge better than it was before? After all, he should be grateful for it. And Henova said at once that it was after all he who wanted Guise's eye to be finished as early as possible. Obviously, had to do it for him, didn't he? After all, he doesn't need to be thanked. But there seemed to be a word on earth that described people like him, and our hero immediately remembered that word, Tsundere. The dragon's eye could now see the hidden withdrawals. Dragon Eye's skill mastery has increased by 22.9%. Now our hero understood why the dragon race was known as the wisest race in the world. After all, even if the dragon eyes are only part of the dragon's ability, it's still so powerful that it gave him a quick boost. And it was interesting what abilities he would gain by creating a full dragon body. At the same time, the skill of metallurgy increased. The longer our hero explores it, the more possibilities open up. He gained new knowledge, intelligence increased, and our hero became more versatile. The body's awakening progress was resumed at 93.94%. It seems that psychological growth is as important as physical growth for his body to awaken. Sighing, perhaps because progress is related to his mental state, he feels tired. And while he thought about it, raising the sword he had made, he wanted to look at it. An unfinished billet of good metal, presumably type. Two-handed weapon grade F, strength 50. The description of this billet seemed pretty good for a first-timer. Very good, considering it's his first attempt. He saw Henova's characteristics and was shocked because now he could see people's stats. But immediately the gnome returned, questioned what he was looking at, and ordered him to keep working. But it was a surprise to our hero, because even though his dragon eye level had increased, who would have thought that it would give him the ability to see information about people? Having the ability to study your opponent is a huge advantage, but it said he was pretty shy, and they hit the bullseye with that description. But then our hero turned around and wanted to ask Henova a question. How do you determine the direction when the metal is welded? What should he do when the fever exceeds the optimum temperature? The bellows was weaker than he thought, and also, why does that part look like that? The dwarf immediately became angry, for he had told him to practice. But our hero explained that he was asking because he didn't know how to do it. Henova immediately started yelling for him to learn it himself, but our hero said he had to teach him so he would understand. Either way, our hero wanted the man to look at it. But the gnome kept yelling how long he was going to distract him. After all, he has work to do. After all, he was the one who made such an order. And yet, he keeps wasting his time, and you can't blame him for being slow. But our hero said he's done, so he wants the man to appreciate it. Taking the sword in his hands, he immediately realized that it was an E-grade classification. The sword turned out much better than expected. The blade may be blunt, but it has good durability. Henova didn't realize what it even was, as it was really a sword created by a blacksmith who hadn't worked for ten days. After all, he knew our hero was a fast learner, but he didn't realize who this guy was. But he only said it wasn't bad for the first time, but he calls it a sword. Can't he do it right? And our hero only asked a question that his lightning would strike if he ever complimented him. Henova also began to shout for him to shut up, for he was deciding if he had enough of something or not, and he should go continue forging on, for he still had a lot of work ahead of him. And our hero said then he would keep asking him questions, to which the gnome said he couldn't just let him work. But then our hero at some point felt something behind his back. And a moment later, our hero picked up the dwarf and protected him from the lightning discharge. Behind his back, someone entered the room, and it was an old acquaintance who immediately started yelling that he was the reason they had to look under every rock to find him. Our hero, as soon as he heard this, turned around and began to roll up his sleeves, and shouts followed from the shop. Just moments later, Hanova, 
squinting really hard, got angry and started yelling at our hero that he was going to leave that guy like that, just like that. But turning around, Pant was sitting there at the time and just holding his bruised eye. He also started screaming and calling out for our hero, because he was only able to hit him because he took him by surprise, and that doesn't count. Pant wanted a fresh start, and this time he would crush him, because he wanted out. It will be a battle of man against man, war against warrior. He wanted to end it for good. But our hero continued to work, making a sword, and didn't even pay attention to it. That's why Pant was furious, because he can't even listen to him when he talks to him. And right there, near Hinov, someone put a cup down. It was Adora, who merely said that the gnome needed to relax a bit and have a drink. Hanova agreed with this, but at that moment he remembered something that Adora had immediately said, that he recognized this sword that Sir Hanova had created, for her, when she was just a little girl. To this the dwarf replied that he remembered now, for she was a tenacious child who had grown up in all this time. After all, she had followed him around, tugging at the edge of his pants with naive eyes and begging him to make a sword for her. But come to think of it, there was also a naughty boy there who pestered him so much that he slapped him on the king's tower. Apparently that guy turned out to be the same then and now. Turning around, Hinova only questioned Edora as to what she was going to do to him like that, to which Edora replied that there was nothing more that could be done, for that was what he was, human. Pant continued to challenge our hero every day, each time pestering him to fight at least one round, even as he went to the bathroom. I mean, he did his best, so can't she at least pretend to listen to him? He should have just stuffed his face. Then soon it turned into something more. Then the requests eventually turned into outright whining. However, our hero pretended not to hear it, from which even Henova couldn't stand it and told our hero to fight him for once, to which Pant also said that only once would be enough for him, to which the gnome said, you told him to shut up. But our hero turned around and only asked the question, why would he do that? Pant immediately said that, of course, to test his abilities. But our hero also interrupted him, saying he wasn't interested and he could be the winner. Didn't he do the same thing last time? Besides, even if they fight, what does our hero get out of it? Pant, as soon as he heard this, became very angry. For how could a warrior say such a thing? But our hero replied that it's easy as he sees it. After all, if he wants to fight, he has to place a bet. If he's got nothing, he should forget the fight. Pant said that he would serve as a friend. What does he have to say to that? But our hero made the point that, would he have to address the winner as you? To which Pant said, of course. And then our hero stood up, standing up, and said, they're going to do it after all. And then, just a few seconds later, our hero returned with Pant but the gnome didn't realize what was going on. After all, to think that the son of a martial arts king had lost in a battle that lasted no more than a few seconds. Hanova didn't understand what had just happened either, and all Pant could think about was the fact that he was willing to swear they were equal in power in the tutorial. After all, they were on the same level as far as how strong he had become over time, but our hero was only happy about one thing, that at last he would be able to forge on in silence. Pant thought it didn't make any sense, but he also didn't understand why our hero was in the outer district and not in the tower. To which our hero immediately turned around angrily, and Pant apologized, for he has no idea how long he's been waiting for this. And our hero immediately asked Pantu if he could keep his voice down, because he couldn't concentrate while he was still talking. But then our hero wondered, why is he here? Right, he has a really good reason. After all, our hero's brother passed the first ten floors in ten days, and thanks to this, he was able to get the key of Hades. This key has brought a lot of attention to Ardia. After completing the tutorial, 
guild members went through the beginner floors in 10 days. Players who quickly make it from the first to the tenth floor will be rewarded with the key of Hades. But in order to get it, they have to beat the passing time record. This means that all ten floors need to be completed in less than ten days. Chonu only realized at that moment that after he received the Hades key, he felt very sorry. After all, he learned that the key of Zeus could only be obtained in the tutorial. If only he had tried just a little harder, he could have been the first and gotten it. Fortunately, he had a chance to enter the treasury of Olympia after all. But if he'd been able to do it sooner, it's been a long time coming, but he has a hunch it's going to be too hard. The experience and skills he's gained in the tutorial should help him do just that, and he needs Gase eyes to do just that. Now it became like a rivalry between two brothers, but still, he has the pride of an older brother and couldn't show his weaknesses in front of his younger brother. Isn't that right? Hanova was very angry at one time, for he has not had a single quiet day since our hero came. And why things turned out the way they did is irrelevant. How much he yells at them, they don't even pretend to listen. And then he stood up, remembering former events where our hero's brother had also approached the mister to look at his sword, whether it was good or not. For why does he remember again those children, but in any case he cannot see them again, and it seems he is getting old, for he is becoming absent-minded? Well, he thought he might as well call it a day. But then the door opened and someone entered the shop. In the meantime, the gnome was on his way out, saying that they were closed today and he had to go. But before he finished speaking and saw who was standing before him, he immediately heard that it had been a long time since they had seen each other. Mr. The gnome dropped his shovel to the floor. At the same time, our hero looked around and unlocked the clock window. He succeeded, because now that he had unlocked the window and gotten information about the watch, he would be able to learn more about it and earn more experience. At the same time, the brother and sister entered one of the benches where our hero and Pant were sitting. The brother questioned our hero as to what he was doing here alone. Without coming any closer, the brother and sister sat down at the table to our hero, and that girl said she was sure he was planning his future action. Isn't that right? But our hero, along with Pant, were shocked. And then the brother got up and immediately started yelling at his sister figuring out his relationship. Why was our hero watching? They looked cuter since their first meeting. A brother and sister is always the same no matter where he goes. But a moment later, Pant turned around and wondered, what's going on here? He activated his gut and saw someone enter the cafe. Pant, he's like that because there must be rumors that they, brother and sister of the same clan, have reserved the terrace of this cafe and spread around. A man who had entered the cafe immediately approached them. Coming closer, the man wanted to get to know our hero, for it was a pleasure to meet him. It was Raham of the Red Wind clan. He had come in hopes that he could invite him to join their clan. The leg was already stuffed with a lot of paperwork. Pant noticed that he was quite popular. It was probably due to his achievements in the tutorial, but after the Red Wind Man left, countless people from other clans came in with similar suggestions. Some were unknown and small, but large clans also came to invite him. Our hero really never planned to join a team or clan, and immediately he said, why don't they go back in since they're done with the coffee? To this the brother and sister replied that they could go. Someone said that the place looked the same as before, and our hero was very surprised. The player immediately asked the question, Is he a greedy devil? To which our hero did not understand why this man was here. Bahal, the firefist rancher, is known for his calm nature, but when it comes to battle, he becomes extremely aggressive and burns everything in his path. He is one of the leaders of the Red Dragon and was also a member of Artia, but he is also a disciple of Heneva. The player also started saying that he'd heard that one was pretty straightforward, 
And it seems the rumors don't lie, but in truth, it's not a bad trait. He doesn't want to waste time and says directly that he wants the one to join the Red Dragon. I'm not sure if he knows this is the first time they've ever made such an offer to a rookie. After all, he is the first such challenger in the history of the clan. If he joins their clan, they will spare no effort to help him climb to the top of the tower, and he must believe that the help they can provide is far greater than he can imagine. The eight clans prefer to invite players who have already proven themselves somewhere, and they very rarely invite promising newcomers. The only exception is the Azure Sword Clan, which puts at least some effort into supporting aspiring players with potential. For the Red Dragons to make such an offer means only one thing. They need that kind of power. Thinking back to the merchant's words when he spoke, whether he might be aware of the situation going on there. At that time, he assumed that the relationship between the eight clans was on the verge of other reasons. He can't see. But perhaps Bahal, though appearing calm, is actually a wild beast. But our hero can't be suspected and needs to give a good answer. To which he only said that, to be honest, he didn't want to be bound by any restrictions just yet. But the player suggested that he's going through a period where he thinks he can do everything himself. Still, he wants the man to face the truth, and also about Hanova. I mean, he seemed to like him. He's pretty mega-hearted, so take care of the old man. Our hero was shocked as soon as he heard this, and then suddenly he decided to return to the forge, opening the doors. The gnome sat smoking his cradle, and as soon as he saw our hero, he immediately questioned what he was doing at this hour. After all, he thought, it looked like Bahal had just come and gone. He thought he would be depressed, perhaps thinking too much, but at the same time, he immediately muttered that it was good that he had come because he wanted to beat out all the stress from these days and accidentally finish the artifact a little earlier than expected. And our hero asked again, but the gnome immediately replied that Geis's eye was ready, opening the box. He asked for our hero to take a look, and our hero, going to the box and opening it, was very much surprised. After all, Geese's eyes were supposed to be an amulet, and what an amulet it was. Our hero interrogated, certain it was that chest, for he does not see his Hano here. Tooth said he should just be the one to look at it, and once he does that, he'll be able to respect him and not bother him anymore. And our hero immediately began to look afresh into the chest. Gizi's armor. Discharge A, minus the amulet, is named after Gies, a giant who had dozens of eyes and hundreds of arms. Dozens of eyes increase your sensory level, helping you to quickly notice any external changes in dangerous situations. Your reaction speed increases by more than 20%. Hundred hands reduces damage taken from physical attacks, electricity, light, and holy power. It also increases resistance to three types of effects, curse, poisoning, and mystical effects, and has a 10 to 15% chance to cancel or deflect the effect as well as preventing gigantomania by turning some of the damage taken into health. If the owner's health is less than 15%, the owner may restore health to 50% by using this ability once per day. After all, Eyes of Geese has many rare protective properties, which makes this artifact coveted by every rancher. But since gathering the right materials is very difficult and not many people can create the artifact, not many people have it. But Heneva was able to create the eyes as chest armor and increase their protective properties. But immediately the gnome told him not to stand there and put on his armor, for you can only see it after you put it on. While putting on the new armor, our hero was shocked at how it sat, and at one point the eyes were activated. Heneva's point was that no matter how many times he created it, it's still intimidating. The range of senses increased by 150%, and it became possible to analyze all the smallest details. His eyes began to absorb his senses. This artifact would now be considered part of his body, 
and the synthesis was unlocked. Originally, Giza's eyes could provide the wearer with information about his surroundings, meaning anything not visible to the naked eye could be found. This information can be expressed visually, by smell or sound. This is the hidden function of Giza's eyes, synesthesia. Body refinement was confirmed. The body's awakening progress has resumed at 98.99%. Current status, 99.1% awakened. Even his arousal level began to rise, seeing his eyes glisten. He felt great, though he didn't know if anyone had noticed. But this armor also has an effect that helps mana flow and increases its recovery by 10%. Of course, he also has defense, health regenerating properties, and it's all basid on his mana. Also, the gnome asked me to check the mask. Heneva's demonic A-ranked mask, a mask in which Heneva had put his soul into, pre-recognizing magic in the engraved smear and interfering with the opponent's cognitive abilities, the mask is never removed without the wearer's permission. Attack boost increased, attack power up to 30%, and in proportion to the number of monsters hit in the last 30 seconds, a 1% attack boost. Obosterora borrows the power of the Beast Lord and inflicts a status fear effect lasting 15 to 20 seconds on nearby enemies, also reducing their defense by 20%. The type of this artifact is growth. It will evolve with the owner. The rate of growth depends on the owner's awareness and skill in using the artifact in question. This is a unique artifact. There are no others like it in the tower, and it will belong to the owner until the end it cannot be transferred or sold to another player. This item comes with Heneva's magical dagger. It gives the wearer a bonus effect, and if both items are worn, the bonus effect of the set of two gives attack speed plus 8%. Our hero was surprised, for it is a set with a magic dagger. Heneva immediately said that he thought it was very uncomfortable to wear something on his face all the time and he had some free time, so he did it, because he thought he wouldn't sweat in this mask, and the size should fit more than he paid him. To which Henoa only laughed, for did he think he could get great Henoa's job? He can have it, because he'll put it on his account and he can pay a little later. Our hero remembered the gnome asking him questions. The day has been, and he has a lot to live up to. Our hero asked him for credit, looking at the mask. He really hasn't changed much over the years. The gnome immediately asked why he was quiet, since it wasn't like him. Something must have happened. You were so moved by Heneva's favor, weren't you? Turning around, our hero said he would find a good use for it, and the gnome immediately asked what he had completely forgotten, for he had never asked his name in all the time he had been here. What's his name? Our hero was shocked at this, but lowering his gaze, he was quiet for a moment. The gnome interjected again as to why he wasn't answering him, but our hero immediately said his name was Cain. Each player who climbs a tower has mana circulating inside his body, and the vessel that contains mana is called a mana organ. However, because the mana organ is often a person's body, it has a limit to the amount of mana it can expel. Because of this, many players are looking for ways to restore mana using external sources. The first thing that was developed was a potion. Then there was a magical tool with various functions and a magical source that collects excess mana into itself. There are also many different items created after the above, but players still wish to find a way to get even more mana. At impetuous times, it got to the point where they would try to create things that could give them an endless supply of mana, and the easiest way to create such a thing was to transform someone's flesh and soul. Creating a mana organ by grinding hundreds of thousands of players was something he had heard about in fairy tales a long, long time ago, but to think that he had actually tried to do it. Raham immediately wondered if he had figured out Leonte's location, to which the man said that he had gone to the tutorial but would be heading this way soon. Raham said it was very good, for they should meet him as he had not said before, 
Our goal is the subject and Leonte. If getting both is impossible, it will be possible to get rid of Leonte. Nevertheless, that item must end up in Raham's hands at all costs. At the same time, our hero was gathering all of his swords and putting on his mask, standing in front of the dwarf in full uniform and telling Heneva that he didn't know how long he would be in the tower, to which the dwarf said that went without saying, since it was his decision to go in or out of the tower anyway. And what's the point of telling him that? Our hero lowered his head and said there was no goodbye, but would Heneva realize that it was a final goodbye? Our hero thanked him for all he had done and headed for the exit, but just as he started to open the doors, he heard a shout from his back urging him to stop. It was Pont who grabbed our hero by the arm and said he was completely ignoring him. When he mentioned the tower, what made him change his mind so suddenly? Because at least he should have told them in advance that he was going inside. But our hero only asked the question, why would he do that? After all, he doesn't know what they think of him, but he doesn't have time to play mother-daughter with them. Playtime is over. He has his own things to do. Pant was shocked when he heard that, because he meant something else. But Idara came up and said that he could go first. But they will follow him as it's their decision and he won't stop them, right? Our hero looked with a hard stare and said they could do what they wanted, but he wouldn't wait for them if they started to linger. Pant immediately told the man not to worry, for they would most likely go ahead of him, destroying everything in sight since they were already on the first floor. So ask anything that interests you. Adora immediately told him to stop being so pushy because she remembered someone had made a terrible mess in there because they didn't understand the rules. And while brother and sister were fighting and arguing, our hero had already opened the door and they entered the obelisk. This is the waiting area of the first floor. The challenge will start as soon as the right number of players are recruited. Waiting area. A place where players are on standby before going on an Eponite Tower mission. Here players can find loyal companions or form an alliance with other teams. Looking around, our hero counted and realized there were about 50 players. But then our hero heard voices behind him that, they are here, they are here again. Turning around, he noticed the players discussing our hero. After all, he kept thinking about what these people were talking about, which turned out to be the two of them. They immediately recognized it was a greedy devil, and apparently a lost round for them. But it was for the best for our hero, because in any case he has no intention of becoming friends with anyone. After all, he has to get through the first ten floors in nine days, which is easier said than done. But if he succeeds, he will have the key of Hades. He must also find the keys hidden on each floor, one key from the tutorial, one from the initial floors, and that leaves ten keys that count as hidden items on each of the ten floors, some hidden in places he wouldn't expect to find them at all, and some given for completing hidden quests. Just then, a man entered the hall, introduced himself, and said, Welcome, dear players. His name is Aaron, and he is the guardian of the first floor of the tower. He knows that there are those here who have come for another first floor test and are already familiar with the rules. However, there are also newcomers here, so he will need to explain the rules once again. He immediately please asks that everyone memorize them, because he will not repeat the rules several times, so the players must be extremely attentive. An arena of double cliffs on the first floor. Testing of the first floor is beginning. There are two huge cliffs opposite each other. On each cliff is a team of 100 players with five crystals. The goal is to protect your team's crystals and take or destroy your enemy's crystals. The team that takes or destroys the most crystals in a certain time will be the winner. As announced, each player has a notice in the window. There is a team of 100 players with five red crystals on the opposite cliff, so he calls them, similarly, the red team and their blue team. It doesn't matter what method you use to protect the crystals. 
You can find a place to hide them or give them to the strongest player, but someone will also have to consider what strategy the opposing team will use. Our hero realized this was a crazy mission for the first floor. After all, they expect strangers to work as a team, and not only that, the hidden key of this floor, Hera's key. He must get all ten crystals, both red and blue, to be rewarded with this key. But the problem is that players may decide to destroy the crystals. However, if even one crystal is destroyed, it becomes impossible to obtain the Hera key. This annoyed our hero, but there was nothing he could do about it. Everyone immediately started thinking about negotiations, war, but he doesn't have time for that. He'll just overpower anyone who gets in his way, but now he needed to get all five crystals in his hands. Aaron immediately said that we would start the challenge and he would hand the crystals to their team, but who will represent them? Aaron questioned who the representative would be, but then one player from the crowd raised his hand and said he would be honored, but then Pant shouted for them to stop, walking over to the player. He stared at him intently and said he couldn't remember if he had agreed to it. But the player said, who cares, because they can discuss what to do already after taking them for starters. But Pant stood his ground and said to give all the crystals to him, but the player next to him didn't realize what he was doing. Pant said, isn't it better to let him protect them than to try to hide them, or is there someone here who thinks he'll do it better than him? But the player who was standing next to him got angry and started yelling at the guy, appealing to his conscience, because his ego had caused all their crystals to be destroyed last time. After all, if he hadn't gotten greedy and started a massacre, there's no way he would have let him take them this time. And only now our hero realized what happened last time, because he should have broken the crystals while he was on the front lines of the battle. It sounds like him, and it's even funny considering how ridiculous it is. Pant immediately stood and said that now if he wanted to fight and see who was stronger, let him come over. But the players were still undecided, so Aaron gave all the crystals to Pant. After all, it looks like they've made their decision, in which case, he wishes them luck. Pant thought it would be different this time, but then suddenly our hero came up held out his hand, and told him to give them all to him. Aaron had already teleported to the base at one point and was asked by the same goblin our hero met on the first floor of the tutorial, to which the man replied that, to be honest, he wasn't sure. But the goblin interrogated what was so confusing to him. Aaron replied that he is a very strong player when you compare him to the rookies. But that doesn't mean he's a rookie either. After all, he doesn't understand why the elders have such big plans for him. To which the goblin immediately suggested to the guy about it. Because if he does something unimaginable, the goblin bet that he would do something to wow everyone after all. But here's Aaron betting he won't do anything after all. In any case, both rejoiced at this, for the bet was accepted and in the arena, none of the players standing around realized what had happened to the twins. After all, Pant had just called him Hen. Pant thought our hero had taken all his crystals to show off to the other players. But immediately, Adora approached our hero and asked him what the plan was for the defense of the crystals. Our hero asked to watch the place for a while, somewhere around 30 minutes or so, maybe an hour. Idora gladly agreed and wished our hero to take care of himself. The reason why the first floor challenge is considered difficult is because someone has to break into the enemy base and try to locate the crystals hidden there. But this unreliable bridge could be a problem. It looks like it's ready to break from the slightest strain, and even if someone could use magic to get to the other side without the bridge, it would require a huge amount of concentration that could easily be broken in the current situation. Our hero has realized that a battle on the bridge is inevitable, so even though they are quite difficult, there are several ways to complete this challenge by taking out his sword and using its power.
A way to crush opponents with one powerful blow is what our hero has taken up. At the sight of our hero destroying the bridge, Pant was shocked, and Adora only smiled, for their path of retreat was now ruined. Our hero immediately threw himself into the fight, but the players who were standing on the opposite side were shocked by such an act for he was rapidly approaching the players, delivering crushing blows one after another. Our hero used the sword he found earlier, with the artifact shredding everything in his path and destroying anyone who got in front of him. He also used other artifacts that he got both in the tutorial and outside of the tower. And so, after a while, our hero had five blue crystals and five red crystals, Clenching them in his fist, he obtained a hidden object in the form of a Hera key. This key was previously used to open the treasury of Hera, the goddess of marriage. The method of its use was unknown, but our hero realized that he now had a second key, and this challenge was completed in only 30 minutes, making it the shortest round in the tower's history. Our hero was able to complete an extremely difficult task and was rewarded with extra karma. 5,000 karma was received and 3,000 additional karma will be added to the total score. All players will be moved to the waiting area. The transfer process has been started. Players need to pay attention. And, just like last time, our player was offered to put his name in the Hall of Fame, which he declined. Aaron said it was impressive. Even though it's the first floor, this is the first time he's seen a player complete the challenge so quickly. He is truly like a demon, for he was able to set a new record. It hadn't been that long since he had finished his game with Mr. Ibe Yulker, but to think that the round had ended so quickly. Losing in sports is unpleasant, but there is something he is unequivocally certain of. The ranks of achievement this player has attained are not the fruits of blind luck. Moreover, he knows of the existence of hidden items and even the method of obtaining all 12 keys of the Olympian. Aaron, you've already said he's going to start giving out awards, but without waiting for the end of the speech, our hero interrupted, saying that he would like to receive all the rewards once he had fully passed the initial zone, to which Aaron was shocked. After all, the longer he lingers for the reward, the better it will be. That kind of tower rule seems to be exactly what he's trying to accomplish. But if he can set a record on every floor, how high will the insanity go? To which the man said, if such is his decision, then the meal is complete. All players are encouraged to move to the next floor. But the players, after thinking about it, realized that they didn't want to go to the next floor since they wouldn't get a drop of karma for those rounds, and they all started to give up because they should wait and start the next round, from which only three people were left. And by the looks of it, it's just your trinity left, Aaron muttered, immediately questioning if they were ready. Pant immediately said they've been ready for a while. Aaron had already started moving them to the next floor, and it was the arena of the mountains and the field of the second floor. Our hero has said before, but if he's not happy with the fact that he's taking all the karma points from these trials, then he should turn around and leave. Pant immediately said it wasn't necessary, because frankly, he was just curious how high he could climb. So he wants to tail our hero. After hearing this, our hero immediately requested a single trial, and Johannes arrived in place of Aaron. He was the guardian of the second floor and asked our heroes if they wished to begin the trial now. But it can be dangerous, because the greater the risk, the more karma you can get. Johannes was surprised, for he seemed to know the tower system well enough, in which case he would have to put a restriction on Serpent and Miss Adora. After that, the second phase of the floor begins. They are located in the Redwood Forest, rich with the goddess of the harvest. The forest has always had enough food for the animals living in it, but recently there have been many monsters trying to take over the forest and the food in it. Protect the forest from monsters and restore tranquility. 
The main goal of the second floor is to become the king of the forest by destroying countless monsters. And this assignment isn't much different from the one in the tutorial. Also, this challenge will be the easiest for our hero, because he just needs to destroy group after group, which our hero proceeded to do. And after a short time, our hero received the key of Demeter. He was also able to set a new record and was again asked to add his name to the Hall of Fame, to which he again declined the offer, saying he wanted to continue. And after all, they tried to stop them, despite their best efforts, and not let them pass. After all, this was already the sword and spear arena of the third floor. It took Archia ten days to mop up the initial area. In this case, our hero needs to complete it in no more than five days. But the people who watched our hero were shocked. After all, he had just completed the seventh floor, and in how much time could he achieve such results? One of the caretakers said it was only 12 hours and 28 minutes, and it was crazy. It was impossible. The members of Artia were at least setting records because of their cohesion, and this guy going it alone was absurd. On the eighth floor at seven how rai and five minutes, he was able to create a Laurel Athens and get another key. All the caretakers were shocked by this development. The goblin, on the other hand, kept betting and he was winning every time. After all, he became so rich because of our hero. How nice it would be if every day was like this one. And in a moment, our hero had reached the fire and lava arena of the ninth floor. Where did the monster come from that only mouthed, how dare he stand in front of him? But our hero said they came too early, and I guess he has no choice. So he asked Pant to take the aggression and Edora to join him. And finally, Pant could show a little bit of himself. Pant immediately lunged at the monster, taking all the aggression on himself, and Adora also threw herself into the fight, trying to hit the monster. But our hero used his abilities to cross the lava, jumped up and managed to land on the monster's head, delivering a devastating blow. Immediately after such a blow, the monster fell and our hero was able to get the key of Hephaestus. Now our hero had ten keys, including the key of Zeus, and he only had two more to go and he could open the treasury of Olympia. One can be obtained by stopping the rookie zone passing record. This is the Hades key. Another Hermes key can be found on the tenth floor. Anyway, our hero had to hurry to finish this, so they immediately went to the tenth floor. The trial came to an end and our hero was asked to move to the tenth floor. However, this floor was a solo challenge and the group was disbanded after entering the portal. Our hero asked Pant if he would continue to stand up for his rights after all this. Pant smiled and said he wasn't going to blush when they passed this test faster than him. But our hero, smiling under his mask, looked at the guy, and they still went to the tenth floor, entering the portal. It was the white arena of the tenth floor, isolated from the living and the dead, where the laws of time and space did not exist. There was no room. We had to find a way out of the void at any cost. Now our hero could understand why this challenge failed so many players after the first floor. After all, it said that difficulty 10 far exceeds the difficulty of the ninth floor combined, and the trials in which players brought through the previous floors come to a dead end, for the place in which only one thing is tested, willpower. Because they kept setting records on each floor, they felt on top of the world and believed they would do the same on the tenth floor. But this cursed tower knows how to dash hopes. After all, the tenth floor takes everything away from everyone. With no friends, family, or comrades, you are left alone in an empty world and must find your way out without a single clue. And no matter how talented you are, a psychological battle is a lot different than a physical one. Success after success after success after all these achievements, Ardia faced a difficult opponent. People who have worked in teams before are bound to go into a stupor when forced to tackle a problem alone. But of course, it didn't work on our hero. There is a door somewhere on the tenth floor. 
Looking with his abilities, our hero immediately found the door and destroyed the space to go through it with one blow. The trial has come to an end. He completed all the rookie zone challenges from floor 1 to 10 and was rewarded with a key. But at the same time, he was able to beat his brother's previous record by 83 hours and 2 minutes, thus setting a new record. And when he was again invited to put his name on the glorious list, he looked to see that his brother's name came first. After all, he knew it would be right here. Smiling, he still refused to enter his name, receiving the Ring of Ice and the Key of Aida. Our hero got another key anyway, thus collecting twelve keys. The keys will then be combined, and only then will our hero be able to enter the treasury of Olympia. The vault contains gold and treasures that the Olympians have accumulated over tens of thousands of years. He will be able to choose one item from Olympia's treasury. But our hero has already thought about the fact that he can choose Zeus' lightning bolt and Athena's aegis, because both famous treasures are kept exactly in Olympia and are activated by the key. Our hero immediately stated that he wanted to enter the treasury, to which Hermes immediately remarked that he seemed to be extremely impatient, but he would grant his wish. With a clap of his hands, a large door immediately began to open behind Hermes. Then, upon entering, our hero was shocked by the size and the amount of gold inside. Hermes immediately said that he was a bit embarrassed to say it himself, but that our hero was thinking of taking this artifact too. After all, as he knows, they are the best of their kind, and if he wants to take one of the artifacts he owns, he will make it his apostle. Apostles are the gods' cronies, beings who follow their will because of the fact that they are endowed with the power of the gods. They are also known as avatars. They may stand shoulder to shoulder with a corda who has a huge influence on her followers, or with an army of one man who has raised his body limit and gained inhuman abilities, thus becoming one of the leaders in the tower. Hermes is the representative of the twelve major gods of Olympus. To become an apostle of such a being is the greatest solution. You can get an incredible amount of power in return. From him getting apostles and unique artifacts is much better than getting Zeus's lightning bolt. Our hero realized it was a tempting offer, but he couldn't afford to be tied to anything and for this reason alone our hero refused, saying that he could not accept Hermes' offer, and he immediately made the assumption that our hero had his own path that he had long ago chosen. But our hero didn't understand what it was about, so he continued to follow in his own direction, where various artifacts seemed to be screaming for him to take them with him, and if he doesn't take them, he'll regret it for the rest of his life. It was as if each of the artifacts wanted our hero to take them with him. But you entered the room with the most valuable artifacts. Though there weren't many, these were the most valuable. Our hero stepped closer and examined each one, but at some point, as he turned around, he noticed what he had been looking for so long, approaching the painting. He said he found it. Our hero was able to find the Aegis of Athena. This is a shield used by Athena, the goddess of wisdom, courage, and justice. It consists of nine layers of thin plates. In the center of the shield is the Gorgon's head, which can activate a petrification effect on the wearer's opponent. It appears to be Gorelf, the Gorgon's head, the glimpse of which turns the enemy to stone. Our hero was offered to take this artifact, but then he wondered where the artifact of Zeus was. And as soon as our hero began to think, immediately the watch he wore around his neck began to glow. Taking them in his hands, he didn't realize what was happening, but then the hand stopped abruptly at the number 11. Turning around, our hero realized that the arrow was pointing exactly at the painting of Zeus. Despite this, our hero realized that here it was, the artifact of Zeus. Our hero, upon opening the picture, immediately began to enter the passage and saw Zeus in front of him. After all, you didn't even have to guess to figure out what it was. It was lightning. 
According to myths, Zeus defeated his father Kronos and the other titans with it, and the lightning was there all along. That's all our hero needed. Not even the twelve artifacts stacked together outside could compare to this. Our hero's instincts tell him he has to take her, but as soon as he took the zipper, immediately it shattered. And our hero didn't understand what was going on and how it could collapse. I mean, what's he supposed to do now? But then something incomprehensible for our hero began. The golden glow seemed to blind our hero. Some sort of chain bracelet began to appear on his arm, enveloping our hero's arm. Afterwards, changing his color, our hero immediately remembered the words from earlier about Hermes helping, that this was the path he had chosen. But what was going on our hero did not understand, because it was absolutely unexpected for him. He didn't know what had happened, but there was no time to get upset, because first he had to find out what had happened to the astrope. Our hero immediately, using the ability, wanted to identify what it was, and it was the Black King's despair. In the end, he was betrayed and imprisoned in the abyss for countless years. Thoughts of betrayal lingered, growing hatred of the Black King. This led to the battle of the three shackles that bound him and turned him into a tool. Huh. The Black Energy amplified versions of the Black Blade Blade could absorb the souls from the collection and turn them into Black Energy. The power increased in proportion to the number of souls absorbed. Our hero realized that he had heard nothing about the Black King, and even his brother had never mentioned him in his diary. For this confinement, like the serpent Akasha, was always waiting for the return of its master. This is what was written in the description of the Black Bracelet. It also says that for this reason she always thought of her master's stuff as something priceless. It turns out that the master of the snake is the Black King, and the reason he couldn't return is because his underlings betrayed him. After all, the Black King was powerful enough to make the snake his henchman. And once our hero gets out of here, he should try to find out more about the Black King. After all, since things had already gotten to that point, he needed to think positive. After all, there's no point in whining about spilled milk. We need to figure out how to more effectively utilize what our hero has been given. Olympia's door closed, and our hero was rewarded with a lightning bolt. Opening his eyes, there was a goblin in front of him, telling him that he was congratulating him on passing the ten floors. But just to think that he would pass them without a backlash, they couldn't, for he just wowed them all and again his congratulations. Why did the lightning disappear? To which the goblin said it was a secret, whereupon our hero wondered who the Black King was, to which the goblin said it was a secret. And only when asked why he got this bracelet, the goblin said that the tower gives rewards corresponding to the player's achievements, and there were no other reasons. After all, not only are the tower representatives responsible for the player's desire for rewards, they are based on the player's actions. Therefore, everything he has experienced has happened because of the path he has chosen, and accordingly, he cannot tell him much regarding his issues. And our hero realized that the path he had chosen was possible. His election to the future may have something to do with the Black King, but he doesn't quite get it but worrying about it won't give him an answer. We should have focused on the current situation. The goblin immediately said that he seemed to have gotten his thoughts in order and could now move on to his next reward. After all, he had collected an amazing amount of karma, and it was simply astounding. But he has a total of twelve awards and karma from the first ten floors. Does he want them now? But our hero also said he wanted them combined into one award. But once the goblin asked what he wanted to get, our hero also said he wanted lightning. But the goblin only laughed, for he knows it's a done deal, to which our hero said he wasn't kidding. But there was nothing else the goblin could do. If he couldn't make up his mind, they could decide it for him, creating a reward. 
He said that no one has ever gotten as far as he has, and that's why the artifact Dan should suffice as his reward. Holding it out to our hero, he questioned if he wanted to take it as a reward. Our hero, who did take it in his hands, thought it would be heavier, for it was forged in nine of his own, but it is light as a feather. The goblin prompted, now that he had chosen his reward and received it, it was time for him to remove himself. Our hero was asked to move to the eleventh floor, and Goblin reflected in due course that he had not only awakened the despair of the Black King, but had been rewarded by Aegis, and it's a very interesting player, as Lapas should be the next guard. After all, it was interesting how he would react to this player's result. After all, it gets annoying when something interesting is found. After all, he is apparently, by bio-record, from the first to the tenth floor. The man realized that he was an interesting guy, for he was even better than he expected. To which another man said, isn't that unfortunate, but no one understood what this was about, because she was about the record. After all, they also participated to set the record straight, but the man said he already thought he was over-tested. But it was a man's personal curiosity. Tut said he says that, he says that their non-queen's adoring henchman is asking him a personal question, because he can keep his opinion. After all, he thinks, it will be easier for him to believe that a dog meows and not a cat. But the man admitted that he would be lying if he said he didn't feel anything. After all, after all, this record is a trace of being part of Ardia. But that's all in the past, for it's all behind him, and he has no plans to get involved. But there's only one thing that matters to him right now, and that's the thought of making a rookie, and them with him. The man was sure that one day he would still be with them, but that didn't mean they had to wait for him indefinitely. After all, if he does decide to refuse, they will simply destroy him as they have done before. Turning around, the man immediately remembered how it was with Ardia. After all, Archia did not belong to any of the clans, so some adored her and others hated her. They were different because they didn't join clans and as shadows would try to get them. Ardia could even pass the test of all the floors of the tower. The eight strongest clans could no longer tolerate it, so they decided either they would take possession of them or destroy them completely. And such an answer the man should have been satisfied, for however he mentioned something he should not have. After all, the advice is to be more careful next time. But the man immediately said that he hoped the man wouldn't notice, for it seems Her Majesty still doesn't trust him. But either way, it's the right place for them. Is that right? But what the man said that, if you believe the coordinates, this is it. Looking over, they saw someone moving between the bushes, also teleporting. After all, this is the portal to Arundon. But what are they hiding since they created the portal on the outskirts of town? After all, they don't have a lot of time, so they need to speed up and prepare to wait for someone to come out of the portal. They saw the two men whereupon, after giving the command, Fire, they immediately began to attack them with their arrows. But the men who were leaving the portal too late saw it, turning around. They no longer had time to react effectively enough, so there was a massive explosion. It was Leonte, who knew in a movie look that he was being attacked by Bahal. The man, in turn, saw that the man had noticed him. Immediately jumping off the cliff and landing beside him, he said that he and Leonte hadn't seen each other for so long. But the man had a different opinion on that, and so he immediately attacked Bahal. But the one in turn stopped the attack. There was an explosion, and Leonti immediately started yelling at him. After all, how dare he attack him, and what did he want to accomplish by doing so? To which the man said, of course he understands, he smiled. After all, isn't that, isn't that a declaration of war? The head of one of the five warrior gods of the Azure Sword Clan's Azure Sword Clan started such an event perfectly, didn't it? After all, they had once been friends, 
so he felt uncomfortable at the thought of someone else doing it. Bahal came to finish him personally. After all, why wouldn't he be able to transfer the mana organ? If he does as he is told, he promises that he can avoid a useless death. But Leonte, clenching her fist, was thinking about something else, to which Bahal muttered that it was just a show-off and his pride left him no choice and he would have to take it away by force. And our hero at this time was already in the arena of the eleventh floor. Glancing around, our hero realized that Pant and Adora hadn't reached them yet. Crouching down on the ground, our hero thought that they could wait just here for a little while. But then a rabbit came out of the portal and said it was a pleasure to finally meet him in person. His name is Laplace. He is, as you might have noticed, the guardian of the eleventh floor. It's the rabbit of the Twelve Zodiac. He realized that this was the strongest newcomer since Artia, and he was finally able to meet the one who excited all the guards. And, in truth, the guardians of the eleventh floor are someone else. However, he traded him because he wanted to give special attention to the rookie. After all, there was no way he was going to miss such a great opportunity and some carrots should be prepared for the guards of the eleventh floor later. Here he immediately asked our hero if he knew how the rule changes starting on the eleventh floor, and our hero replied, You already said that I heard there would be no more waiting area, and the trials become long term. Rabbit immediately said that was correct, and he seemed to get the gist of what was going to happen in the future so he thinks further instructions will be difficult for me to explain. How can he know who goes through numerous trials to become rich and famous as players? They have to overcome the limit of their body, and in order to do so, they will have to pass through dangerous tests with a number of difficulties. It is said that the real test begins on the eleventh floor, as what he will face here is nothing like what he has gone through before. Laplace was trying to explain to us one simple truth. After all, even if a player failed a challenge in the beginner area, he could attempt it countless times, as there is a waiting area where he could heal his wounds and rest, and then go back to the test. However, everything changes starting on the eleventh floor, as the waiting area no longer exists. If he fails the test, he's still on the floor, and if injured, the method of extraction will have to be found on his own, and even if he hits a dead end and looks for a solution, will have to do it here as well. Eventually, he will be trapped until he passes the test, so our hero here will no longer have such a concept as rounds, and if anything to want to clarify, he asked the rabbit a question, but hearing no answer, the rabbit began the ordeal. After all, the test of the eleventh floor has begun. It is a dream world, a mythical place where the dreams of beings intertwine, on the next levels all worlds and dimensions. The creatures that reside here are known as mythical beasts that exist and evolve through dreams. Our hero's task was to raise a mythical beast that would be the perfect partner for the long journey ahead of him. The object that appeared in our hero's hand is the egg of a mythical beast. However, no one knows who will hatch from it, as its form will change according to the dreams and desires it is fed. But one thing to remember is that even though an egg grows on its own, it is still an egg, and it will never hatch if the owner does not nurture and care for it. So our hero should make sure he gives him the right food and treats him well, giving him the care and affection he needs. After all, the more heart and soul he puts into it, the stronger his partner will be if he has no questions at the end of the ordeal. Then teleporting away, our hero looked at his hand where the egg lay and looked up, thinking that this would bring him a lot of worry. Our hero, taking his head, realized that his brother was saying that he on the eleventh floor was able to rest and have fun. After all, compared to the previous dreary ordeals, this was the first fulfillment to enjoy. But also, Chonu's great trait was psychometry, as he spent all day lovingly caring for the egg and talking to it, feeding it good dreams. 
It was only through this and his efforts that our hero's brother raised one of the most powerful creatures of all, the mythical dragon. Later he used it to meet the ancient dragon Kalados, making a contract that allows him to use a skill and power similar to the dragon's eye. In a way, the eleventh floor was a turning point for Chonu. But on the other hand, our hero wasn't very good at this sort of thing, because unlike his caring brother, he's bad at this sort of thing. But he doesn't particularly care about the care and breeding process, as the diary showed many ways to breed. But the problem is, what kind of beast would hatch? Essence is good in many aspects and would be a great fit, so it would be good to increase his skill level. In such a case, it was worth cultivating Phoenix because of its high connection to the elements of fire and air, because our hero needed to get the flame of life. After thinking about it, our hero stepped back a bit and realized that Pant and Edora were lingering, and apparently there was nothing that could be done about it. Immediately, our hero set about scratching out the inscription on the stone. After all, they had agreed that they would leave little messages about where they would go in case they got separated, and through that they would be able to find him. After all, it's time to move on. Our hero has moved into Phoenix territory, and in this territory his defense against the elements of fire and air will be greatly reduced, and his stats will also be reduced under the influence of the phoenix. Our hero realized that Phoenix had begun to follow them from afar. Looking up, he didn't understand why Phoenix was suddenly so wary. After all, his brother hadn't mentioned such arrogance on his part in his journal. But then our hero looked up and saw the Phoenix's nest and tried to take a step, but immediately heard someone tell him to stop. Our hero realized that it was the Phoenix, who bade him not to come any closer for otherwise it would be the cause of his doom. Our hero immediately said that he had come from afar to get the flame of life, for he needed it badly. Phoenix immediately said that he was unwilling to share anything with lowly people and told the man to leave. But our hero at these words realized that something was going wrong, because for some reason Phoenix resembles a curled-up hedgehog, and just don't tell him. Using his skills, our hero immediately made his way to the cave, apologizing for the intrusion, but Phoenix had better tell him how he dared to enter his home, to which our hero, using his dragon eyes, saw that the Phoenix was hatching eggs, that's what he thought, and immediately said he could see that she was incubating eggs. Phoenix didn't understand what the problem was. Our hero should have left, for she has no time for his jokes, but then our hero questioned that most likely one egg had been lost, and Phoenix didn't realize what he needed or what business he had. Well, and since he now knows there isn't one egg, he should leave her alone. But our hero offered a mutual exchange. If he could get her egg back, she would give him a mission. Immediately flapping her wing, she told him to do what he wanted. Our hero has a hidden mission, the phoenix egg. For while searching for food for future chicks, an egg was stolen from the ruler of the southern phoenix forest. We had to find the missing egg and return it to phoenix. He, in turn, will never forget his kindness. As a reward, he would receive the phoenix's blessing, so he immediately went on a mission, instantly disappearing from the cave. As he passed, he realized that this was where the tracks were disappearing. And where could it have gone? While walking by, our hero noticed something. When he looked, he saw two players holding an egg and talking about how they couldn't believe their luck. After all, they found the egg while Phoenix was composing it unattended. They have no idea how much they can get for such an item because they are willing to pay any price for it. The player immediately began to think because it would be nice to have a phoenix of his own. Only a handful of players in the tower possess the legendary mythical beasts, and as soon as he gets the chance, he wants to take it for himself. But then suddenly something started to happen. Turning around, he turned to the expensive player and asked when he had time. 
to which he received the answer that the water he had given him recently had made him very tired, since he had not noticed so much mandrake juice. Well, that's okay, because for people like them, he shouldn't take offense. I mean, he's got to realize. After the player fell, the other one who took the phoenix egg had always wanted one. After all, he never thought this day would ever come. After all, he was already planning to become a ranker with legendary mythical beasts. But then all his plans changed as soon as our hero showed up. Appearing from behind, he delivered a crushing blow to the player, grabbing the egg and holding it in his hand. He wanted to attack from behind, taking them by surprise, but was afraid they would drop the egg during the battle. So he had to act quickly, waiting for the right moment. And thankfully, it was much easier than he expected. In fact, since they decided to attack each other using their opinion of fire, he immediately burned the evidence. After all, it was great if all subsequent tasks turned out to be so easy. Our heroes returned to Phoenix, where she was reunited with her child, saying that she already thought she wouldn't see her dear child again. Our hero, looking at all of this, realized how good it was that they were reunited, remembering the events with his brother. Phoenix immediately thanked the man for his help, to which our hero said it was nothing. Immediately Phoenix said that since he saved her child, a deal is a deal, and as she promised, she would give him a task. But he should say what he wants. Our hero also said he needed her flame of life, to which Phoenix said he should know what he's asking for. But our hero has heard that this is the source of her existence, for the phoenix is a creature that perishes by being burned by its own flame and is reborn again, bursting forth like a spark, and the flame is a symbol of rebirth, also known as the sacred flame. But Phoenix immediately realized that he was planning to use it for his own egg, and she realized initially that she should have given him an assignment, however she decided that she would do without it. After all, since she was indebted to our hero, plus she could tell for certain that he would have easily passed the test if she had given it to him. So, he just got Phoenix's blessing. And Phoenix's confidence has increased by 200%. Phoenix's suspicion of our hero diminished, and he was rewarded with the flame of life. However, Phoenix said that to take her flame he needed a suitable vessel, so he should go create it and then come back. After all, the flame of life, the source of the phoenix's endless power, requires a special vessel that can withstand the heat of a never-dying fire. Our hero should have gathered the materials scattered throughout the floor and created a vessel to carry the flame of life. They were the albatross egg, the shadow snake, and the heart of the weakest dragon. There were no time limits, so our hero thought the task of creating a vessel was more annoying than getting a flame. But since they've taken care of business, he can go and come back when he's ready. After all, even though it's just a beast in an egg, it's still, but by now, has to be to outside stimuli. So the first thing he did was create a quiet, calm environment. After all, it may be a little late, but our hero realized that he needed to make his nest quickly. Seeing that the egg was glowing, our hero realized that he was in a good mood because he had done exactly as it was written in the diary, and so he hoped he would be comfortable. Lifting the egg and taking it in his hands, he didn't realize or believe he was doing such a thing. Bringing it closer, he immediately started stroking it, looking at the egg, and apparently it couldn't be helped. He realized he could stroke it some more. But after a while, morning came and the egg was in the nest. Our hero looked at it and realized that this would be much better, because now he could take a closer look at the rewards he had received. For he had eight items which he immediately accepted. The only useful item is the skull emblem, an auxiliary item. The earring is created from the skull of a player who was a shaman during his lifetime. At the time of its creation, it was a wonderful artifact, but over time its power has diminished and it is now only used as an auxiliary item. 
our hero realized that just by looking at the description, you can't say it's a good item. But it contained the shaman's soul, and it was a very good chance to try the black bracelet. Clutching the skull in his hands, there was an immediate reaction. Our hero's arm began to glow with red flames. A soul burst out of it, and a skeleton appeared. Looking at it, our hero did not understand, for he thought it was the player's soul that had been absorbed by the monster, and whether his experiment had worked. It couldn't be helped to begin with. After all, he had only summoned it in spirit form. He still had yet to take possession of it. So first, our hero needs to take control of it. Telling the one to obey him, he repeats it time after time, to which the spirit started talking incomprehensible nonsense. But our hero continued to tell him to listen. Well, then a reaction began to occur, after which the smoke dispersed, and in front of our hero was already standing the creature, looking at him, who in his heart felt as if they were one with him, and now he understood how that felt, and immediately ordered him to sit down. Our hero immediately started giving commands like, Stand up, run twist the confessional to that tree and come back. See that fruit over there? Bring it to me. For the shaman's soul carried out every order of our hero, from the simple to the more complex. When asked to fetch the fruit, he used the simplest spell to accomplish the task. He may not be able to use stronger magic now, but apparently not everything is still available to him. The spirit showed no sign of disobedience or expression. It had become his faithful servant. But there were other tests he'd run on him. He checked his speed first, though he was slightly behind, not so much that there would be a problem if he took it with him. He then began to check the command's distance and realized that he could hear his orders around a hundred meters away. Realizing that when the spirit is near him, there is no problem, but the further away, the worse he hears and feels the increasing distance between them grow thinner. But we had to figure out a way to strengthen the bond between them. He thought he'd call her Puppeteer's Putty, for starters. After that, our hero was done with the tests. Our hero continued on his way, but as he turned around he realized that the transformation seemed to have slightly improved the spirit's original abilities, but it wasn't enough. Although due to the physical damage ability of a large number of familiars, this would be a great fit. Over time the undead are capable of evolving into higher beings, so it's entirely possible that this familiar will even become lich-like and it's an army of the undead, if only our hero could create it. I wonder if there are souls in his collection that he could transform. Opening the list, he was very much surprised. Two more souls immediately appeared before our hero, a huge null, a creature guarding the laurel leaves needed to create the wreath of Artemis on the sixth floor, and the powerful boss of the ninth floor, Vulk, defeated with the help of Pant and Adora. These souls of the strongest creatures from the newcomer zone our hero has collected in case he finds a use for them. But who knew you could use them in this way? After all, he thought it would be easier to manage them with names, so he immediately started handing out names to them. He named the first one Ka, the second one Null, and the third one Boo. In doing so, he gave names to his spirit familiars. Our hero's proximity to the familiars increased. The higher the proximity, the stronger the bond and the devotion with which they will follow our hero's orders. The closeness of the familiars of each soul was, the first was 15 out of 30, the second was 8, and the third was 10 out of 55. Our hero was surprised that they were so excited about the names. For the spirits that have been collected have no personalities, and being captured, they lose their ego. Even though spirits and familiars are stronger than normal spirits, they still don't realize who they used to be. But in acquiring a name, they find a new meaning for existence. The result isn't too bad. And he feels that the connection between him and the spirits is stronger than it was before. 
the abilities of each are similar to what they had when they were alive. The nimble knoll boasts high speed. Ka, who had immense power, was slower but very strong. This means that our hero needs to keep looking for strong spirits, which is what he decided to do. The number of souls collected recently was 500, and previously our hero could only collect 150. But now the number has increased to 500 and apparently his limit has tripled. But our hero wanted to see how many familiars he could create. But so far 10 seems to be his limit, much less than he expected but still good too. And it's not just that. New familiars created hastily are rather weak and useless. So the capacity has increased along with the user's ability, which means they only have to hope. He needs to find out what the artifact is. So we'll have to ask Idora to use her eyes. But then our hero heard Phoenix addressing him. They say he has an interesting subject. But our hero thought she was already resting. But her fledglings have finally calmed down and the artifact he found has piqued her interest. It is that bracelet on his arm that is who he is. Meanwhile, at the other end, a man was coming out, wondering how he had been able to escape using items and skills, but now he had nothing left. It was Leonti. They say it wouldn't have happened if he had that stone, but he wanted revenge for what was done to him no matter what it cost him. Therefore, the news of the battle between the Red Dragon and the Azure Ball Clan shook the entire tower. Mostly talked about how Bahal ambushed Leonte, who later turned out to be the sole survivor. He declared war and put up a notice on every floor that the Red Dragon and the Azure Ball Clan were the biggest clans in the tower. That is why this war should cause great consternation. Countless clans and players began to prepare for the coming battles. Ripping from the papers, Pant realized that no matter where you go, it's the same everywhere. After all, he thought that he would be able to safely pass the trials starting from the 11th floor after finishing the rookie zone, but then Pant looked up and noticed something. It was a bird that perched on his arm, for it is the herald of the clan. Opening the note, it said for the brother and sister to come back as soon as they could. Communication, and it was a call, back, to his clan. Everyone began to notice that the brother and sister had come, and immediately everyone started coming up and asking, why did they come back so suddenly? After all, everyone knows how busy the tower has become lately, and isn't that the reason for their return? But then a father came out of the crowd to greet the returning children. Edora immediately said that she thought something serious had happened, but apparently it wasn't. After all, some are chilling in the vegetable garden, but childhood has already told them they need a snack. After all, it doesn't matter how busy he is, because you have to rest once in a while too. And besides, he's very curious as to why his little girl is so cranky. Pant immediately intervened and said he could tell the reason. After all, she wanted to go on an exciting adventure with her dear man, but because of her father, she didn't have time to finish. Adora immediately threw a punch at her brother and he finally fell silent. But then everyone started talking again about how the month had finally found a husband candidate. Does that mean they'll be eating noodles soon? I mean, it's been a while since they've had a party. The father, embracing his daughter, said that it was very good and he wanted to know who had managed to win the heart of his proud daughter, to which the girl only told him to take his hands off. Stepping back, my father immediately said he didn't understand and had no idea who she was so cold about, and you can't even make a joke about it. They should get back to business, because maybe he didn't mention the message to me, but he was sure they'd already heard the news on the way here. The sibling's father was the martial arts king, Nayo. Pant immediately questioned his father about the reason for their return, for he hadn't even blinked an eye when Ardia was in trouble. Now, what's the difference? But he also said he didn't want to get involved, but things took a turn for the worse. 
the guy didn't understand what was supposed to happen, to which the guy told him that they had decided to participate in the war as mercenaries. After all, Flan refused, and they know what that means. After all, to their clan members, rogue means honor and pride. Giving up the horn is the same as putting your life on the line. Dad exhaled and immediately said that it looked like their conversation was going to go on for a while, so they should go inside first. Inc. Events returned to our hero, where Phoenix asked him what the bracelet on his arm was. But our hero would like to find out for himself, to which Phoenix said that he sees the essence of most objects. But this mystery seemed to be shrouded in mist for him, at least in his eyes. But our hero was thinking, after all, an artifact to recognize that even a legendary beast can't. And you really disappointed him. But Phoenix could tell something for sure, for this bracelet was his complete opposite. Yet at the same time, it seemed as if it was a reflection in a mirror. Our hero didn't understand what the opposite in the mirror meant, to which the phoenix explained that he exists by burning life and being born from fire, but this object gives life through death and is its embodiment. After all, life and death are diametrically opposed, but at the same time, the same, for they represent one whole. Our hero interjected, life and death are one, the phoenix immediately said that this was true, for the phoenix may be a living being, but it will only be reborn from a spark after death. On the other hand, the black bracelet that controls death collects the souls of the dead and turns them into dark energy or familiar spirits. This could be seen as a resurrection, and this shield he definitely feels divine power emanating from it. After all, he was blessed by the goddess of war, Aegis Athena. Aegis is a nine-layered shield blessed by Athena, goddess of war, that can block most attacks, repelling all evil and placing a terrible curse on those who looked into her eyes, gives the wearer a blessing that protects against ranged attacks and unleashes a powerful aura that can break an opponent's spirit also within range blesses those the wearer considers allies. Blessing increases stats by 10% and increases resistance to all effects by 15%. The area of effect and number of recipients are increased by the mastery of the skill. Our hero realized he was very good due to being a divine artifact, and that sounds like a cheat. After all, Aegis can both defend and attack, it serves as an excellent defense against dark magic and also casts a petrification curse on enemies in a wide radius. But that's not the most important function, as the King of the Crowd skill allows her to buff allies and debuff enemies. Normally, this type of skill was only available to the Lord class, but even hordes have limitations on skills, such as only being able to be used on their subjects. On the other hand, Aegis can give a buff to anyone who allows themselves to be considered an ally. This means that any spirit familiars or those who follow her commands get a buff. And it was much better than our hero's brother had mentioned, for he didn't even have to worry about daggers thrown from afar. But there was a flaw here, too. After all, the spirits of the familiars were wary of the artifact, and the binding of the spirits of the familiars was decreasing. But our hero shouldn't have talked about it. The bracelet began to emit a strong magical aura, and our hero hesitated. Apparently Aegis and Black Bracelet are incompatible, as Black Bracelet uses curse and dark mana, while Aegis contains the element of light. It makes sense that they are incompatible. But in this case... Our hero realized he wanted to test what was once a divine artifact and how it would react to a blood-soaked demonic sword. A dynamic curse struck Vigrid, but was dispelled by Aegis. The characteristic of the divine artifact began to appear again. However, since the sword curse was too strong, it would take more holy energy to completely lift the curse. Our hero seemed to begin to realize what and how, and Phoenix immediately said that Aegis does not accept the bracelet of death, 
but rejoices in the cursed sword. And that's a very interesting fact. It is unusual for a dark bracelet and a light bracelet to bestow such different artifacts at the same time for the tower. He might want to find out why the tower rewarded him. But right away, Phoenix asked one favor. After all, all three chicks had just hatched safely, including the youngest one he had rescued. Our hero the same congratulated Phoenix, who immediately thanked him, but as far as his chick was concerned, he hoped he would name the youngest. Our hero walked over to the cave, taking the younger Phoenix in his hands, eyeing it with his gaze. Phoenix muttered that apparently even someone like him could get excited by difficulties. Our hero touches the little Phoenix and feels warmth, but the Phoenix insisted on being given a name. Our hero thought about it for a while and named him Chirik. The Phoenix immediately changed and looking around, our hero wondered what the problem could be. To which Phoenix said, it's fine, but that's what he thinks it's going to be like. Still, our hero made the decision to call him by that name. In return, he made the connection along with Chirik. And Chirik will have a strong influence on Phoenix. Chirik's affection increased greatly for our hero, and he made a contract with the legendary beast. Because of this, all mythical beasts other than demonic beasts would be less aggressive towards him. Our hero felt something awaken inside his body. This was a confirmation of his spiritual growth, and the progress of the body's awakening resumed. The current stage of awakening had reached 99.5%. Our hero thought that it seems that making a connection with the phoenix chick had affected his growth, and there was only 0.5% left. In all likelihood, his awakening will soon be complete. But he still didn't understand how he should use the shield then. Our hero wanted to try to infuse him with mana using his power. He figured it was some kind of telekinesis, a little easier than he expected. But immediately he wanted to try and split it, and there was a huge explosion. But if he wants to control it, he has to concentrate on all nine parts at the same time. After all, managing one does not provide labor, but about two he already has difficulties. Even when he tried hard, he gave it a lot harder than he thought he would. Everything looks like drawing a circle with your right hand, then drawing a square with your left. It's not that hard. However, if you draw at the same time, you won't even get accurate figures. It is therefore quite expected that using nine at the same time is not possible. If he wants to use everything, he'll have to split his consciousness. But after summoning the spirits, he immediately said that they were beginning to have a training session. Our hero took off all his armor and put it separately, then lay in the water. Upon discovering his characteristics, he was surprised, for the sharpening of his senses had seriously raised his level, and this was due to his concentration on sensations during his attempt to split consciousness when he was mastering Aegis. Our hero realized that there really wasn't much to do on the eleventh floor until the beast hatched, and it was worth focusing on practice. But either way, he didn't realize where they were. For by all appearances, something happened. After all, they should have finished and moved to the eleventh floor by now. It means they have some kind of problem, but I wonder what happened. After all, he's not too worried, because Pontu and Edor can definitely stand up for themselves, but he hoped they would get here before his beast was hatched. After thinking for a while, our hero lay down again, and by all appearances, he too had changed. After all, after five days, the brother and sister still hadn't shown up on the eleventh floor, and all this time our hero had been focused on training and learning how to control the three layers of Aegis. In addition, his family name spirits are now able to materialize for longer periods of time and have also grown to the point where they have begun to think for themselves, and only now are they ready for the real battle. After getting dressed and taking his shield, our hero started to leave, to which Phoenix asked where he was going. But our hero said he had a little something to prepare, 
for it is time to create a vessel for the flame of life. On the eleventh floor, Albatross territory, approaching, our hero realized it had to be here somewhere. And coming closer, he spotted what he was looking for. It was Albatross, who had discovered the hidden mission. Albatrosses were known for their habit of devouring everything in their path because of their voraciousness, and the beast dwelt close by. Our hero needed to take the eggs from the albatross to keep the cubs from hatching. Our hero took a closer look, smiled, and commanded the spirits to come out, who immediately appeared out of nowhere. Having prepared, our hero for the fight with the albatross handled it fairly quickly. With a touch of his hand, he realized he could swallow an albatross, and he might not be able to turn him into a familiar spirit now because of his displeasure, but maybe later he could do it. But it was a very good job he completed the challenge. Our hero used a spirit pill, increasing all spirit stats. After all, he used souls to create these spiritual pills, and they seemed to be quite effective, raising the level of his spiritual familiars. Every time he doesn't absorb one of them, the stats increase and he needs to work harder to create more spirit pills for them. The hunt was easy, as these guys did all the work for him. It was awesome. After all, all he had to do was sit back and watch his stats increase, and perhaps he could just as easily get his hands on the remaining materials, for further, as long as the shadow snake. Turning around, he ordered the spirits to follow him. But then Taniti's team showed up. They were already quite tired, for they had been walking for a very long time, but the girl who was with them was only telling them that they should hold out a little longer, for Sliff was telling them that they were almost there. To which the guy smiled and said that if he said that, then it was true, and it was time for them to already do what they had come to do, the Shadow Snake Tunnel. The most difficult dungeon the group went through, a bunch of snakes attacked at any moment and paralyzing venom, instantly effective when bitten. The team had already been in the tunnel for five days. Therefore, the stockpile of antidote was empty, and if this was a normal passage, they would have retreated long ago. But they've come too far to turn back, for at the end of the tunnel there is a reward waiting for them that will make up for all the hardships they've been through. Because once they get the apple, they won't have to go through such difficulties anymore, and going through any dungeons will be a breeze for them. As they approached the door, though, they realized they were in the right place and rejoiced, for they had finally made it. But one of the guys said he understands that they are excited, but they need to focus on preparing for the battle. Opening the door, they were alert, preparing to attack, but the fact that they didn't see them was very surprising. After all, it was just a forest in front of them, and they didn't realize what was happening without a single apple. After all, in our time, the hero has already taken all the apples and completed the task. After that, he was given awards, but he, seeing them so often, had already ceased to be surprised. Our hero entered the city of Porak. And why were the players who saw it outraged again? After all, why did he need so many ingredients? One player heard that in one place there were none left at all, they should certainly recover soon. But this, when will there be more of this? After all, he thinks he'd sooner grow old than finish the damn ordeal. But our hero realized that there was nothing he could do to help them, for only these ingredients were suitable for making the vessel of the flame of life. Well, even if our hero doesn't need all these things now, he can find a use for them later. Porak was the largest and busiest city of the eleventh floor and it was unclear why it was the reason for the changes around it. Did something really happen? And then our hero heard someone shouting for everyone to move aside and make way for him. After all, they don't know who they are. It was the Hippo Clan. After all, these are not guys who would fail on low floors. What did they want here? They are, a.k.a., one of the leaders on the Blue Flower Island. The fact that they stirred has some connection to the Blue Flower Island. 
Our hero understood that this was something to try to find out, but after stepping back a bit, he still found the place he was looking for. Once inside, many people were sitting around just having a drink and relaxing, minding their own business. Our hero walked over to the bar where the bartender was standing and threw a baggie on the table and said he wanted to buy something, to which the bartender said they always welcome guests with fat wallets. But what does he want? So our hero said that he needed a large number of celestial insect wings. The bartender said they certainly have such trifling goods. But our hero only wanted the species that resides on the 31st floor. The bartender also said they had some, but it would cost him a lot more. But if he has enough money, he can provide him with as much as he wants. So the barman immediately took out a pouch and gave it to our hero who, in turn, after taking it and seeing what still suited him, said that he was interested in something else. But the bartender immediately said he was empty-handed. Without thinking long, our hero took the hint, throwing another bag. The bartender immediately said he had a generous soul and would help with what he needed. So our hero asked, what to do outside, hippo clan guys, and what are they doing on the 11th floor? to which the bartender wiped his glass, surprised, for it seems to be the first time he's seen them here. They had only appeared in deserted places before, and he didn't even know where to begin. Therefore, he immediately said that a war might break out between the Red Dragon and the Azure Sword Clan. Our hero was shocked by this, but then everyone sitting at the bar immediately began to act aggressively, some even grabbing their swords, which made our hero turn around and think that it was very reckless. Our hero wanted to know more, but the bartender didn't understand what he meant, to which immediately the hero said he wanted to know more about the war he had just mentioned. So the bartender immediately said that he didn't seem to be aware at all, because Bahal of Red Dragon and Leonti of Azure Sword had shared something. Leonte escapes on the verge of defeat, and the bartender has heard that the two Kona are about to declare war, for a great battle is coming. Our hero thought for a moment. Bahal and Leonte. After all, if two top players from two of the biggest clans collide, then war is inevitable. Events take an interesting turn. Therefore, the bartender said that the probability of the 11th floor becoming a battlefield for them was very high. But our hero did not understand, after all, why this floor, why here? And the bartender even explained it, because there are several reasons. Here, you could deploy full-fledged combat operations, and also the 11th floor has a symbolic meaning, because it was easy to collect souls and artifacts, and also a fast process of supplying resources. After all, when the spirit's powers become stronger, they can be of quite a bit of help, especially their inner strength, which can help players who are hungry for fast development. This is quite appropriate when preparing for war, for in such a case they could not keep their cool. Our heroes exterminated all the spirits, taking the pouch. He realized that he needed to finish the challenge before more players got here. As soon as our hero left, the guy who was sitting behind the bar wondered to the bartender, who's the cocky type? To which the bartender told him to find out everything he could about him. Maybe they'll figure something out. To which the guy asked if that meant he was going to die, because he didn't realize this was a real hunt. But still, who is this man? And the bartender immediately said, Why does he need eyes then, if he can't see? Because that masked man is a greedy devil. Meanwhile, our hero continued on his way and at one point stopped. And without turning around, our hero told those to get out already. To which the guys immediately showed up and said he was that player. But it was unclear to our hero what he wanted. But the man said he wanted to make sure because he too had heard of a man who had made a complete mess of the 11th floor ecosystem, and more than one player had suffered from it. And they suspected him of the crime, for it would be better if he helped in the investigation. 
So the guys immediately began to surround our hero from all sides, but he did not understand what was happening. Why are they so eager to get other people's information? At this answer, the man was shocked, for he did not understand what he was talking about, to which our hero said that if they were going to attack, it was about time they did and let them stop their pathetic excuses. After all, if they are going to attack, they should do it now and stop these dirty excuses of theirs. Why was the man very shocked and angry? Sounds like this is really his case, and he will answer for what she was doing. But our hero said that if they wanted to attack, let them risk their health. And while our hero was saying this to one of the commanders, a fatal blow was struck, from which he immediately fell down, and everyone was shocked at what happened. But it was the spirit of the familiar. But the other players didn't realize what it was and started yelling for them to attack already. But before he could speak, another spirit appeared beside the man. And already literally near every player were the spirits of our hero's familiars. The players didn't realize what was happening, but they were dealt with rather quickly by the spirits. And why they were terrified, they immediately started running away, or breaking their heads to escape, only turning around to see if they were escaping after all. But the spirits were persistent, so some they caught up with immediately. But also our hero did not remain standing still, and such players who could not be caught up by the spirits. And one of the players left looking in the direction of our hero, saying that at least he knows what kind of creature is at their back. But our hero, taking the player and lifting him up, said it shouldn't bother him, because they weren't leaving here anyway, and the other players realized that it looked like it had started. This is the time of the guys who decided to teach the greedy devil a lesson, and aren't they some of the best fighters out there? After all, he was able to take down the hippo all by himself. It was crazy, because facing a clan without blinking, this guy is a loner, and he wouldn't be able to face a large number of enemies. As strong and outstanding as he was, the players decided to surround them with an experienced ring and corner them. In that case, even he won't be able to present anything. Looking back at each other, they still decided to stick to the plan they had worked out, so they went at our hero in a sweaty formation. But then the players began to notice that it was very dark, for shouldn't there be more light here, they pondered. After all, it's not going to work that way. If they keep this up, they'll just drift away from each other at a great distance and now gather all in one place. As they looked around, they didn't realize what was going on and where had everyone else disappeared to. One of the players started yelling for them to think about the plan again, but then the Sonin clan commander ran out, who also began to shout what they had forgotten here for though it didn't matter now, they must get away from there and fast, to which the player only said to calm down and tell him what happened there and what happened inside. He immediately said that he was being chased by spirits, and they would tear everyone to pieces if they didn't leave the battlefield quickly. They needed to get away as soon as possible. But the player didn't understand. What spirits? Is he talking about monsters like the tower, and? But the man said they weren't like that and they should hurry up and leave, because now is not the time to discuss it. But what he saw shocked him. The player didn't realize what had happened, but the others immediately started shouting, turning around. The player saw a spirit that was already standing too close. It was a monster that took everyone and everything. In fact, the fog actually pulled off a couple of tricks. First of all, it dulled the player's senses, preventing them from being able to pinpoint their exact location and recognize the closest other players. This made fear engulf the mind, for being surrounded on all sides, one does not know from whence the enemy may come. Gradually, panic began to encompass the rest of the squad, and after a short period of time, everyone was gripped by fear. Even though it's a minor debuff, curse, the effect is pretty good. Utterly stupid and such weak people. They dared to come and ruin his master. 
After all, he is in the endless confinement of death, and he has a master who found him and brought him out of this pit of hell. If he could handle them, their generous master would give him soul pills again, and he would have the opportunity to become even more powerful. And he's pretty strong right now, but things will be a lot more fun and easier if he keeps it up. After all, didn't the master say that it could evolve and be more useful in the future? He wants to help his master at least a little so they can have some fun together. He will destroy all enemies for our hero. One of the players only now realized that it was just the three of them, and they realized that they had been caught up in the middle of it, and they were in such a mess. But then the player said he heard something, turning around in the direction where something was approaching. They were very frightened, and out of the mist our hero began to appear. Slowly and gradually he approached the players, and in a moment he was standing beside them, looking at them with a steady gaze and asking the question, Is there one among them who wants to survive? After all, our hero could only give one a chance. With a crushing blow, one of the players remained unharmed. Looking up, he heard our hero tell him that anything could be done. So the player immediately lowered, said that's exactly what he would do, and he would do anything. Our hero also said that he remembers who gave them information about him, and he should pass on something that everyone will like if it happens again. To which the player questioned what it all meant, but our hero didn't understand what else he needed. So the man lowered his head and said he would relay their warning, and our hero could rely on him turning around as quickly as possible. But our hero didn't want to let him go so easily, so he ordered the spirit not to let him go. Because now we need to follow this player and track down those who are spreading the word. He'll get to them later, and I'll make them scream in agony. It was only now that he realized that he had wasted a great deal of time fighting these players, and he must find the remaining ingredients as soon as possible. Events returned back to the bar our hero visited, where the bartender pondered why there was no word. It had only been a few hours since he had relayed the information. Several clans have gathered in Porak to prepare for the war between the Red Dragon and the Azure Sword. They paid mad money for the information. The clans began forming joint units to hunt him down. This information was part of a very important deal for their bar to become his main supplier. Even if the hunt ended unsuccessfully, it would be a good chance to find out how powerful the famous Greedy Devil was. And this information could also be sold expensively. But while the bartender was pondering all this, the player who let our hero go stormed into the bar. He realized that it looked like they had failed after all, so he snapped his fingers and immediately three large men and players appeared and stood in front of the guy, who was quite scared. But then the guys in front of the player looked up and were shocked, for a spirit had appeared before them, and none of them understood what was happening. Why are they increasing? What happened to that intense glow and powerful explosion? The players who were watching did not realize what was happening there, for the explosion was quite strong. Meanwhile, our hero has returned to the Phoenix, talking about how it took longer than she thought it would. But our hero also said he came in to deal with a bunch of players, and Phoenix realized that something seemed to have happened. Even so, he sees that he has brought everything he needs. Thanks to their stupidity, our hero was able to get a lot more useful items. But since that was the case, Phoenix suggested starting as soon as possible, using all the artifacts he could gather. The ingredients are of the best quality. He seems to have selected very carefully, and by combining them, magic began to happen. He used his powers to the maximum to create something of such high quality, the flame of life. High grade has been completed. Phoenix has transferred a piece of his soul, and the hidden quest, Flame of Life, has been completed. Therefore, as a reward, he received the Flame of Life of the highest class. Despite this, our hero immediately began to remember moments from life with his brother, 
how they, playing consoles, told each other that this time they would definitely win, but immediately began to fight, because one of them turned off the electricity. Thinking back to those wonderful times with no worries and moments of fun and laughter, those memories surfaced in the very back of his mind. Despite his brother not being around, the way he smiled, his smile was in every memory, and his little brother was sitting next to him. He had tears dripping and apologized to Phoenix for demonstrating inappropriate behavior. But Phoenix didn't understand what inappropriate meant because it was a good opportunity to realize that he was a good man with a warm soul. Even at a time when it looks as cold as ice, all these memories symbolize life for people. Memories are not something to be renounced. They help them move on in difficult situations and become better, being a motivation in their lives. Their whole life is a series of memories that pop up every now and then, and he can't know what he saw. But those memories live on, and he should cherish them. And our hero thanked Phoenix for understanding. Charik looked very happy, and Phoenix said that while our hero was away, little Charik had managed to get close to his egg, so now he was upset about the impending separation from a possible friend. Hearing this, our hero realized that it looked like he would have to drop in on them from time to time even after passing the eleventh floor. But they did get down to business. The transformation of the egg began to work, and Phoenix realized that he had not yet been born, but had already reached an incredible size, for such an occasion had not yet happened in his memory. He thought it was the golden dragon heir. An egg of incredible size had already appeared between the phoenix and our hero, which immediately gained a green priesthood. Our heroes, looking at the egg, were delighted, Looking around at each other, they still didn't understand what was going on. Phoenix was looking at our hero, and so our hero was looking at Phoenix. After all, they've waited so long, and he didn't even think to move in there. Never with something like this, because the creature inside the egg absolutely had to grow up. But why is there still nothing going on? Phoenix exhaled and offered to just watch him for a while. After all, wouldn't he be spending eternity in that egg? Our hero, despite the egg, still agreed with Phoenix that it was worth keeping an eye on him. After thinking a bit, Phoenix suggested that the egg might be hiding life. To test that theory, they should try to create a few more pieces for him. But no one ever hatched out of the egg. Only Charik climbed on top of the egg, sitting on top of it from which both Phoenix and our hero took on their faces. But Phoenix said they've tried so many things. There was at least some hint that he was alive at all, and he seemed to know why. But our hero didn't understand what Phoenix was talking about or what he was saying, to which the latter in turn said that the source was this very creature who lived by the hopes and reveries of others. It is born in dreams and exists by feeding on them. Beasts don't feel the need to manifest in a world where there are no dreams. Our hero must have, as others certainly have, a dream, for the achievement of which he will do anything. The memory symbolize life itself, and the dream is the goal and cause of his suffering. Phoenix suggested that perhaps our hero has a dream after all, asking him that question. Our hero sat down and thought about the dream. After all, judging by Phoenix's words, he doesn't have one, though even if he does, it's trivial revenge, and he doubts it can be called a dream. After all, he'd always thought dreams were nonsense. What's he supposed to do about it now? While our hero was thinking about this, Charik came to him and our hero realized that he had come to comfort him after all. After all, his freen is just sleeping, so the baby shouldn't worry too much, and he thought that since he needed a source, he couldn't cheat a little and do without one. After all, our hero will try to feed him the sparks of life until the very end, if it never works out that way. He'll try the remaining four ways of energizing it, 
and until it grows and hatches out of the egg, he'll just keep feeding it, even if it doesn't help much, and he'll see how much longer it stays in that shell. After a while, our hero continued on his way, and a young man appeared before him, asking the question, Are you Cain? From which our hero tried to grab the guy. The one bounced away, and before our hero already appeared the face of a young man, who, stretching out his hands to each other, said that he was glad to meet, and his name was Yanu. He came to give our hero a letter from Edora and Pant. And the contents of the letter were nothing special, for they currently had an urgent matter in the One Horn clan. The brother and sister were required to return since they were members of the royal family. They apologized for not being able to contact him during that time and also told him not to worry and to go to the next floor first, promising to catch up with him later. Reading the letter, our hero was glad that they were okay after all, and then asked the kid how they were doing. And the one replied that our hero should not worry, for they are all right. They are quite energetic, especially Mr. Pant. Our hero smiled and thought it was no surprise, though it was good enough. But here the guy immediately asked if he happened to have any difficulties, to which our hero asked, What's he so interested in? To which the young man said that, in truth, Her Majesty had told him, Cain, that if there was still any trouble, the young lad should be helped and then only return. And he must confess, for he is the heir to the Seer Cohen, because he can trust him. So he was shocked. So does that mean he can predict the future? After all, he was the most powerful modern descendant of the Tower, so they were always in serious positions. Their influence and maintaining neutrality was not the only reason for this. The prophets, thanks to clairvoyants and soothsayers who could communicate freely with the gods, achieved incredible success. The diviners of the one-horned listened to a message from the deity. They also acted as intermediaries linking other unicorns to the deities. The other clans also wanted to possess such magical power. Though the unicorns of the Vane clan themselves concealed the existence of seers, and the kid already knew what our hero wanted to say, but he was in no hurry to convince him that his abilities were no better than anyone else's. After all, there are several heirs, and the one who will be the next true seer is now elsewhere, but his abilities are no different, so it's just our hero should put his trust in him. Our hero still hesitated a bit, though, and just when he was about to say something, the kid realized he needed Madame Adora's wise opinion. Is that what he means? he asked. But our hero said that to begin with, and just as he speaks, began to speak, the kid interrupted him, saying he could return with him to the clan, but our hero remembered that he'd been told that he had some problems right now, to which the guy said that, of course, it was a big deal, but truth be told, there are a few elders who would like to see our hero, and I think they'd love to meet him. Uh, the kid said he was glad. Pondered is one of the strongest towers. Don't they keep the secrets of their power? but he realized that he was sure he could benefit from meeting them. Our hero and the guy approached the egg, and the guy was very shocked because he had no idea it was that big. But our hero was ready to go. However, he was interested in one question. How would they get to the place where the one-horned clan lived? They say the road there is off-limits. One horn and purple hair are great traits of the clan, a race with outstanding abilities and physical skills. They are known to rarely leave their village, except for raiding and passing towers, which is done when they reach a certain age. It is said that the village does not keep in contact with the outside world, so it is very difficult to find, to which the guy said it was all bullshit. After all, if they were as reclusive as others say, now how could the village even exist? They have visitors, by the way. Oh, and traders often come to the village, which is really well defended, so our hero shouldn't lag behind, and the ticket is worth taking to our hero because it will help him get back. 
The guy ripped up the ticket and disappeared in a flash, and our hero turned around and took hold of the ticket and said he'd be right back to the Phoenix. Then he tore up the ticket and teleported to the guy, who immediately told him to follow his footsteps and that if he made a single mistake, he would be in trouble. And only the kid took a step. Our hero was surprised. After all, this circulation is a technique. In addition to the various visions of battle to the clan of one-horned men is significantly special. The skill of this technique is to control energetic underground currents and distort space, affecting the landscape object. It is somewhat similar to the magic circle but has a different concept. If magic exists through the accumulation of force, circulation implies a flow of energy, the movement of which is infinite. Our hero couldn't say that he had figured out how it worked, but he thought he could figure it out as he went along, and taking a step, it was as if our hero was already in another world. The kid asked the question cheerfully. That's great, isn't it? Yes, and they're coming to the village soon. Our hero, using the dragon's eye, realized that although they tried to hide the path from others, but if you look closely, you can see that it follows a certain trajectory, and it is quite similar to a magical chain, and he thinks he can do without his help. The guy went 45 degrees left, then right and down 16 degrees, and further. But our hero turned around and started walking in the other direction, which made the guy not realize where he was going. But taking steps, our hero studied a little already in front of the village, asking the question, is this here? But how is it possible an outsider could get in here without a clue? The guy didn't realize what it was or where he was headed, but luckily he managed to find his way. Had he backed off, to which our hero said he saw the road and got out, and the guy was shocked. Our hero saw a shortcut and took it, though, and the guy shouldn't worry. But it's impossible to determine the trajectory the first time. He's a monster, and no, he didn't expect it. In the village, people continued to work and children played. Our hero realized that it wasn't much different from an ordinary village. People didn't realize who the man was. Was someone supposed to come today? But no one had heard of it. But some people noticed this man. After all, he knows Mrs. Edora. And the one in the mask. Janu said he had to fulfill the princess's errand. Everyone looked at our heroes and was very shocked. But our hero didn't realize what was known about him. But then someone called out to our hero. Turning around, he saw that it was Edora. Approaching her, our hero asked the question, Are you all right? But the girl said sure, and she apologized for disappearing without saying anything. After all, she didn't think they'd have to go back so soon. But our hero put his hand on her shoulder and told her that he had heard they had a good reason, and these things happened. She shouldn't worry. The girl, hearing this, smiled and was pleased. But the people who were standing nearby noticed that their cold princess was smiling, and as soon as Edora turned toward them, they too turned around and said they would go to work. And then the father of the brother and sister appeared and asked if the same man had visited them, for his daughter and son had praised him so much. Our hero realized that this was the clan head, the one who had brought the village to blossom, Mu Wan, and his energy was very strong. But our hero was not surprised by this. Why was the man shocked? After all, he had seen it, and it was pretty good. It didn't surprise him, though, since he had overcome their defensive circulation technique with such ease. Whereof, Pant immediately asked what was there, but his father said something very curious, and such sleuths as he could not yet see it. From which Pant, with a change of face, said, of course. Anyway, the man said he had a conversation to have with our hero, but our hero thought he saw something wrong or made a mistake in passing. But the man immediately spat out that he was going to take his daughter away. Pant, hearing this, immediately changed in his face, as did Edora, who was shocked by what she heard. The man asked again when he was going to pick up his daughter. 
and so our hero was shocked. Yes, and the girl immediately started yelling at her father, but he said she didn't leave, she just forgot about our customs. After all, if a good man appears, he should be taken without slowing down. Naim and our hero was exactly as he should be. After all, her dad had also met her mom and married, and then had a girl, realizing how long ago that was. To which Adora said, You said it was her wedding, and stopped looking for potential suitors for her. Pant held the girl, only apologizing, for it was embarrassing. And the girl still continued to scream, but the man said that as it was, it had been a long time since they'd had visitors from the outside world and it couldn't go on like this for long. And immediately, he offered our hero to come inside and drink tea and talk. Upon entering the king's residence, our hero did not expect the interior to be so simple. And then a voice came from the side, apologizing for being late, because he was changing clothes, so he was a little late. It had been a long time since he'd dressed like this and he'd already forgotten how to do it but our hero said it suits him. And the man smiled and said he knew, because he had such a figure that any clothes fit, and when he was young, he had tons of girls chasing after him. Now they should talk it over. After all, he's brand new to the tourney, but has broken all records in the starting zone, partner of Foxtail and Bloodblade, a monster that kills everyone in its path and seeks all sorts of honors and rewards greedy devil. He's also the one who single-handedly attacked Arendon. Is the man right? Why? Our hero. I was shocked, jumping up. He asked the question, how did he do it? Why, the guards immediately drew their swords and the man told the man to sit down using his power, but our hero did not realize what this energy was, for he could not move. He was deluded. It was not hidden only from Muwan's eyes. He knows about our hero, after all, of the two of them. He is the monster. Sitting back down, the man also told him not to worry, for the people who guessed it were no more than three in the tower. Now they should get to the most important part. He'd already heard from Janu about the purge he'd come here on. After all, that huge thing is the egg to which our hero said that's exactly what it was. But when he heard from Janu, he thought he was delusional. But when I saw him, I was surprised. I mean, it's such a huge egg. What is the beast inside? Our hero asked the question, Is there any way we can find out after learning about this? But the man said he wasn't sure, because he wasn't much of a judge of such things. But it was worth trusting their people. They have heard a lot and will be able to help. After all, there were records of such cases in their archives, but the elder thought they were facing something much more unusual, so they wouldn't be much help to them. And the man immediately asked, What is it? After all, the egg reached just over four meters. In order for the creature to hatch, one method was used. There is a dragon of emptiness in the shell, and it was amazing, wasn't it? Pant, upon hearing this, was shocked more and more, but then Edora interrupted and said that, as far as she knew, the spirits of the four elements originated inside the tower, and it was the right one. They originally dwelled in the outside world. This also applies to the Dragon of the Void, for it happened long before the origin of the tower, in another era, to be precise. And the man thought, so this egg could give birth to either a void dragon or a creature similar to it that would be as strong as that one, right? From which the elders said it was right. After all, this is likely how events will unfold. Now this egg, for some unknown reason, has mutated and grown to a size that is not normal. They need a moon seed to deal with it. It is one of the rare medicinal herbs that has been passed down from generation to generation in their clan. For others, it has no particular benefit, so they have not told anyone in about the existence of the seeds. And our hero wanted to get him and asked how he could do it. The man said he really needed it, and they possess them, don't they? Our hero said right. Why, 
The man immediately mouthed that in as he had heard from his daughter, it was a very valuable medicinal herb for their clan. To get even one of its roots, you have to grow the seed for fifteen years. Why, our hero said, as they realize he has nothing worthwhile with him, if they need a fee, it will be a little later. Why the man turned around and said they don't give out loans here. So our hero immediately wondered what Muwan might be interested in from the artifacts he had. Big Rid or Egin? But the man immediately said that it was not necessary to pay with some thing, for he was a fine warrior with outstanding abilities. After all, he should have heard about the war between the Red Dragon and Blue Flower Island by now, right? They will soon have to participate in it as mercenaries. And how about our hero offering his help too? Why, our hero was shocked, because the hidden quest, participate in the War of the Red Dragon and the Island of the Blue Flower, was opened. For the first time in decades, the One-Horned Clan expresses a desire to intervene in foreign affairs and are about to enter the war as mercenaries. Our hero needed to become a member of their army and take part in the war, as a reward for which he would receive an increase in the levels of relations with the Clan of Unicorns, as well as a Moon Seed. After all, the war between the Red Dragon and Blue Flower Island is a war of revenge that he must take part in, no matter what may happen. And our hero was looking for any excuse to get involved, and here the unicorns ask him to participate as a mercenary. After all, until the egg issue is resolved, participating in this war was a good chance for our hero. But don't they, the unicorns? adhere to absolute neutrality within the tower. And it's not that their actions are completely without explanation. The god of the battle spear from the Blue Flower Island is a human who comes from the clan of the One-Horned Clan. What had he done to make the One-Horned Clan go to the outside world? So our hero also asked if they would fight on the side of the island, to which the man said he was very bright. Ask the question, Will he still participate or not? After all, he could give him a day to think about it. But our hero didn't need that day, and he immediately said he would take part in the war. He said that the value of the money was not as important to him as the experience of participating in the war, which would help him in his further passage through the tower. I turned around, and the man said that our hero would take part in this war as an aid if anyone had any objections to that. And just as the man began to say it was settled, he saw a hand reach out. On insertion, the guy said he had an objection, but the man didn't understand what Chan was trying to say. And the guy immediately said, Father, looking at the man. But the man said it was an official meeting. He should be treated appropriately. The guy somewhat off the top of his head apologized, saying, My king... After all, a person from the outside world whose abilities they couldn't be sure of, hiring someone who hadn't even gotten past the eleventh floor, was unacceptable. And Adora immediately objected, because what he's saying is, he doesn't believe her and Pant's words, does he? To which the guy said exactly that. I mean, it's just a person. Adora also said he could be held responsible for those words to which the guy said, absolutely. And here already the king intervened, telling them to calm down. After all, if they want to wash each other's bones, they should do it somewhere else. Turning to the guy, he also said that it turns out that Chan doesn't trust Cain. The guy on the horse in the head said exactly that, to which the man said that since that was the case, they would just give our hero a test. After all, there's not much time left and they are performing in five days. What didn't our hero understand? Why so soon? But the king also said that there is nothing to be surprised about because they are the ones who start this war. This is the king's business. Shouldn't he effectively show up on the battlefield? Elsewhere, the men pondered that they now had to accept this player. It's more like a dumb joke. 
Blue Flower Island is the god of the battle spear, to which the other man wondered how long had it been since he had taken the place of the god of hand-to-hand -hand combat. After all, he had said he would restore it, and he himself had used up the yellow dragon's valuable internal energy. The man was furious at such a thing and shouted for a god like me to stop, because against him or not, Rian, their mate with whom they drive islands together, it would be better if they just skipped the whole statement about each other. After all, the most important thing for them right now is to decide how they will fight the coming war with the Red Dragon. As much as they know they are losing in terms of numbers of fighters. However, they have a sword that they do not have. I won't exaggerate to say they can provide that sword to the narcissistic king of summer. It seems to us that they need a breather before they go into full-scale war. And one of the guys asks, I don't understand what this is about, a respite. After all, it's worth it to deal with the four elements and solve any possible problems beforehand. The god of the battle sword grants goodies for the opening of the sixth and seventh. We should all get ready and head back. And they also got a message that the unicorn clan was moving out soon which meant that there wasn't much time left before the war started. After all, the sword god had already begun preparations before entering the battle. Everyone needs to do their work diligently, and that's how they should end their meeting. But one of the men asked the swordsman to stop, asking him the question, if he's going after the elements, where is he going to start? After all, he knows his brother and sister are about to move to the eleventh floor, and he doesn't want them to run into each other. In southern Phoenix, sitting under the moon, the king meditated and pondered that perhaps it would all be over. He asked his wife, to which she said a little more, but it was clear to the king that this was indeed the case. He asked his wife if he listened to her at all, for he was raring to go it alone, not listening to advice. He himself found his way to our village with the help of Adora, who has a talent for discernment. He could have reached his full potential, couldn't he? The king remarked that this was true, but what about the guy who got the blessing of death? He'd like to try to bring him up as an apprentice, if that's possible, of course. After the battle with Chan was over, the clan of Homogeneous had a small celebration in honor of the guests who had arrived, and they actually wanted to enjoy the remaining time before the war began. Our hero sat with a drink in his hand and watched the people who had so many smiles. They were all very joyful, but it didn't suit our hero. Just then, a man stepped in front of him and said that he was the youngest of the special unit. Our hero did not understand what was meant, and the man immediately said that why was he quietly sitting back, for he must join society and the elders would seek him out. There should be nine men in this squad, and he's one of them, kind of just a mercenary trying to restore military discipline, and it was funny. So our hero waved his hand and told him to back off, because he couldn't see anything. But the man got so angry and started yelling at our hero, but then Edora appeared and asked if there was any problem. The princess immediately stepped in and gave a posthumous greeting, saying it was no big deal. She just heard there was a newcomer to the squad and wanted to welcome him, to which the girl said she'd do separate training for the special unit and asked the man not to worry. The man, angry, looking at our heroes, turned around and started to leave, to which our hero said that it was not necessary, and the girl agreed with this, because she knows, but still so much fun at the holiday, she would not want to get into a fight. At his presence near our hero, she said that the egg had been carried to the elders, and they were certainly very grateful to him, for he had seen the elders' eyes light up, hadn't he? While he was in the fight, they asked if they could do research with the egg. Though it was a request, it was more like a plea, because this is such a rare chance for research. Leave it to them, as they won't harm the egg. And that greedy gleam in his eyes, I can't even remember it. And then the girl noticed the chain on her arm and said she hadn't noticed it before. But our hero, raising his hand, said that about this he would like to ask her something, but what? 
The girl asked the question, the only thing is, what is it? Can the girl use her ability to test this artifact? After all, what our hero knows about him has some limitations. The girl looked and realized it looked like handcuffs, but very ancient. But in terms of quality, it seems to be a special iron. It's not much, and they couldn't have been made of such material. She couldn't say for sure, but she thinks there must be a few more parts, since there are two more hidden somewhere. After all, there are three ways of apprehension. The first is handcuffs, like the one on his arm. The second is leg irons. Well, and in the final condo that is worn around the neck, they feel like they need to collect all three. After all, it is worth putting the remaining pieces together, and only then will he be able to free himself from the chains and restore the true function of the artifact. Our hero was surprised, for he had another request. After thinking about it for a bit, our hero said he wanted to learn the technique if there was any way. It's about a family technique that's only passed down in the one-horned family. Idora was shocked that our hero wanted to learn the technique of the warrior feat. But our hero understood that it was a special technique of the clan of one-horned men, and he had heard that none of the outsiders had ever learned it. So even Adora couldn't answer, and our hero didn't hold out much hope on that score. But the girl said that today her father was in good spirits, and she could try to persuade him. Perhaps he would give his permission after all. But our hero says it won't work, and he is well aware that he is asking for the impossible. If that doesn't work, he'll try to study it himself. The girl still came to the king and said that our hero wanted to learn the Mogon technique, and the king was shocked, but at this late hour she comes running to him with this question. I mean, it looks like his little girl likes that boy. Idora said that because in the future, Cain might become a shadow sword lord. Still, she kept saying he had her so hard. Idora therefore asked her father if he didn't think our hero was good. I told you she was right. After all, he has incredible potential and plenty of perseverance. And judging from her father's answer, the girl thought it meant agreement. But the man said no, for there was one but. After all, his daughter must remember the conditions associated with joining the next provinces, because in this hundred-year history of their clan, the only one who has learned the essence of the skill of foresight is her. She is soon to take her place as the next soothsayer. Therefore, she should prove that the man she has chosen is really worthy of it. So the girl said that she believes that he can fully handle everything. The man reflected, for his daughter, the hope of their clan, despite her young age, is intelligent and seriously preparing to walk the thorny path. At the same time, under the moonlight, our hero was walking and pondering about the girl's words when she talked about it being about quality, and it was like a special metal. But there isn't that much of him, and there would hardly be enough for them. Our hero thought it was the iron of Hephaestus. And is this really it, looking at the bracelet? After all, there are many artifacts that can increase magical power, as well as very important rare materials that are just as effective as them. And one of them is the Iron of Hepastus. It's not hard to guess that it's almost impossible to find him. Many even doubted its existence, but he was sure that this iron could be found. After all, what made him become what he is now is the very sword that was made from this iron, the very metal used to create the sword that struck his brother. If he can be restrained with this iron, then it turns out the king of darkness was human after all. Word must have gotten out about him. And while our hero was thinking about it, he met the very man who had molested him earlier. As the man walked by, he immediately turned to our hero, talking about how was he allowed to hang around so late. I mean, he could get lost. Yeah, I used to hide behind the princess and think I'd done him in, because he should try to deal with him by challenging him to a duel. And a time later, when it became morning, 
this same man with a not-so-cheerful face asked the question, Did he sleep well? Speaking of a good journey. And our hero, approaching the girl, immediately inquired in regard to his question. But she turned around in due time, thinking about the fact that they'd only just seen each other, and he was starting it all off so immediately. But another time still came successfully, and he is given access to the military book depository. Our hero didn't understand what it was about, to which the girl immediately said that it was the place where all the information about the Mugon technique was stored, which had been passed down from generation to generation. Throughout the entire Tower Passage, if explained in simple terms, the military book depository is divided into only four categories, gold, silver, copper, and iron. Guests from outside cannot access the copper class. Only the best fighters are allowed to do so. But he will have access to him. It seems the girl's father really cares for him. But he had one condition. Neither she nor Brother Pant must help him. He will have to concentrate on books on the Mugan technique and understand its essence on his own, without any help. And after four days, the father will personally check what he was able to accomplish. If he can show basic ability, he will become our hero's personal mentor. Why was our hero shocked? After all, he was personally willing to mentor him. Therefore, our heroes have a new quest. The king of the clan from Deer Muan, who was interested in his abilities, himself decided to arrange one test for him. So our hero should have gone through the copper and iron class military book depository and tried to find his own style of Mugan techniques. But as a reward, he would be able to get Muan's instruction, Mugong Bajiquan, and a shadow sword. Though our hero wasn't much interested in the two items, he was especially attracted to Muan's mentorship. After all, that sounds interesting enough for our hero. However, inventing his own technique, Mugan. All in four days, it was some unimaginable condition for our hero. He doesn't know what made Muan so interested. But this exam is a great chance for him, and our hero had to cope, regardless of the difficulty. So he immediately asked where he needed to go, and the girl took him to the location of the Iron Class Vault, and right behind it was the copper level. These guards will be keeping order, so unnecessary curiosity is not worth it. And just the girl wanted to say something, our hero immediately interrupted, saying that she didn't need to apologize for not being able to help in any way. After all, he is very grateful for the access to the vault, and now, first of all, he needs to find the right book among the others. Such a precious book must have passed through many hands. As he pulled out the book, he realized that this was it, internal energy and acupuncture points. As he read them, he realized that there were a lot of complicated words and he couldn't understand the meaning, but it couldn't be helped. If he can't understand it, he should at least learn it. But the girl was thrilled. She thought Cain already knew something about the technique, didn't he? But how had he guessed to pick up a book on meditation? After all, by mastering it, he will form the basis for learning the technique. But even so, it's going to take a lot of time. Will he be able to learn it as quickly as possible? And at first, our hero's reading speed was very slow, but if he read the whole thing, and then the next book, and then more as he accumulated what he read, the speed also increased. Words, the meaning of which he still did not understand, lingered in his mind. But even so, he couldn't grasp the basic meaning of the content. Filling the bowl with a lot of information is not a good idea. First, you need to enlarge the bowl that will be filled with something. The same with magic power. You need to focus on its circulation and on calculating the possibilities of the magic circuit. All this time, he had been concentrating on accumulating magic power, but he hadn't even thought about the fact that he could try to expand the magic target itself. So he realized that he needed to concentrate on strengthening her. After that, 
the magic power itself will begin to circulate as later. After he finished reading the first batch of books, he turned around and saw more books in front of him. He should read the rest of it. Magic, inner spiritual power, and energy channels all form the flow of mana. It constantly circulates within the body, increasing the potential and capabilities of a person. The main goal is to store energy within the body through the respiratory process. Magic moves through the lingual channels and the physical strength of the body increases in proportion to the amount of mana in the body. Energy power is needed to control magical power. It acts as a vessel for mana. The result of magic in each energy channel is a single link in the magical chain. The royal family has in-depth knowledge on this topic, but they can only abide by this rule through their own endeavor. Our hero realized that he was only a human being, and there was a huge difference between him and the royal family. He needs to form these energy points, and it is better to call them nuclei. Our hero needed to install cores in all magic channels. If he could control them properly, it wouldn't be difficult for him to control magic power. Therefore, a new concept of magic chain was developed, and an unknown royal family technique was discovered. In addition, our hero learned that some gods and demons of the 98th floor had shown interest in our player. He realized they were watching him. But for some unknown reason, creatures from the 98th floor watch the world below 77 closely. If they like a certain player, they might even gift him something. For it was the same with Hermes, who offered him the place of an apostle. In addition, through a message, he reiterated his interest. But that only happens to a few, and even Chan hadn't gotten any such messages. Is this really such a unique phenomenon? But only one thing was clear to our hero. He was on the right track. First, our hero should have considered the features. He could easily access the mana inside his body, and the amount of energy stored increased greatly, and the speed of recovery increased. Not only did he have access to a large amount of energy, but now, once his mana was depleted or completely spent, his recharge rate increased. The faster the turnover of energy consumption and accumulation was, the higher the efficiency of magic power utilization became. For the player, it was like getting an ability you could only dream of. Then comes rank, and the amount of mana accumulated increases greatly. He can use various mythic attributes without restriction. Not only was he able to gain 15 units of magic power, but he was also able to increase his skill level in skills. However, there is a very important point. It is the use of magical attributes without restriction. This means he can even use attributes that were originally incompatible, such as Aegis and Black Bracelets. With the attainment of such a title, all restrictions disappear. The last skill he gained was the ability to recycle unused mana into magical energy. Processing speed increases in proportion to skill level. With meditation and breathing techniques, he can obtain the purest mana, which can be accumulated in the form of magical power. Unleashing internal energy increases the power of recycled magical power, and power efficiency varies with skill level and current potential, increasing the discharge. This skillet makes the magic chain more effective, though its discharge is the lowest. But now is not the time to think about how to improve it. After all, he has succeeded in mastering some of the basics, and now he needs more in-depth training and has the materials in front of him to learn. The girl opened her eyes and realized that she seemed to have fallen asleep at some point. Rubbing her eyes, she realized that today was only day three. But how was our hero? Looking at the guy, she was surprised. For that look, she guessed what it meant because she had experienced it before. Pant and the others from their clan, for it is comparable to Kitanium in the mist. Only he felt like he was clearly caught up in something at this point. Technique Mugan was really becoming her personality. 
That's how he feels after finally climbing to the top. It meant only one thing. But just as she began to think, something incomprehensible happened, and the guards were shocked at what was happening. And unperturbed? Was that possible? Our hero was able to unlock eight bonding points, and is it really possible to do all that in four days? It means he was able to reach the right level. Turning around, he saw Edora standing in front of him. Even though she'd been watching him all these days, she had the feeling she was looking at a different person. He was intense. But our hero also said he was hungry and he would like to have something to eat. And the girl brought him something to eat, who, in turn, realized it was because he overcame himself at times. But now he felt free enough to even talk to Adora. After all, once the flow of energy opened up, the magic chain began to become more and more perfect. Our hero was able to open 36 nuclei, and this was the first stage of the magic chain transformation, which was completed successfully. The current process was 97%. Our hero realized that this is a good job because there are only 360 energy points in the human body. It is important to locate the 36 points where the mythical energy is concentrated. Cores are needed to collect and concentrate mana. Although the magic power within the chain has been greatly reduced, but its effectiveness is many times greater than what it was before. Adora asked our hero if he had finished cooking. The guy replied that he was 95% done, with only 5% left. Though it's the basics, he created his own Mugan technique. In three days, he had achieved near completion, even though he had no previous knowledge of it. So the girl asked if perhaps he was missing something, but the guy replied that every Mugan style probably has its own specialty, whether it's a third-party or second-party style. Everyone has their own goal, and they focus on completing the vessel formation. The law of three beginnings includes the energies of heaven and earth. The heavenly dragon technique imitates it by concentrating internal energy. If you dig deeper, you'll find techniques such as Shingo, Magan, and Tokan. Everything he's accomplished so far is just the basics. If he wants to gain full knowledge of this technique, he must acquire the specialty, but he can't do that yet. So the girl asked him if he had any other ideas, to which the guy replied that he didn't yet. So the girl didn't understand what he was going to do, but he needs to do some searching in the copper vault enclosure again. With all the books available to him, he realized that he only had one day left and he had to find what he needed. The elder and the king sat at a table studying different scrolls. Throwing one of the scrolls, the man said he couldn't concentrate. After all, what good things have happened lately that the king is always smiling? Will he be able to explain what happened? But he, in turn, said that today was the day. But the man didn't realize which day he was referring to. Today they will test how good their fiancé is. But now the man realized what it was all about. After all, is Edora really going to trust him with a shadow sword? But the king said it looked like it. And after all, he hadn't been through a tutorial very long ago but he had already climbed 30 floors to meet someone like him. It's not easy to meet someone like him. However, it's a shame that you can't see his face because of the mask. But the king remarked that he was a handsome man, to which the man doesn't understand. How did he know that? After all, his smile suggests he's hiding something else, and you need to make it right. After all, to learn the Mugan technique in four days... How can you give such impossible challenges? He realizes that he can take everything with his own hands, but if he overextends himself, he will only meet increasing resistance. Even he couldn't pull it off when he was young, and they called him a genius. So the man immediately said he was interested in what was up with the egg, and the other man picked up on the fact that he had changed the subject so discreetly. But the further they get, the harder it is to determine what's inside, but it's entirely possible that it's a divine-level being, and he'll give the details later, 
So far, they've checked everything out. But the man swept up what he thought was going to be something grand. Now let's see how their groom did his homework. The king savvy that our hero should ask. His daughter Marilla a question. Does she starve him? But looking at the gleam in his eyes, you'd think he'd accomplished more than he expected. So our hero asked if he could start now. To which the man said sure. And our hero remained focused. After that, he began to release incredible firepower, which the king was delighted with. After all, just look at this rascal, and the girl was also shocked at what our guy was able to do. Until this moment, the name by which all of our hero's thoughts were known was hidden in his chest, Heavenly Wings Mastery. Heaven's Wings was his brother's longtime nickname. The king has swept up that he is a real monster, but did he do it by imitating him? To which our hero said he was the strongest among those he knew. So the king smiled and told him not to flatter him. After all, he focused on maximizing his striking power and the power of destruction. It looked like he was trying to achieve balance using the technique of Huang Ya's ghost knight method, but he was focusing more on its components than on Huang. Our hero asked for an explanation of the reason, but it seemed to the man that he wanted it explained to him simply because, as it was said, a glance was enough. Thinking back to earlier events when he was just learning the concept that their brothers like Yule were saying the same thing, he realized that they were apparently such geniuses that they could read people with passive skills. Nevertheless, he passed his exam and came third, so the king congratulated our hero. The quest was successfully completed. Muwan's exam was passed. As a reward, our hero was given the opportunity to learn the Mugan technique from Muwan. Having trained and reached a higher level, he was also granted the right to study Bajikiyufan. As the king had promised, he would now instruct him in the basics of the Mugong technique and impart knowledge of Bajikiyufan. As he knows, they're going to war soon, and he can be around him as a receiver and learn everything. The king also handed the book of Bajikyufan to our hero. The king will only show him once and will not repeat it again. Our hero realized that by being near the king during the fighting, he would be able to watch him fight. If he used the dragon eyes, he would be able to achieve more success, but he wanted to ask the king for something else, to which the man said, questions again. But he can still ask, and our hero said he had just received a shadow sword as a reward. What does that mean? Muwan said that when the time came, he would tell everything. But it's not going to happen now. Our hero then said that he was the third person to pass his exam. Can he find out who the two men are? Mu Wan's point is that he wants to be first everywhere. After all, there was one person he had to see. After all, he's pretty famous. He's the god of the sword. Sword god. He is the foremost among the five masters of the Blue Flower Island. There are none in the tower who are his equals in sword skills. There are rumors that they even recognized his sword technique. It turns out this man was the first to pass the test. But who's the other one? This is where the man said it was a secret. It's not because he doesn't want to speak. Even if he does, he still won't understand. And it's probably some influential person that the public doesn't know about. But the last thing our hero wanted to ask was for Mu Wan to show real strength. Our hero wanted to see the true power of the king. Muwan was of course shocked that he wanted to see his strength, but then he realized that it was very difficult to fulfill the role of a mentor. But he should still show it off, but he didn't know what, since he didn't usually show it off on purpose. He will make an exception for him, but he should watch very carefully, for one of the techniques of Bajikwan is Heaven's Breakthrough. Using his strength, he even tore his shirt and delivered a crushing blow towards our hero. Our heroes were shocked by a blow that did pass by, and it all happened so fast that our hero didn't see much of anything. But he absolutely caught what Muwan was hiding, and it was the look of a beast. 
And then there was a massive explosion of radiance behind our hero, wrapping even Idora, who was shocked. Looking at it, our hero and the girl were shocked. But after a while, it dragged on again, and our hero realized that this couldn't be happening. I mean, that's impossible. Turning around, the king said that it had been a long time since he had used his strength. Even his shoulders were slack. But our hero had to see it through. They're going to meet tonight anyway, so our hero shouldn't be late. And of course, he turned to his daughter to feed our hero, because he looks gaunt, and suddenly people will think that they do not feed him at all. And the king has things to do, so he will deviate from them. And as the king walked away, our hero realized that one day he would surpass him. Muan grabbed his hand as he returned to his place, and then a voice said it was a pretense to get his way. After all, he was overdoing it, trying to prove his might, knowing that the elders would be in the sky, and the other clans wouldn't approve either. Is he out of his mind? But it was the wife, and the man also said that there were children looking at him, and he could not show his weakness, especially the mentor should initially look like an insurmountable goal, then the student will have enthusiasm. But then the man's wife asked, what if the enthusiasm fades? But he has other reasons besides that. Now the man must be satisfied. I mean, he wasn't going to do it, was he? Muan said he was happy with everything from the beginning and it exceeded his expectations. It was the same with the god of the sword. This guy passed his test in just four days, though others took a month. Of course he should put the same amount of effort and diligence into it. Isn't that what balance is all about? For thus comes the night of war's entry. Muan stood before his people, calling for attention. After all, they are all shaking from having to go out into the outside world for the first time in such a long time. Are they scared? After all, he is personally ready to make sure that there are no such cadres, and they should not make their king blush and disgrace himself in battle. Otherwise, they will have to look for another king. But then there was an altercation between the two boys, for one was asking the other a question. Is this worth watching? To which the guy said he deserved it, and our hero realized that he would never get used to such atmospheres. Muan also went on to say that one way or another, don't even think of dying. For those who die, he will personally find them in hell, enough for a year, and bring them back to this world. Did they understand him? Everyone immediately shouted, that's right. And he raised his hand and shouted that they were moving out because it was time to party heartily, throwing papers to everyone which everyone immediately began to tear and teleport away. Our hero, despite one of them, realized it was finally time. Thinking back to my brother, out after Red Dragon Moon and Zhongwado, the first act of the war between the two clans has begun. It was the eleventh floor of the world inside dreams. The king sat near the rock, looking up at the moon. Our hero, approaching the king, addressed him for it was likely that he called him Muan. The king turned around and said that was right, for he thought he should teach him Bajiquan before they began the siege of the city to the chickens. Starting today, he will master one move a day, so he should make sure he keeps his eyes wide open, because he has already said he doesn't teach anything more than once, our hero realized. The guy immediately replied that he understood, so Muan said the kid at least answers, Okay. As he already knows, martial arts are broken down into three parts, Shim, Kai, Che. Shim is Nagan, or what he calls Mana, in other words, content. Che is a vessel, he says of Danten and the body itself. Ki is the thread that connects the two, allowing for the proper use of Mugon. The sword skill, Kwacha combat, denotes these things. The Bajiquan he wants to learn is the best chi. After all, Muan was the one who created it, and that is why it is the best Bajiquan, not just a martial skill. If he uses a sword, it becomes a sword skill, 
If a spear, it becomes a spear skill. That's exactly how it works. But the king does not like to be fastidious about weapons, and his lecture seems to be going on too long. Now he will show them one by one, and our hero should watch carefully. The first one is Ganbo. Next up is Tagak. Iguan. Watching these movements, they are crisp and concise. The placement of the hand steps. They follow the flow of energy that envelops them. It's not just a coincidence. The martial arts king follows this flow. Muwan, showing, said that this is the first group of steps. There are a total of 32 groups of Bajiquan steps. They are called Gongon Chinchin. Even if it was the first group, it consists of 464 different small steps, and he joked about promising to show only once. Of course, a beginner will never be able to memorize it the first time. The man wanted our hero to be honest and said that he would not memorize his steps, for it was the great master who would teach him step by step. Asked if he could do it, our hero also said he had it all memorized. The man was shocked, but the guy said it would be okay if he started now. Performing move after move, he approached the man rather quickly, asking if everything was correct. From which Muan was shocked, for he had indeed memorized from the first time. Confirming that he had done the right thing, after all, he wouldn't be his student if he had already encountered problems, would he? For now we move on to the next group. After all, he had successfully learned Bajiquan, and the skill was established. The art of dots and eights. It can be used with sword and spear. It is a highly ranked Mugon. Step 8 the 3G divination each performs. Step 8 the 3G increases strength by 5% with increasing skill. The link between each step can stop up to 40%. Mana 8 points improves sense and blocks blind spots, so our hero uses mana more effectively. Therefore, the second and third sections of Bajiquan remained, and our hero needs to find the rest of the pieces and complete the skill. Muwan confirmed, as he expected, that he was decently trained in Bajiquan, and as his student, he was obligated to do at least that. His brother and sister, watching all this, realized that he was embarrassed and in shock. Our hero felt his mana circulation was smoother, and he only learned the base, so it will take some time to get used to it, but he wants to test it out. Turning to the man, Your Majesty, but then the man interrupted, saying, Master. After all, he is his apprentice, so why is he calling him king? He should call him master. But our hero asked to leave the battle in Kurama to him. But the man was shocked and immediately said no. After all, it's not their clan that's responsible for this. And there are those who want to have a good stretch too. But they really need to find out how much he's learned. Watching the other players, he had a great idea. The events take place in the city of Kuram. Red Dragon Division, White Dragonian, Captain of the Eighth Squad, Shannon, was shocked by the attack. They immediately assumed that it was the Laser Sword Clan, but no, it was a homogeneous clan that made the attack. That's impossible. They've never interfered in the affairs of other clans. So why now? But what is it? Don't tell him it's a martial arts king. It was he who dealt a crushing blow towards the enemies. And because the role was so strong, he immediately smote everything in his path, and only a couple people were left. When he approached one of them, he asked if he wanted to live to which the man immediately said he could give him a chance. And after a moment, Pont noticed someone flying toward them. And he had something in his hand. Nobody realized what it was. It was a man. As he flew up, the king landed, flipping off two guys, and Pant immediately said that now he's also kidnapping people. To which the man told the man to be quiet. After all, he says he wants to test his martial arts, they should fight. But the guys didn't know what they were talking about. But pointing his finger at our heroes, he told them to fight that guy over there. Whoever defeats him will live. How do they look at his proposal?
Five people agreed to accept the duel. Our hero realized that Muwan had promised to give him a chance to stretch, but he couldn't have imagined that he'd come up with the idea. Although the martial arts king's presence pressured everyone, they were actually all capable fighters. Will our hero be able to fight them as equals? But that doesn't mean he has to give up. So our hero agreed, because this is a great chance for him to test Bajiquan and the skill of heavenly wings. The rules of the bout are simple. They will determine the winner and loser in a one-on-one -on -one match. All they have to do is step forward according to the line and they can decide for themselves who goes after whom. The men looked at each other and made a decision on who would go first. He may be an unknown on the 11th floor, but he's still a rookie. The man couldn't imagine fighting the newcomer. He told our hero to attack first, for that was the only advantage it would give him. Our hero Ali, taking his blade, made a stand. Muwan immediately announced the start of the fight. Our hero, using the skill of celestial wings, began to attack his opponent, from which the man didn't realize what speed it was, and it was very dangerous. He needed to increase the distance between them, but our hero wasn't going to just let him go. Bajiquan and the mastery of celestial wings. They didn't work together at first, the movements didn't match the magic, so he focused on bringing them together, Shim, Ki, and Che. And in using the movement of the flow to swing his blade, he soon learned that everything now worked in harmony, as if it had been created specifically for him optimal movement. He sees it, for he was able to see the best path and attack his opponent. Muwan immediately told the next one to attack. And there are four opponents already. He never thought he'd have to fight, but it still looks like he's at his limit, and he should be careful with him. Even if he sees, no, even if he was at his best, he'd be a strong opponent. This guy's a half-ranker. Ranker, a title given to the strongest players, sorted by Tower Floor. These are mostly players who have started to sort themselves out at the 50th floor and beyond, but the 50th floor should not be underestimated. It is much harder than the 49th, as it is worth being proud of. Even the strongest players either give up or fail on this floor. It is also called the Barrier Zone. Players who are close to losing on floor 50 are often called challengers or semi-rankers. To use it to his advantage, he would have to fight the eight clans alone. In this case, he needs to win and even prank the ninth kings, hence the battle with the half-rankers. The best way to quickly surpass your limits and become stronger, but here's a guy who decided to ask for a favor because, regardless of the outcome of the battle, he would want to save his subordinates. And to what our hero was shocked, pushing the guy away who immediately said that, frankly, he was very scared on the way here and couldn't help but think about his subordinates. But he knows they met as opponents, but he's not cold-blooded enough to kill the surrendered either, right? Our hero realized that this guy doesn't plan to win the battle because anyone can see that the advantage is in his hands. He doesn't know what caused it, but his willingness to die means that our hero needs to be ready for it too, and he decides to destroy it at once. It's because he's a semi-ranker. It's completely different from those four, no matter how hard our hero attacks. Our hero fails to find a gap in his defense. He is quite strong in defense, but his attacks are seen by our hero. And at some point he did find a gap the top of his left forearm. With his attack, he still managed to hit the guy, and the guy realized that he wouldn't be able to dodge in time. Our hero realized that he didn't have time to dodge his opponent's attack. Putting up a shield still received the strongest blows, from which he immediately flew off. Our hero, raising his head, did not understand how this could have happened, for he was sure to hit him, and there could be no mistake. But our hero seems to have missed something. As he flew over his opponent and looked at his back, he realized that this time it was twice already. But then his opponent abruptly turned around and prepared to attack, dealing heavy damage to our hero. But what was it? After all, 
the energy had suddenly disappeared, and what was even happening here, our hero did not understand. This sense of anxiety is noticeably heightened. He doesn't need to let himself be fooled, or it will ruin him. The opponent at both Osek was realized. Wow, because he probably doesn't know what a hocho is. And as soon as our hero heard that word, he didn't understand what it was. But his opponent said it was impossible, and it's a common mistake for martial arts beginners. As it is, he doesn't care. Because he can still use this technique, in the end only one will be left alive. As he approached our hero, he realized that he was very fast, his movements were different than before, and all the while, his main goal was to discover our hero's weaknesses. The opponent swung his sword. The opponent started throwing punches. At this rate, he'll be dead soon. There is no way to avoid this blow, nor is there any way to repel it. It was only now that he realized that he couldn't even reduce the damage because there were absolutely no solutions or ways out of this situation. He will not be able to change anything, and the only thing left is to accept his doom. But at the last moment, the foresight skill was activated, and after reviewing all the outgoing events, our hero was stabbed with a dagger. He was immediately surprised, for how is it? He was sure he had dodged. But our hero made a knight move, and the opponent didn't know about it yet. And already our hero's rival was lying on the floor. It is said that, fortunately, his subordinates survived. Our hero wondered if he was afraid of death, to which the guy replied that he was not, because before coming here, he was out of his skin, because he wanted to live. Looking at Muwan taking care of him, Everyone who has abandoned him pops up in front of his eyes, and what a shame to lose. But still, he is the leader. Our hero was shocked by this outcome, because at that moment, the thought flashed through his mind. Chonu, if someone like Shannon had been on his side at that moment, he wouldn't have met such an end. The brother and sister betrayed our hero, and Mawan immediately said it was worth it because he knew he could defeat him. But our hero was interested in what Hocho was, and the master said it was fake. Not even that. It was too different from fake moves. But in essence, it looks like a hoax, and the only difference is whether it actually was one. After all, that explanation would make more sense when he intended to stab him with his sword. He had several options. He could immediately attack, parry the blow, and he could deflect the contact or put his sword away altogether. And in that moment, he chose one of the possibilities. Our hero realized that he had chosen the opportunity according to the situation. The master said that it was right, because according to the situation with the help of reaction and prudence among all possible outcomes, our hero chose the only right one. However, if he chooses one of the options, he thus generates two new ones. It was only now that our hero began to realize that this was a trap, and one could say so. After all, he can choose a different outcome of the attack, also may not interrupt, so he can act directly. Hakho is the power that allows him to choose the outcome. Only those who have developed their key can achieve this. To the limit for him, who has recently started learning by Jiquan, it is quite difficult, and to tell the truth, Hocho is not so perfect to reach a certain level of this technique. It's easier if he's developed a sixth sense. Hocho and sixth sense are similar. They cannot be acquired as a normal skill and can only be achieved by maximizing your physical skills. And it seems he has no choice but to constantly temper his body, our hero realized, and so ended the first battle between the Red Dragon and Flower Island. In the resort, the eleventh floor is a large forest. A group of players moved out, with a separate man, and then Phoenix realized there was something there, called his Chirik. And the very next day in town, our heroes were sitting around and Pant was telling our hero that he seemed to be feeling much better and might not fight just one round this time. Our hero, after calling Pant's name, 
only told him to be quiet if he didn't want to end up hanging by his feet from a tree. The guy immediately lowered his head and got upset and said he was heartless, starting to walk away. But our hero tried to concentrate on Hoch Ho's technique. But then at some point he remembered Chirik and opened his eyes. The brother and sister left the lodge and Pont began to wonder what he was thinking about again. And besides, he had heard that Uncle Plan would be traveling today. The girl confirmed for he had said he would join them soon, and the lad thought nothing good could be expected from his visit. And the girl should reconsider after our hero, so to speak, take this chance, and so be it, he will play along with her. The girl was immediately angered by such words, but she realized that he was saying the same thing as her father. But then the door flew open sharply behind her back. It was our hero who kicked in the door and immediately flew out of the room, but the girl didn't realize where our hero was going. But our hero moved swiftly, for he sensed Cherik's fear. But he didn't understand what could have happened there to make the chick so afraid. Walking into Phoenix's territory, he was shocked, but he didn't feel her presence. With a strike, he smashed the rocks that blocked the way into the cave. Looking in, he saw something. In the distance, beneath the rocks, he noticed a light. Moving closer, he did find Charik. But what happened to Phoenix, and the premonition did not deceive him. Something really terrible has happened here. The bird's memory spoke of him being arrogant and told Phoenix that he knew that the likes of him ended the same way, after all. And we were shown how Phoenix, the very man who said he was guessing. But it does. He said the outcome will be a little different this time around. And it was to Mucin. Among all the eight clans of the Blue Flower Island, it is considered the smallest, and there is only one reason for that. Five of them are Musins. They are a deity of the martial arts. Even among the rankers, they are considered one of the strongest, and one of them is Thomason. He was in Phoenix's hideout, attacking him. Our hero held the chick and realized that Phoenix was dead. His mood immediately changed drastically. After all, Blue Flower Island is now cooperating with the One-Horned Clan, and he can't take Cherik with him and transfer him directly to Blue Flower Island. He'll have to leave the One-Horned Clan. But then some sacred being appeared behind our hero and told him to look like the kid from the show, and thank goodness she's calm now. Our hero realized it was Phoenix telling him not to be upset about her death, for she is destined to return to life again, reborn from the ashes, and though she is now gone, she will soon open her eyes again. And apparently, those were the last thoughts. Doom is doom. Even if one being is reborn, it will be a completely different being. She was worried about our hero to the last and was afraid he might make the wrong decision but she had a request that he would please watch the little ones until she returned. Of course, she wouldn't leave him empty-handed. Some processes have begun to take place, and though it is a small power, it will help him and the baby on the path that is laid out for them. And our hero received the inheritance and said, Life magical purpose prepared for acceptance, and hid the life body, starting the whole inheritance process. Our hero realized that he had gotten hot enough, for this is a power left behind by the phoenix that cannot be missed. On our hero, all magical chains were unlocked. The transfer was completed, and he was given the title of Phoenix Heir. Fire affinity is increased by 30 units, and he inherits partial mastery of fire. By doing so, he had reached 100% of the development progress of the flame skill, and the fire wind skill was now available to him. The fire wind skill has been modified using the fire mastery, and the highest form of the skill, sacred fire, is now available to him. Strengthening the body, the deity level has been raised by one step, and the current inheritance process has resumed reaching a level of 99.8%. Our hero's vessel is enlarged. And it's good, of course, that all the magical circuits have been uncovered. 
But why is the phoenix energy located next to the stone and you can't move it? The sacred fire symbolizes the phoenix, the bird that embodies the powers of resurrection and rebirth to life. The sacred fire is also called the fire that fell from heaven to earth and was desired by many gods. The air-burning magic power and curse has unimaginable dark magic power. The higher the skill level, the faster the recovery rate. Sacred fire is known as the fire that fell to the ground, and it holds an undeniable primacy among the other types and has the strongest resistance. It also gives you the ability to control fire. A skillet with an ordinal number is indeed a very valuable gift. Our hero, turning to Chirik, asked him if he wanted to find other mythical creatures. After all, our hero never thought he could meet someone in the same position as him, such a sweet and warm creature. So our hero decided with Chirik to look for them together, but then Idora appeared, and our hero questioned how she found him. But the girl immediately said that he had popped out of the village so quickly, and she was worried, so she followed him. But what is this place? Asking the girl, our hero replied that he used to live here, and somehow the island of the blue flower was up to hunting mythical creatures. As he passed by, he said he wasn't expecting any help, for he also had no intention of asking her to leave her clan and follow him. But he hopes she won't stop him. The girl thought a little and said she would go with him then. But the guy thought the decision was made because she felt guilty, but the girl said that wasn't the case. After all, she just wants to help, and truth be told, she doesn't have a good feeling about the blue flower island that keeps hanging around their tribe. But the boy realized that it was unlikely her father would approve, but the girl said wasn't that what he was going to do, being his apprentice. Our hero, despite the girl, smiled and said he would go first, as he knew the way. So the girl agreed with him. Our heroes, along with Idora, came to the dragon territory on the east side, and what they saw made them realize they were too late. But then a voice appeared, saying he was a fated player and knew what happened here. Our hero realized that it was the dragon's soul, in which case he replied to him that he had a guess. So the dragon said he wanted revenge by getting his power in return. After all, it's not a bad idea, and the dragon likes that sort of thing, since these wretched humans not only woke him up, but also took his heart and inner strength. Except it's not his style to calmly await resurrection by interrupting into oblivion. Anyway, he trusts our hero with something. Recognizing the dragon of nothingness is a hidden quest. The test of the dragon of nothingness has been successfully completed. He has received the dragon's blessing not to be. I have, as a reward, the level of intimacy with the dragon of nothingness increased. However, there is a huge difference in strength between him and those people, and he will reduce it a bit. To begin with, the draconic being offers him a second challenge. A divine being of the East, the dragon Oblivion, asks our hero to take revenge on those who disturbed his dream. Our hero must embrace the power granted by the dragon of nothingness and avenge him. The more fluent with it and the more terrible the punishment, the higher the reward. Thereby the contract was concluded. Our hero has received the blessing of the dragon of nothingness and the title Counterpart of the Dragon of Nothingness. As he made his way north of the Abyss Turtle's territory, he heard the soul again, asking him what he needed, for he was late. But immediately they questioned whether he wanted to get. There was no doubting them, and our hero said of course he wanted and asked for them. That was why he had received the blessing of the Abyss Tortuese. Our hero was also given an assignment. The party of the Abyss offers our hero a challenge following the phoenix and dragon oblivion. The tortoise of the abyss has no interest in being together. It is more important to her to find a successor for the northern lands to take her place and purify a mythical creature worthy of taking her place. But our hero didn't realize who the successor was. Soul said there were two of them, 
so they were able to live a doubly fulfilling life and even after their deaths, they have no regrets. But still, there's something that keeps them going. After all, they left no heir, so they ask our heroes to help them, and they will watch what happens from the stikes. After saying this, they immediately began to disappear and our hero gained the title of Deputy Tortoise of the Abyss. His affinity level with the element of water increased by 50 units. The affinity level with the ice element increased by 50%, and the Blue Spirit Blessings skillet was obtained. By doing so, our hero gained a new skill, Blue Spirit Blessing, and this skill only really works during the Abyss Tortoise Challenge. The spirit by which the blessing of all divine beings is conflicted and stable was presented to him. This is a unique skill that can only be obtained by those who have been chosen by the Tortoise Abyss. Depending on your skill level, the number of features can increase, and our hero got a skill he really needed. Chirik, hear about Chirikov, our hero. He said that was right, for they were going west now, and there was only one mythical creature left alive. And in a moment, our hero, sitting on a log, was looking at the cook. A girl stood in front of him and asked him a question. What should I do? After all, the tiger of the blade is safe now. But there's a but. When talking to him, he said it was funny. After all, they want him to leave his home. After all, they are the ones who should go away and he will sort out his own problems. Or they should leave him the child that our hero holds in his arms, because he will help him become stronger. The girl realized what a rude creature he was, but our hero said that his pride would not allow him to leave him, even on his deathbed. But the girl said if she could share her opinion, to which our hero asked her if she had any ideas. And the girl immediately said that first of all, they should leave this place, as it was different from the previous. Mythical creatures had refused their help, and they had done everything they could for it. Our hero agreed, because he thinks it's really true, so the girl suggested that we return to the Island of the Blue Flower, but our hero said they can't do that, as they can't be around them because of Tarek. Our hero made the decision that he would take the egg and go to the Red Dragon, but then the girl noticed an explosion and she was shocked, for it was very strong. Turning around, she told our hero that the attack had begun and he realized that Charik should watch carefully, for they would have to hit them all. Using a shared view, they began to watch from the sidelines. Enough times, and he realized that they were the nine devil swords that Tomosin had collected on the different floors of the tower, asking questions about what kind of swords they are. Amazing, because Tomosin is so powerful that looking at his madness, you'd think he was possessed or possessed of black magic attacking the white tiger. And at that moment, the white tiger collapsed to the floor, and our hero opened his eyes, realizing that this was happening now. As he approached consciousness, he realized that Tomlinson seemed to have left a short time ago. The white tiger addressed our hero with the words that he had come to laugh at him, but our hero said, could it be done that way? After all, it was his choice. Then why did he come back? After all, if he hoped to get something out of it like the rest of them, he'd better disappear from his eyes. After all, he's not going to leave a legacy to the people. But our hero smiled and said he didn't say he would beg. Extending his hand, he began to absorb the power using Bathory's sword. He received his opponent's energy and magic power, making the white tiger not understand why he didn't stop and remove his hands. But it has already been confirmed to rapidly strengthen the body and increase physical strength. The inheritance process is 99.8% restored. Biotier said that our hero was nothing, and how could he suffer at the hands of a human? But our hero did not stop absorbing, and after a few seconds the inheritance process was completed. The current level of progress was 99.9%. .9%. The title of Tiger Blade Kidnapper was obtained. Our hero has successfully gained the power of all four magical creatures and the title of 
Phoenix Air. The counterpart of the Dragon Oblivion, the Deputy Skull of the Abyss, and the Tiger Blade Kidnapper had been merged into one. He was given a new title, Heir of Divine Beings. This title is awarded to a player who has been recognized by all divine beings on Floor 11, which is proof that the divine being has accepted it. An effect of 15% resistance to all attributes and a level of control over all souls, including the souls of mythical beings, has been increased. Also, while receiving the blessings of divine beings, his hidden skills began to manifest. Our hero realized that taking damage with Bathory's sword could be considered a repeat death. From his hand, our hero received a soul, and bringing it close to his pet, he fed it. With that, the phoenix cub, Charik, successfully absorbed the orb from the soul and evolved under the influence of dark energy. The phoenix creature changed its appearance. Its wings and tail changed color. All the tests were completed, but our hero did not understand what had happened. And, it turns out, Charik is also a divine being. The system also seems to have recognized his level of affection and assigned him a task. From that point on, he must raise his own mythical creature. Charik thanked our hero for feeding him, and the guy said he should thank him. Our hero, along with the girl, approaching the town, realized it was their tiny little phoenix. After all, you can feel the energy in it, which is quite enough to hunt magical creatures. But our hero immediately, responding to the name of the Edora girl, said that he was grateful for everything, but she had better get back to the others upon her arrival in Vakure. But the girl didn't understand what our hero was talking about, and the guy explained, because there might be a situation where he'd have to cross swords with a clan of one-horned men, and he didn't think it was a good idea to drag her into it. The girl was shocked at this, and very much upset, lowering her eyes. She said that he was saying that without knowing the real reasons why she was helping him. Left in silence, Cherik immediately asked if they were going to mate, and what the girl and the guy were shocked, and our hero asked where he learned such expressions. To which Phoenix said that his mom told him he had to do that too when he grew up and found a mate and our hero wondered why the phoenix had chosen to tell such a small fledgling. Our hero, along with a girl entering the city, saw a man with a spear standing in front of them and were shocked to look at him. Our hero realized that they had decided to hold a rendezvous with the island of the Blue Flower. But the girl said she had heard that her uncle was due to arrive today. And our hero realized it was Chang Musin. I mean... That's what happened. It was the Chan Musin plan. In the One Horn clan, he is known for his peculiar spear technique. It is also considered one of the strongest contenders among the members of the Sharp Deep Flower. The man, looking at our hero and the girl, was surprised. A guy and a girl just walked by, about which the man, looking at our hero, was surprised, for it seems his brother had picked up some apprentice again. Our hero went in to see the foreman, and he immediately asked the question, what good things have happened in the meantime? But the guy was already wondering if he had guessed right away, to which the master said as he sat there with a face as if he had gathered himself. Our hero immediately apologized to the teacher. He came to tell him something, because he wants to leave the one-horned clan. The man was furious as soon as he heard this, clenching his teeth, he spewed out energy saying that he had gotten everything he wanted and now he felt threatened and decided to leave them. But our hero said no way, to which the foreman asked what happened then and what was the matter. The guy realized after a bit of thought that they had a seer, therefore it would be difficult to continue to hide the truth, and immediately said that such a thing happened. You found the master said, I'm a fool again from the island, oh, Bogotka something. Threw the tube at our hero right in his face anyway. He said he was a rascal, for what does the teacher-student relationship mean to him? 
Our hero did not understand in what sense it meant, and the master immediately said that not much time had passed since they had met, but still treated him as his own son and put all his efforts into his training. He does it from the bottom of his heart, but he apparently treats it differently because he feels obligated to live up to what happened and even as he doesn't ask for help or beg for it, not to nag. Really, you're not going to do anything like that. Just stop being their student. Careless boys, listen up, master. The teacher-student relationship is no different than the parent-child relationship. Let parents bond with children by blood, but the teacher bonds with the student by moral principles, and this makes the relationship deeper and more intimate for the student. And our hero wondered, who was he to him, Muan? Always, like she was teasing our hero. However, day in and day out, he tried to teach something new. And if our hero didn't understand something, he helped him figure it out, but always cautiously and suspected him of something. Is he really any different from those who are? And our hero immediately said that he was his teacher and would continue to be so from now on. But the master lowered his eyes, thought for a moment, and then shouted out, So it wasn't like this before. Slapping his hand on the book, he too said enough of that. He would look after the egg and our hero would take that and fail. Picking up the book, our hero read that it was a Bajikwan training manual. Our hero thanked the master, from which he turned away and said that the next time they meet, they will start a battle right away, so he should be prepared. So the kid only tilted his head in respect and said thank you. Walking down the street, our hero looked up and noticed, a brother and sister. Pant immediately said, what if he thought he was doing a good thing by abandoning his younger comradus? like that. The girl complimented that. He wasn't even thinking of talking himself out of it, and they would follow him anyway. But our hero said that they should realize that they could end up on the side of their family's enemy, and the girl immediately said they were ready. And Pont said he was fed up with those perpetually disgruntled guys from Blue Flower Island. The sight of them makes him sick to his stomach. Our hero clutching his face, only said that they could do as they pleased, from which the brother and sister were overjoyed. Turning around, our hero began to walk away, and the brother and sister followed him. Only now he began to realize that he seemed to have met not only a good teacher, but also loyal comrades who would follow him at any moment. We need to know the current situation in the city of Pagos, the Red Dragon concentrates all his forces while the Blue Flower Island continues to attack the city thanks to the chicken attack. Blue Flower Island was able to take the initiative and now has the advantage because the offensive on Pagos has become less active. But our heroes wanted to know the reason, and the girl explained that it was because of Bahal, who had brought his army. Our hero asked the question, Bahal, immediately. The brother and sister began to tell me that they had been assigned to watch over the 11th floor because of their clan's entry into the war. He's due back with his army, and apparently they'll be trying to get revenge and take back the 11th floor. The island is supported not only by Muwan, but also by Tomusin and Chanmusin. The Red Dragon probably already knows this and will not stand idly by. For that matter, it would be nice to see Leonte here. Pant was shocked. After all, what was the guy going to do now, considering the Red Dragon was probably targeting him? Our hero also questioned what would happen to them. The girl said that their clan members usually act alone, so they don't care where they stay at night. But our hero was worried about one more thing. What if an internecine clash started? The girl replied that it didn't matter to them and they were concentrating all their efforts to avoid conflict with each other. Pant had picked up on the fact that they probably weren't the only ones who acted this way, and few would want to mess with them, knowing Muwan's character and the fact that they didn't have a father. So he questioned again what they were going to do. Our hero replied that they had already just answered it. Bahal will probably want to get our hero, 
And even if you look at the situation from their perspective, it's clear that they wouldn't want to just leave a ranger like me, and more so Pegos. Our hero approached Mr. Bahal and conveyed that this gift was from Cain, which he would probably like as our hero had prepared something special. A while later, when the player handed over the letter, Bahal came out looking at our hero and said that it was to us that brought him to us. He wondered if he knew how long he had waited for his visit, but our hero only thought, for he had said the same thing to his brother. Clenching his fist, he leaned over and apologized for having to be so late. After all, he had some problems to solve, to which the man replied that it didn't matter at all. The important thing was that he was here. Players watching from the sidelines recognized that this was the rookie who had risen so high as if he were in command. But this was just our hero's game, for he wants to use his fame to firmly establish his position within the Red Dragon. The brother and sister began to talk about Muwan's children. Can't they go over to the enemy's side? After all, they've been disobeying their father for a long time. To which the man replied that he was glad they had come here anyway. So he immediately suggested that we all go inside together. After all, they're in the middle of a meeting and he's going to introduce them all to the others. Upon entering the room, the man introduced our hero, as well as a brother and sister from the one-horned clan. After all, those who are interested in the news of the lower floors should hear at least a little bit about it, right? You can see from the faces of the natives of Artia that they are all traitors and no good can be expected from them. Even Bahal doesn't get welcoming looks. There were 81 pairs of eyes. They resembled the pupils of a dragon, which consisted of 10 facets. That's 81 high-level ranchers around Queen Lethe. There are familiar faces among them to our hero, but it was not clear who they were yet, and the guy asked our hero if there was something wrong, but he immediately replied that everything was fine. Bahal immediately addressed the people by hitting the card and said that this should get their attention. After all, they should have realized by now what was going on here. The layout of the Blue Flower Island campground raised questions. One of the men approached and asked the question, Is it true? It was the leader of the troops, Raoul. He asked if he could look at this map by opening it up and taking a look. He turned to the man who had brought him the map and asked who they were. The one replied that they were their companions, but the man thought they should probably start checking, as the map might be a trap from the Blue Flower Island. To this Bahal immediately said, That does it matter to a wolf, and if this map is indeed accurate, then they have indeed gained a big advantage. But shouldn't they reward their new comrades properly? How do they feel about it? The man immediately turned around and said, He assumed so, and everyone agreed. Turning to our hero, he said that the place of the commander of the second unit of the Foreign Legion was vacant, and it would be a good idea for our hero to take it. Therefore, our hero immediately thought that the Red Dragon Foreign Legion had around 3,000 mercenaries, and that was quite a large army. The commander's seat gives him the right to command hundreds of players, and that could improve his position considerably. But none of that matters. Who will give him a chance? For he must not miss it. So he immediately said he would do his best. And a moment later, one of the men tapped his foot on the floor to draw attention to himself and announced that, from today, Cain would be the commander of the second unit of the Foreign Legion, and Edora and Pant would be the new members of their team, and he asked to receive them. It was a chapter within the Red Dragon on White Dragonian. Turning to our hero, the man immediately whispered to him that he didn't trust him, and hoped he wouldn't pull anything that might piss him off. Our hero had the players who were sitting in front of him immediately ask, Aren't these two from the one-horned clan on the side of the Blue Flower Island? Isn't that Cain over there? Everyone was shocked, and it looked like they were, especially considering the children of the one-horned clan beside him. Pants said that our hero seems to be very popular. 
But then the sharp players got angry, standing up and raising all their weapons. They demanded that the commander approach them, for they had many questions for him. And our hero also said, what do they want to talk about? The players immediately said it was no big deal. After all, they just want to introduce themselves to each other. Well, and by the way, someone has collected all the hidden artifacts of the 11th floor, thus causing them a lot of trouble. He looks a lot like the guy who did it, but they're just looking for him, because that guy owes them a lot. Our hero also said it annoyed him, turning to Pant and immediately telling him to deal with them. But he didn't understand why it was him, and when our hero turned around and said that he was suggesting he handle it himself, the guy immediately came out saying that of course he was all about it, using his lightning bolts. The players didn't realize what was going on. After all, they've already had him, and he doesn't want them to disappoint him by starting a fight. Pant began attacking players who were displeased with our hero, and one by one, those who approached Pant received the strongest discharge. Grabbing them by the arm, he would deliver a punch, followed immediately by a sharp second one. Me to achieve that, the players were shocked. One of the players didn't realize what they were doing. I mean, they should have swooped down in droves. And even in such a situation, when three players decided to attack Pant, he didn't get confused and only said that it would be even more interesting for him to do so. Hitting the floor, he zipped away all the players who approached him with a lightning bolt. Chirik, seeing all this and hearing them yell, arm or leg, was shocked. And then he called out to our hero, saying he liked the man. But one of the players was targeting our heroes and the girl, starting to attack them. Chirik remarked, I was the one who attacked the player who was about to stab him in the back. Our hero had had enough of all this, so he called the guy. All he said was that he expected more, but only ended up getting his hands dirty. He immediately saw the guy and approached him. The guy said he still appeared to be able to stand on his feet and didn't even flush. The girl noticed that the burns had to be measured a little by their fervor after all, for if you crippled them badly, how would they be afterward? Our hero, using his power of sacred fire, began to heal all wounds, from which the players were shocked, for they did not realize what it was. Even Pant questioned our hero, saying he didn't understand what was going on or when he learned such a thing. But our hero immediately interrupted him, saying that that was enough, and again instructed him to teach these scum all to one. And after a while, the players were standing in front of our hero thinking he was the devil. For no, he is even much worse than the devil. After all, he heals and then strikes again. An endless routine. He heals and then strikes again. Is a man capable of such a thing? Sitting down, our hero decided to tell them just one thing, for they must listen to him and remember, he needs obedient hounds. The Rabid dogs biting their own master have given up on anyone, and he gives them one last chance. Pant immediately smiled, pointing his finger, and told them to behave themselves, to which our hero called him over and told him to finish all business here. But the guy didn't get the point, so our hero told him to coach them so he wouldn't be embarrassed. But Pantha didn't like it, for he had left his own clan for him, to which our hero said that if he didn't like something, he could go home and slam the door shut. Pant just looked at this, turned around and was very angry, and the players in front of him complied with what our hero said. In the meantime, the girl sat and looked at Bahal, saying that he pick it up a pretty good guy this time. And the girl said he even provided them with real information. Isn't that sweet? But the man said she seems to be showing interest in him. To which the girl said, Of course. After all, this kid is inspiring. Who wouldn't be interested in him? And immediately added to listen to him, for she thought he had joined them for a reason. Bahal said he would take note of that, and the girl asked about Leontes. To which the man replied that he has not been out in public lately, and Tomusin is always by his side. 
so it will take some time, but he will still make arrangements to track his location at any time. Everything's going according to plan. The girl didn't understand what it was about, what the bait was, but the man walked up to her and whispered something in her ear, and she only smiled. After all, it surprised her, and she thought it would be interesting. After a little thought, she remembered the sky wing. If it wasn't for him, they wouldn't have had to go down to the bottom floor, but now there wasn't much left. He found him as soon as possible, for only with him could she regain her dragon heart. The man who broke in was very angry. Turning to the king, he asked the question, What does all this mean? But the elder immediately turned to the martial spearmaster, John Muxing, with the same question, for as you was not his relationship with the head. He asks him to behave himself. After all, this is a place for official meetings. The god of the battle spear? He seems to have become a stranger to them irrevocably. According to the treaty, he gave up the tribe and is now on his own. He got too angry and forgot his position for a moment. So immediately I deeply apologized for interrupting them. As a responsible person, he would like to ask Muwan if he knows about the treason of Cain, Pant, and Adora. To which the king immediately said that, of course for he would be a complete idiot if he did not know the affairs of his own children and pupil. The man immediately started shouting, But how could it be? After all, it's... But the king immediately interrupted him and said it was his decision, which made the man fiercely angry to the point where even the veins showed on his face. Muan, I just said he was sorry that Blue Flower Island was affected by their actions but they shouldn't interfere in the personal affairs of the clan. The clan must be held accountable for them and their actions. After all, he knows best about it himself, doesn't he? The man realized he wasn't just talking about one particular case. He seemed to have decided to recall the deeds of days gone by when he left the clan with sword god Kamuzin. And that means that when they face them in battle, he'll be able to strike them down with his own hands. The king immediately said that, as he had said, they must be responsible for their own actions, and they could not interfere. So the man said that he hoped he would not recant in the future, and immediately turned around and walked out of the room, slamming the door. The man thought, for what it's worth, he had hoped for him to wise up at least a little, but apparently there was nothing he could do about his temper. The elder immediately said they would leave the plan in place, but right now other things were more important. After all, is he really going to leave the situation with Khan, Pant, and Adora like that? To which the king said that the order remains the same, from which the elder realized that only by going through the ordeal of asceticism could one become a true warrior, and he seemed to reason that way. In the meantime, Pant was running drills while yelling at his subordinates. They're not going to fight properly. Want to do everything in a circle again. One step to the right, forward, sword to the left, and strike diagonally, ordering that everyone execute that exact movement. Our hero and his girlfriend were watching Pant train his army, and the girlfriend noticed that in just four days of training they were already fighting pretty well, and our hero noticed it too. After all, they will be of use now. If you look at his hustling character, this guy definitely has the makings of a leader. Our hero thought he could rely on him in the future. The girl wondered what he was reading all this time, to which the guy said it was the second volume of the Bajiquan technique. The girl was shocked because this was the second volume, and it seems that her father really trusted him. Bajiquan created by Mu Wang, is considered one of the most important techniques of Mu Gong. The more he advances, the more difficult it becomes. Memorize the current techniques so further study begins to take much longer. It wasn't easy for the girl when she was learning Baji Quan either. It wasn't easy for the girl's brother either, but this time the father didn't say he would help him. After all, it meant that he was able to help him learn a little bit. 
From this point on, even he must be having a bit of a hard time, and she might be able to help him in some way. To which our hero said no, because he had already learned everything, and he only needed to reread the step technique to make sure he got it right. And it's going to be quite a challenge for him to combine that with his mana usage technique. Bajiquan is Mugong's outstanding technique, so it is very different from others. In order to combine it with the magic chain, edits need to be made. The god and demon of the 98th floor stopped watching our hero, Hermes looking at him with a satisfied smile. Our hero thought that at first his attention had seemed like something incredible to him, but now it was getting a little annoying. And suddenly Bahal appeared, talking about how things were going much better for them, and luckily they were able to adapt quickly. He also heard that our hero had taken the mercenary in an iron grip. Watching all of this, he realizes that the rumors don't lie. Our hero just thanked the man and asked if he was ready to start military operations right away. Our hero added, can he move out at any time? But first, he has something to say. Does he happen to know that the son of the Sabil god Tomosina is currently on the 16th floor? Bahal, because he didn't know he had a son. But even within the Blue Flower Island, Tomosina is held up as an example of a good warrior. He attracts attention for his increasing strength and for the fact that he has never approached women in his entire life. So how could he have children? When asked about Tomasin's recent lack of magical power, the man replied that he was aware of it, but did it have anything to do with his child? After all, his son had poor health from birth. He was born with a body unable to store magical power, and no medicine helped his son control magical power. There was no way to cure something like this. Perhaps elsewhere it would be normal, but for their world such anomalies were considered bad. Besides, Tomosin had many enemies. Somehow he had to hide his son and at the same time deal with finding a cure. But then he began to wonder. For that is, he is trying to heal his son at the expense of his own magical power. Right he understands our hero to which the guy only nodded silently, saying that was all he knew. But in truth, the reason Tomosin hunted the four mythical creatures was to cure his son. Blue Flower Island allowed him to take the heart and inner energy of these creatures, so there was no reason for Tomosin to refuse. He's also taken Phoenix's heart and energy, and he must find him to prevent that from becoming a thing. But the man asked where he got that information and honestly admitted that our hero read it in Chonu's diary. But he said that he knew about it while he was in the clan of one of them. But the man warned that it could be a trap whether he wanted it to be or not. Our hero replied that it might be so, or it might just be what he uses. That's why he's willing to go on his own. The man was surprised, but our hero said he was ready. Also for him, as the commander of this operation, it will only come to good use. Bahal agreed because if this operation was successful, he was willing to give him what he had promised. When he'd seen him a month ago, he couldn't have thought he'd be willing to submit to someone. Our hero realized that the world is full of cold and cruel places. Bahal only confirmed that it was the right thing to do. After all, when he is cold, he needs to be in a warm place. Henceforth, he will not enjoy the warm days. Our hero only thought he would not forget those words. After all, warm and cheerful days, looking at Bahal, he only wondered who knew if they would be like that for him. Our hero's second squad is assembling. He said they had received orders that information about their attempt to capture Tomasin's son could be leaked to the masses, so they need to quickly and quietly storm the unit with the sharp blue flower, which is located on the 16th floor. Also, our hero has to tell them something before they go. After all, our hero has not yet finished testing this and subsequent floors. So teleporting to the 12th floor, the 12th floor test began, and the water source completely dried up. 
Therefore, nothing grows here and this arid place has become a wandering place for lost spirit-filled travelers. Our hero should have overcome the trials of the land, relying only on his own strength. After all, if he has enough strength and determination to overcome this vast desert, he will be able to cope with any difficulties. The players who were around didn't even think they'd have to go through that again. Their rumors were not deceived, for it was very hot here. From the twelfth floor, the quality of the environment begins to deteriorate. Therefore, most of the challenge is to overcome climatic difficulties. And plus, these floors have relevant rare items that are nearly impossible to get. There are various hidden treasures scattered everywhere, and one of them is the Firestone. It turns out that our hero can capitalize on the situation and will do well to collect everything he can as he passes the floors, especially with the help of the Red Dragon. Our hero ordered the players to find all the items in the allotted time and go to the 13th floor, and he himself went to the desert. Immediately, everyone agreed to the orders and went about their business, while our hero let out a shower. He thought about how he would feel better now that there was a spy here. Charik wondered why they listened to our hero unquestioningly, to which the guy said he didn't know, and then the little guy questioned what they were looking for, to which the guy replied that they were looking for firestones. Charik also asked the stone what it was and our hero replied that it was something delicious. This news made the little one rejoice, for the Firestone would definitely be a healthy and tasty treat for Charik. He will give one half now and the other half in spirit afterward. The time to strengthen the black bracelet had run out, so he thought of another way to strengthen its properties. It would be nice to endow spirits that already contain dark, evil forces with different elements, they have everything they need for amplification, and the bigger they get, the more they forget that they can get it in large quantities for free. Charik asked our hero to find more goodies for him, to which our hero agreed and told him not to worry. The baby realized he was falling asleep, so when our hero finds the goodies, he wants to be woken up. Putting his hand on his chest, he realized the stone was there again. But you can tell he doesn't know, because it's just more comfortable to be here. It's very warm and cozy, so it makes you want to take a nap. Our hero understood that the phoenix spark was here. Perhaps that was why the baby was more at ease in the stone, and the baby's energy was restored much faster and stronger than in other places with a magical purpose. Should he complete it or figure out another way to control it? Perhaps as long as the kid is using this stone, it won't affect our hero. And all the tests were completed. Our hero performed a legendary deed, passing through the desert without a single stop. He will be awarded extra points. Through this ordeal, our hero has strengthened his physical resilience. In addition, it helped strengthen the sacred fire property and he was able to get the number of magic nuclei up to 180 pieces. Then our hero was offered to move to the 14th floor, and he realized that there was nothing more for him to do here. But then the rabbit appeared and asked him to wait a bit, saying that she was still the same as in their last encounter. And it looks like our hero is in a hurry, so he gets straight to the point because at the moment the player is heading to the Temple of the Three Goddesses, which is located on the 16th floor. Is that right? Our hero stared intently, but the rabbit told him not to worry. After all, I'm not an admin, just doing my job to ensure players have a comfortable, immersive gaming experience, and I have in no way tried to hinder you or spread rumors about you, so you needn't worry. Our hero thought for a moment and remembered what his brother had said about it being quite difficult to resist the administrators, especially the twelve zodiacal spirits of the highest rank. Laplace is the zodiac rabbit, extremely curious and loves to pry. He's got a pretty nasty temper. So our hero inquired what business he had come for, to which the rabbit replied that he had come to pass on the words of the higher-ups. 
Our hero was a little confused, and the rabbit said he didn't know if our hero was aware of it, but administrators, especially in the twelve zodiacal spirits, have another function. They are messengers of gods and demons. Our hero was surprised, for he did not understand what was in question regarding the messenger. So the rabbit immediately said that he had come to convey the words of one of the demons, saying that, Human fear the oldest of the three goddesses. Our hero did not understand what the words, Fear the oldest of the three goddesses, were referring to. So he questioned what it meant and which demon had given it to him, to which the rabbit said that he was only acting as a messenger, so he couldn't give details. Even if he knew, the system wouldn't let him tell. The player is now notified and must make further decisions on his own. So our hero thought for a moment. If the eldest of the three goddesses is meant, it must be Erdeal. But why she did, and why she gave him that message, he said he couldn't even speculate. After all, he is but a lowly messenger, and how can he know what thoughts occupy the minds of gods and demons? So the guy realized that a demon is a demon. This is not a species to be trusted. Also, it's probably not about the three goddesses. So the question is, he's not going to listen to it, is he? In that case, continue on your way, because he had taken all the precautions, and from now on, neither administrators nor other people would bother the player on the way to the 16th floor. Despite the rabbit, our hero began to move to the 13th floor, and as soon as he moved, he noticed the subordinate players who had been knocked out. He snapped his fingers and, using his powers, ordered them to hand over everything they had collected on the 12th floor. The players realized that it was like collecting money. After all, didn't he take it in order to take away every last coin? During this time, he obtained 182 units of firestone. 35 units of ice crystal, and 91 units of snow roses. And before leaving the 11th floor, Bahal presented our hero with a bottomless bag. Within it, a huge space is formed by magic. This artifact is expensive and similar to inventory. Not a bad thing for our hero. Turning away, our hero said that if they had finished their training, they could move on. One of the players raised his hand to apologize and turned to the commander, asking where the secret base of the Flower Island was. Our hero thought a little and replied that it was in the Temple of Skuld. All the players were shocked by this response. The past is Urd, the present is Bredandi, the future is Skuld. According to the Edda, Beneath the roots of the world tree Yggdrasil flows the source of Urd, where the three Norns live. The goddesses spin the threads of fate with a spindle, weaving them into the flesh of human destinies. That is why their temple was always filled with believers. Speaking even among the gods and demons, there were those who wanted to meet them face to face. However, the goddesses avoided all of this and did not show themselves on the 98th floor. They reside peacefully on the 16th, occasionally appearing to humans. But the players were perplexed. What does that mean? They're not going to attack the temple? And even considering the Norns don't leave the 16th floor, they're still divine beings. If you anger them, they will be punished. But our hero said he didn't. I can't help but worry about it. They are only able to predict fate without being able to physically harm. There's a simple explanation for why they don't lead creative lives. According to the tower's rules, according to your power, you get the appropriate restrictions. You could say that their bodies are restrained to prevent them from abusing the power of fortune-telling. And to top it off, abandoning this plan would be considered a breach of contract with the Red Dragon, and it's clear to any human being that punishment will follow. So, be prepared to be held accountable, our hero said. After all, they remember well what it's like to fall into the hands of a demon. Having agreed, our hero only said that in that case they would move out, turning their backs on the other players. And our players were chosen to follow the path leading to the future temple of Skuld. 
Players walking by didn't realize who they were, and it was a red dragon. But what were they suddenly doing on the 16th floor? Our hero met three people who asked him a question about why they had come here with the red dragon, for he does not know what business they are on. But these are the sacred abodas of the deities, and so he asks everyone to leave their stabbing and cutting objects here when going inside. But our hero Sayyid, they know why they came here. But the man interrogated what he meant, to which our hero said that either they despised them, for they had sent incapable men here, for if they knew, they only pretended to understand nothing, although it could also be seen as contempt. Does he understand them correctly? After all, our hero had no hatred for them, as he had come here on behalf of the Red Dragon. The bigger the battle, the better. Besides, the more damage there is, the faster this will reach Blue Flower Island and Thomason. Therefore, our hero immediately used his power, causing people to start overlapping. One by one they began to flee, from which our hero, pulling out his sword, began to deliver blows, which were followed by the strongest explosions in the city. The players grabbed one by one those who guarded the place, and our hero only followed his path. To which one of those caught shouted to our hero that he was not allowed to go in there. But our hero did not even pay attention to it and, opening the door, smelled the odor. Immediately the question arose, who was he? For this was the first time he had seen him. It was Hanbin who asked where his new toys were, and if he had brought them, for he was Thomason's only son who had been hiding all this time. He questioned our hero whether he could hear him or not, and whether he had brought someone with him. One of the guys opened the door, barged in, and said he would explain everything, just give him some time. But our hero said not to let anyone in here, and one of the players decided to enter him. But the guy didn't understand who he was or why he was touching his stuff. But our hero only ordered his subordinates to take him away, to which the guy agreed and asked to be released, talked about whether they knew who he was to pull something like this. Thomasine's love for his son completely blinded him to Hanbin's congenital disease, and Thomasine suffered all his life, searching for an easy way to escape this pain, and eventually got to the point where he even ended up in the Temple of Skold. No one could do anything about it, for it was the son of Tomusin himself. If anything happened, they could be greatly embarrassed, so they had no choice but to accept him inside the temple, and in the end, they became accomplices in the matter. Though the Norns can predict fate, they can't interfere physically, so they couldn't do anything. News of what had happened spread throughout the tower in an instant, and the status of the three goddesses was undermined. Tolmason and Blue Flower Island's reputation was also affected. Our hero arrived on the eleventh floor and met Pont's brother and sister, immediately noticing that everything there was destroyed. And Panta was interesting. That's once he finishes the challenge. So will he. The man, upon seeing the boy, realized that he was a completely exact copy of his father. I mean, he could have said it was him. Just add a few wrinkles and it would be just like him. The man thought he could get such an important person, but who knew he'd get such a big fish? And that's real luck for him. After all, the plan to retrieve the stone, to be more precise, the plan according to which Leontes' stone is to be a replacement for the dragon heart of the Queen of Summer. It is absolutely necessary to retrieve it, and as far as he is concerned, the stone that Leonte wanted to make is not yet complete. If you get hold of the materials to complete it, no matter how much you doubt it, the temptation to finish it is great. So he secretly prepared all the necessary materials and stored them. Initially, he wanted information about it leaked to lure Leontai out. But there was one flaw. Knowing Leontai's character, there was a good chance that he must have acted with extreme caution before checking the materials. However, it turned out that they got Thomason's son, and if it's about him, it's clearly going to help lure Leontai out. 
that would be enough to get Leontai to pull out the stone. Besides, Thomason won't give up his son for the Blue Flower Island, or is already talking about the child he sacrificed his own magical power for. Obviously, his own blood is more precious to him than any organization, and he should start by waking him up. A rabbit teleported into one of the rooms and immediately greeted everyone with a good morning by opening the door. He was surprised at who sat in front of him, walking into the room. He questioned what brought him to him. There was a goblin sitting in front of the rabbit that we'd come across before, and he immediately said he was just passing by and decided to pop in. Plus, some interesting rumors had reached him, as it was rumored that a certain demon was interested in what was happening on the lower floors. Laplace is said to have had something to do with it. So the goblins wanted to know the rabbit's thoughts on the matter, to which the rabbit only thought he was an old snake and apparently they wouldn't be able to get rid of him so easily. At the same time, one of the messengers came running to the man and reported that the red dragon had attacked the Skold Temple. As he had already realized, Hanbin was Tomason, who was surprised to hear Hanbin's name, to which the messenger immediately began to shout where the gentleman was going to go. The man replied that he didn't know exactly where, but he had to find him wherever he was. Upon entering the premises, Tomason saw his backpack, said there it was, walked over to it and grabbed it by one of the straps. He immediately slipped them on his back to head out. But before the man walked out, he noticed a box with a piece of paper on the floor, walked over, read it. The note went on to say that if he wanted the price back, he should bring a rock with him. Looking at that note, he realized if they knew and, afraid to open the box, he still made up his mind to open it but what he saw shocked him. After all, there was... We were then shown a man who, holding his head up, all he could say was that his head was splitting. It was the island of the blue flower, Comusen, god of the sword. After he and Comusen left the one-horned clan, wherever they went, they always encountered obstacles and difficulties. They defeated their enemies, captured them, crossed over and went on, always achieving victories. Eventually, people who looked like them came into their midst, and they are now members of the Blue Flower Island. However, unlike Artia, which Komosan easily defeated, the Red Dragon is the most powerful clan capable of resisting all alone. The famous 81 pairs of eyes are only a small part of their power. First of all, the Red Dragon is different from other clans with its own history and traditions. A long time ago, a lot of rankers gathered on the 77th floor and established a special organization to destroy all enemies. Over time, the organization grew and left its own legacy for future generations. Thus, the Red Dragon became an organization of true strength that surpassed the other clans. Even the players sent to the Red Dragon on the 11th floor represent only the tip of the iceberg. And by using only this small portion of their power, they were able to resist the Flower Island and perhaps even surpass it. Tradition and history, even if some other clan joins them, are they capable of destroying the Red Dragon? With all this in mind, the man wants to end this war as soon as possible. Of course, if this happens, the very notion of nine kings will end. In this case, Blue Flower Island would not be able to clear its reputation, remaining in fifth behind Red Dragon. This will actually be the starting point for his deposition. The island of the Blue Flower has always been known for two things, inflexibility and a sense of self-worth. All of this can't just disappear. Is the sword really the only way? Though this weapon is called a sword, when used it can take the form of a spear, as well as a bow or axe. The sacred weapon is the embodiment of deity. However, it requires a tremendous amount of magical power to use it. Leonte had not yet completed the stone, but now he was obliged to take it out, the stone a versatile item with which to make full use of the sword. The man wondered what if he got rid of Leonte and used the sword, but then a voice from behind me said they were in trouble. 
to which the man just asked the question, what's up? The man was told that Mr. Thomason attacked Kwan Musin, the god of Kwang Musin. What was the man shocked about? There was a duel going on where Thomason was all but telling the man to stop repeating the same thing, for he needed the stone and the man had to give it here quickly. To which the man only continued to say that he did not have that stone, to which Thomason said, but only we don't hurt the man. And he immediately added that he was crazy, because how many more times could he be told that he didn't have that stone? Thomason, you said he doesn't ask him where it is. He just wants him to bring it to him. After all, if he wants to live, he will do as he says. Thomason was furious. With another attack, he decided to deal damage, to which his opponent was shocked, for he realized that he had no time to dodge such an attack. But then a beam stood in front of him, which protected him with a beautiful with all its power. Thomason was shocked, for his attack failed, and there was a man standing in front of him. It was the god of the spear, to which the man merely told him to back off, for he had nothing to discuss with him. But the spear god said, You said I had questions about the saber and what he was getting up to in the first place. After all, the red dragon is right in front of their noses, and he's having a feud here. Has he gone completely insane from his own cruelty? Thomason, only raising his sword, told the spear, God, to step back. But before anything could happen, they heard a voice telling them what they had set up here. This voice belonged to the strongest white priest, even dazzling, and even Thomason managed to grab the floor with her sword to keep it from being swung away when a man appeared and wanted Saber to explain to him what was going on here to which the man merely told her that only he needed one thing, and he had come to take it from the spear god. But the man was interested in the question, what did he come for? To which Thomason merely said that it was about a rock, and he seemed to know something about it. However, the man told her that he did not know anything about it, as he was not interested. But Thomason added, I said they grabbed his son, and he needed that damn rock to get it back, and later he would repay his debt. But he needs him right here and right now. To which the man realized that he had fallen into the red dragon's cruel trap, and until he was clear on the whole situation, he needed to calm down for starters. And afterward, they'll talk it over. But the man was furious and shouted that he had every second counted, to which the man immediately dropped his sword and told him to settle down at last, for he should go inside and cool his head, but in the meantime he would sort things out here. Thomason stood indoors pondering the fact that he had been ignorant of love all his life, until one day like a light spring breeze brought it into his life. They weren't destined to spend a lifetime together, and by closing her eyes forever, she left only one trace of her presence in his life. This weak and sickly child had been waiting for him at home all this time. The man realized that if he had been a little stronger, nothing would have happened to his son, and he apologizes. But then he noticed something else. After the man went into the room, he saw another box, all ahead, and he was powerless. Reaching out his hand to open the box, he was disappointed, for the note also said that if he wanted to see something, he should bring a stone. Lowering his face, he let out a large amount of energy, which the guy noticed, running up to him and shouting, Sir! The guy closer saw the magic flow. Finding himself very strong, the man questioned the guy on which side he was on, opening his eyes and looking at him. The lad fell on his knee and said that once on the battlefield the man had saved him by fending off his enemies, and from that moment he was ready to be his faithful sword and shield. Thomason said that they should gather everyone as the revolution will start that night. And at this time, in the Red Dragon, Bahal sitting on a couch, addressed our hero, asking if he had heard that Thomason had rebelled. Thanks to our hero, everything is going as they planned. 
to which our hero only asked if they already had their own man in their ranks, Bahal had already thought of opening the veil of secrecy to him for there was no place in the tower where the red dragon did not have his eyes and ears. They're everywhere, and of course, it's thanks to our hero. Everyone at the meeting was wildly excited about this arrangement, so they are already planning the next step. Soon, the war and the island of the blue flower come to an end, because he can then strengthen his position by providing compromising evidence against those who called him a traitor, Plus, all this will help our hero as well, because it's their common victory, if you can call it that, and he hopes they will continue to cooperate and work together. Our hero nudges him, because he has to agree, it sounds pretty good. Our hero also recalled the first day in Artia, which remained in his memory from the beginning until the death of his brother. But Bahal has already forgotten about it, and no remorse stops him. After all, the red dragon has ears and eyes everywhere, and he's beginning to realize that in Artia, it would have been him all along. After all, with Hanbin's kidnapping, their game began. If he wants to achieve what he wants and get rid of what he doesn't need, he needs to prepare. It's worth creating protective barriers just in case. He realized that he should increase his strength and that was the first thing he needed to do. Releasing his soul, he ordered a spirit to appear, who immediately greeted our hero and said that it was probably because his soul was also a player, unlike the other spirits. Thus, Boo was, to some extent, able to talk. Despite this, his mental and communication skills are not developed. This means that he can only use certain words to accomplish his goals, it is necessary to develop his thinking, so our hero said he would now give him things in order, and the spirit should swallow them, but not let the magic disappear. He must remember that, even if some of the magic disappears, the experiment will fail. The spirit only said it understood, so our hero immediately started. Two fire crystals, five ice crystals, and nine golden flowers. The spirit began to consume everything our hero gave and successfully swallowed the fire gem. Fire affinity increased by one and fire skill increased by three, realizing that if things worked out, he could help Boo evolve. There were two reasons for Ardia's success. The first is his brother's encounter with the dragon on the eleventh floor. The second are enhanced artifacts created by Bailik after various experiments. Since the process of inheriting the dragon power would soon be completed, our hero realized that he wasn't the first to worry, but here are the artifacts. Enhanced artifacts were medicines that enhanced magical power, but his younger brother didn't know exactly how these pills were made. He wrote down the main ingredients and mixing proportions in his journal. And even knowing the proportions, they are not easy to make. Balik didn't make the process that easy. It took a lot of fiddling to make the ingredients. It was also difficult to accomplish this alone. But souls are themselves an anomalous form of concentrated magic, which means they can absorb anything our hero gives them. After all, our hero would like Boo to be able to develop on his own, but because of the black bracelet, this is hardly possible. So we'll have to make do with what we have. Boo successfully absorbed the blue amethyst, and his water skill increased by two. He had thus reached his limit, and any further improvement would probably cause a strain on his spiritual body. Boo is suffering due to the constant absorption of energy. His vessel has reached its limit and has begun to crack. And even after absorbing the black rose, there was no change. But our hero realized that he had to deal with it and absorb everything. After all, he chose it in hopes that Boo could awaken his mind. And the spirit did succeed. It overcame the limitation acquired in a full vessel. And the process of formation and development of the spirit began. It began to evolve, becoming stronger. Evolution was successfully completed, and the death wizard was born. Looking up, he only told her that he welcomed her and was ready to obey. 
Thomason stood indoors pondering the fact that he had been ignorant of love all his life, until one day like a light spring breeze brought it into his life. They weren't destined to spend a lifetime together, and by closing her eyes forever, she left only one trace of her presence in his life. This weak and sickly child had been waiting for him at home all this time. The man realized that if he had been a little stronger, nothing would have happened to his son, and he apologizes. But then he noticed something else. After the man went into the room, he saw another box, all ahead, and he was powerless. Reaching out his hand to open the box, he was disappointed, for the note also said that if he wanted to see something, he should bring a stone. Lowering his face, he let out a large amount of energy, which the guy noticed, running up to him and shouting, Sir! The guy closer saw the magic flow. Finding himself very strong, the man questioned the guy on which side he was on, opening his eyes and looking at him. The lad fell on his knee and said that once on the battlefield the man had saved him by fending off his enemies, and from that moment he was ready to be his faithful sword and shield. Thomason said that they should gather everyone as the revolution will start that night. And at this time in the Red Dragon, Bahal sitting on a couch, addressed our hero, asking if he had heard that Thomasine had rebelled. Thanks to our hero, everything is going as they planned, to which our hero only asked if they already had their own man in their ranks. Bahal had already thought of opening the veil of secrecy to him, for there was no place in the tower where the Red Dragon did not have his eyes and ears. They're everywhere, and of course, it's thanks to our hero. Everyone at the meeting was wildly excited about this arrangement, so they are already planning the next step. Soon, the war and the island of the Blue Flower come to an end, because he can then strengthen his position by providing compromising evidence against those who called him a traitor. Plus, all this will help our hero as well, because it's their common victory, if you can call it that, and he hopes they will continue to cooperate and work together. Our hero nudges him, because he has to agree. It sounds pretty good. Our hero also recalled the first day in Artia, which remained in his memory from the beginning until the death of his brother. But Bahal has already forgotten about it, and no remorse stops him. After all, the Red Dragon has ears and eyes everywhere, and he's beginning to realize that in Artia, it would have been him all along. After all, with Hanbin's kidnapping, their game began. If he wants to achieve what he wants and get rid of what he doesn't need, he needs to prepare. It's worth creating protective barriers just in case. He realized that he should increase his strength, and that was the first thing he needed to do. Releasing his soul, he ordered a spirit to appear, who immediately greeted our hero and said that it was probably because his soul was also a player, unlike the other spirits. Thus, Boo was, to some extent, able to talk. Despite this, his mental and communication skills are not developed. This means that he can only use certain words to accomplish his goals. It is necessary to develop his thinking, so our hero said he would now give him things in order, and the spirit should swallow them, but not let the magic disappear. He must remember that even if some of the magic disappears, the experiment will fail. The spirit only said it understood, so our hero immediately started. Two fire crystals, five ice crystals, and nine golden flowers. The spirit began to consume everything our hero gave and successfully swallowed the fire gem. Fire affinity increased by one and fire skill increased by three realizing that if things worked out, he could help Boo evolve. There were two reasons for Ardia's success. The first is his brother's encounter with the dragon on the 11th floor. The second are enhanced artifacts created by Bailik after various experiments. Since the process of inheriting the dragon power would soon be completed, our hero realized that he wasn't the first to worry. But here are the artifacts. 
Enhanced artifacts were medicines that enhanced magical power, but his younger brother didn't know exactly how these pills were made. He wrote down the main ingredients and mixing proportions in his journal, and even knowing the proportions, they are not easy to make. Balik didn't make the process that easy. It took a lot of fiddling to make the ingredients. It was also difficult to accomplish this alone. But souls are themselves an anomalous form of concentrated magic, which means they can absorb anything our hero gives them. After all, our hero would like Boo to be able to develop on his own, but because of the black bracelet, this is hardly possible, so we'll have to make do with what we have. Boo successfully absorbed the blue amethyst and his water skill increased by two. He had thus reached his limit and any further improvement would probably cause a strain on his spiritual body. Boo is suffering due to the constant absorption of energy. His vessel has reached its limit and has begun to crack. And even after absorbing the black rose, there was no change. But our hero realized that he had to deal with it and absorb everything. After all, he chose it in hopes that Boo could awaken his mind. And the spirit did succeed. It overcame the limitation acquired in a full vessel, and the process of formation and development of the spirit began. It began to evolve, becoming stronger. Evolution was successfully completed, and the death wizard was born. Looking up, he only told her that he welcomed her and was ready to obey. Due to the sudden gathering of the entire army, training with Shenan didn't last long. But then, our hero abruptly stopped talking. Something went wrong. Grasping his chest, he realized something was wrong with him. But what was it? Looking up, he saw the dragon and was shocked by it. Really? Summer Queen. She is now using one of the blood-chilling dragon skills. Fear of the dragon. And our hero realized that this was apparently how his body was reacting to the presence of another dragon. But it's a good thing they're not looking at him, and he needs to calm down and gather his thoughts faster so he doesn't get exposed. The dragon looked up into the sky and began to open the portal, looking up at him. Thomason, passing by, said that they would gain nothing by helping him, and anyone caught would be labeled a traitor and condemned to death. They had one last chance, and they could escape right now. He will understand them, but there will be no turning back after the road. All the players who stood in front of the man only remained silent, and no one was about to leave, to which the man realized that he had nothing more to regret, said he appreciated their trust. Turning around, he ordered to go forward. Under the moon, they began to attack to which one player asked, do they even realize what they're doing right now? To which the other said that if they didn't know, they wouldn't do it. Striking a blow, the man turned around and asked the location of the target, to which the other said it was now Thomason, and he's locked himself out of his office and won't let anyone in at the moment. The boys wondered how much longer he would last, to which the other said, apparently, not for long. The guy realized they couldn't avoid a fight with him. He also realized it was going to be very difficult. They should send a signal, to which his subordinates agreed and sent a signal into the sky. They called on others to get things started, whereupon the attack began. The guards shouted that their warehouse was going up in flames, but they didn't understand. After all, they thought the Red Dragon did it. Tomosin was walking in the fire and only heard screams where the red dragon was. But this is the blood he received after defeating the sixth general of the demon army. It can certainly increase physical potential beyond all possible limits. However, due to the high probability of lethality, this item is used for self-destruction or to enhance magical power in dangerous situations. But if it's the only way to defeat Tomosin, the man will eat as much as it takes. One of the guards, noticing the man, immediately addressed him, telling him that he couldn't be here. Tomusin landed crushing blows, causing the guardian to fall, and the men turned from this outcome of events, shouting. Back came the explosion, blowing a path for the man. 
Thomason entered the room through a hole he had punched where two men were standing. He said if they turned in the stone he would keep them, to which the other man replied that how much more could he repeat since they had nothing, and already the masked man had said that he was going to screw his head up until the last one. Thomason only said that he was already here anyway and wasn't going to leave without the stone, and they should return what was his. And the man realized that he was going to have to talk to him in a very different way, using his powers. They went outside and were about to continue, but the man looked around and realized that, was it really an illusion? After all, everything he saw was only an illusion. It was his own fault. And that's all it came down to. The man was giving him a chance, after all, and because he considered him his loyal friend. To which Tomusin said he could not understand, for they accepted doom with a smile on their faces. If he shows a little pity now, he will only spit on their feet. He should have realized something a long time ago. Whether he is one or ten of them or a hundred, he only needed one person. He should have realized some things a long time ago. One in ten or even a hundred. He won't stop because he only needs one person. The man was ready to take the fight, and Thomason immediately lunged at him, and the subordinate men began to shout louder. After all, they had to protect their leader. They should not be allowed to get close to him. There was a duel between the man and Thomason. Thomason began attacking the man with his strongest punches, one after another. But at some point he stopped and was shocked, for the man remained unharmed even after such blows. Turning around, Tomasin saw a man standing nearby and thought that perhaps it was the power of the four swords. Here he couldn't have imagined the man would catch up with him so quickly. Tomasin only smiled and said that he was going according to plan, and it was a waste to approach him so quickly, for at this point his end would come but the man only touched his finger to the blade of Thomasine's sword, and it immediately fell apart. Thomasine was shocked to see that their sword had just fallen apart. Looking at the man, he realized it was impossible. After all, he had increased the magical power of his skills on a completely different level. But he still couldn't even touch the man, taking damage from three balls from different directions. He plopped down in front of him, not realizing how this was possible, but the man only said it was a skill. His days of roaming the world looking for strong opponents and opportunities to get stronger ended at the hour of their meeting. When he came to his senses, an attempt to learn new things and become more experienced followed, but he devoted his life to training and meeting the love of his life, who gave him a son, which made him unable to grow stronger. It was obvious that his skills and abilities wouldn't surprise anyone else. And here he is. The man said he was grateful to him. Thomason didn't understand what he was talking about, but the man explained that ever since he used the blood obtained from the demons, his powers had become stronger than the four legendary beasts he had no idea about before. The activation process was finally complete, and all he had to do was extract what came out of it. The man continued, for who could have known it would happen so quickly? Tomosin, looking at the man, immediately laughed, for at that moment he realized what had happened. For whatever they did, Tomusin was always watching them so that he could then take over all their accomplishments. And that was surprising enough, because he was always just being used, and he didn't realize it. The man ordered him to approach, and Tomosin realized that if this was how he was destined to lose, his son, who had spent his entire life in agony and had never seen a ray of light in this pitch blackness, wanted his fate for himself, but not for Hanbin. But then he remembered the letter that had been sent to him. The only line that was written below the message talked about the stones, and those were the coordinates. Tomasin said he made a terrible mistake. The man didn't understand what this was about. Tomasin immediately said he should have kept his mouth shut and not told him about the cannonballs. 
Using the force, something strange began to happen. The man closed his hand a little, took a step to the side, and as soon as he looked, the man was gone, and it turned out to be a portal. And as soon as the man looked, the portal enlarged and a red dragon with a rather large size began to emerge from it. He immediately attacked the man in front of him. A red dragon started flying out of the portal, along with people, including a man. Within this group was our hero who realized that it was the magic of the four legendary beasts. He realized that Thomason had apparently died using his power and began to absorb all that energy. Our hero began to absorb the magical power of the four legendary beasts, acquiring the title of heir to the divine creatures of absorption. The energy properties flowed much faster, and his magic power increased by five times. The mana circulation skill increased noticeably, and the hero's vessel expanded, confirming the development of his soul. The legacy process resumed and occupancy was progressing at 100%. Legacy progress has been successfully completed. When the hero opened his eyes, the process of his awakening in the dragon's body began. The players standing below watching the red dragon realized that it was a real monster, but it wasn't clear to them how they should deal with it. The red dragon began to build up fire, instantly releasing it in an attack on players who barely had time to dodge its attacks. However, the man was not intimidated by this enterprising dragon, turning back to him. He realized that he had lost the power of the four legendary beasts, and on top of that, that terrifying dragon was surely losing its grip. After all, his plan was to seize the stone and complete the creation of the sword with the power of the four divine beasts, but as always, things didn't go according to plan. Maybe the queen of Lethe, was she really trying to stop him? The man got angry enough to claim it for himself, then immediately jumped out. The dragon noticed this, but it was too late, for the man was above the dragon and preparing for his devastating attack. Pant said, only I said it was all boredom and shadow, but who knew they were so weak? The players, hearing this, wanted to confront him and started to attack, but then Edora appeared. She thought it was fortunate the tribe hadn't arrived yet, for if her father was here, the red dragon would be in trouble. Plus, she remembered our hero telling her to take care of it. She wondered where he had disappeared to in the midst of the battle and she only wondered if nothing had happened to him. But our hero began to transform, receiving the strongest streams of energy. Our hero's mana power and circulation increased to the point where it felt like he was being torn to pieces. His body began to undergo modifications, and after a while, the dragon body fully awakened. The conversion was successful, and our hero was a great success. He was added experience points, and his achievements increased by 10,000 points and then another 15,000. The status of an unfinished dragon body changed to a revived dragon body, and he became eligible for dragon reports. Some of the dragon possessions that were previously blocked are now available, as well as some dragon knowledge that was previously blocked. Dragon abilities have also been unlocked, and the characteristic of an adamantine build has been replaced with a dragon body. A dragon's possession now depended on its skill, and it could occupy a certain area of Binus. In this territory, he had to maximize his power in certain ranges of dragon knowledge, depending on his qualifications, could have opened Hokmu. Our hero realized that everything had changed, not only his physical form, but his very essence. It was as if he had only observed this power before, but now he could control it, the power leading to the knowledge of the truth about everything. This is what it means to be a dragon. But what has changed the most is its capabilities and influence. A dragon body that has received the blessing of the dragon of nothingness is able to unlock eight levels of power proportional to its characteristics. Even though he's at level one, it's still a lot more than all of his previous accomplishments. 
Our hero also began to hear a voice that addressed him and told him that he was not the same, an ill-mannered heir who was spoken of as a child. That voice belonged to Colatus. But how is that possible? After all, when he met Chona and gave him the inheritance of his will, he closed his eyes forever and said he would wait for him here. Now he should find it. The hidden quest, the second dragon nothingness check, has been completed and the rewards were the sphere of the abyss, the wrath of the dragon of nothingness and the nest of the dragon of nothingness. Our hero realized that his first goal was to destroy Thomason, but now it was time for other tasks. Our hero ordered the spirits to appear. After all, these players were not so simple. They all belonged to a clan that was made up of the best of the best, which included the Rankers. If he absorbed their power, it could bring him a huge boost. He was excited, but it was too early for a victory celebration, so he ordered the spirits to begin. After all, he still had Leonte and Bachal to deal with. There will be no end to the war until they are dead. Soon, perhaps, Bahal will try to attack Leontai, who in turn will defend himself in every way possible, but he has no stone. That means he's going to have to use all of his powers. When they come together in battle, our hero will attack from the back to finally end this situation once and for all. After Bahal appeared, the opponents were furious and started attacking him, but the man said they really thought they could buy time that way. After all, he was strong enough that ordinary players couldn't do anything to him. Bahal wondered what they were trying to accomplish, since the thundering great Quan Musin was like a rat now hiding in his hole. Bahal immediately asked Leonte to come out, for his charges were too easy prey for him. But perhaps because of a past loss, he chickened out. Leonte thought how much he was pissing him off. After all, if Komasin hadn't told him not to get involved, he would have entered the fray long ago. But the man kept asking questions about why he didn't want to come out. Is he really up to something? But either way, he no longer has time to play by his rules. Breaking the barrier, Bahal asked only because of one question. Where's the rock? Leon only looked at the man. Seventy-two swordsmen, demon guards, elite guards. It's funny to think that they were all guarding him. After all, he ended up alone anyway. I wonder if he has anything to say. Or he wants to give up. After all, all of this only happened because of his stubbornness. He might not have been so stubborn before and handed over the stone. Leonte immediately got angry and started yelling that he didn't have the stone, that the stupid stone had just disappeared. If there was one, he would have used it a long time ago. Bahal didn't understand, and only I asked him if he was going to play to the end, because he no longer has any choice. He doesn't care. He immediately tried to strike, but the man put up a defense, and only now did he begin to realize just how stubborn he was. But it's possible that the stone is gone. I mean, it can't be, but even if it is, all he needs from a man is a way to create. After all, who knows how long the queen will be able to fight the three gods. I don't think she has time left. There was no way to let the others know that her dragon heart had been destroyed. Only she is capable and worthy of running the tower. Bahal actually apologized, but he was really in a big hurry because he needed to find the stone and restore her dragon heart. After attacking the man, he still managed to cover himself from that attack so he wouldn't get hit, and the man immediately started yelling at him to stop. He should give up finally, because he would die if he continued to be stubborn. After all, he should be done being stubborn. But then Leonte had incredible power. Bahal, as soon as he saw this, was shocked, for they must have been mocking. A man stood before him, and Bahal realized that, could it really be the dragon's energy? I mean, it was impossible. Where did he get that kind of power? But Leonte only said, for it doesn't really matter. He immediately stood up to deliver his attacks as quickly as possible, closing in on his opponent. But once he got as close as he could, 
He still didn't hit, but his look, he doesn't understand how dare he look at him like that. Pulling away from his opponent, Bahal immediately tried to use Diffo's power, but his opponent was already so close that he realized he didn't have time to react because of Divoff. Bahal only had time to put up a block that could protect him, but his opponent, as if joking, asked what was wrong with his face. Didn't he expect it? After all, now he wants to test how long he can last using all his power. Bahal didn't expect this. Is it really Gungnir? It is a modern weapon of the highest rank, once owned by one. But he didn't understand where he got Gungnir from. Using all his strength, he delivered a crushing blow that left only him standing. But then, as he looked up into the sky and then at his hands, he realized that he had used almost all of the dragon's energy, and now it was clear why Comusine had advised him to use it only in extreme cases. For if this power had originally belonged to him, he would not have needed the stone. But if he can get that kind of power with just a single stone... Just then, a voice came from the smoke and shouted to Leontai. It was Bahal, and he also shouted, How dare he! for he would never forgive him. But the man, just looking at Bahal, realized that he was pathetic, and in all likelihood he would have to use force to the end. But before he could think about it, another voice addressed him, telling him that here they were, meeting. Leonte couldn't have expected this. He didn't realize what was happening, for it was a familiar voice, and it was Aura. But he did not yet realize who it was, and our hero delivered a crushing blow to Leonta, from which he only fell. Bahwal, on seeing our heroes, was very much surprised. After all, how did he get here and why him? But our hero, approaching Leonta, does not believe that he has swallowed the core and power of the dragon Chonu. After all, did it disappear because the island of the Blue Flower was appropriated then? It was because of the dragon Kalthus that he had taken an interest in Chona in the first place, and they were close to each other. But the only thing that worries our heroes is that he can still get those powers. Our hero used Bathory's sword. He absorbed the remaining energy and his strength increased by two, his health increased by five. Bahal immediately asked our hero what he was doing and why he was here for he had ordered him to lead the second mercenary squad. So why he's doing it here is unknown. But it was a surprise to our hero, for he seemed savvy in turning around. Bahal was also surprised, for until now he had not realized what was what and what was the point of looking at our hero. He thought it was impossible, for our hero seemed weak, but it was a skill that only dragons and similar creatures could use, and he couldn't imagine anyone but the Summer Queen being capable of such a thing. He couldn't understand how this was even possible. If he has the power of dragons, he should get out of here alive and report back. The losses exceeded their expectations, but Kagutsuchi is still alive. Kagutsugi is a master blacksmith in Japan, and with him, the chance of winning without much loss increases manifold. Bahal thought about the fact that he didn't know what our hero was up to, but all he could tell from the murderers, Aura emanating from him, was that they would not be allies now, and it seems he expected them to destroy each other, or at least exoust each other badly, but his plan is not destined to come to fruition. After all, they immediately dispersed and the most important thing for Bahal was to get away from the battlefield as quickly as possible, for he had to report to his superiors what he had seen. He'd love to fight him, but so far he had no idea who he was dealing with. For if it weren't for his condition, but he should wait a little while and he'll get his. Our hero turned around and asked the question, hasn't it still dawned on you that you can't get away from it? After capturing a large area of territory, the process of being taken over by a dragon began. Our hero could spread his power and increase his skill level in a given territory. By doing so, he was able to capture Bahal, 
who could not understand how such a thing was possible, looking at our heroes. All he could think was, who was he and how did he get such powerful dragon power? Our hero decided to activate his dragon blood skill. During the limited time the skill is used, all characteristics are increased by a certain number of units. Defense also increases by a certain number of units during this time. Using this skill, he increased the defense of the captured territory by a given number of units. Thus, our hero awakened the power of the dragon. Dragon Blood, the ancient dragon Kalthus, established an eight-step process of acceptance and adaptation to the dragon body, facilitating the awakening process. Our hero is at the first stage, where dragon's blood has high resistance and defense, as it consists of partial mana. It also maximizes the user's body potential by activating dragon magic. User's sensitivity to territory assignment increases as their sense mastery increases. Perhaps they can be evolved to more powerful skills in the future. Our hero realizes that there is too much information and if he doesn't focus, he will lose control of the situation. His thoughts actually started moving faster, so he activated Dragon Blood Awakening. The Dragon Blood transfusion process has begun. Dragon's blood is highly resistant to various methods of influence and other types of magic, increases stamina, and speeds up the recovery process. Our hero felt it circulate throughout his body and increase his strength. It was the first dragon power. Bahel was shocked by our hero, for how dare he look down on one of the best rankers. Our hero immediately decided to attack his opponent using his dragon power. But Bahal only smiled at this, for he still intended to smite him. It's a shame he didn't do it sooner. Kagutsuchi is already on his way here, so they'll hear from him soon, and he's sure it won't take long for the Red Dragon Squad to arrive. After all, he didn't care if he had dragon power or not. He didn't have too high an opinion of himself. Our hero unleashed all his spirits predicting that all those present here would fall with Bahal. But the guy immediately realized that he not only had the skills of dragons in his arsenal, but also the powers of spirits. After all, having both of these powers can bring the entire tower into chaos, and it's scary to imagine what the wielder of both powers can do. The players, upon seeing the spirits, didn't realize what was going on. One of them ordered the others to run without turning around, for they had a little farther to go. But one of the spirits said he would follow orders, to which the players didn't realize who he was. These were the souls of the dead, and one of them cried out, For the glory of the Lord, we should do his will. And in just a moment the players were showered with souls. At this time Bahal realized that defeat was near, but the worst part was that the Kagutsuchi were dead. It couldn't have gotten any worse. After all, he couldn't remember a day since leaving Artia when he hadn't had it easy, and still nothing came easy. He did everything he could to survive and not lose heart. Even when he was nauseous, he always went all the way and despaired with skill. He was able to become one of the 81 red dragon eyes that were considered the best, but as he looked at our heroes, he realized that he seemed to have had a momentary lapse of judgment. In truth, he was about to run away tail tucked from our hero, but his eyes didn't change. Just then he launched an attack on our hero, asking, Do you really think you can defeat me? After all, he shouldn't be stocking up. He's emerged victorious from worse situations. Our hero was surprised, for it seems there was still only strength left in him. That's why he's called one of the best ranchers. Raising his hand, the man tried to strike, saying that he was Bahal, the victor of the strongest natural element of fire, striking a blow for our hero. Our hero, upon seeing the attack, immediately realized that he needed to make his attack to avoid getting hit. But Bahal didn't want to retreat so easily, so using fire lightning he continued to attack our hero. 
Our hero realized that Bahal was trying to distract him with flames, and once Bahal was too close to our hero, he decided to deliver a fiery blow towards Bahal, thus hitting the target. However, he didn't expect his opponent to be so strong, so our hero decided to unleash his fiery wings. We need to get this over with quickly, but Bahal's, because still, he thought he could fight back. But the power of the fire was not enough to stop our hero, who easily approached as quickly as possible and struck his opponent. But our hero wondered if Bahal himself was bored, so he still made the decision to end it once and for all by delivering a crushing blow to his opponent, from which the latter could do nothing more. Bahal was just wondering who he was, I was. But our hero took off his mask and asked the question, are you really curious about who I am? Looking at Bahal, who in turn thought it was impossible, I mean, how can that be? Bahal began to remember events that happened long ago in the tower, that very battle. But no sooner had he thought of it than our hero straightened up, glaring at him. But then, at some point, it started raining. Looking up, he only uttered his brother's name, Chonu. The girl began to realize that contact with one of her eyes had just been broken. But according to the contract, the bond cannot be broken at the will of the contractor. And that only meant one thing, that Bahal had been defeated, and even considering he had Kagutsuchi with him, the damn dragon's heart was about to burst. And she really did the best she could by being here but she didn't see what the point of, it all was if she never got the stone. The dragon was furious and the man didn't understand what was going on or why he was doing all this. Even perishing would be useless, for not even the three Muzins could defeat the Summer Queen. But then the man had Gungnir in his hands, and he didn't understand why the sword he had lent to Leontes was here and now. After all, they must be joking. Our hero, looking at Bahal, realized that he had finally found the power he needed, but then he was approached by spirits who informed him that all enemies in the area had been destroyed, to which our hero only said they were good. But our hero felt the bracelet vibrating strongly, expectedly as he absorbed not only the power of Bahal and Leonte, but also the souls of Komusin and Kagutsuchi. The number of high-level souls of powerful players had increased greatly, but it was unbelievable, for they were trying to get out, but they would soon have to realize it was futile. Perhaps there was something he didn't know about these warriors, so he was going to ask them about it later, and he wasn't sure he could properly use the thing to create and the protection that only souls were entitled to. But since there's a war because of this red dragon, we'll have to learn. The shower, however, immediately asked if there were any more orders, so our hero said no, for that was the end of it. Perhaps he could use this bracelet to strengthen his army by feeding on these souls. Our hero realized that he had achieved his goals, and that was the end of it for now. There were still warriors in the second squad, but if he was too greedy, they could get into trouble, and it wasn't time yet but by this time he had almost forgotten that they needed to tell Pantha and Edora that it was time for them to go, for they were done here, and it was time to retreat. The resistance was too strong. The man realized that he couldn't remember such an event since the war with Ardia. After all, he had to work hard to recover from it, but he still managed to gather capable people, uniting them and creating the island of the Blue Flower. However, because of this battle, they suffered too many losses. The power of the four legendary beasts dissolved into thin air forever, two of their gods gone. They also lost the very stone, and it was already difficult without it, and now it was even worse, for the man said that the Summer Queen was too greedy. The battle between the dragon and the man continued, but at the moment of the attack, another appeared in front of the man and repelled the attack. Saying that he's probably asking in vain, but what are these useless and pointless attacks? Turning around, all he asked was, Has he grown weary? 
But the man didn't answer for a while, and the man was a bit at a loss. But the man, after a little thought, decided that it was a good time to use Gungnir. So he asked that Chan Musin, Gun Musin, and the god of Volcano help him by joining them. He said that he had come to summon Gungnir, and it would take some time to use his power. This means that Gun Musin, as well as the man, need to pick a time to attack, but the dragon, seeing this, thought they were up to something. But as if the dragon could let him do anything with an attack with his tail, he failed. After all, they had great cover. The dragon was shocked that his attack didn't go through, and the guy after that immediately started attacking the dragon already. He, in turn, thought the guy was arrogant. But here the bow god had already joined in and began to strike while the dragon was distracted by another. The dragon was shocked by this, as it had to take quite a bit of damage. The man realized that her attacks were hitting right on target, and surely the Summer Queen's strength was running low. If you hit a gung near, it's bound to fall. From this outcome, they clearly had a sneer on their faces, so they immediately began to attack with fierce flames. But it was to the men's advantage, for it was excellent. They wanted her to keep getting angrier and angrier. Most importantly, make sure she doesn't get distracted from attacking with her man, because these are her last minutes. He said that was the exact moment, and the sunset arrow tried to strike, but the dragon dodged in time and the man didn't understand how it was possible that he missed. And the archer himself could not understand, for there could be no such thing. The bow god was shocked, as was the other man, who immediately shouted to him to save himself. But the man stayed in place, using his power to direct the strongest beam of his energy, resulting in a rather powerful explosion. Kalmason thought that because of this magic, all of his insides were damaged, and it seemed like he was about to pass out. But now all the questions he has been so desperately seeking answers to are beginning to fall into a groove, for the appearance of Tomosin, unprecedented infiltration of the Blue Flower Island despite the guards, those boxes that were brought in, and including rumors that Leonte had the stone. It's all an arm of the humongous in case. He seems to be delirious, Komusin said. Stop ragging on me and trying to do something. Just go quietly. But then the guy jumped up and said he'd get even with him. After all, how dare he, thought Komusin, but the man only smiled. What a welcome Chanmusin. After all, how could such a seasoned and skilled warrior forget to protect his body? The dragon in turn managed to strike with its tail, lifting that one quite a distance. The situation was taking a new turn, and the warriors of the island could not believe what was happening. After all, they always had a reason to fight and an unwavering belief in victory that kept them from giving up, even when facing a battle with the strongest enemy or the Reds, since the strongest martial arts gods were side by side with them. However, Gun Musin's betrayal shocked everyone, along with the fact that the two strongest warriors were on the verge between life and death, and the dragon realized it was taking longer than he thought. But in front of the man, Chan Musin, who covered his body, the man realized that, unaccountably, he had lost consciousness. I mean, not him. He is the core and strength of the sharp blue flower, and he was the only friend. He couldn't just let him die like that. After all, the island of the blue flower does not fall as long as Komusin is alive. And the only order given was to protect him at all costs. At the same second, the Blue Flower Islands that were perceptive of the war spirit looked at the dragon and raised their weapons and pointed them towards the Summer Queen. After all, they had only one single goal, buying time for Chan Musin and Komusin to escape. For that, they were willing to give up everything. But the dragon only told them to stop, for if they thought he would just let them go so easily, he didn't. Do the most damage to your enemies. To which Pont watched from the sidelines. Someone singularly asked our heroes, Did it all work out? 
After all, they do come from his plan, but they are somehow uneasy. Our hero turned around and said that everything was right, for now their interference would be out of place. Yes, and the rest of us will be grateful for it. Pant had just heard about it and didn't understand what it was all about. And could he have explained? Edora immediately stepped in and asked her brother why he thought their tribe showed up at the very end of the battle, at which Pant hesitated, for he did not know. Even though it was a surprise attack, he doesn't think they had a clue. Yeah, and the kid's dad likes to meddle in things and make a fuss. Adora immediately said that she thought there was no more use from the alliance with the sharp blue flower, and there was also a high probability that the red dragon had sent his own to the tribe. Even after Karam was conquered, they didn't touch anyone, which means they respect them, and that's the end of the blue flower island, so they certainly have nothing to fight the tribe of one-horned men. Pont taking a header just wondering what these elaborate schemes were. Why can't we just live? But Adora's point was that nothing is hard, because in politics there is always one outcome, and he needs to achieve that if he wants to be king, and that was the power our heroes were heading on their way. And after a while they did come to Muan, who greeted his daughter and son, to which our hero looked up and asked if they would like to say hello to him. The master only said that he had his own life, and why say hello, because they had traveled and were satisfied with the result. The weekday sun came running back, to which our hero said that, perhaps you could say that. The master then swept up to see if he had managed to absorb anything this time, for he was constantly returning in a new guise. Yes, and his body had changed, including his odor. Our hero realized that you can't hide anything in front of King Muan, and he really tried to hide Dragon Awakening. So all he said was that he would explain it to him a little later. To which the foreman said, okay, but if it's something worthwhile, he should share, because there are already too many secrets around him. But since he doesn't want to, he doesn't hold them back any longer. As soon as Pant and Adora and our hero began to leave, the master called our hero over asking him only one thing, if he was done with his business. To which our guy looked at the master, thought a little and smiled, and leaned in. He thanked and said it was all thanks to him. So the master immediately said that he could go. Reading further scrolls, a smile also appeared on his face. And after a while one of the players asked the master not to leave them, because they can't just leave. After all, they have an alliance with them. He asks, although Chang Muxin and Komusen managed to escape, their location is not exactly known, so surely the Red Dragon is already chasing them. So he asks that they help the Blue Flower Island. Mu Wan, looking at the player, did not understand why they needed it, to which he said that they had a treaty with him, and the island of the Blue Flower is now on the verge of destruction, and even now the Red Dragon continues to actively besiege their positions. So, our hero thought, because that means they are already storming the main units of the Blue Flower Island, and it's much faster than he expected. His. But he wondered if it was because of the stone. The player went on to say that, in addition, Chan Musin and Komusin are part of the tribe to which the man replied that they had been excluded a very long time ago and had nothing to do with them, and he should get out, for their alliance rests on equality in strength and power of the island, the flower and the tribe of peers. However, they can barely stand up to anyone at this point, so they don't have a one-rod tribe. Our hero understood this and realized that it was quite a strong hardness. In a word, he ruined his student and his own blood. Now our hero understood how he had managed to develop the tribe, and right now it was on his side. He is afraid to imagine what fate will befall him if something goes wrong, for at this point only one thing can be said. The sharp flower no longer exists. They were unexpectedly easy to defeat thanks to Gunmuzen's betrayal, 
and who knew that one of the eight clans would go so fast over such a small thing? Surely the other clans will start a battle for what's left of them, and if that happens, a war between the sharp blue flower and the red dragon will go down in history as the beginning of a disaster and needed to focus and get stronger. After all, he must deal with the dragon abilities and the ones he acquired in the battle with Bahal. It has become clear to our hero that he needs to learn a lot, because not all dragon skills are available, so you need to practice as much as possible, unlocking them one by one. Although it will take a long time, this quest given by the Turtle of the Abyss of Bahal and Leontes' soul is already in his collection, so we'll have to talk later and get the information about the stone out of them, and then go back to learning the technique, and also to the offense. But of course, he should finish the egg awakening first. At the same time, someone in the tribe was talking about how it was impossible. What's the rush? After all, who could have known it was too early in the egg? It's worth leaving it alone, letting it open up on its own. After all, the guy needed to finish passing the 11th floor. They need more time to research, and he hasn't even found the moon seed. How will he order the egg to be opened? After all, there's no way they would do it, and even if he wanted to, they wouldn't let him do it. Our hero thought that maybe he should just ignore them, but the elders immediately said that it wasn't just an egg after all. While studying it, they realized that it contained divine power and they could not awaken it without the moon seed. Our hero heard the divine power and realized that someone like the four legendary beasts might be there. Edora immediately interrupted, apologizing, and said that normally they weren't so stroppy, but right now they were working very seriously and passionately on this egg, and they're really concerned that it's going to go downhill after a while. Will it be possible to awaken him without it? Our hero thought for a while and realized that he didn't know. After all, he thinks it won't be easy. There had to be a way for sure, and he would find it. In addition, after the divine beasts awakened, crystals formed by the intertwined four different auras would appear. The blessing of the four divine beasts should help with this. And to top it off, he had recently begun to sense the egg dweller and feel its thoughts. It wants to wake up and say something to our hero. After all, it's not just communicating mentally, but in person, in front of another. Just then, a little boy flew over to them and said he wanted to see his new friend too, from which the elders were shocked at what they saw. When they saw Phoenix, they were delighted, for he also absorbed the souls of the saber-toothed tiger. As they watched the phoenix, they thought about, this is what a divine beast looks like, and apparently they really do change their appearance, adjusting to their master. The black feathers need to make a record of them, as it was quite unusual and the first time they've seen such a thing. I wonder how the look will change in the future. Will they be able to study it even a little bit further? But the baby looked at our heroes and said they were so weird and annoying. Can he get rid of them? To which our hero told the toddler and his sister to put their heads down. Our hero then entered the room, asking permission to enter, and the man now realized what was making the outside so noisy today. For when he is concentrated, he does not notice anything around him, and, as the elders see, is very busy. The kid can come in, because he'll explain it to them later. Our hero thanked and said that he was not worried, for this was the chief elder, the second strongest man in the tribe after King Muwan. Different energy comes from them, but it's still filled with power. I guess that's why everyone is so afraid of him. Our hero, looking at the egg, wondered why it had gotten bigger, to which the man replied that, yes, the height is now almost four meters and is constantly increasing. So our hero, looking at the egg, questioned how much of a door it would be when they went inside. The elder said he didn't know, but if it was still in the embryo pose, taking its shape, it would likely reach five meters. And our hero realized that meant waking him up outside, 
to which the elder said that would be very apropos so that those fools outside could investigate him as well. Take the egg outside, someone questioned. Is it true that an egg can be awakened? To which our hero said there was one way, and the elder said that he was glad, but he was still worried about the egg, to which our hero wanted to be curious and find out the reason for such excitement. And the elder, of course, explained that they weren't sure if it was a divine beast, but he didn't sense any unique trait about it that was unique to them. And that's the only reason the elders want to wait. Because if they hold it early, there could be trouble. Also, there is a lot of power coming from it, but because of the resistance, he can't tell what it is. The elder tried to constantly check what was inside, but she couldn't. Our hero thought that the power of resistance might be the cause. After all, because of resistance, it is impossible to determine its strength and traits. Such a thing was impossible for divine beasts, but he was sure that the moment had come and the beast itself wanted to stop resisting in front of our hero. So the elder Thoten said that he was sure of the necessity and inevitability of his awakening, so he can't affect our hero anyway. The elder held out his hand and told our hero to hold on. Our hero has successfully completed an additional quest, thus earning 5,000 achievements. As a reward, he received improved relations with the tribe for 150 points. Now, I practically consider them members of the one Horn tribe. Taking what the elder was handing over in his hand, he was a little surprised, for these were intelligent seeds. In this way, he received intelligent seeds, and he had the added blessing of a divine beast that he could use at will. Holy seed growing under the intelligent light can be used as a potion with a special method of preparation. The elder looked at our hero carefully and wondered. Pant and Edora are part of the One Horn tribe, and he's been with them all this time and for a minute members of the royal family so they had no doubt that he would pass the additional quest. Our hero can consider it a gift for taking care of them. To be honest, the elder himself would like to see the awakening as soon as possible. Our hero just thanked the elder to which he told him to get started already, because he can't wait to see what happens inside. Plus, the audience is getting bigger and bigger, and they're obviously tired of waiting. Even the king showed up, who yawningly asked them if they had started yet. Our hero, noticing the king, was surprised, to which the latter said that if he thought he would miss such an event, then let there not be a marvelous unknown creature there. To which our hero said they were just in time and it was time to meet him. Our hero realized that he must not just appear in the world, but be reborn, so he immediately began to use the moon seeds and the power of the four sacred beasts. Well, and also, of course, the power of the dragon that is in the stone. Although we were all well aware that it was almost gone because of Leonte, the core was still preserved, and that would be enough to pull off such a trick. And once all the ingredients for the awakening were ready, our hero immediately ordered that the beast that was in the egg should wake up. Immediately in an instant the process began and the egg began to crack. Cracking in half, a powerful red energy was also released from the egg, and then a dragon flew out of it, standing in front of our hero and looking at him. Immediately he rambled on about the fact that they had finally met. Looking at our hero, the dragon also said that he had been waiting a long time to be called again. Pant looked at it with shock for it was probably a dragon of existence. But he also realized that he looked completely different than expected. It was real. Pant wanted to see if he had the right understanding of everything that was going on. So immediately he asked his sister if he had the right thoughts on the matter, to which the girl replied that it didn't seem to be a dragon of being since it looked so much like Akasha, although different aura emanated from them. But still the strangest thing was that Idora could not call him a dragon, for he was surrounded by terrifyingly strong dark magic. Pant pondered, could a dragon of existence be endowed with it? 
But the girl said she didn't know, for since this was the first time she had seen such a thing using her skills. Besides, it was impossible, for despite the dark aura in his beasts, the girl didn't understand how this was even possible, because it couldn't be. Also, the elder noted that these creatures were as strong as the divine dragon, and he had made up his mind that they would think of him as a mythical beast, for no one had ever encountered such a thing before and was unlikely to guess anything about it. As he looked at the egg, he also realized that he could see how the magic tower would stand on its ears from the dark dragon, for it had finally descended into their world. The dragon's implication was that he had waited too long in oblivion without a physical body, and only their meeting gave him hope that he could be reborn. And our hero knew it could happen. But after a moment, the dragon didn't understand what had happened, for he used to talk to him all the time, but for some reason he couldn't utter a word now. Though the dragon realized that this appearance could be a shock to him as well, but as soon as the dragon finished, our hero apologized to him, for he was not the man he expected to see. Hearing this, the dragon didn't understand what was going on or what the guy was talking about. Turning around, our hero asked the teacher's permission to step back, for they needed to talk privately and could he ask to be excused for a while. Muwan only waved his head, giving his consent for our hero to step back and speak to the dragon alone, out of sight. Our hero simply said thank you and in that same instant, using his skills, he immediately began to fly away with the dragon rather quickly and swiftly to a quiet place so they could talk. But the elders who were standing around didn't realize where they were going, because they hadn't had time to write it down yet. They had so much to write down, and they didn't want them to leave. They needed them back as soon as possible. Muwan also thought that a dragon with a dark aura was quite interesting for him. After all, there was no equivalent of such a fundamental power that could not be extracted or created by art like poison or illusion. Such power was something only a demon of the 98th floor could control. The dark power distorts the soul of the host, making it incredibly powerful and terrifying. But like the clan of the eight lords of darkness, many would be willing to give up everything for such power. After all, the mythical dragon is one of the most powerful magical creatures, for it is able to assume a form similar to its master. But as he turned around, he didn't realize what was happening to the dark dragon, or what would come of it. In the meantime, our hero and the dragon flew to a remote place to talk, and he asked the dragon what it was about, for had he lost his memory from the shock. He cut off contact with him and told him to get on with his life, but he believed they would meet again. And coincidentally, he realized he wasn't wrong in his opinion, thankfully. Our hero thought for a bit and realized that's why the dragon is still alive, because awakened beasts are inseparable from their master, even though the ancient dragon Kalatis was the embodiment of Chonu's soul. And both complemented each other's powers, becoming wielders of frightening might. When the host dies, the dragon also loses its physical shell. It was only now that our hero realized that perhaps Chonu knew of the impending doom and protected his dragon. So our hero, without long hesitation, took off his mask and said that he was not the man he said he was looking for, introducing himself to Yen and announcing that he was Chan's brother. The dragon, looking at our hero, could not understand how such a thing was possible. And our hero noticed that he and he are twins because they look so similar in appearance. And thanks to Chan's diary, he was able to access his memories and enter the tower. His goal is to find those who ruined his brother and make them regret it once and for all. It was only now that the dragon began to realize that Chonu was dead after all. Our hero lowered his head and said that, unfortunately, he would probably have a hard enough time accepting such a thing. So he made the decision that he needed to think about all these thoughts for a while, and so he would leave it for a while. But the dragon immediately said no. 
They say he is not lying, even though he is not his master, but is bound to him by blood, and he sees that he speaks only the truth. But the dragon had a question. Did he come here to deal with those who had ruined his master? Will he be able to keep his word and not let him down? To which our hero turned around and said that he would certainly keep his word because his real goal was revenge, and nothing would stop him. He will destroy the entire tower, and perhaps only then will he be able to quench his pain and anger a little. The dragon was even a little shocked from such an answer because he didn't expect it, but after a while he said that he was crazy, but he likes this kind of thing quite a lot and he hopes that he won't disappoint him and will still fulfill everything that he literally recently said. After noticing that our hero is now his new master and he only wants to follow him, the dragon realized that in order to do so, our hero needs to accept him, and without any doubt our hero agreed to it, to which the dragon remarked that he should then be given a new name, for he had been reborn in a new body, and therefore needed a new name from his new master. Edora, she said, Cain's back sooner than she expected, but how's the dark dragon doing? To which our hero only said that he needed rest and full recovery after awakening, for he was not yet accustomed to his strength and body. But, as he said, the elder still woke him up a little earlier after the deadline, but the girl said that she didn't think that the reason was only because Although he was a legendary beast, he still needed time to fully integrate the powers of the four beasts and the dragon of nothingness. And our hero turned to the girl, for he wanted to know how true it was that he was bad at making up names. And the girl, remembering Chirik, smiled a little, but also asked him what his situation was. To which our hero said that he wanted to name the dragon but he got angry and now he has to come up with a new one or their contract will be cancelled. And the girl, out of curiosity, inquired what the guy wanted to name him, to which our hero also said that he wanted to call him Greg. And as soon as the girl heard that name, she immediately smiled. And our hero continued with what else he wanted to offer Grin. After all, he thought it was a normal name, and he didn't see what the problem was with them. Also, our hero was reminded of the hidden quest, Trial of the Abyss Turtle. After all, the Turtle of the Abyss, with interest watched his success in passing quests, wanting to test him, because she was looking for a suitable replacement for himself, so he will have to distract from the accomplishment of revenge and find a mythical beast that can become a worthy successor and turn him into a legendary beast. And our hero thought about it, because legendary beasts symbolize the world of the tower from the tenth floor, and it is not easy to create a legendary beast because otherwise everyone would have them, and this quest is more difficult than passing thirty, forty floors. And he certainly has beasts that could take their place. But there was one but that confused him enough. Turning around, he called out to Pant and Adora, saying he wanted to talk to them outside. Pant also asked what he wanted to talk about, and also said that he hadn't slept at all, as he was just thinking hard. Idora had already apologized, for they hadn't yet figured out the best name for his dragon. And so the moment came, and there was pitch-black silence, for our hero did not know how to solve the problem and asked others for advice. And the brother and sister, who also did not know how to solve the problem, quickly tired, but our hero said that's not what he wanted to talk about, and when he went outside after a while, the girl asked if she understood correctly that he wanted to make a mythical beast into a legendary one. To which our hero replied that yes, for with his help it would be enough for the mythical beast that absorbed their dreams. Plus, he'll share the powers of the legendary beast and help them with his energy, and everything should work out for them. Pant said that's certainly a good thing. That's it but is he sure he wants to share the powers of the legendary beast with them? And our hero said that not by everyone, after all, but that's not a bad thing, and he's going to be careful and considerate because it's going to work out. 
Using the A-level abyss sphere plus the ancient dragon creation sphere several thousand years ago, which combined the essence of the void and abyss into one whole. This could be material for players who deal with dark items. Also the flower of an A-level legendary beast, a medicinal plant created after much research by the leader of a peer tribe. By ingesting it, the beast can evolve through several stages, unlocking previously hidden skills. And the girl was shocked when she heard about the legendary beast flower and the abyss sphere. After all, it was worth giving them so many great elements. But our hero's point is that they need to create a legendary beast. So in fact, it's an investment in the future, which they're taking full advantage of. After all, only if they failed would it be all for nothing, and there was no point in further storage. Pont immediately said that it was a great solution, and then they had no reason to refuse since they too would be able to get a divine beast as a companion. But the girl still wasn't sure if it was worth a try. After all, these were still top-level items and could only be used once. To which our hero said it was okay, because those ingredients would be much healthier for them. They should use them when the time comes. Also, our hero thought about the fact that Pant and Adora hadn't arrived on the 11th floor yet. There is no reason for them to refuse such an offer. Yes, and the orb wouldn't do much good, as it was weak to his beasts, and it would be much better to turn it into an amulet, and of course, with Cherik's flower and Dark Dragon still haven't developed their potentials to their maximum, so it's unlikely that these items will benefit them. So it's worth doing their evolution and strength building first. He also said that the four legendary beasts of the 11th floor were dead, and it would take a lot of effort and time to revive them, which means that the 11th floor will be in total chaos for a while because the balance on it was upset with the destruction of the guards. If their beasts also stayed legendary, they would absolutely be able to take the positions of the four pillars of the 11th floor, and then the 11th floor would be under their full control, and they would receive a decent reward for their passage and experience. Pant was ecstatic, for he hadn't believed until the end that the guy would actually do this for them. So, of course, Edora was also happy to give thanks to which our hero said that they should not thank him, for he was also doing it in order to complete the quest. But since they had already agreed, Pant rejoiced, for he realized that they could gain quite a lot by taking over the eleventh floor. And also, the girl had also mentioned that she thought the elder would be most excited, because then they would be able to explore their new legendary beasts. So apparently our hero realized that they had already made a deal. After all, if the eleventh floor was in his hands, all the beasts would become subject to him alone, and that was far more important than experience and rewards. So he realized that it was a pretty good investment for the future, as he had said earlier. Plus, he'll be able to get worthwhile system rewards right away and will have the entire floor under control and what others can never get. In addition, there will be an opportunity to get previously tower system achievements and rewards. Turning away, our hero said he would leave his brother and sister for a while, and Pont asked where he was going, since they hadn't come up with a name yet, to which our hero said that it's not that urgent and it can wait, because he wants to practice a bit, so they will meet a little later. To which the girl said, okay, of course, and the guy remarked that he was too busy lately. After all, he doesn't even have time to rest, at least to eat, for starters. And having already moved far enough away, where he realized that here he would not be disturbed, he immediately began to summon spirits from the bracelet, and two guys appeared in front of him who did not understand where they were. It was Bahal and Leonte. Bahal already thought they had managed to get out, but our hero, asking if they enjoyed the walk, for he was sure they missed this world, among the spirits there is no place as good as here. And two guys, seeing our hero, immediately screamed, but so far they did not understand what was happening, because they could not do anything. 
for they were enveloped by some incomprehensible force. And our hero said that he didn't bring them back to walk around here, because it's time for all his questions to be answered, and he hopes they can handle it. Bahal immediately started yelling that he wished the guy would let them go, but they didn't realize yet what was going on, looking at our hero and saying that his tricks wouldn't stop them, because it was funny. But a moment later, Bahal could feel our hero's over-the-top noise and strength on her. They also immediately asked that he stop doing it, because they are asking for it. To which our hero, taking off his mask, said that he was repeating himself for the last time, for he wanted answers. Immediately, he asked what they knew about the red dragon attack stone on the sharp blue flower. After all, they must tell everything they know without deceiving him, and one of the guys said they didn't understand, because they were dead. But why do they have pain so bad that they can't cope? And looking at our hero, they didn't understand how he did it. But they also realized that it wasn't Chonu, for he was well aware that they were only similar in appearance, but nothing more. But he was still interested in who he was and what he wanted. To which our hero replied that he was the only one asking questions here and no one else, and using his powers, he proceeded to damage Bahal. The one, in turn, asked that he stop and stop, for he would tell him everything he knew. Only he should stop doing it, because he can't stand it. But our hero did not stop. He only approached Leonta, who looked with great fear at our heroes, to which the latter, in turn, said that he knew much more than Bahal. And after a while, Leonte asked our hero to stop, because he had already told him everything and knew nothing more, so he asked to stop. To which our hero replied, so he created the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone is a magical item that every player in the tower wants to get their hands on. The stone is endowed with infinite partial mana, capable of creating a wide variety of spells. There are many rumors about him, but no one has ever seen him in person. Angry Our Hero began to say that Leonti is holding on like a fool because he thinks he can be noodled around. Leonti said he was telling the truth because what would be the point of him lying in a situation like this? He knew that no one had ever managed to create such a stone before, but he did. Therefore, Our Hero received the necessary information to unlock the hidden text which stated that the purest form of energy in the world is the human soul, and this stone was created by processing many pure souls with the help of the emerald tablet. However, it was in an unfinished state. The artifact exists in the tower in a single copy and can only belong to its owner. It will also be impossible to change owners in the future. The artifact, in turn, was not ready, and only after the Philosopher's Stone was completed would he be able to see the hidden information about it and its characteristics. It was only now that our hero realized that he had not, in all probability, lied, but he did not understand how he had managed to do it, for he did not think it was possible for such a shallow creature as he, to which Leonte said he was able to get his hands on the emerald plaque didn't understand what the emerald tablet was or what it was, to which the guy said it was an ancient scripture, an instruction manual that Vera possessed. It's the only way to create the sage stone. And as soon as our hero heard Vera's name, he was shocked. Is he talking about Vera Dune? Well, Leonte said right, and now he can straighten him out. But our hero realized after a bit of thought that he had fallen for her hook because apparently the stars of Vieira Dune were part of the Valpu Rdi Eva of the night, who was not among the eight most powerful clones, but made him shudder at the mere mention. In terms of power and strength of authority, she was definitely not inferior to them. After all, Vera Dune was one of Artia's most valuable members and Chonu's love interest. Speaking of her, many guises, sweet beauty, grateful lady, lecherous heart snatcher, and many more such variations. 
She was always like a chameleon adapting to any situation, presenting to others that desired guise, charming the victim. Her main skill is temptation and mind control, and when one realizes that she's got him wrapped around her finger, it's quite late. Chonu, for his part, was only able to see Vieira's real face after he lost everything, given how much Leonte has a taste for power and women. No wonder he fell under her spell. But also our hero was curious about what that ancient scripture said about the stone and how he was able to find it. Leonte immediately said that the emerald tablets contained instructions on how to create the stone. Blue Flower Island and Walpurgis Knight have formed an alliance to traverse the dungeon on the 69th floor. Vieira Dune was supposed to pick it up, but he managed to keep the original by substituting a plaque. He also didn't want Kamusen to find out about it, so he tried to find a place where he would never find her. But he felt like he had the entire tower in the palm of his hand, and he needed a place that no one knew about where he could experiment on the other players. To which our hero asked, Where's that plaque now? But the guy said he destroyed it by smashing it. And our hero was frustrated, for he could learn so much more if he looked through the dragon's eyes. He then asked the guy to tell what it said. To which the guy said that if he told him what it said, he would let him go. And our hero agreed, promising to help the guy disappear. Leonti immediately thanked our hero and said he would tell everything. In doing so, our hero discovered the dragon knowledge of Hakam. The search for information on his request begins. Eight topics related to the Philosopher's Stone. He can explore two of them. Creation through alchemy based on magical engineering. How ancient is alchemy? It would be hard enough and take a decent amount of time, but he was sure it was fake that it was fake, and he didn't think it was all lies here, but someone had made it on purpose, and it was worth admitting they'd done a pretty good job. He also wondered who had written the Emerald Tablet, and, of course, uh, why did Vera Dune need this plaque? Leonte also said that he has already told everything and is asking to be released, to which our hero said, I haven't forgotten at all, and summoned the spirit Boo, instructed him to give orders. The guy said to give the order to eat. The spirit thanked him for the food, but immediately the guy started yelling that he promised, and the spirit at once carried out his command, at which Bahal looked and realized that he was not going to let them go or save them, for all he wanted was information, and once he had it, he would apply it to their souls. They have no chance of rebirth. Our hero also turned around and said that a guy has to realize what he needs. And Bahal immediately said that the situation is really desperate because he wants to end it. And so he will tell everything. But since he still hasn't realized that the reason why the Summer Queen attacked and destroyed the Blue Flower Island is because of the Philosopher's Stone, only you are giving him help and really not Chonu. After all, they had to fight in the past, and despite losing, Chonu had seriously injured the queen, and no one ever found out about it. On that day, the heart from the Summer Queen's dragon was destroyed. The dragon heart is not just a muscle that pumps blood. It is something of a mana reservoir and helps dragons use their abilities to the max. And after such a thing, she was so desperate and willing to start a war in such a state all for the sake of finding a philosopher's stone that would help restore her dragon's heart and power. But he realized that perhaps he was wrong, since the stone Leonte had spoken of had turned out to be a fake, and one could draw the logical conclusion that he was going in the wrong direction. And our hero, smiling, thought that it turned out that his brother had still managed to do some serious damage to her without letting her use himself and hadn't died in vain. And these two fools fought amongst themselves without even knowing where the stone was actually located. With that, our hero didn't think he could say he was actually interested in the stone, but it was still better to modify the plan a bit. After all, if the Summer Queen wanted to use the stone to restore her dragon's heart, he was sure it would definitely come in handy. 
and he thinks it would work for both increasing the quantity and quality of mana, or creating two means for a dragon. Bahal had also implied that he didn't know what he was up to, and this information was helpful, as not many people know about the Summer Queen's dragon state. If the eight clans found out, the consequences would be such that Blue Flower Island would fall, and the tower will be cast down into the abysses of chaos, and he hopes he doesn't miss the chance to take advantage of the situation. To which our hero told him not to come any closer until he had told all he knew. Bahal also asked him about the presence of an artifact, a ring. To which our hero, taking out a ring, asked what exactly he was talking about, since it was the most common artifact. Bahal looked at it and said that he was really so lucky that it was even hard to believe it, since he hadn't tried to open the ring yet, and he was sure he would find a lot of interesting things inside. After all, he needs to focus on the patterns and channel his mana into them. And yet our hero obeyed, and in a moment a strong illumination appeared from the ring, and he realized that it was the same. Going inside, our hero didn't realize what this place was yet, but it turned out to be the key to the Entrenian Gate later on. It was a key that opened the owner a passageway to the Entrenian, a magical vault created by the Summer Queen, Mistress of the Red Dragon, by compressing and transforming immense space. Because of this, the storage unit boasts a huge capacity. Because the host is connected to the ring on a subconscious level, they can move necessary items into their world without moving directly into the Entrenian itself. It was the infinite Entrenian vault, which could hold any item in unlimited quantities because it was limitless. It is also easy to move since it is in another world and has no characteristics such as weight. Only now our hero, examining it, was surprised at the endless storage. As he looked, he realized that there were quite a few gold bars. They're not called clans for nothing after all. After all, now there was no need to worry about money. He also realized how incredible the Red Dragon treasury was, because he really couldn't see the end of it. But using his abilities, he had already moved into the magic vault in an instant. After all, everything is allocated to cases. It's even bigger than the library of a homogeneous tribe. But there was some kind of door in front of him, and our hero wondered what was inside. Opening the door, our hero saw something in front of him that he was very much shocked by. And everyone had to joke about it, because as he got closer he realized it was just what he needed. After all, so much rare material is collected in one place. It was definitely the vault where the Summer Queen kept everything she needed to create the stone. But who would have thought she would give him such a gift? After all, he finally knows the contents of the Emerald Tablet, and he has all the ingredients he needs. With all of this, it was only a matter of time before the stone was created. Sure, maybe not all the information is true, but using the dragon's knowledge, he can definitely do the necessary research and solve the problem. And after a little thought, our hero remembered Bram. After all, he feels like his help will be needed as he is one of the two alchemists Chonu was familiar with, and he is said to have a rather peculiar and conflicted character. But he was unlikely to refuse him, after all he was related to Chonu. And it's very fortunate that he's not in hiding, as he was even able to use his name during the search for Haliod. But also our hero realized that he needed to get stronger to get to him. After all, He's already a rancher and has settled into the upper floors. As he left the treasury, he approached Brahm, saying that he hadn't expected the information from him to be so useful. But the guy said he'd let him be reborn as a reward. But our hero said he could not do that, for he himself must realize it. After all, it wouldn't do him any good anyway. And there's someone waiting for him. Bahal had expected this, of course, but he hadn't had the slightest inkling that he might allow him to be reborn. But he also realized that he had remained an idiot to the end, and our hero immediately summoned the spirit of Shannon, 
ordering it to consume him, and as soon as he did so, the knight successfully absorbed the enemy's soul. All stats were boosted, and his dark attributes were increased by 15 points, making him even stronger. With that, the knight was able to, and our hero realized that they were very lucky, for he had obtained the outstanding skill of Bahal. With this, he would be able to upgrade Shanan and Boo, and our hero realized that since they had already become much stronger, something incomprehensible had begun. After all, the evolution of Shannon and the knight influenced our hero as well, and the sword of the vampire Bathory was used. By doing so, our player was able to take the enemy's energy and acquire the skill creation skill, Heavenly Fire No. 4. Our hero realized that this was something he couldn't even imagine, as he didn't realize that Bahal's energy could affect him so much as well. Heavenly Fire was Bahal's iconic skillet that released stored fire energy that appeared in the form of lightning. These lightning bolts were so fast and powerful that they took away the target's ability to move. At the moment, this skillet was blocked, as it required high skill to use, as well as an increased concentration of magic in the body and level of mastery of it. Thunder Sigma, proportional to mana consumption, emitted even more powerful lightning bolts, sometimes shattering the enemy's defense barriers and throwing them into terror. After using the skill, the fire sprays would leave burns, burning for an extended period of time and there was a chance to destroy the enemy's healing magic. It also increased the pain from the burning sensation of the flesh, and our hero realized that even his brother, with his mana and body development, didn't possess heavenly fire and two other such destructive skills. He had a lot of skills that he could use consistently, but they weren't devastating. However, that's all about to change. Now, thanks to Cherik, his affinity for fire at a high enough level, his skill and amount of mana consumption, and thanks to his dragon body. But then Shannon approached him, asking if he could, but our hero immediately replied, no. Shannon said he hasn't said anything yet to say no. Our hero already knew what he wanted to talk about. Shannon also brought up the point that he himself should realize that he wouldn't submit to him, and maybe he could. But our hero immediately said no again, for very soon he would call him master. After absorbing the sacred beast's magic, he would be able to capture its soul and add it to their collection. Thus he ordered that one to appear, and Thomason appeared before him. Raising his eyes, the man looked at our hero, and the latter in turn said that he would not stall, and ordered that he should obey him. Our hero also assured that he would then save his son. Tomusin was surprised at such an act, for he thought his boy was gone. But how will this be possible after the overthrow of the Blue Flower Island? Because he's lying to him. Having regained bits of his consciousness, he was able to look at their world and was well aware that he knew nothing of the fates of Blue Flower Island and Red Dragon Island after the war, and he couldn't believe the words of our hero, who in turn said that, did he have a choice? Turning around, our hero only told him to follow him, the blind man, and after a while they were approaching one of the buildings, stopping on the roof. Tomusin questioned our hero about what he was up to. Is this really a village of one-horned men? And our hero didn't say anything back, just told him to look straight ahead. Looking into one of the buildings, Tomusin saw his son, and he was indeed alive. But at the same time, he didn't understand how this was possible, or why he was here. Our hero immediately said that he had moved him here before the war, when Bahal told him to deal with him as he had no time for it. The man only thought that he really wasn't going to leave it behind by getting angry at the Red Dragon, but our hero also said to say, thank you to Charik. But the man didn't realize who he was talking about. And then our hero said it was the child who destroyed the phoenix. After all, he did want to straighten him out, as he had no need to draw attention to himself not in the sense of Bahal. 
Yes, this was a good opportunity to avenge his spilled phoenix blood. But the little boy stopped our hero even though he was the son of the one who ruined his parents. He said he didn't want others to go through similar suffering and insisted that the large number of deaths was pointless. Tomusin. Why? And how could this happen in the tower? After all, here, day after day, hundreds of new offenses disappear and hundreds of new ones appear, and everyone is willing to do anything to achieve their goals. My life has been no exception to that rule. After a little thought, he said he would not forget the fact that our hero had saved his son, and our hero, turning around, was surprised, for the man struck with his fist. The legendary Thomason, Islands of Blue Flower, greets his master. The soul transformation was successful, and the second knight was born. By doing so, a rare achievement was achieved, and he was awarded additional karma points, added 3,000 karma, and then another 2,000 karma. The knight will become his faithful haste due to the effect of the Black King's desperation, wristbands, he will become his protector and weapon. The name of the new wealthy knight is Han Ren. Loyalty increased by 15 points and obedience increased by 5 points. The knight realized that his body had become very heavy and it did not match the characteristics of his soul. Skills and powers would be redistributed and all of his stats would be reduced by 21 points and then another 17. Our hero was very upset because his stats had dropped too much, and being a ranker, he was much more powerful. But what to do with him now, he didn't understand. Despite the decrease in stats, the knight's soul is still too powerful for his body, and he will need an increase in fitness stats to regain his combat potential. And this pleased our hero a little because he did not lose all his points, and Iran remained the same. But immediately, the knight bowed and asked for the nine great swords to be returned to him, to which our hero only asked, does he need it for his skillet? To which the knight said, that's right, because he has two of the strongest skills, the nine sword shrine and sword winding. He needs to develop his physical form and his swords to use them. After all, the number of swords and their characteristics directly affects his damage, Simply put, the higher their quality and the greater their number, the more powerful the damage will be. But our hero, after a little thought, realized that the treasure house must be something suitable, and he would give him such for the present, and afterwards get him something better. The knight thanked our hero, and he immediately thought, for he was just thinking whether he should find something spirit in the vault or not and he realized that he should meet Heneva later. After a while, our heroes continued to have training sessions. He fought his master, realizing that he had incredible resistance and strength. The king was quite strong, and at one point he jumped up, preparing to attack, concentrating all his energy and magic in his fist to deal damage to our hero. But he, in turn, also used magic. Our hero wasn't Gubit Catfish, and he still realized that there would be nothing left of him after such a blow. He definitely couldn't be fought at full strength, because he was so eager to hide his true strength. There's no other way to deal with him. Perhaps he would be able to defeat him, even with all his strength and skills. But it was far better than doom. Using his wings, he still turned away from the impact to which the master said that he had finally done it, for it was only now that he had failed to really show himself. But Muwan didn't want to stop there, so he continued to attack. After a while, our hero realized that it was as if he had become even stronger and faster, and was he really giving in to it? After all, only now did he realize what King Muwan was really like. Still, our hero, using his sword, decided to end this game using the patronage of the blue spirit, Heavenly Fire. Muwan, as soon as he saw it, was delighted, for he thought it wasn't bad. When he looked back, he was shocked, but immediately laughed, because looking at our hero, he realized that he had become much stronger than he was before, 
because that made it even more interesting for him. Although he's still a fool, but who would have thought that he wanted to hide his true power? Our hero listened, made the decision that, right now, he would demonstrate in all the glory of his power and immediately attack the master. From afar, the brother and sister watched the fight and didn't understand what was going on. They also realized that if they didn't stop it, everything around them would just blow up. But also the girl was curious as to why her father and our hero were so strong. And Pan Sayid, she always knew these monsters were worth each other. But now they're real demons. The brother and sister were watching from the sidelines and were shocked by the events. Also, the girl said that over that hill was her favorite place. But the fight was still going on, and Muan also kept attacking our hero, saying that it was admirable. But then he saw a strong illumination in our hero's pocket, surprised at this, for he did not realize what was happening. The master's attack did not go well, for our hero was able to defend himself against it, and he was astonished, for he still had strength and aces up his sleeve. But at the same time, our hero realized that his mana, magical energy, was almost out, and it was quite dangerous. After all, it's not much of a workout. Remembering how he had come to his mentor a few hours before and said that he thought he had rested enough and was ready to continue his journey in the tower, the mentor said he could go, sure. But before he left, he wondered what about his checkup. But who knew the inspection would turn into such a massacre? For with all his body, he felt the approach of doom. It's worth the distraction for a second, because he's been on the limit a few times already, and I don't think his strength will leave him and run out so quickly. But at the same time, the most important thing he realized was that he would not give up under any circumstances, and as he struck, there was a tremendous explosion. And after the smoke cleared from the violent explosion, the master began to approach our hero, who in turn said that he had lost while kneeling. But the master realized that even though the boy was at his limit several times, he still got out and even attacked him at the end. But he also wondered what else he was capable of. After all, he had been able to pump up his skills so much in just a couple weeks, and he didn't think he could teach him anything else. So the master, with only a smile, turned to our hero, and the latter, raising his head, replied only that he could go. Our hero continued to train harder and harder, but he also realized that it wasn't enough, for although Master had said he was getting much better, he probably meant that now he could just evolve without his help. And that meant only one thing, that from now on everything depends only on our hero and how strong he will be. After all, he has no time to waste and definitely needs to become much stronger without feeling sorry for himself now because the difference between their powers is too great. In a full two weeks, he's never once been able to pull off a victory. And of course, thanks to their training, he was able to endure this hell, even though he reached his own limits. But it still wasn't enough, as he should be the one to be the winner. Still, one day our hero realized that he might have to beg for mercy. And just a few days later, the town of Pant began to clamor for our heroes. I don't understand why he decided to continue the ascent. Asking our hero, Is it unkillable or what? Or is he a complete fool? After all, he'd been beaten for two weeks straight and he'd recovered in three days. To which our hero said he was indeed fine. But the guy kept yelling because the doctor said he needed rest and he didn't understand why he had to hurry so much. Edora also said that she didn't understand, because he could have rested a little longer and been with them. And about these words our hero thought, because think about it, only this couple was a terrible nightmare for everyone in the tutorial, and in fact, two cute sheep that, and a fly, will not hurt. And he cares for our hero as if he were his own. Therefore, the only thing he said was that they should focus on the performance of their divine beasts. And of course, don't forget about your workouts. I, hearing this, 
the lad turned around and said he was quite like his father, but the girl wished he had been more careful. Turning around, our hero said that he would of course be careful and would advance very slowly, so they should not slow down and would have to catch up with him. And at the same time, our hero came to the forge again, thinking that he was here again. But he wasn't sure if it was worth coming here again, and he hesitated, for the thought of just leaving had crept into his thoughts. But unfortunately, he couldn't, for he had come to make swords for his knight, except that he hadn't thought of Bahal and Henova's connection. After all, he probably already knows he's dead, and he loved him just as much as he loved Chona. After all, after the information about the breakup of the army and the news of Chonu's death practically drove him. But also our hero was thinking what incredible pain the death of his brother Bahal would bring him. But while he was pondering, he heard a voice asking him what he was doing here. Turning around, he was a little surprised. Was it Henova who had just asked him if he would stand outside like a stiff? Then he told him to go inside, since he had already come, because he was obviously coming to see him, to which our hero said they hadn't seen each other in a long time. Henova said he honestly wasn't expecting guests so he didn't have much to offer, but he did have something to drink. Our hero looked back and asked him if he had started peddling again, to which the man said he was bored just sitting around doing nothing, so he decided to go back to work. But looking at the workplaces, our hero noticed that the place was somehow too clean. Is someone helping him? Henova turned around and said that those very nights, or whatever they were, he no longer knew what our hero had done to them, but they had lost the last of their brains. After all, they kept coming to him and asking him to let them help and clean up. After all, after such actions, there were rumors that he was their hidden leader. But of course, it was nonsense. Our hero, upon hearing this, even laughed a bit, to which Henova started yelling at him for laughing, because he's the reason they're like this. He wants him to tell them to stop coming and licking the place, because he's sick of them. But come on, it's not that big of a deal, because our hero has been on everyone's ear lately, to which the kid said he didn't do anything like that. But the man told him not to be modest, for we don't go for that. But why did he come? After all, if he decides to find out how he's doing, he should leave. He's doing fine, so he said that it's a shame he can't visit his old acquaintance. Henova only told him not to mix it up and said quickly what he needed. And our hero said, since that's the way he wants it, to make some balls if it's not too much trouble. So the man only asked the size and material because of that. To which I got the answer that it didn't matter, because they just had to be durable. The rest didn't matter. And the spicy stuff, of course. Henova, on hearing this, said that he would not be missed, to which our hero said that if it was too difficult, he thought it was not worth asking someone of his age to carry out such an order, to which the man turned around and shouted that he had now called him old by asking the question. Our hero said he didn't mean such a thing. After all, he used to be one of the top five artisans, but now both his age was not the same and his strength was clearly not the same. Henova, from such, was furious, saying he could see his muscles showing off his biceps. But the guy asked him what other muscles are there. But all the man did was shout out that he was messing around. As things stagnated, he only told the man to tell him exactly what he needed, because he wouldn't even have time to blink an eye before it was ready. To which our hero said that he didn't want to cause any inconvenience. Maybe it would seem like an impossible task for him. Hanova couldn't stop yelling at him to shut his mouth and say what he needed to say. But once he saw the layout, he would be surprised. After all, it's not just any sword. It's more of a magical sword, or even, I might say, a demonic sword. Such a sword will undoubtedly be one of a kind and can easily be considered one of the best. After thinking about it for a bit, the man realized that it looked like it would be fun, 
but such detailing is only inherent in skilled artisans. I wonder where this guy dug them up, the man thought, for he really is an interesting fellow. Thikes, our hero asked the man, is he really going to get everything done in ten days? To which the man shouted, twelve days. After all, he's got plenty of work to do without his stupid order, so he's bound to be here in twelve days. Turning around, our hero also asked, what about payment? To which the man told him to leave it somewhere and walk away. After all, he's glad he's doing well and Bahal's demise doesn't seem to have affected him much. Our hero made the decision to leave it here and go, but Hanova, responding to our hero, said that at his age, saying goodbye to someone forever is a familiar thing, so you don't just come here anymore, and you don't have to look for it later. Our hero was surprised at this. Lowering his head, he even felt a little sad, thinking that he knew what it was like to lose his family. His words resonate very differently in his heart, but still he is thankful that he is okay. But then we were shown a man who was sitting in the basement with his head down. As he pulled himself up, he didn't realize where he was or why he was here. Think back to events where other players realize they were much bigger and should have Moosin's back, so they have time to leave. It became theirs to protect. He only remembered leaving and thanking everyone for giving him the opportunity to leave, because the fragments of his memories were not complete, and he didn't remember what happened after that. He realized that his magical power had apparently been completely destroyed, and his body had suffered quite a bit as well. After all, experiencing an interruption in consciousness in his state can be considered a miracle, but no other way. With my hand resting on my arm, I tried to ask a question if anyone was here, but a moment later I realized that no one was around and that I couldn't even use the energy of my voice. Is it really happening again? And here we are shown events that took place far, far in the past. The guys asked me if I had at least learned to listen and do as they say, because I don't know how to do anything at all. The guys didn't know what to do with me because I think my pretty face will save me. They were wondering when I planned to pay off my debts, and they also thought to show me how horrible this world is. The kid realized that he could stand up to them, and such events became commonplace to him over time. But on the other hand, thanks to them, he immediately understood with the main thing, the law of life. The weak must perish, only the strongest survive. After all, the fate of the child in the tower was predetermined. He was going to die at the hands of the stronger ones. But then someone appeared and yelled for them to stop. The guys didn't realize who it was, but when they looked closer they were surprised, for it was one of the one-horned ones who instantly felled all the guy's offenders in literally one motion. Guy realized that this boy was a lot like him, only he wasn't as weak as he was. Turning around, the guy asked him, Are you okay or did something happen to you? After all, if you're okay, why don't you at least say thank you? The guy immediately started making some incomprehensible sounds, to which the one-horned man realized he couldn't speak and apologized. But at the same time, the man realized what was the point of raking up the past. When he looked up, he saw what he wanted to see. An exit opened up in front of him. After thinking for a bit, he still headed further towards the exit, but the light coming from under the rock blinded him. Covering himself with his hand, he peeked out anyway and was shocked to see six silhouettes standing in front of him. Looking a little closer, he didn't realize what it was. It was the players who protected him. But there was a one-horned man standing in front of these players, and the man, seeing such a picture, immediately began to scream in extreme pain. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. Why? Why him? The man didn't understand why the hell he was smiling like that. After all, there was also an entire red dragon army lying in front of them. He didn't understand the good in his demise. After all, if he could give him his life, 
he would have done so a thousand times over, remembering how they trained to fight together. The man realized that he was his reason for living and becoming a better person than he was. After all, it was only because of him that he kept going. But at that moment, something strange began to happen. It was Gungnir in Komusin's hands, began to emit lightning and throbbing, and his heart was filled with anger and sorrow. And Brelo that gave peace, he realized that he would not physically be able to bear using Gungnir, let alone restore his magical power, which would take decades. And then there was no place to dream of. However, he no longer had any reason to live and fight. In an instant, he spit on his pride, for in his hands was a power he had never used before. It was Forbidden Kai. This skillet allowed you to apply the creature's skills by absorbing it. If he could avenge his friend and the rest of his companions, he would no doubt set aside his pride, but he also realized that they would never stand back to back on the battlefield again, but now he was a part of them. The girl asked the man why he was already leaving, to which the man replied that their deal was done. The girl noticed that he was right. God would his bow, or it is more correct to address him as Chang Wei. After all, he was able to take one of the top five leadership positions on the island of Blue Flower. That was why the Red Dragon was able to win without a loss. The girl recognizes his contribution and offers a decent payment. How about a place among the 81 eyes? What about it? The man said things would change if he accepted her offer. But he doesn't like working under anyone or for anyone at all. And also the girl noticed that he knows how high the position of any one of the 81 eyes is, and still he refuses. The man only apologized for his refusal. Upon reflection, the girl didn't expect him to backtrack. It was a shame, but of course she had heard that he was a martial artist and a pretty famous Class S. But to be that bad, you can't find a match for him. And considering Bahal's demise, she needed him badly for a true master is a treasure that should be hers. But this is not the time to show her greed, for her hair is turning more and more blue, which means her dragon heart is slowly fading away. If she does nothing about it, it will turn to stone altogether. Even though her wars circle every floor looking for Kamusin, it's unlikely to help find the rock she thinks he doesn't already have. After all, she was sure someone had already stolen it, and not just the stone itself, but the materials needed to create it. But she was willing to do anything to find him, lest it cost her too much. Also, the girl realized that she needed to be careful and act fast enough. So she decided to ask one last time if he was sure he wasn't going to work for her, because she was sure he knew exactly what it meant to be one of her associates. But also the man apologized again. After all, he already has someone he serves faithfully. To which the girl readily agreed and said that now she should leave him alone. I mean, I took it then, but about the other offer. She'll pay whatever amount he says. There is also no time limit, but I would like to be quicker, of course. After all, she needed to find a man. To which the man only asked, Who? And the girl said, Who? And it was already clear to us, of course. So the man stood in front of the port, realizing he had a new victim, but wondering how long it would take this time to complete the task. But at some point, the amulet began to glow. The man didn't realize what was going on and took it in his hands and stared at it intently. Then clenching his fist, he still headed into the portal, hoping as much as he could. And at the same time in the coffee shop, our hero was approached by one of the players, bringing him coffee, talking about being the bean himself and brewing it for him from the finest dark roast coffee. Our hero immediately turned around, and the guy didn't realize what had happened. Then our hero said he had changed a lot, and the guy said he thanked him for being able to be a better person, to which our hero asked if he was serious about it. But the guy said, of course, for he would lie to me. So he has a conversation to have with him. He didn't want to beat around the bush and wanted to get to the point. 
The guy was a little shocked and scared, but still asked to be told, to which our hero said he needed to find a man, and that man was Braham. And the guy asked him, for he understood correctly that our hero was talking about the one who was banished. After all, he used to be a member of Elohim, one of the eight great clans, and they carefully selected their members based on blood. Therefore, unlike all the other clans, they were sort of the aristocracy in the tower. And despite the fact that Braham was the heir to some of the highest ranks in the clan and was himself in good standing, he considered his lineage useless, for which he was subsequently banished from the clan. You know he'd like being in the clan more, though, to which the guy bowed his head and said he needed four days, after which he would get back to him right away said fine, and he would wait, for he was glad he hadn't asked the reason for the search, so I decided to throw him a ring. But the guy was surprised, because he didn't expect that our hero could give away such a valuable artifact. This artifact, which allows you to contact a person even over a very long distance, albeit with limited use, does not detract from its value. Such artifacts can be incredibly expensive and very rare. But our hero said it was a prepayment and immediately put the bag of coins on the table. Turning around, walking away, the guy said he shouldn't have, but our hero only told him to keep it and find the man as soon as possible, whereupon the guy opened the bag and said, of course, for he didn't see how many coins were there, saying he was grateful and would make things very quick, but it was pretty good for our hero to have such a helper. After all, he may be too good-natured, but he is very capable, and our hero thought he could be very useful because he does everything quite quickly and without too many questions. Our hero stopped and looked up at the tower and realized that the time seemed to have come. He then moved to the sixteenth floor of the Gate of Life. After all, he had previously chosen to go to the Scold Temple, so he can no longer change his route. Our hero realized that this was quite a difficult task, as the Temple of Skuld had already been destroyed. But he wasn't sorry it had happened that way, for now passing wouldn't be so easy. So he immediately stood up to enter the portal and move to another location. The path to Skuld's temple was blocked, and only now did he begin to realize that he wasn't even allowed to go inside. Still, he has to accomplish the task somehow, so when he decided to deliver the ball, he made the decision that he would have to force his way in. But then he suddenly heard a voice behind him telling him to stop, for this is holy territory, and asking him to leave all evil thoughts behind and hide his weapons. But our hero was curious about who he was. But the girl replied by saying that she was apologizing, for she should have introduced herself at once. She is Hepburn, priestess of the temple of the goddess Erd. The saint would like to meet. But our hero wondered why all of a sudden. So made the decision to ask if she wanted revenge for that incident. But the girl said didn't he himself know they had no right to do that. After all, if he has trouble believing her, she's willing to swear on the name of a saint. So after thinking for a bit that priestess Erd was no threat to him, she might not be rancor level, but she was unlikely to be able to do anything. But he still didn't understand why they were having this meeting. After all, if she's willing to take an oath, then she must bring our hero to no one. The girl also commented that he shouldn't be so worried, as Her Holiness doesn't wish him harm and only wants to talk to him. And besides, she thinks he needs it himself to successfully complete the floor passage, and the other temples have closed their doors to him. But Erd personally sent her here in hopes of meeting her. And after a bit of thought, our hero realized that he really had no reason to say no, except something wasn't satisfying him. Therefore, using her abilities, the girl didn't realize what was going on, but he also told her not to be surprised, because he needed it that way. To which our hero said he just has his own ways of negotiating. He was a little surprised, for he didn't think she was a high elf. So the girl immediately asked if he wanted to explain what was going on. 
to which our hero said that he had already said that he was not happy with this arrangement because she had been so kind and courteous to him, in effect, manipulating him and leaving him no choice. And he's afraid that even the oath he's taken won't make him believe her words, so he'll only let her go when it's over. After all, if her saint really doesn't want to hurt him, then she has nothing to worry about. To which the girl said he was too suspicious looking with his eyes. But our hero said he was rather calculating and far-sighted, for in the tower it was fraught with danger to blindly follow his true aims. But the girl didn't want to argue any further. So closing her eyes, she only mouthed that, let it be according to his will, and she would guide him to the goddess. Thus our hero has already come to the temple, where he has already been met, for he has arrived at the personal invitation of the saint, and it is worth while to open the gates before them. It was the temple of Erd. Our hero noticed that although she is the oldest among the three goddesses, her abode is very small. Perhaps this is because it is not particularly popular with parishioners. Plus, the regular priestesses are direct avatars of their gods. But judging by the behavior of the priests, it does, especially considering she has a sickle near her neck and the fact that one of them didn't even look at her, let alone attempt to use a weapon, which means that our hero really should be careful with her because who knows what she is capable of. Remembering the rabbit's words when he spoke of, among the three sisters, fear the eldest. These words were conveyed by the demon through Laplace. After all, he wouldn't say that one should trust the words of demons, but this warning was not without merit, and it was worth being much more careful. Priests are beings who carry the will of the gods and cannot leave the 98th floor. Hence, their demise would be a great blow to the gods. Our hero understood that it was good that he had taken her hostage, for the High Elves are the ancestors of the Elves and Dark Elves, and their golden hair color is an indication of their kinship with Freya, the goddess of beauty. To meet one in the tower is akin to a miracle, as they are born very rarely, and the current living members of the race are over 1,000 years old. If suddenly the High Elf who is the Avatar dies, Erd's position will be jeopardized quite a bit. Our hero realized that she wouldn't be too happy about this greeting, but the important thing was that he would be safe. Walking along the corridor, after a few moments our hero together with the girl came to the gate, where the girl said that further he would have to go alone, because behind this door is a sanctuary where there is a saint. And the girl has no right of entry, so she can no longer be his assistant. Looking back and staring intently at our hero, but then he felt something incredible. At first he didn't realize what was happening, but then as he looked at the doors he felt an incredible energy, for a similar breath spurted out. After all, he had not thought that he would encounter such rich and dense matter, for behind this door there was indeed a great power hidden, and he knew it well. The girl also noticed that he seemed to be really sensitive for it was not common to find people like him who were very sensitive and could immediately sense another's power. After all, they usually have a well-developed sixth sense, well, or have had the honor of meeting the gods before. But also our hero is full of curiosity. What lurks behind the door? But the girl said there was a god behind the door. But our hero was surprised, for he could not believe it. The gods are not able to leave their cage on the 98th floor, though he had heard that the three goddesses had left bits of their consciousness on the 16th floor, lest they remain locked away on the 98th floor. Then how was she able to move her physical body here, and was she able to move it at all? Open the door, the girl told him. Not to worry, for he would soon realize everything. He should not keep any more goddesses waiting but our hero himself couldn't wait to be behind that door. After all, he wanted to see God in person with such power, except that the power lurking behind the door was far more powerful than he could have imagined. It seemed to him that there was no end to it. 
It was an all-encompassing, deep and terrifying sensation that continued to consume him. This is God, and it seemed that he had become a small and defenseless firefly, for men are really only small bugs underfoot to the gods. Our hero also realized that it seemed to him that at one moment he would simply dissolve into this sensation and disappear. But after a while, our hero realized that it was impossible because he could not die here. Our hero realized that his end couldn't be that pathetic. And he was well aware that if he didn't pull himself together now, he would surely die and he needed to suppress her influence with his consciousness using magic. Then he heard a voice saying to him, What a foolish and stubborn child! You know, the hero didn't realize where she was. Would he really have to go looking for her? It was indicated by the presence of Erd consciousness right here, and that meant only one thing. He also heard himself being addressed, saying, Why was he afraid? After all, she had promised not to touch him, to which our hero only asked if he could trust her. But immediately he heard a question. Isn't he too cautious for a dragon heir? After all, these flying reptiles are nothing without their black copper pride. And only now our hero realized that he could not defeat her, and in all likelihood he would have to kill the elf in order not to die here. Still, he wondered why she was calling him, and once he heard it, he was just a little shocked. Then heard him imagine, for the other players fear them and revere them, or just try to maintain neutrality so as not to cause trouble. He was the only one, against all odds, determined to destroy everything. The temple of God. That had caught her attention. That's it. But our hero didn't realize what was happening, because he had passed the test. He was surprised by this outcome of events. Our hero's encounter with the goddess Erd was quite successful. After all, it is a rare achievement that is not easily learned and has karma accrued to it. By doing so, he gained enough karma and was offered to have his name inducted into the Hall of Fame. But then something happened, and what our hero, a little worried, did not realize what he should do. The girl said that she had seen many people in this place over the past millennium, and every single one of them was drawn to the events of the past. Each of them had one cherished wish, and three hours later everything from the past was blotted out of their memory, and they dreamed of getting out of the abyss of this all-consuming hell. Nevertheless, the girl noticed that our hero is not like that, for she does not see him as craving oblivion. He willingly does not let go of the events of days gone by that happened to him earlier. He also kept blaming himself for not being there in the past, for he filled only a dead brother, a kindred spirit to be betrayed by his family and friends. Then now he fears a repeat of his fate. After all, he didn't fully understand if those around him could be trusted, but of course he was sure they weren't, except his brother thought the same thing. After all, betrayal can manifest itself at the most unexpected moment, so he is always very careful with his loved ones. His thoughts are always the same, that he might be betrayed and that he shouldn't trust anyone. And it was because of this principle that he was able to make it this far. Recalling events from when our hero was in the service and was ambushed, their squad retreated to a helicopter to evacuate. There was only 30 seconds to go, but the last of the guys, me, who was running up to the helicopter, turned around, looked at our hero, and, seeing him fighting and shooting back, just said, Sorry. The helicopter immediately took off without our hero, who continued to stay in one place, protecting us. But he was surprised by this outcome of events, for only now did he realize that he had been cheated by his close comrades, leaving him right on the battlefield. He also realized that he was willing to sacrifice his life to save them, but in the end, they betrayed him. And only now our hero began to realize that no one at that moment was going to save him at all. But he could not just die because his anger at his betrayed friends, coupled with a thirst for revenge, continued to give him hope, 
forcing him to overcome himself. And, needing in himself first aid, our hero sat resting. Two guys immediately appeared from behind the trees and decided to quietly approach and inflict damage. But our hero was not simple, and by doing so he was able to prevent this and strike a first, for he thought only of survival. And in the 150 kilometers of his journey, he met quite a few people. At a certain point, his consciousness blacked out. All that haunted him was anger, revenge, and resentment for just being left like this, because it had all ceased to exist, and he surely had. From then on, his name was Cain, for it denoted a being without feelings. And then the girl told our hero that his past was dragging him deeper and deeper, depriving him of the possibility to get out. After all, it should become part of his collection like other toys, thereby remembering the real him. The girl wanted him to show himself. Well, and of course, gave free rein to the monster that had been waiting for its hour. But at some point, our hero got bored with it. After all, isn't that his limit? And using his powers, he surprised the girl quite a bit. After all, she thought it was impossible, because he couldn't do it. All ears had so many regrets about the past, and he's still holding on to it himself. Then how did he manage to get out so easily? But our hero said that apparently her mediocre performance was over, so there was no point in staying. Turning around, our hero only gave thanks for such an easy task. After all, Erd had originally planned to relegate him to the very depths of his memories. This ensured that our hero would forever experience his own hell. But the player had no hope. He just kept moving through the floors with no purpose and only sinking deeper and deeper into his past. So she decided to press this point. After all, Erd's power was the ability to see the past and she enjoyed seeing people relive the events of days long past over and over again. And of course she was certain that our hero would not be able to escape her trap. But who would have thought that his facial expression would one day cause such intense resentment? It was only a pathetic sight, for he had decided to test her nerves to the limit, and then Hermes appeared, telling her to stop playing with them. But the girl stood up resentfully and said he would never understand it, to which Hermes replied that he didn't understand how this unicum was able to get out of her trap, for he has no hope, no dreams, nothing. The boy wanders aimlessly through the floors, but turning around, the girl said that apparently he knew who he was and had been watching him for a long time. Hermes also said that not only him, but Athena, Ares, and Dionysus also filed into his fan club. Because to be honest, a lot of people were interested in it, for on the 98th floor, practically everyone dreams of getting him and making him an apostle, and only if it met the necessary requirements. Imagine what happens when he's on the 50th floor. After all, the demons threaten to get him as much as they do, and Agaris, who rules in the east, wants him at any cost. The girl was surprised to hear the name Agaris. After all, it was the second strongest among the 72 demon kings, and the face of chaos and destruction was interested in a mere human. Well, and of course, most importantly, it was Hermes who first noticed him, but she also said he can't put into words how much it annoys him when someone tries to take him away. After all, he's hoping she's gotten the message that he's his after all. But the girl was really pissed off promised that Hermes would pay for her humiliation, and she promises it. After all, it was rather strange, and she didn't recall Hermes taking such a strong interest in anyone. And it wasn't even greed. It was like he was trying to protect him, but also the girl didn't understand what he was up to. Herald of the Gods. Yes, I certainly am. Why would Athena and Dionysus be so curious about his person? It's even more alarming that the third generation of Olympus gods would show such interest in anyone at all. It was all very suspicious. But then the girl called out to the assistant, who immediately came to Misha. And the girl said, 
because since she can't get it, she should just destroy it, thus fulfilling the order and absorbing it, and do it at all costs. But in the same second, the shadow unnaturally let the news slip. After all, our hero guessed that so easily the goddess will not let him go, so he hid those not priestesses of his henchmen. And already in that hour the divine bond between the goddess and her incarnation was instantly severed, for one little carelessness. And because of Hermes's power, the dulled sense of saint, then she didn't even realize that they weren't alone. One small calculation led to a real disaster, and in a moment, when our hero came out, he was already being attacked by defenders in the name of the goddess. Our hero looked at those who were attacking him and realized he had had enough of them. But the only thing he asked of them summoned his spirit to tell them one last thing. And in the face of such power, I the defenders could not resist. With that, our hero realized that this was the sixth time he didn't even need to use his dragon power. Apparently, they are at the limit of the lesson. I can't believe Temple Saint tangled with mercenaries for his head, though he is better now, for their souls are replenishing his army. Thus, his army quickly annihilated the enemies in the target area. Our hero only had time to say that they were good and did nothing else. But even for the spirits, it was too easy. The knights realized that they couldn't even have fun because everything was so fast that they had nothing to do, and it was a humiliating waste of power for them to go after such weak players. But our hero swept them not to worry, because they will still meet enough opponents on their way. Now, they are still actively evolving thanks to soul absorption, and he doesn't even have time to pull out a weapon. So the knight said that he was quite right, because frankly, there were some things that were bothering them. Flying was still interesting, how our hero was able to escape the goddess's trap, especially given his connection to the past. After all, is he really capable of thought control no matter how unique he is? He was never given any rest by the gods. Even inside the bracelet he could feel how great the inexhaustible power of the gods was to consume him but he was able to defeat a goddess capable of destroying the high elves with such ease that it was surprising. After all, they were certain that such a thing was impossible, unless his past was different from what they had seen. But our hero has picked up on the fact that she and he have seen the same thing, and all his thoughts are just soaked in distrust of people. And that's why in the tower he wouldn't let anyone get close. But unfortunately... That's not the case now. Thinking back to his little brother who smiled and said that he was always his hero and asked him not to lose himself over the experience, even when he was gone, he realized that he couldn't let his little brother down. And that's what gave him the strength to move forward. But also, they also seemed to have finally gotten behind our hero, as they should have been focusing on their saints and the position of the cult, rather than following our hero. It will take him quite some time to regain his strength, and his trust in the three temples is already below the plinth, for the power of the gods rests on his greatness, which they have so easily lost. That meant he could forget about them for a while, even though he became an enemy of the three goddesses. But thanks to this he gained incredible power, replenishing his army but he was also interested in how he would use that power intelligently. After all, he only wanted to make the Erd weaker. But who would have thought her power would be contained within Hepburn's soul? It's too valuable and too big. But what should he do with it to make the most of it? After all, his souls existed because of necromancy, which meant that for them, the holy power was nothing but poison. Also, Chariks and the demonic dragon's powers also originate from black magic. He made the decision that he wanted to try and use Vigrid. It was a holy sword that consumed the soul of the curse of heroes with the help of holy power. It would be able to return to its original state, because normal curses were removed by Athena's guide and holy fire, 
but the essence of the sword was distorted by the curse, and one wondered what kind of superior-looking weapon everyone dreamed of. And just by raising the sword, an incredible process began, whereby the sword immediately began to glow with golden magic, triggering the purification process. Vigrid began to absorb divine power, and our hero was surprised, for the sword began to lengthen, and even the runes became clearer. He also realized that it might take a little more time to complete the cleansing process and fully recover the skills he had. After all, once the awakening is over, he will be able to find out what Vigrid is really like. He also went to the 17th floor and then to the 18th and 19th. Thanks to his training with Mu Wan and the skills he gained from the fight, our hero could safely compare himself to the Rankers. After all, he had the opportunity to use the information from his brother's diary and the knowledge of the dragons. So getting through the lower floors was not too difficult, and it certainly didn't mean that no effort was made. After all, finding hidden items and setting records on each floor spoke for itself. Also, our hero was surprised, for the journey to this place took only a few days. It was the twentieth floor of the Pentecostal Repentance Gate. You name the ship and the ship will sail, and what was happening here lived up to the name. After all, one wondered if his expectations would be met. Our heroes moved on to the twentieth floor trial, and those who wish to become gods must undergo privation and learn to overcome their limits. With a little thought, our hero began to pass the ascent of the first mountain, and the first test is vision restriction. He was unexpectedly surprised, for the first thing that happened in the test was the blocking of the senses. Sure, the darkness causes some inconvenience, but our hero had special feelings, and using his powers he was still able to discern the path where he needed to go, but he found it to be an easy enough ordeal. Also, he thought it should have been. Apparently, something else. Fast enough to the foot of the first mountain, he hoped it would show him what a test repentance was. And on the way to our hero appeared other guys, who, communicating among themselves, talked about the fact that they stopped, because here is a very strange ground. One wrong move and they'll go to the other side of the world and one of the players suggested that they split up so as not to disturb each other, because they have plenty of time, so proceed slowly and carefully, not hastily. But then our hero flew by them, and they were shocked. They didn't realize what had happened or who had run past them, but immediately thought it was the wind. But our hero, looking at it, was very much surprised realized that they should have developed their senses better before passing the twentieth floor. After all, he didn't understand why they were so dependent on sight, because it didn't make any sense. After all, they saw nothing in front of them. I think they got caught in a swamp and got sucked in. But our hero, meanwhile, began the climb up the second mountain, the second test, hearing restriction. Our hero saw players in the video talking about how they were already out of water, and he realized it was weird. After all, that's what the challenge is all about. The Gate of Pentecost, a system of five trials during which players will not have a minute to rest. On the first mountain vision is blocked, on the second hearing, on the third smell, on the fourth taste, and on the last fifth, there is a loss of awareness but people always rely on their fifth senses. Without them, man is helpless, guided only by phantom sensations created by the brain. Often many players stop their playthrough at this level, but for stronger and more advanced players, this place offers a chance for high rewards. By overcoming the five limitations completely, the player can develop all five senses to an incredible level. That's why the building talked about pushing the boundaries of consciousness. But it's too easy for our hero, because he's unlikely to get any benefit from all the lower floors. It was XYX that many rankers were looking for. Even in the diary, it was written that many members of Ardia had a hard time at this level. However, 
Our hero didn't realize how much he was overcoming himself even before that and was constantly testing himself, setting record after record as he progressed in the tower. Therefore, the 20th floor didn't give him as significant a jump in development as other players. In fact, even while going through the tutorial, our hero constantly, maximizing his skills, successfully demonstrated an incredible level of mastery of the fifth sense organ. And also, working in modern services in Africa, he anticipated the direction of bullets or enemy attacks. He had also mastered a true dragon that enhanced his sensory acuity to 80%, making the skill passive. So our hero, hoping to apply his skills on the 20th floor, soon realized that he would learn nothing new here. But it doesn't matter in what way. He realized he needed to increase the difficulty. After all, he had decided to give up using artifacts for a while, removing his cloak and mask. With that, our hero felt as if he was back to the beginning where he started, and he stopped the circulation of mana. And our hero wanted to try to pass the test as an ordinary person. After all, exposure to external factors can have a detrimental effect. Our hero's using magic. His senses were blocked, and skills were also blocked. A little time passed, and our hero began to be consumed by darkness, and only now he was realizing the sensation of being in outer space. After all, he hadn't felt such a thing even when he entered the tower. It was more reminiscent of my time serving in Africa. It was only now that he was realizing that he should have done so immediately. Except he has too many enemies, and now is the perfect time to attack. But also getting rid of the constant worry becomes another of his challenges. And it was more like something like roulette. With that, he wanted to play it. For now, it was more like a challenge. And our hero has already managed to reach the foot of the third mountain. The third test is olfactory blockage. Climbing up such a steep cliff, it was challenging enough. And then there's the almost complete lack of feeling. On top of that, he realized that he had gotten used to this kind of thing but the price of a mistake would be his life, and he only had a taste and realization left. The three most important senses were completely blocked. He didn't realize how much time he had spent in this ordeal, or if he was going the right way. But he also realized that the only thing left to do was to rely on awareness. Right now he could feel the wind blowing, and apparently that was the only way to find the right path. Feeling a little, he realized that it wasn't just that he could feel yet, for there was something else. Albeit faintly, he could feel the waves emanating from each object by concentrating on them. They had been barely distinguishable at first, but now he could feel them much more clearly, and a different wave emanated from each one. If you don't focus, you may not feel it or you may miss it altogether. But right now, one had to focus on the battle will. He needed to shut off his consciousness and focus on sensation, to feel the very passage of time and everything around him. Our hero's level of mastery of battle will begin to increase more rapidly. Using time constraints can damage his brain, his mind too quickly. Our hero was advised to take a break from using it, but he still didn't stop and his mastery of battle will continue to increase rapidly. And it was already 62.2%. Our hero wondered, for it had been two days, or perhaps a whole month. But through continuous training, he was able to feel a grain of soul. As he opened his eyes, he realized that he was able to master his soul control. Our hero was able to get a rare achievement. He was awarded additional karma points and also our hero was advised to continue training for greater results only after he had mastered spiritual control. Our hero thought about it for a while and realized everything. After all, these were all souls that made it possible for him to recognize objects around him that he had no idea about. Even with a dragon eye, it was barely possible to turn something like this around. After all, 
Spiritual control allows us to look into the very essence of an object and identify its sensation, which is very different from the perception of the object with the five basic senses. Truly a great power of comprehension that not everyone can do. Now I can see why rankers revert to five grams so often. After all, there was such a powerful force emanating from Mu Wan and the Summer Queen that their mere presence would chill one to the bone. This is more of a disadvantage for them, though, as powerful players are quite easy to spot with this skill. Except they all have their flaws. Even when using control, you can barely detect the presence of a weak player. It is worth starting training with small objects, and once you manage to feel them, you can move on to his enemies. After all, any doors will be open in front of players capable of such a thing. Our hero is a bit of an afterthought. After all, if only he could control them, perhaps then it would be possible to unlock the secret of the Yin Sword. Yin and Yang Sword? These are exactly the kind of relics that the One Horn tribe dreams of obtaining. After all, this world is full of riddles and mysteries, to find answers to which hardly anyone can. Muwan also asked what our hero knows about the tribe's origin story to which our hero said only that they were created by the discoverer of the tower. Muwan confirmed this theory, for their tribe had inherited a valuable technique from the creator and must continue to develop it. Each of the one Horn tribe is fluent in the martial arts he taught us. Except there's one but, as Muwan said, and it's about swords and yang. After all, they both incorporate the wisdom and power of ancient times. Their search has been going on for hundreds of years, and of course they have always wanted to gain the knowledge of the great triad that created the tower. To be honest, even he realizes that sword and saber are too complicated to understand. But fortunately for Muan, his daughter became a Yang wielder, and in all that time they barely came close to figuring out the whereabouts of the Yin sword. But also the master said that the devil is not kidding and our hero should try to find him. After all, maybe our heroes can find him after all. This is by no means a guide to action, just old legends and tales, and he is not comfortable with that kind of reading. And he can consider it the last homework assignment from his mentor, because he shouldn't disappoint him. But our hero sat in front of the fire for a while, hoping for a little instruction or at least some clue. But when he thinks about it, he realizes that even after reading and memorizing everything from cover to cover, he hasn't understood anything. For originally in chaos, because of the formless void, created was Titan, who with his hands tore all creatures apart, one of which surged, and siding with herself, all around reaching the warmest depths. And the second has become the foundation of all things and is the pillar for the new world. To this day, life goes on quietly, only thanks to this system of the universe's arrangement, where many buds have borne their fruit. And after reading them, he guessed why the legends didn't please Muan. I mean, it was such a weird feeling. But then, a knight appeared near our hero and asked him, Is he really developing a sixth sense? After all, he was planning on helping him with it as soon as he was ready but he also didn't expect to start practicing on his own. Our hero queried about the sixth sense and got a reply from the knight that he had, after all, said that you had to find a starting point for it. Our hero understood what it was all about, but he didn't know what that sixth sense was. He also wondered what soul control was then. But the knight didn't understand what he was talking about. They immediately thought our hero was delusional, but he said, Aren't they now talking about waves coming from every object in the universe? Our hero confirmed, saying he wasn't very good at it yet, so he figured he could identify almost everything around him thanks to this skill. In fact, to be honest, he hadn't even thought about the sixth sense. It's a very practical power. But the knight, after thinking a little, asked him to wait, for he had no idea at all what he was talking about to which our hero was surprised, for he did not understand what was happening to them, and also now he was curious. What was the talk about then? 
and the knight said that the sixth sense is connected to his subconscious and instincts, so we can regard it as a doorway to spiritual power, but it feels like it's moving in the opposite direction. But that's impossible. But here our hero asked to stop, for first they should have explained for him, who understood nothing of the power of the soul. The knight went on to say that if soul control is its weight that can grow through training, then soul power is its very essence. It usually helps restore mana levels and increase mana levels. Since this power lurks in the depths of the subconscious, it usually slumbers within. And our hero only now realized what it meant that since the sixth sense was connected with the subconscious and instincts, he dared to assume that it was on the edge of the conscious and unconscious. And our hero asked, Am I understanding this correctly? After all, if in the process of development I can master the sixth sense, I will become its conduit to the subconscious mind. And there is only one clue. The subconscious mind is 80% conscious, and it is very easy to approach it because you have to be extremely careful. One tiny mistake could cause brain damage, and as a result I could risk being stuck there, losing any chance of getting back. And our hero understood that the way to his soul was through his subconscious. After all, only by passing it to the end can you get the opportunity to start mastering the controls. But he couldn't even find the soul door, after all. He could still use powers, and he didn't understand how that was possible. To which the knight said that it was really tactically impossible. But imagine you have a building in front of you. How will you get in there? Our hero misunderstood the question a little and asked in what way, for he would come in through the door. To which the knight replied, that's right, for he uses either the main entrance or the emergency door. But in this situation, he's doing things the wrong way and, in keeping with his manners, he jumps on the roof and walks to the front entrance on the first floor. But our hero only asked what was so surprising to him the question of whether he was serious in saying it, to which the knight said that he was just starting to master soul control. Angry, simply using soul control is a meaningful achievement in itself. After all, even though he wasn't on the 77th floor, he'd jump in at a run if he had the chance. Use this skill as the same Calmacine and Summer Queen are unable to fully realize the potentials available to control, only creatures with excellent builds are able to use soul power, which means that our hero's body and his soul must be perfect. But our hero wondered, for such are gods and demons. And the knight said he did, but he still had a long way to go. For he must remember that the price of error is the sanity and integrity of the soul. But our hero understood, because unlike magic, which is restored, spiritual power cannot be restored because its origins go back to the soul itself. But in the future, our hero should try hard, with the development of body and soul to possess this power. But soul control is already a big enough step for him. Therefore, it will be much easier for him to master the sixth sense. For now, it's simple for our hero to focus on developing soul control and think about how to work with his sixth sense. After all, he should see it as another way of perceiving reality. It can be brought beyond the unconscious and brought into the conscious. So all he has to do is find a way for him to get outside and plot a route for him. And our hero asked him that, roughly speaking, you need to create your own channel. To which I received the reply that it almost is. He will still have to release the power of his soul outward someday for his sixth sense must be well developed to do so. And after thinking about the soul, soul control and soul power, if he can master all of the above, he will become a true master. The path he had traveled before was completely predetermined, for thanks to his brother's journal he was prepared for everything that awaited him here. But finally from now on, his own journey, augmented by his sixth sense, begins and he realized it would be interesting enough for him. And so, after some time, our hero found himself at the foot of the fifth mountain, 
the last of the available five senses to be revealed. As he began his journey, he was struck by a startling discovery. Even so, he became aware of his surroundings. His sixth sense became more and more apparent as he used it, and now the waves emanating from objects became much clearer, allowing him to sense even the smallest objects. It was indeed a completely different way of perception than using magic to explore an area. All the secrets of this place were now literally in the palm of his hand, as if his third eyes had been opened, and it seemed that this tree had grown and thrived here for centuries. Our hero realized that by using some of his soul power, controlling objects became much easier, thanks to his sixth sense. His soul level was strengthening considerably. However, the knight still couldn't understand how such a thing was possible. Why is the system so unfair? Another knight asked our hero to be quiet and not disturb his master, to which the latter immediately began to ask if it annoyed him, for he was able to get what he had been seeking all his life, and it was impossible to achieve so quickly. New facets of his skills have opened up, and new skills are now available to him. The sixth sense skill level increased significantly. He managed to max out and access new skills, including the inspiration skill, only after he got what he was entitled to. Did our hero exhale and tell Shannon to stop grumbling? However, he is still grateful to them, because their advice really helped him understand himself better. Now, thanks to his sixth sense, he could see even what was hidden from the eyes of ordinary people, and he intended to develop his senses to the limit, thanks to Shannon's training. Knight wondered, however, if it was possible this was just an illusion, but how had he managed to push the sixth sense to its limits, almost immediately after its discovery? But our hero also didn't understand what inspiration was, and why this skill had increased as well, and he needed to figure out how to use it properly. And a moment later, he was amazed. I understand what's going on, as the inspiration skill has peaked. Our hero assumed it was a joke, because it couldn't be. The system, as a reward, tried to find a suitable skill for our hero. But then something strange began, and as if lightning struck our hero. The knight was amazed, for this could not be. Our hero had obtained the skill of psychic. Feeling all this energy within himself thanks to combining the five senses and the sixth into one skill, he can now recognize his surroundings much better than the previously available skills. So far, our hero did not understand what psychicism was, but there was a small instruction for him. As the skill increases, the range of sensations gradually expands. As such, he can easily sense creatures within the skill's range, sometimes triggers a premonition close to foreseeing the future, and can even penetrate the essence of some ideas. In addition, the speed of detection of hazardous situations is increased. But also, when there is a crisis situation and hit points drop below 10%, all stats can be increased up to 200%. This skill can be applied once a day. Psychicism is one of the best skills available to obtain and develop a player, because you should first develop the skills you already have, and then expand your horizons by discovering other aspects of them. It's a standard path for any rancher, much harder to develop than normal skills. But the knights didn't understand how it was possible that he was able to obtain such a skill. It's really hard to believe. However, they realized that only their master was capable of such a thing. And our hero understood that the feeling of everything inside him evolving was very different from when he had gotten the body of a dragon and expanded the boundaries of his consciousness. Thanks to his psychic powers, everything around him suddenly became completely clear, as if every possible skill was now available to him. It was only now that he was beginning to realize what psychicism implied. But who knew this skill was so great and allowed you to feel everything around you? After all, 
I wonder what it will be like when our hero passes the test and all his feelings return. Here, one of the knights turned to our hero and now realized why that one-eyed man was always acting like that, saying that he was no doubt a monster, for it was truly incomprehensible, and the knight resented it. What kind of discrimination was this? Why do others have to take an agonizingly long time to reach that level while he managed to get it so easily? After all, all five senses are trained with a sensory enhancement that grows through mana memories and the power of the dragon, sixth sense and soul power. It was impossible. However, he can now see the mana streams and you could say he has risen so high that he is able to see everything in its pristine form. And our hero just said that he realized because he can fully feel this mountain and using his powers, he can feel everything around him, and it became clear. But here, in one of the mountains, we were shown a man who was sitting with a glass in his hand and didn't understand what this power was. And besides, he didn't understand who such power could belong to. But someone new seems to have gotten one of the higher senses, a little hesitation, for otherwise they would know exactly who he was. After changing his mind that there was finally a worthy newcomer and even flipping the bucket, the man realized he needed to go say hello. Our hero immediately noticed something wrong and at once ordered the knights to hide quickly, for he did not realize what power was approaching him, for it was very swift. Our hero still didn't understand what was going on, but then he felt something from above and when he looked up he saw feet and then a man who asked him if he was Cain. He also asked if it was true that it was him, and he also wondered how he got here in the first place, for he sees that he has advanced far, and asks how life was, it was Cain. Khan immediately started asking our hero why he was silent. After all, in all likelihood he had just managed to step outside the boundaries of his consciousness and had not yet mastered it. But what else would he have to do to learn to control his voice transmission? Our hero finally realized that it was an intonation and manner of speech unequivocally characteristic of Khan, but he still didn't understand why on earth he was here, since he had said that they were bound to meet some day. And until Doyle is retired, his past shouldn't be here. Besides, the tutorial in the tower opens at her will, and he hadn't heard of it opening again, whereas he didn't understand how he ended up here. The guy said he was looking forward to seeing them, but I don't think it's going to happen so soon. He'll teach him how to use voice transmissions a little later. And also, with a laugh, said that he was really raring to go into battle right away, just like before, because nothing had changed. Our hero asked him why he was here, and where was Doyle? After all, it still seemed strange to our heroes. He didn't understand what was going wrong here, because it wasn't at all like he remembered it from the tutorial. He couldn't even control his powers properly before, and now there were so many of them that there were problems. He is able to not just keep his powers in check, but to hide them. But then a voice was heard asking the question, Why was he the only one raring to go, Junior? The guy only asked, did you have to interfere? After all, they haven't seen each other for so long, and she's prying and interfering. And the girl realized they knew each other after all, asking if he wanted to introduce them. But the guy thought the infestation was pissing him off. Let her try to say the wrong thing to him. But then, out of nowhere, a bolt of lightning curled up on the guy, striking him. He immediately asked for her to stop, saying, Enough! And the girl immediately said that she was giving a second chance and just let him try to say something wrong, and she wouldn't even leave coals from him. Our hero was surprised, for he did not understand what was happening. It all happened so fast that even his psychics couldn't catch on. Nothing before the blow, he wasn't definitively sure but now he could definitely tell it was rune magic, 
Runes are the language of God, so mastering them is a pain in the ass. That's why there are very few people in the tower who own them, much less use them, and it's so skillful. It was Sadhu, unequivocally. After all, they have taken refuge on the last mountain and love the solitude. So the players that passed the 20th floor weren't lying, stopping here for the sake of self-improvement and self-development. And the guy immediately said he was apologizing. For if he did not translate it, he would die here, and he might consider it an act of saving the life of an old friend. After all, it's not like he's going to leave him to his fate. And our hero, as soon as he heard this, rushed to conclusions, for he immediately realized that he had not changed, and they did begin their journey. But he also thought about the fact that he really had gotten a lot further since the tutorial. But our hero had received the blessing of the dragons, but he didn't understand how he was then able to advance so quickly without something like this. You realize that Khan must have really sacrificed all his time and energy for development, because back then he dreamed of defeating Pant and Edora. But now he himself is a danger to them. So our hero wondered how he could manage to get so far ahead in that time. Apparently, he's got someone helping him a lot. Maybe a dragon. And the guy said he's half-dragon himself. And our hero remarked that his sense of humor, while not a gram of it, had not increased. And then Kang turned around and said they were almost there and advised to be on the lookout. And coming to the place, our hero was surprised to see a girl and a guy. He didn't think it was two people, but coming closer, the girl, seeing the mask, asked if he was serious, and in such simple clothes. Apparently, he had figured out how to make the most of the place, but that's not the most important thing, because she's excited to meet the handsome man, and our hero, looking at the girl, realized that, apparently, it is she who possesses the magic of runes. The red sacred tree of Victoria is one of the famous, low in numbers, using runic magic. But he also wondered what she had forgotten in a place like this. And then, turning around, our hero saw a child with demonic powers, Croatoan's ghost, kindred. You'd never tell at first glance that this kid represents a powerful evil. If you compare him to Muan, the king, in comparison, epitomizes the king of the jungle, while Kindred is a wild animal who only dreams of getting out. The diary indicated that he belonged to the army of a country that worshipped a nearby demon. At the head of this army were nine bishops, and Kindred was the second of them. Little was known about him, and hardly anyone even knew he existed. All this is because he usually tries to stay in the shadows and doesn't even participate in battles with his army. Our hero did not understand how his brother knew about it, but thanks to this it was not a surprise that Kindred is really looking for something on the 20th floor, because the rumors turned out to be true. But our heroes were interested in what he wants to find here, since he hasn't left this place for more than 10 years. While our hero was considering the child, the girl remarked that he had better be so interested in her, for he was delicious to her, and even nearer, much handsomer. But our hero didn't even feel her approach, and he didn't realize when she had time. But Kang immediately asked about the mask, that it was some kind of joke to her, because how did she even realize he was handsome, and does she realize that their age difference is so great? Also, the girl smiled and said that everything about him was good except his mouth was chatty. Immediately she struck him with lightning. Our hero again didn't feel it when she used magic. After all, how high is her level of rune control? Does she really have the ability to create them instantly when they are needed? But perhaps she has them prepared in advance and uses them when they become necessary. But are they really encased in this bracelet? although it is entirely possible, since it is capable of creating high-level artifacts. But then she abruptly disappeared from his view, and the girl behind her said that she realized he had a lot of questions, but there was no need to stare at her so openly, because she was terribly uncomfortable. Our hero apologized, 
for this is the first time he has seen the magic of runes, and it is simply amazing. But the girl realized what it was all about, and if it was so interesting, she would be happy to teach him everything. Huh? But then abruptly Kang began to tell him not to fall for this witch, for he would immediately regret it if she deceived him. And maybe they'll spend a hot night together, but then he'll just be her prisoner. The girl immediately yelled at Khan, saying that he was accusing her of lying as she rushed to remind him that their night had indeed been hot, to which the guy said he almost died because of it. And now our hero understood the point, for she had tricked the fool. Kang kept yelling at him not to fall for it, and he means it, and she should turn away and not look at him, because he is her savior, after all. But here, while they were talking, the child smiled and immediately used his power to target our heroes, and he sensed it. Turning around, he didn't realize where he had disappeared to, but he immediately saw that even using psychic powers, he couldn't catch a glimpse of him feeling the incredible power. But our hero didn't understand why he was attacking him, since he hadn't done anything to attack him, and our hero's magic flow activated. Our hero was surprised, for had the defense mechanism been automatically triggered, such a strange feeling possessed him, as if the activation of the magic flow had strengthened his body and increased all the capabilities of his indicators. Could it be that his abilities could be so astounding just by combining magical flow and psychic powers? Kang, after the explosion, didn't realize what was going on, and the girl also immediately said that this was her home after all. But the guy's new abilities had opened up, and the girl didn't understand how that was possible, but immediately smiled. After all, it made her happy. Our hero went on the defensive against the kid. Our hero immediately entered the fight, realizing that he was quite fast. His attacks are very fast, but using his abilities, he was still able to discern how his opponent was moving, realizing that it was possible to predict his actions. Psychics really are incredible. He could predict all his movements and, for example, destroy his defenses in a matter of moments. And what his opponent was surprised enough, for it was interesting for him, and everything literally became equal, and there was an intense energy coming from each blow. But to all this, our hero was surprised that the one was able to stop him, least of all with his energy. Kang, for his part, didn't understand how this was possible. After all, he hadn't used his magic all this time, at all. But also, you can get burned because of the random explosions. Khan didn't understand when Kane had managed to become such a monster, and the duel between our hero and Kindred continued, but they were already fighting in the literal form of fire that our hero had created, and could completely control every attack of their opponent. Well, here the girl said they didn't care about her house at all, shouting at Kindred to finally calm down and come to his senses. But then our hero, looking into the pall of smoke that rose up, didn't realize what was happening. And just then he heard a voice behind him saying that he was sorry, for he only wanted to watch him in battle. The next thing you know, you're just a little oblivious and out of control, but he really is fun to play with, and our hero didn't understand why this couple always appeared behind his back. Kindred immediately threw a punch at our hero, from which he literally disappeared. Khan immediately started calling out for our hero in a cloud of smoke. They say it's overkill. Plus, they're asking since when did he do that. I mean, he could have been killed. To which the guy said he was fine. Pointing his finger, our hero appeared. And he immediately pondered, for he didn't think that the second bishop of the demonic army was so strong. Even Hanrin would have to work very hard to win and he was able to anticipate his every move thanks to psychic powers. Yes, his fighting skills, it must be admitted, were top-notch. Well, Krishna's dagger wouldn't last long, as his attacks resemble exploding bombs. Any more and he would have lost for sure. Also got off easy, thanks to his abilities. 
though he didn't think he would have been able to overpower him. But the guy immediately asked if he wanted another go, and our hero said he wasn't ready, afraid that was his limit. And the guy said he was lying and not blushing, with a smug look on his face. But so be it. We'll call it a day. After all, he'll still have time to torture him. And besides, he wondered, what did he and Komusin have in common? Our hero didn't realize at once what he was talking about. But after thinking about it for a bit, because they were somehow connected, but there was no mention of it in the diary. And the guy told him not to even try to lie to him, because his sword skills were very similar to his style, though different in places. And our hero understood what it was all about, saying that he was actually King Mu's disciple. The kid was amazed at this answer and asked that Mu Wan was from the one Horn tribe. After all, it was clear at the time what was going on. Komasin was also his disciple, but he thought he no longer took disciples after that incident. And it was kind of weird, because he was the youngest, and now it made sense to him why he liked him so much. Asked if he came to five years old to practice, to which our hero said true. But the kid immediately said he suspected he was past his money, already had a very good base, and they should have some fun once he got stronger. And our hero realized that in all likelihood, he had come for his test, and it seems Kindred is the one running the place. He and Victoria were much stronger than our hero expected, and perhaps this place can still surprise him, and he can learn something from all of them. Even though our hero already had soul power and psychic powers, but he feels like he can definitely do better in this place, and the pack is much stronger than it is now. Kang, looking at our hero, was very surprised by this outcome of events, for he didn't think he had gotten so much stronger during this time, and already the girl is asking what they did to the house, and she forgives only because of his beauty. Khan told our hero that he could stay here. Inside there are all the necessary things to live on, and he will get his own food. If he needed anything or had any questions, he could go to him. To which our hero replied that it's really not bad here, but the guy also said that it's all thanks to the people who used to use the place. However, there is one rule. Don't interfere in the lives of others. Everyone is here for self-improvement, so it advises you to do your own thing and develop your skills. Victoria and Kindred Mary didn't leave a very good impression, but still, the people here aren't bad and he shouldn't forget about other people's personal boundaries. Then perhaps they might even help him with advice in his hour of need. Our hero wondered when he could enter the tower, to which the guy replied that it had happened recently, since it had only been two months. But he has to admit that his accomplishments are truly impressive. Unbeknownst to him, the first place in the Hall of Fame is exactly that. Rightly asked by our hero's boyfriend, what's so obvious? Kang immediately said that he knew it because he had never dreamed of such successes, saying that he thought he was well pumped, but after seeing his accomplishments, wasn't so sure anymore. Our hero immediately asked about Doyla. Kang said he's not here because he hasn't seen him in a while, so it's not worth asking. But our hero had a thought. After all, they were like siblings, but he didn't understand what had happened. Either way, it's not his problem. Let them handle it. But it was clear why the news of the return of the bloody blade had not stirred the tower. Though it's odd, of course, that he decided to train in secret. After all, Doyle was a very quick-witted and bright fellow, for which he was nicknamed Baldtail. So even if he is in the tower, he will definitely meet him one day, as I promised. Kang, you said he was surprised that our hero was able to stand up to Kindred. After all, it's worth a lot. Usually everyone gets a good kick out of him because of his appearance. He's not the youngest in their hangout now, and he's hoping he'll be able to pass all the tests and take that spot. But our hero swept up in the fact that he's as frivolous as ever. 
And Kang only laughed it off, saying who would talk, since he still won't let anyone near him and is just as closed off. But he should try anyway, because his life has changed since arriving here. It's tough on everybody, but it's worth it. So he should try to make the most of his stay here, because he's hoping they'll get a chance to spar, to which our hero only agreed. And after some time our hero was meditating, but then a knight appeared, asking the other if everything was all right. After all, he had already been sitting in that position for too long. A dragon's body won't matter much if their master can't open their body's magical channels for mana flow. To which the other replied, should he just do something for nothing, after all, it would probably help him find the yin sword. But the other remarked, didn't he say he couldn't be found? But anything was possible. Back then, he had not yet had access to the full capabilities and knowledge of the dragon. The one-horned tribe would never have been able to utilize these abilities. But I wondered if he would have time to learn something new in three days. And even at night, our hero continued to meditate, concentrating on his distant goals. But time flew fast, and then our hero began to hear his spirits appealing to him to wake up and come to his senses. Opening his eyes, he realized he was sitting in the same pose, looking at the spirits who told him they thought he was already dead and asked if he even had a brain. Any more and he would have failed and died. Meditation shouldn't take more than a couple days, and he's completely out of his mind. Spending a whole month like that was mind-boggling. Our hero wondered about what his knights had said about the whole month, but they wondered what he could find in his mind. After all, they really wondered what had gotten him so hooked. Our hero said he couldn't see anything, nothing at all. But the knights only laughed at this, for they thought he was joking. Our hero said he didn't, but he realized something. After all, the power contained within this ball represented far more than what was known about it, but he didn't know what to do with it. It felt like he was wandering in a fog. Even while studying Mugan, he hadn't felt this stupid. And one of the knights said, If you're in a fog and don't know where to go, maybe you should go back and start taking slow but steady steps toward your goal. But you don't need to complicate it, and it doesn't matter. After all, the Yen Mosque contains such power. First and foremost is the sword. Why not start by learning ball handling techniques? It's worth getting the right level of knowledge and skill first. Masters perfect martial arts techniques. Experts have surpassed the limits of their bodies and are on a whole other level. However, there is also a virtual world that has transcended reality and the study of technology. Our hero should try to become a master for starters. So what does he have to do to become a master? But he needs to learn how to create an aura. And our hero wondered. After all, even in his journal, his younger brother wrote that he had never been able to figure out the aura, even though he couldn't because of his decimal immunity. For through decimal immunity, all the components of the world are united into one system of knowledge that only the bearer of the power knows about. But then what did the aura represent? It's an element that's out of order. And then came the moment when our hero couldn't get his diary out. Huh? But by the same token, he has two excellent mentors whose knowledge he does not doubt. Shannon didn't become a ranker, but he was able to achieve a lot as a swordsman, and Hanrin is no worse. And he thought his skills were at master or virtual level. After all, he was even able to fight back against Comasin. But unlike Shannon, who practiced the Red Dragon martial arts and trained others, Hanrin had been gaining experience in actual battles since early childhood, and his sword technique was honed to the point of automaticity. If he could combine their techniques and knowledge with his experience, he might be able to master the aura. But then our hero contacted the guy who promised to find Braham, asking if he did. To which the guy said that, of course, because he had been waiting to get in touch with him, so he hadn't stopped following his movements. To which our hero asked where he was and got the answer, on the 23rd floor. 
and it seemed to have been there for quite some time. Our hero only told him to keep watching, and if he came to another floor, to inform him immediately. The guy immediately said that he would do so, for on the twenty-third floor spread the cursed Gilea, which was full of devil trees that spawned the inhabitants of the demon world. This forest was the home of demons and devils, causing the floor itself to be considered incredibly difficult to traverse, and a truly unique place. Brahm, I love places like this, thought our hero. Our hero was afraid he'd go higher than the tenth floor, but it turns out he still has time to prepare for their meeting. But then, there's something he needs to do. Adora woke up in the night to someone sending a message to the ring. She immediately realized it was our hero, and he apologized for bothering her so late. But the girl told him not to lie, for she was glad he was all right. She was very worried about him, and she hadn't heard from him in all this time. She wondered where he was now. Also, is he eating well? So, of course, how does the confrontation with the priests of the Temple of Urd go? It was him, right? Also, the girl said she couldn't even realize how freaked out she was by the news of this. After all, if they had, our hero only exhaled, thinking about how much she was worried about him, but only said that everything was fine and not to worry. Also, he had long wanted to ask her if he could ask her a question now. But the girl said of course she could, and so the guy asked if she had contacted Heneva, because he had asked her, but how much time had passed. He should be concerned, and if she contacts her, let her speak up. And the girl immediately began to shout that Heneva had come more than once, and told her that he was no longer there, although they had agreed to meet. And he now lives in their village. But she also asked if that was all he wanted to ask to which the guy said yes, and she threw a ring, too. But our hero didn't understand what was wrong and thought that maybe he shouldn't have called so late. Our hero continued to train with the knights, who said that it would only be possible to begin mastering the aura after thoroughly studying and mastering extrasensory perception. Not otherwise, he needs to learn to control his unconscious and engage it all at once though it's worth admitting that he's already surpassed the others in this, as the psychic powers available to him are in many ways superior to the sixth sense of others, and that means unlocking the potential of your mind and using it to its maximum. It is not difficult for him, for all the difficult things are contained in giving physical form to the intangible, except that his maya would have to be an order of magnitude stronger to keep the balance between them intact. And our hero said, let's say he understood everything, but what about the immaterial and unconscious? Knight also said that it was hard to explain, because everyone has a different concentration of unconsciousness and the way to express it. He has, for example, a faster pace to victory. Our hero was surprised at this. But the other knight said he had willpower and becoming the strongest, trying to attack our hero. And our hero realized, because it turned out to be much simpler than he thought. For in his case, it is a force of all-consuming destruction, to which the knights said that they didn't even doubt it, as he was still close to becoming a master. However, this is not enough to master the aura. But since he was already able to decide on the concentration, to focus now on combining the several hundred different forms of the eight extreme gifts, and turning the eight types into the power of the eight forms. And our hero said, that's exactly what he's trying to do, because it's a secret technique that's supposed to help him with his aura. But the knight said to be quicker. After all, aren't the eight extreme fists developed by training alone? He must use the different forms in the correct order. And our hero seemed to understand what it was about faster. You realize he should still be doing it. And the knight said that he understood everything perfectly. He should focus his mind on the tip of the sword, concentrate and direct the stream of consciousness along the desired trajectory. After all, it will be the soul force that will later be spread across it, 
with proper understanding and application of the concept, allowing it to multiply its attacks that require the use of aura and magic. And it seems our hero began to realize, looking at the knight who ran to attack him. He realized that he should focus his consciousness on the tip of the sword, remembering the words that one of the forms of the eight extreme fists. And he began to realize what he was talking about, for the Mup King had shown him this technique once, and by concentrating, he was able to use the path to repel the attack. The path of learning, the secret technique of the eight extreme fists, opened up to him, and he was able to learn how to control the concept of his consciousness. His mastery level of the eight extreme fists had increased significantly. By doing so, his swordsmanship had improved markedly under the influence of the progression of the eight extreme sword skill. The proficiency level of the eight extreme swords was 71%, and our hero continued to develop in this direction. But after a while, after stopping, one of the spectators said that it was great, because one of the secret forms of the eight fist, Danchen technique was much more powerful than he had thought. This was clearly not the limit, and Mu Wan was able to cut the sun with it, to which the knights understood what he was talking about, but still he managed to become a master in such a short time. After all, all that's left is to get used to filling the sword with aura, its basic sword aura skills, and it has a certain high affinity with fire, since it's less brightly glowing red. By doing so, our hero was able to reach master level and overcome the excellent work for him, the additional rewards available, and mastered the aura. However, his knowledge is not complete. He should keep practicing to gain the proper level of skill and knowledge. And our hero wondered, after all, does the color of the aura affect something? At his nights to which they said rather the opposite, he is not an indicator. However, could give him a glimpse of the owner, and our hero seems to have begun to understand. But the other knight said that the secret technique of the eight fists he also wanted to master. But then we were shown a girl who was doing something. They say her calculations are unequivocally correct, but is quantity the problem again? After all, she didn't understand what was going on. She's almost there. Can't artifacts last forever? Fighting on floors and advancing through the tower is not a problem for her as long as she can apply the universal rune rewrite combination. But on reflection, no matter how good it is, her calculations are constantly being influenced by odd factors that make things go wrong, and then there is only one thing left to do. We need to rewrite the reaction combination form that will allow for all possible excesses. But will she even make it? all the best of endless fruitless experimentation and rewrites. If there was a way to transpose the techniques and abilities of sword masters and artifacts, it would seem when things were simpler. But then she remembered our hero and wondered why not use him specifically. After all, his skills in the battle with Kindred impressed her a lot, and he adapted well to the situation. The girl also thought of Kana, since he's doing well too but I think of the new guys being better. Though at the same time, the thought occurred to her to ask Kindred himself or other Sadhus for help, except she wasn't burning with the desire to give away her weaknesses to them. But then, for starters, trust me, and then stop by to visit one handsome man, and she hoped he'd been able to grow stronger since their last meeting. Teleporting, she immediately felt that energy, realizing it was here somewhere, but looking around, she saw that no one was there. While she didn't understand what was going on, at the same time, she didn't understand from whence this place had become so lifeless. But then, a landslide appeared in front of her, and the girl looked shocked. She didn't realize what was going on. Did she not notice anything because of the dark energy falling here? After all, she can't even sense the magic used here. Well, looking at this place, the girl thought, because it felt like only a moment ago the Hermes serpent fight was unfolding here, 
and has everything here changed so much because of his training? After all, Kane's power displayed in the battle with Kidred had certainly impressed her greatly. But now, yeah, it's a whole other level. How did he get so much pump it up in just three months? And where did this overwhelming amount of dark energy come from anyway? Wasn't it supposed to be like this on the 20th floor? Though she acknowledges its power and the implications of it are quite interesting to analyze. Who knew he would become so strong so quickly? Smiling, it pleased her greatly. She thought it was marvelous. In the meantime, our hero realized that training with Shinon and Hanren had definitely benefited him. After all, he is generally happy with the result. He was also able to obtain rare and high-level skills. The time difference turned out to be just what our hero needed. Because of the monk attribute, a new skill is available to him, and he can use mental acceleration while focusing on assessing the situation. He is in control of time itself and can transcend time, moving freely outside of it. He can also do several things at the same time, and as the skill level increases, the number of concurrent tasks will increase. Our hero realized that with this skill, he could evolve into the subconscious and not worry about the time involved. Of course, that doesn't mean he can use it all the time. Yes, and there's always the risk of getting stuck in unconsciousness and never getting out. Although through this, he had completely mastered the secret technique of the eight fists, and it was definitely worth it. But then a girl appeared behind our hero's back and asked him what he owed to Victoria. The girl immediately asked our hero if he was glad to see her, to which he replied that he remembered the main local rules to calm others. But the girl said he was very boring, to which our hero only said that he was always attentive. The girl thought a little and still decided to offer our hero to make a deal with her. Our hero and the girl did make a pact, and the girl realized that the guy had perfectly developed skills that would be very useful to her. Well, on top of that, he's handsome, and they agreed to experiment for one month. But she also realized that she needed a little more time, because luckily, he was agreeable. So many more interesting experiments could be done on him. In addition, she thought that our hero is not so smart. It seemed to her that it was good for her, because our hero agreed to help only if, in return, she would help him learn the runes. But she also realized that runes and runic magic were very different things, although she cannot complain because thanks to him, her experiments in any case will end successfully, and perhaps today will be able to finish the work with the development of 50% of the scheme. Thus, the first day of the study is over, but after a few days, on the 20th, the girl realizes that something is wrong. After all, she was sure that they would quickly completely figure it out. Almost half a month has passed, and hardly anything is visible, and also she felt like they hadn't moved from the starting point in any way. And also he took elixir, drew magic circles, and even used other artifacts, but in the end they still didn't achieve anything. Well, and on top of that, the girl realizes that she has to analyze it thickly. Something can't be wrong, she thought. His spiritual self-defense was to blame, but it wasn't there. And besides, she wondered why he'd gotten so deep into studying martial arts. And besides, his questions gave her goosebumps. After all, it felt as if his subconscious and capabilities were limitless. It felt like he was capable of processing an inconceivable amount of the most complex information. Though the girl realized that his abilities were vastly inferior to hers, and she was fairly certain of that. But there were only ten days left, and she wanted to extract everything she could from our hero, studying him from different angles. But at some point, our hero once said that time was up and he was happy to deal with her. But the girl only angrily realized that it didn't work out in the end, and as soon as our hero started to walk away, the girl immediately yelled for him to wait, 
asking him if he belonged to the liquids or something, but immediately realized that she was talking nonsense. Turning around, she only said that she would see you again, and our hero, saying goodbye, began to leave. Sunset, and the girl realized that on the twentieth floor has nothing to do the highest kind. And in just a moment, our hero landed at his house. Once inside, he summoned his spirit, Boo, who immediately appeared and said he was at his service. Our hero reminded him of the rune magic he told him about, because the spirit said he remembered, and our hero thought that was great. But immediately, the knights came along and started saying he was a fraud. After all, to think, made a deal, you know, that it is simply impossible to analyze the dragon's body. The knight was pleasantly surprised, because he is not as stupid as he thought. But our hero did not understand why it was his fault. She was the one who suggested it. But the knight noted that only here it was immediately clear that she will not succeed, and in fact the whole deal is a total deception. But our hero interrupted and said that there was no point in refusing, because for a witch without a losing venture, and also at Boo whether it is possible for him to apply it to radiance, together with improvement, strengthening, and acceleration of magic, all four. And the spirit said, it is possible, but radiance is not like other types of magic. It's much more complicated, and he would have to experience incredible pain. Our hero just sat down and, taking off his shirt, told him to get started, for he would not let his effort go to waste. After all, this month should pay off with slow but fairly sure steps. The spirit said he would do his bidding. However, he is forbidden to move and must not lose consciousness. Immediately he set to work, for the magic of the runes would penetrate his bones deep enough and our hero had to be patient. On what he only grinned and said that he was ready, they should start. But the knights were shocked, and they were also interested in whether he will endure, because not a year of unambiguous in the head of one sawdust. To which even another knight thought he was insane, for he had decided to bind the magic of runes to his body, winning faith in them on his bones. It was hard to imagine how much it hurt, though if he could overcome that pain. He will definitely achieve what Victoria dreams of, because his bones will gain unprecedented hardness and the highest magical conductivity among all essential materials, magic runes quickly and effectively, and all this will be under the control of our hero. But after a long enough period of time, our hero wondered, for it had been six months since he first arrived on the twentieth floor. After all, he did not think that he would be here for so long. Also, our hero realized that it was time to deal with all the pending cases because the sacred creature is about to hatch. But first, our hero wanted to try out his new power. He wanted to see what it was like in action, psychic, and aura. He wondered how strong he was after all this. Well, as well as his sword, Vigrid. That one is 90% complete. He had become almost the same as the other swords, but our hero didn't realize where he should start yet. After thinking a bit, he realized that he wanted to activate the power of the runes and immediately felt an incredible power being added to him. Using his sword, he literally cleaved in one motion, and the rock seemed to tear as if it was bursting from such a power of force energy. And as soon as our hero looked at it, he realized that it was much better than he expected. But then suddenly he heard a voice telling him that he was startled and asking him what happened here. And also another voice that clearly told him to keep his voice down because it's all just with the help of Ara. But our hero said he just wanted to check something out, apologizing for disturbing him. And then Shannon appeared, who said that, our hero scared them, and now he should realize how strong the aura alone is in its purest form. After all, even if you pumped all the skills and mana, no one was sure if they would even compare to such power. And our hero only said that now no one would dare to touch him, because he would be doomed to defeat. 
and one of the knights only queried the phrase, deciding to touch, because he could just use the territory of the dragon. But then our hero felt something, asking him to wait, because there was someone nearby. It was Cain, who asked our hero if he really did such a thing with just his aura. After all, it was incredible. His powers really are limitless. Cain asked our hero if he was leaving. And as soon as he got the answer that he seemed to think a little, because it seems that he wants to talk about something. But it felt like he had been trying to avoid him all these six months, so they hadn't been able to have a proper conversation, and he felt like it had something to do with Doyle, but he still decided not to pry into his personal space and pretend he didn't notice anything. But then he started to speak. Just then the girl interrupted, saying quietly to everyone, for there had been a disaster. Our hero, me along with my boyfriend, didn't realize what was going on, she asked her. What happened? But the girl only cried and said that Kindred had just died. Nas heard he, our hero, was shocked by such news. Well, here we were shown an event where Kindred was telling a girl that they have a pretty close relationship, but the girl asked him why. The guy said that she knows who he is. The girl asked to stop because she doesn't like this conversation, but the guy also said that there is magic that can find out his whereabouts. Is it true? But the girl was shocked, asking, what's he talking about? And then said that they are in life. But the guy, only lowering his head, said that he didn't say she was the case. He was just asking if it was possible. To which the girl said yes, and the guy immediately smiled and asked her to do a small favor for him. And after a while, the guy disappeared. But then the girl heard the question. Is it true that Kindred really died? After all, the likes of him can't die. On the twentieth floor, the girl turned around and said that she hadn't seen those two for a long time. It was the blade and salt, the moon. It was the apostle of God, the fox of Kernan, Rebecca. But the girl said that it would be a long and difficult conversation. They should go inside. But at this time, our hero along with Khan were already moving quite fast towards the girl, and Khan said that it seems they will be the last ones to see the two people. And our hero only now realized that they hadn't seen each other for six months, and he couldn't even think that the occasion would be the death of one of them. As he drew closer, he noticed the men. I and he realize that one of them is a Mechal Saul Moonmaster who is a vampire, and the girl standing next to him is a high-level rancher, Rebecca, and as soon as our hero and I, along with the guy landed, Saul Luna walks up to them. He says he now realizes who interrupted his sweet dream. Our hero apologized for the inconvenience. But while he was saying this, he realized that hostility was coming from him. And then the girl appeared, saying that the story will be long, so they should not stand on the aisle, and she asked them to come inside. And already at the table the girl was asked who could have destroyed it. To which the girl said that she did not know, because unfortunately, to be honest, she was surprised as much and still does not understand anything. Rebecca, asking if Kindred had a premonition of his imminent doom, and she was now pondering whether she had heeded his words or not, to which the girl said that she was correct. After all, this quest is Kindred's, and she will now share it with all the heroes. With that, Victoria offered to share the quest after familiarization. Refusal would not affect any of them in any way, to which Saul Luna said that he had a bad feeling about it, but nothing will happen to him anyway if they just watch it. By doing so, everyone gained access to the hidden quest, King Mihu's Palace. The hidden quest is King Mihu's Palace. The twentieth floor had long been called the Hero of Ascension. According to one ancient legend, it was here that a mythical king rebelled against heaven and was sealed by Shakyamuni, becoming a prisoner of this ridge. As the centuries passed, anger and resentment did not leave the prisoner, distorting the very essence of the Fiave Mountains. He himself is no longer here. 
Yet many forget that it was King Mihu who broke the seal that restrained him and left. It was necessary to find the traces left behind by the king in order to have the opportunity to become his successor. The players who saw it didn't understand what was happening or how such a thing was even possible. And our hero at one time wondered about King Mihu. After all, is this quest really about the monkey god, Sun Wukong? Without the existence of King Mihu is a sign of the existence of many divine beings. Birth of a monkey from a stone he surpassed many and became a god, gaining various skills and achieving enlightenment. Mihu wandered the heavens and deeded everything to his head, for which he was later sealed again and fought demons in the name of redemption. And in the end he was reborn as a true deity, for few even in legends could reach such a level. That was why he was known to everyone in the tower. Except how such a serious quest opened up on the twentieth floor, our hero did not understand. It was unlikely that the tower system had malfunctioned. But it was strange enough, but at the same time there was nothing surprising because among the rankers for a very long time there were rumors that the twentieth floor could be related to King Mahu. The twentieth floor used to be called the Row of Five Mountains. Penance said that it was in one of them that the king was once sealed. And besides, since the staff was mentioned among the rewards because of the 72 transformations, we can safely say that the rumors were true, as it was thanks to them that Mihu was able to be reborn as a divine being. Sun Wukong, on the advice of his subjects, went to the Dragon King in the Eastern Sea and asked him for some weapons for himself. Heeding his request, the dragon gave him a staff of wish fulfillment with golden hoops, once these rumors spread, it would surely become noisy. Although he thought they had time while everyone was in shock, they couldn't think of anything else. After all, divine transformation in essence, they were exactly a form of matter and closely intertwined with clairvoyance and control space. For even inside the tower, it has barely been possible to gather any scraps of information about the 72 transformations, better known as powerful progenitors. King Mihu and his kind are similar to the gods often spoken of on Earth. They are transcendent beings who have transcended the boundaries of the human body and possess incredible power. But it was interesting. Does he really exist? After all, his brother had never managed to meet one during his entire time in the tower, and there was not a single mention of it in his diary. At least those very transformations must be true, since, judging by the conversations in the tower, the use of all for one reduced space and clairvoyancy by nature, some image associated with that skill. 72 Transformations That's how King Mihu was able to be reborn and become stronger. After all, surely everyone wants to comprehend them, but it's somehow strange that a bishop died doing such a quest. In all likelihood, this is some kind of trap. As far as our hero knew, everyone in the demon army is quite cunning, especially its leaders. For the sake of achieving their goals, they are willing to spend more than ten years, slowly setting traps and gradually waiting for the moment to catch and devour their prey. They are far more cunning than anyone else, and Kindred was no exception, though his greed and avarice are no match for his avarice and ruthlessness. The demon hierarchy is based on the belief in the devil. If he was able to become the second bishop, I'm sure his faith is unshakable. But then, what's the point? After all, Kindred was stronger than the five of them combined. Yeah, he hardly needed them because he was weakened. Rebecca said she'd probably say something stupid, but he couldn't be alive. But that Victoria said no, because she's sure, and her doubts about her and her magic really hurt her. To which the other asked what exactly she was talking about, and the girl said the effervescent wind. It's a rune magic that shows not only the location, but also the state of the person you're watching. It can't be removed, no matter how strong the person is. 
but they might also think that she and Kindred have spoken and want to trap them. But that's absolutely not the case. In fact, she's willing to swear a mana oath if need be. But she only has one request, and it's that she needs them to help her get into the quest area and retrieve Kindred's body. She doesn't really want any part of it either, to be honest. But she owes him a great debt, so she has to do at least that. Well, also the girl mentioned that, naturally, it's not for a simple thank you, because she wants to make a deal with them. Our hero just heard but a bit misunderstood, and the girl also said that she will show them the right place in the dungeon. If they do take up the task, they will have to guide her to Kindred's body, and those are all the terms. Our hero seems to have begun to understand, for she is looking for guards for herself, but at the same time our hero was unsure, for the stakes are too high. And already Rebecca turned to our hero, saying, Aren't you tempted by the possibility of getting the power of the great king? After all, such a chance may come only once in your entire stay in the tower. But as soon as our hero heard this, he immediately said that he had changed his mind but for a different reason. After the war between the Red Dragon and the Blue Flower Island, all the other eight clans had become active, but the devil bishops and their army were quiet and kept their heads down. If these things are interacting somehow, they should deal with it sooner or later. They're going to have to face them either way. So it was worth taking the chance to find out more about what demons were really capable of. And immediately, everyone began to slowly say that they are in, also confirmed it, Rebecca. And of course, our hero said the same. But then Victoria asked about Saul Moon. What about him? But after a little thought, said he declined. After all, he wasn't becoming a vampire to get involved in another delusional adventure and get himself killed. Well then, suddenly vines appeared from under the floor and grabbed the man, and he didn't realize what was happening. The vines felt like they were whittling him down, but then Rebecca said he was free to choose whether or not to accept the quest. Except she's not sure about his ability to keep his mouth shut. And then she doesn't have a single reason to let him go. Doesn't he think about it? Saul Luna only asked that she calm down. After all, he's not crazy enough to weave intrigues behind the back of the red sacred tree and Apostle Kernun. And of course they had to realize at last that his life was far more valuable to him than that. But the girl said his words too. He had better keep them to himself, squeezing the vines, but Victoria interrupted, saying that since they had figured it out, they should move out at the same time tomorrow, and everyone should take whatever they saw fit. After all, they should be prepared for anything that happened along the way. And so, the next day they set off, for the land at the top of the fifth mountain was to be had. Rebecca, ask Victoria, what was there in the cave all along? Well, Victoria said she thought the video it was hidden by a major barrier. Kindred said he almost lost his mind looking for the entrance, although it's not surprising since Shakyamuni Buddha himself created her, and she is the supreme being and one of the greatest gods of the tower. Such a being would have no trouble creating a barrier that even the highest level rankers could not bypass. Rebecca thought she understood. It sounded very plausible. But was it really true? At least it explained the protracted, agonizing search that Kindred had been interrupting for the past ten years. But our hero, upon a little reflection, realized that no one had doubted Kindred's death. However, he also noticed that Khan seemed to be too immersed in his thoughts, but didn't realize what was going on in his head. It wasn't long before they arrived at the location, and Victoria confirmed it, saying that it was here. Our hero was surprised that there was such a place, because it seemed to him that the development of psychic will allow him to easily find and feel everything that is hidden and inaccessible to the five bases of the senses. But his self-confidence blinded him, still higher being, what kind of creations are still unreachable? And it was necessary to memorize everything exactly, because in the future it could come in handy, 
If he understands the mechanism of this barrier, he could easily create similar ones using rune magic. Victoria also thought about the fact that Kindred had repeatedly crossed this barrier, destroying it and creating it again, so its reliability is much less. If it weren't for those gaps, she would never have found it. It is unlikely that she would be able to completely destroy the barrier, but she might still be able to do it, and after she started destroying it, our hero was surprised from such strength, at the same time shocked. After all, such a frightening power involuntarily reminds of the meeting with Erd, the same sensations were present in our hero, although it's not even worth comparing them. After all, if the barrier was really created by Buddha, then this energy is more like the power of King Mihu. And after a little manipulation, unimaginable things began to happen in front of our hero. But Victoria at one time said that this is all she knows. After all, to find this and other entrances with the help of psychics would be impossible, because they are very well hidden by barriers and scattered over a great distance. And the feeling that there was nothing but emptiness ahead of them made them extremely cautious. Rebecca immediately confirmed this by saying that she would guide them forward. After all, they couldn't rely on their will alone, and they had no choice but to enter using their physical bodies. Thus, they entered the dungeon of King Mihu's palace. Their team consists of four people, and the entrance to the Monkey King's palace is protected. There are curses placed on their team members, the curse of loss of self-awareness, the curse of confusion, and also the curse of poisoning. Victoria was surprised because she didn't understand why so many of them were using the protective barrier, and Victoria immediately created a barrier. But our hero, after thinking a bit, realized that the situation was a stalemate because the external energy was not available and could not affect them. But for how long will this be the case? After all, if all five senses are blocked, there is nothing left but to explore the cave and try to maximize the use of his will. Rebecca also said that it was a monstrous place and they should try to keep moving. After all, King Mihu had been imprisoned here for several hundred years, which was unbelievable. Since he wasn't, negative energy is accumulating here. They should all be careful. And as they walked deeper into the cave, they were surprised. Victoria noticed another crossroads. It was as if they were walking in circles and returning to the same place over and over again. Rebecca on this only asked not to harm. It is better to normally maintain the protective barrier. But Victoria was angry because she generally imagines how difficult it is to do so. Despite this, our hero realized that if they continue like this, these two will definitely not last long. After all, he doesn't know what kind of skills they are using, but it feels like they are wasting too much of her mana and materials. Oh, and Victoria's rune of magic has pretty much dried up, but looking at Kana, our hero realized that he seems to be handling the situation better than anyone else. After all, he only uses the will on his body, reducing its radius of action so as not to damage his consciousness. Did Rebecca and Victoria forget the basic skills because they were too used to rune magic and divine power? After all, they had only gone through a little bit, but they were already at their last breath. And he was fine for now, but should they have taken the leadership position? And also the king's nature tried to put a curse on them, such as mind cloudiness and information consciousness. But our hero managed to avoid this thanks to the cold-blooded characteristic, and the stun was cancelled and resistance to mind-blurring and information consciousness was obtained. Thanks to the characteristic of equanimity, he has gained outstanding spiritual immunity to curses and mental attacks, and he is no longer afraid of magical attacks. The equanimity allows him to gather himself and soberly assess the situation regardless of the circumstances, especially that he gained when he first became a player. Having helped him many times, not that he has used this ability often, but now is as good a time as any.
and since the king's toxic thoughts no longer affected his mental state, he could use his will and sixth sense. But they still continued to press him from the outside, and he needed to expand the territory of his skills. In a way, the king's thoughts were like a tsunami, sweeping away everything in its path, but with no particular direction of travel. He needed to create a breakwater. Thus, he learned to filigree control of his will, to direct the streams of consciousness, and now he was able to protect his mind and resist curses. But our hero understood that it was only necessary to identify a weak spot, and as soon as he identified, and immediately was able to direct the energy, he realized that this was it. Rebecca suddenly felt something incomprehensible, thought that the influence of the King of the Apes had waned. But immediately she realized that wasn't the case, for someone was deflecting all their attacks. Turning around, she realized that it was our hero, and looking at him in surprise, she asked how he did it. To which our hero said that he just had the right skillet, but he knew very little about it. Rebecca, for her part, said that under other circumstances she would have definitely asked him some questions about it. But Victoria interjected, saying that they were alive because of him and because of our hero. But also the girl pointed out that they didn't like the fact that he was hiding such a thing from them. After all, why couldn't he help right away, knowing how hard they were going through? And our hero said, Look, I do not understand whether she is angry or really grateful. After all, I do not want to deceive you, but I also do not see the point of revealing all the cards and using my power to the maximum. Thanks to my psychic sense and its augmentation, I'm beginning to gradually understand the structure of the cave. It is a labyrinth like a spider's web, with many intertwined paths and false exits. Going back makes no sense, since the entrance is no longer there, and I can't find the exit either. There must be many other traps and horrible monsters created by the angry king's energy. Under our circumstances, I would have easily dealt with them myself, but in our current state, we would be too easy prey for them. Of course, as a top-level ranker, Rebecca can definitely handle them, but I'm not sure about Kang and Victoria. They'll be in a lot of trouble, but in any case, there's nothing to be done. Therefore, he immediately ordered his spirits not to appear and gave only a single order, destroy every single one of them. The souls immediately began to follow our hero's orders, protecting them from the monsters, the Omnitools who were only trying to get closer to them to attack. All the knights, along with the oncoming army of souls, immediately attacked the monsters, not even giving them a chance to come within the minimum distance of our heroes. And of course, after defeating any monster, they could become much stronger due to absorption, and in addition, they destroyed all the traps quite quickly and without waking. Thus, 45% of the labyrinth was explored, and the dungeon was cleared with incredible speed. Our hero rejoiced at this, because everything was happening as if by chance. Of course, he realized that it would be nice to get rid of all the traps at once, but so the ghosts will be too easy prey for the monsters here. It also allowed him to get through the labyrinth much faster. He was also finally able to figure out the mechanism of King Mihu's cave. But then he saw something on the wall and he didn't realize what the traces were, because he could feel the energy, but it was much different from the attacks that had attacked them earlier. And a very old sword mark was found, and then a spear mark made much later. After all, there was an oppressive energy coming from the curse, while here there was an energy of joy and warmth. How could such marks remain in this place and not change? And what is their true purpose? The knights who saw this were also amazed. After all, they thought it was simply incredible. It was hard to believe them, and they were also surprised no less than our hero. On what our hero realized that they clearly knew something, but what exactly, he did not yet understand. And the knights even laughed, because he climbed to such a level and still does not know what it is. 
After all, he had developed his swordsmanship skills, but he forgot to pump his head. He should reconsider, and then he will see everything. Our hero only thought about them pissing him off, but he noticed common sense in Shannon's words. Using his dragon eye and psychic perception, he would still be able to get a strong inspiration. His dragon eye and psychic perception would help him see the traces and start to take shape. But once he saw thoroughly those traces, he was surprised. After all, these were martial arts. Was it really at the expense of training? After all, this record and martial arts masters who had honed their skills for 100 years. Those footprints were a creature consumed by its own madness and rage. Now our hero began to realize how things really were. For after being imprisoned by Buddha, the king never gave up trying to free himself again and again, trying to break the seal. After the seal was broken, the monkey king became angry and cursed the Buddha. He was strong enough to destroy everything around him, but he still lacked the strength to resolve the seal. Because of this, his mind left him and agony set in. Only then could the king realize that, having lost himself, it would be impossible for him to get out of here and get even with those who had done this. For the king of the apes began to gather together and systematize his knowledge accumulated during his life. Having put his thoughts in order, he began to work on himself, and this was a difficult task, because to work on himself you had to learn something new, and this proved to be almost impossible. But the king had something that people always lacked, and that was time, of course. And that meant that he moved slowly and surely towards his goal. Plus, whenever a new truth was revealed to him, he would test his strength on the wall to see what he had accomplished over a period of time. After all, the restless king was finally able to know tranquility. The man who was willing to do anything for his goal had changed beyond recognition. The new wielder of power, the owner of the heavens, began to fear the whole world. So another 100 years passed, and then 200, 500. And at the coming of almost 1,000 years in confinement, the king was still able to make it, and what he saw before him initially shocked him. He didn't expect to achieve this. Once free, he was able to gain enough strength to destroy the seal that had been imposed, and our hero only now began to realize that this was impossible. But then he thought that this was the 72nd transformation. The knights, as soon as they heard about the 72 transformations, were shocked. After all, how could he even compare 72 transformations to only 1% of King Mihu's total knowledge? And this was only the tiniest bit of the knowledge he had collected throughout his life. One could say his entire being, equal to the heavens, was encapsulated in them. A great sage, a being powerful enough to consider himself equal to the gods, and right now he could see the power that made him so. All that remains here are traces of his doge and the intense training, meditation, and labors of a king. The mere mention of him sent shivers down the spines of gods and demons alike. And our hero absolutely must make sense of all that Sun Wukong had left here. But that was beyond his comprehension. It was worth at least trying to memorize everything that was deciphered later. After all, he was sure that this knowledge would prove to be far more sword yin. And it wasn't martial arts, nor magic, nor alchemy, let alone those very transformations. He wasn't sure if magic was also present. However, this was on a completely different level, much higher than one could imagine. But then suddenly, our hero heard Khan addressing him, who immediately asked him why he stood there like a stump. After all, they need to focus. There's another intersection here, and he shouldn't forget that they're in the king's palace, and it's almost unrealistic to survive here alone. Our hero just apologized and thought that because of his updated perception of time, even though his thought processes had changed, they still noticed his hesitation. Rebecca noticed that the structure of the labyrinth had changed, and Victoria added that if they used their will a little further, naturally the king would hit them again. 
So the girl realized that there was nothing they could do but wait, and here she would try to find out what was next. But as soon as the girl started to move, our hero noticed something. In fact, he noticed an incredible power and immediately, using his skills, everyone was shocked. Victoria does not understand what is happening, as well as Kang. After all, they did not understand why our hero immediately used the power and abruptly headed towards the girl, and it looked like he wanted to attack her, to which the girl turned around and didn't understand why would he suddenly start heading towards her so aggressively. But in just a moment, our hero was able to stop the girl by grabbing her. Rebecca still didn't understand what happened or why he did it, but a purple glow immediately appeared in front of them. And as soon as our hero looked closer, he only apologized and said that there was no time for explanations. For apparently, they had finally attracted the attention of Mihu, who was now desperately trying to destroy them. God of the Hunt Kernan One of the most cherished desires of high-level anchors was to become his apostle, and the girls still managed to get that title except that none of them were upset or jealous when it was she who received the recognition. But she didn't understand why it was her. While our hero fought with this powerful force, the girl realized that this cannot be. After all, was she weaker than this brat? Clenching her fists, she was angry enough. After all, then what was the point of all this grueling training for so many years? and she didn't understand. After all, she's a recognized apostle and a high-level ranker. But then, the girl noticed that I was starting to get annoyed by all this, and using her power, she attracted our hero, who turned around and saw that she was quite strong. Her power was incredibly powerful, and now our hero understood the power of high-level rankers. Okay, she was also an apostle of the strongest god, and it was unlikely that she would be able to use even 50% of her full power in this situation. Even so, her power was astonishing, and it was scary to imagine what her power would be like outside of the five mountains of penance. But while our hero was thinking about it, the girl turned to him and said that from now on he would now lead them. But our hero was surprised by this, for it was unexpected for him. It is very rare for high-level rankers to admit their weakness so humbly. And here was the Apostle of Kernan himself, willingly handing over leadership to someone who was much lower in level. It was unbelievable, though he thought she would surely still prove herself in the future. But then abruptly, Victoria said she was against it. Sure, the guy had performed well in the dungeon, but you need the strength of a high-level ranker to go further. She's not downplaying his strength, and it's not worth thinking about. But even Kindred died here. She doesn't recognize the player as a leader weaker than her. Rebecca, on the other hand, immediately said it was the most common decision. After all, he is the only one among them all who navigates this maze. That is why he will lead them further. But our hero realized that this is a serious decision. In order to achieve his goal, he must do everything to ensure that they survive. And that would be extremely profitable for him. He should have taken the lead in the beginning. But then our hero thought about the soul gun. He should have been more attentive to him. Victoria and Rebecca were only focused on moving forward, so they didn't notice him, although he himself could hardly guess what to expect from him. He would probably bide his time until Rebecca and Victoria were in trouble. And from the looks of it, the king's once in a vampire and his skills aren't much affected by this place and nature, though he could have taken those cherished 72 transformations and gotten away with them a long time ago. Yes, what was he up to? Still, our hero was sure that when the time came, he would definitely make his move. He was discouraged by the fact of assigning what happened to Kindred and the army of demons, but he realized that it was better to get out of here as soon as possible, so he agreed and said that they would be moving very fast and they should stay focused and keep up, 
and moving through the tunnels they moved fast enough, but also, using his skills, he could quickly determine which way they were heading. So, immediately, changing courses, Victoria called out to him, Hey! To which Rebecca told her to calm down. After all, they should just follow him in the dungeons. She can't afford to be willful. To which Victoria thought, Was that the right thing to do? But our hero realized that perhaps it was Rebecca's influence, and he didn't expect them to believe so easily and follow him blindly. Then he realized that he couldn't let them down, and quickly enough, destroying everything in their path, they continued moving, and everyone followed our hero unquestioningly. And Victoria at one time thought that she didn't understand how this was even possible. After all, it felt as if he had been here before, and even with such ease anticipating all the attacks of the enemy. After all, of course, she had been watching him for a long time, but she clearly did not expect this. And while she was thinking, our hero turned around and said that he thought they had already gotten there. But Victoria was amazed by this, because the signals went on, but at some point they flew into a large space, and only now Victoria began to realize that they had already come so quickly. And stopping in front of the door, our hero noticed that it was huge, and Rebecca asked what kind of iron door it was, because it seemed to have some inscriptions on it. But our hero said that they are terribly old and covered with rust, so he cannot make out anything. Looking closely at the door, Khan turned to Victoria, asking her to take a look. To which she immediately said to, Wait, for the gate is made of divine iron of heavenly order sealed by Juyi Bang, Victoria, looking at those doors, realized that they were indeed there. And our hero thought it was unbelievable, for he thought they were just fairy tales. But another thing is important. No one saw what was hidden under a layer of dust and rust. These drawings and engravings are the last part of King Mihu's legacy. By doing so, he was able to discover the king's legacy and gained extra karma. But he wondered... Could they be remembered as Heavenly King? Victoria said that this place was created to lock the golden hoop, meaning they might not be able to get in. After all, the doors are made of divine iron, which is a metal resistant to divine or demonic forces, and it would be difficult to destroy something so strong. Kang immediately started trying to destroy the doors, as did Victoria and Rebecca, but all their attempts were futile. They realized that the doors hadn't even moved a millimeter, and the magic of the Roonies wasn't helping at all. Rebecca wondered how Kindred could even get in there, but our hero wondered a bit about the Holy Iron. After all, they can't open the gate with power, which means it won't help them. Kindred was able to get through somehow else, and they only had to figure out how he did it. But as soon as they touched the doors, some sacred phenomenon began, to which everyone was surprised, for they did not understand what was happening. But after a moment, our hero was able to unlock the gate, from which Victoria, Khan, and Rebecca were surprised. Our hero turned around and scratched his mask and said that they could go forward. And as soon as they opened the doors, they immediately entered some room with rather large statues. At first, Rebecca said that she had heard that King Mihu was also called the Monkey King, but it felt like the whole period of his reign had been recreated here, with a mountain of flowers and fruits. Especially impressive were the huge statues, which seemed far more powerful than Cain and Khan put together, and perhaps even herself. But then Victoria noticed Kindred, noticed that he was there, and Rebecca noticed the writing. This was King's 72nd rotation, but then Khan thought he had found it after all, because now Doyle could. But then a bat suddenly appeared, saying that these 72 sacred techniques would become his. It was a salt moon. It was approaching fast enough, but then a voice suddenly sounded, asking, Who dares to disturb the king's eternal sleep? Immediately, an incredible force attacked the bat.
But then our hero and his team began to attack, and it seems he was wrong not realizing that the king was sealed on one of the five mountains of repentance. It seemed to him that all the trials on the way here were made up by him. Except it wasn't the king himself who was making these monkeys move. It was his vassals who were behind everything. They should have paid attention to the very name of the dungeon. After all, this is King Mihu's palace. The palace isn't sealed, so it's unlikely that his spirit would have stayed here. One should have immediately guessed that the monkey king's creature could not be so weak and practically powerless against them. Let its trail had led them to this place. But, in fact, all this time, the winters had been opposed by his minions for fear that they would disturb the king's eternal sleep. So his minions immediately asked about the fact that they had tried to awaken their king from his eternal sleep and they would have to pay for it with their lives. And our hero received a sudden quest. The king was able to leave the five mountains of penance at the end of his punishment and was allowed to become king after years of training and self-development. However, his loyal knights who had selflessly guarded his sleep and waited for his awakening for so many years were doomed to live in that material waiting. And then the consciousness of the underground palace was also left here to preserve the remnants of their ruler until he returned to them again. This palace was also created to preserve the king's legacy and prevent anyone from taking possession of it. You'll have to fight the king's minions and prove that they are worthy to be his heirs. And then suddenly the monkey started attacking the players, and all the players immediately started fighting and dueling. Khan picked up on the fact that they were unbreakable and Victoria should keep them out of the door. Our hero began to realize that they are trying to block their way to the gate so as not to be surrounded. Then he should help them as well. Khan, with the help of his power, was able to strike hard. But that was only enough to put them off. But it was good that our hero knew the nature of the challenge. If they need to defeat them all, then so be it. Using his dragon eye, he was able to see their cores and only need to hit them using his power. He stored up his energy and immediately started hitting right in the center of the core with the beam, telling everyone else to go where he was pointing, because that's where their core was. Kang realized that they had a weakest point after all. Knowing this, he drastically changes the course of events. Rebecca immediately used rain and arrows to strike, and Victoria also, with her focus, delivered a divine hammer strike. All of them quickly enough started smashing everyone in their way without giving the slightest chance of defeat, and thus the first trial was successfully passed, and it would be possible to move on to the next test after the countdown was over, which was five minutes, but Victoria said that she had no mana left at all. She also commented that they were really incredible, but then the salt moon showed up, and everyone didn't understand what he said. They're called undead for a reason, because people like him aren't easy to destroy. Only after thanking them for their work, he told them to keep it up and immediately disappeared. And Rebecca got angry, because just a little bit more and she would have destroyed him. Victoria said that in any case he needed to restore his physical shell, and he would not bother them in the near future. To which our hero summoned the spirit of Shannon, only gave a command to which he immediately said to leave it to him, because he does not like such without precise guise, so he would betray him a lesson. And our hero realized that so far they are lucky, since the army of demons has not yet shown up. After all, it may be that they just have not yet achieved what they need, or they will wait until they finish here and attack outside. After all, even using his psychic sense, he couldn't see a single hint of the demon army's presence. After all, they were alone here, and they would probably want to take the 72 holy techniques and the golden staff. There was definitely bound to be something else here. In the meantime, Victoria started to approach Kindred, and as soon as she got closer, she realized that it was just a puppet. Only now did Victoria realize that it was just a mock-up, but she didn't understand how that was possible, 
because it meant that the real kindred might still be alive. And while Victoria sat by the doll, Kang immediately began to approach the obelisk. Putting his palms together, he realized that it was the same 72 divine transformations. He realized that he would have to memorize everything. Our hero thought for a moment, for the quest description said to take his skin. He would have to fight the king's minions and prove that he was worthy to be the heir, by taking his skin and leaving the tomb safely. What's the point of the quest and what's going on here? The skin is supposed to be... It was used as a metaphor. The king possessed it before becoming a god, 72 divine transformations. They were the very skin he was collecting Mihu for when he completed his new masterpieces. Therefore, to prove oneself truly worthy, one must learn them for sure. The army of demons will not stop aside and will try to get or entice worthy people to their side. After all, the first battle tested their basic skills. Hence, the second test would be analyzing and applying the contents of the secret scriptures, but the statues that guarded the sons of the monkey king would be their, shall we say, examiners. But at the same time, they still didn't understand why they had brought this dummy here. There must be a reason for it. But then our hero guessed something, and the second test began. We had to get ready. Our hero, as he attacked Victoria, immediately responded, realizing that he wouldn't have time to get to her as well as Rebecca. And as soon as the explosion happened, our hero couldn't see anything because of the smoke that surrounded him. But trying to dispel it, Rebecca was attacked by someone and flew away, and her sword broke. Our hero tried to dodge the blow of the huge statue, but still by inertia, he was thrown a few meters away. Standing up, our hero felt as if he was about to lose his arm, because it was an incredible force, too fast and heavy. Rebecca's condition was critical, and the other statues also gradually began to move. Something urgent had to be thought of, for he was afraid even if it wasn't possible for him to learn all 72 divine transformations in five minutes. But it was clearly not unreasonable to have been given so little time, because to become a worthy heir to the king, one must first show proper respect and concern for the king's well-being. And then, at last, our hero realized. And when the statue swung, striking our hero, the same moment shouted for everyone to lie down and hurry up. Kang and Victoria immediately obeyed and did as our hero said. When the statue saw that the guy bowed down, it immediately stopped. Kang, seeing this, thought, did they really succeed? And the statue continued to look at our heroes. Kang thought this was crazy. It meant they needed to pay their respects to the king. But Victoria's tears flowed and she only repeated, Rebecca, after all, she had pushed Victoria away, but she herself was wounded. Victoria still tried to help, but she realized that she couldn't even ease her suffering by one hundredth as she had used up almost all of her mana reserves. Rebecca first lay with her eyes open and then closing them, and everyone was very surprised, especially Victoria, who immediately started screaming, No! Khan and our hero just looked at it, without being able to do anything. It was only now that our hero began to realize that Khan had run out of stamina, while Victoria had used up all her mana to control the runes. Even if they use all of their skills, continuing on with the quest would be dangerous for them, and now this couple would only get in their way. And since, since it was already like this, King Mihu's legacy had to go to our hero. After all, there would probably be something else equally valuable besides the 72 divine transformations. Besides, they say that the golden staff of the monkey king, like the gate, is made of sacred iron. He should definitely get his hands on it, because then he would surely be able to learn more about the black bracelets. But first, our hero needed to throw off his balance. So he immediately said that he thought that all the tests that they were going through were necessary in order to choose the heir to the king. It is by the data of the king that the monkeys check if there is a worthy one among them.
and by doing so, the engraved 72 sacred transformations could be the key they need to get hold of by learning them all. Kang began to realize what the point was. After all, to get hold of the 72 transformations technique and prove that he could be his planned heir, and that already sounded pretty convincing. Also, Victoria asked, what about Kindred then? To which our hero said that apparently his demise was built to lure them into this trap. He hadn't been able to clear this dungeon alone, so he decided to put it on them. And as soon as Victoria heard this, she immediately got angry, saying that she had beaten this demon. But our hero said, they'll deal with him later. First they need to get out of here alive. So the statues immediately decided to attack our hero, who, in turn, used magic equipment. Immediately, there was a violent release of energy. Using his power, swinging his dagger, he was able to stop the statue's spear. Realizing that he had succeeded after all, after all, the magic equipment did work. Turning around, he saw that the two had made it and were now safe. Immediately, our hero very quickly approached the door, where Victoria told him to hurry up and get out. To which our hero replied that they would have to leave first, closing the door behind him, and he was left alone on the latch, using his Entrinian power. He only now realized that he finally didn't have to hide his true power anymore, and with his sword in front of him, he was ready for battle. Victoria immediately started yelling for him to open the door, and with that, they left the quest area and could no longer return since they were not qualified. Kang was angry too, for he didn't understand why he always acted like that, remembering Doyle. He realized that he had trained so much to become more useful, and the sacred techniques were right in front of his nose. But as he knocked on the door, he realized that he was very angry, but protected them and sent them to safety. Turning around, he turned to Victoria and told her that Kindred was waiting for them outside, to which the girl was shocked. Khan told Victoria that he had an idea and it was worth listening to him. In the meantime, our hero, using the expansion of his domain by gaining Bin's dragon territory, can set his own rules in his chosen domain. All the restrictions that held him back no longer matter, because now it is the domain of the great dragon, and in it he sets his own rules. All rules and prohibitions are set on the five mountains, and the penance is no longer in effect. With that, our hero's five senses returned. For the training was not for nothing. He could feel his psychic perception intensifying, emitting waves and streams of mana from every object that became incredibly clear. Therefore, it was now within his power to even interact with them. In addition, using his dragon scales, he could go crazy, for he had never before been able to exercise such immense power in his body. It simply overwhelmed him, and as soon as our hero spread his wings and pulled out Vigrid, he felt that he too had definitely changed. Vigrid, thanks to his new master and his divine power, the sword becomes excellent again, partially cleansed of the curse, the cause of which is still unknown. It remains unclear, however, whether what will restore Vigrid to his true form will become a hero. The blessing of the sword affects all enemies in the controlled territory, cursing them and dealing a decisive blow to one of them. With each enemy struck, this effect increases, infecting them and significantly slowing their movement speed. When fighting, the caster will be able to use the sharpened soul of fallen heroes when their hatred and desire to deal damage exceeds a certain level. Speed and strength will also increase by 30%. Strength will increase to 1,500, and damage from critical hits will increase by 35 turn to 40%. However, while this status is in effect, skill and defense attribute scores will decrease by 50%. The purification of the sword's abilities and the mighty sword and its wielder will increase depending on the absorption of anger and greed in battle against the enemy. 
the combat power of the sword increases in proportion to the strength of the enemy, and the probability of striking a strong blow also increases. Also, our hero utilizes Athena's advice and guides. As well as releasing the souls he had previously collected from his subject knights, he only mouthed that it was all the result of his long work and his strength, to which the statues told him to prove that he was truly worthy to be considered the heir to the greatest king, Mihu. And at some point, they clashed in battle. And one of the knights told our hero that he did not think he would dare to challenge them, for he would not be missed. Also, the other was glad that they too would be able to take part in this obviously, undoubtedly decisive battle. I wonder what they will do, thought our hero, for he thought they were very much inspired by the heavenly energy that overflowed the dungeon. But then the statues again began to tell them not to dare to disturb the king's rest. But our hero was quick enough to get between them, and the spirit with the help of his power was able to stop the two spears that were aimed at him. And our hero, of course, continued to make attacks, for as long as they held their defenses. But still he realized that there were too many of them, and they were getting stronger. If the battle drags on, they will lose their advantage, and he must prove himself worthy to be the king's heir not destroy his guards. He needs to learn the 72 holy techniques and prove himself. When you think about it, they move very strangely. It's like each statue uses six different techniques. There are only 12 statues. If the 12 statues each use six different techniques, then there are 72 techniques, and that is the 72 holy techniques. So our hero realized that he needed to keep defending after gathering himself and calculating their every move, he needs to use the king's legacy. If he doesn't understand something, and finally take away their 72 holy techniques. But with so much information, his head is about to explode. But here, using a lunge, he was still able to concentrate his energy and strike, destroying one of the statues, realizing that he had succeeded after all. With that, he obtained the first holy technique, the lunge, and began to learn the 72 holy techniques of the king. A lunge is a technique for creating a strike within a certain spatial range. Its development requires great mental strength and concentration. If it fails, it will be plunged into a state of frustration for more than three seconds. This was a skill King Miku Song Ugon had learned from his teacher Subhisti during his childhood. This skill allowed him to take the place of the king of the seven demons of Dunju, the king of monsters. Each of the 72 holy techniques has its own special style, so they are quite difficult to learn. But if he succeeds, he will be able to choose the path of a monster or a saint. By doing so, he would gain an achievement that is rare to obtain and karma would be credited to him. But then abruptly the statue spoke that he had dared to disturb the king's dream, and he must prove that he could be called his follower. Then she said that their work was done. It was only now that our hero began to realize that it was possible to prove a, his claim by learning just one technique out of seventy-two. Only now did he realize that he had been lucky enough. With that, he had successfully passed the second test, and the third would soon begin. But our hero was not happy about this, because he didn't understand how the third test could start at once. From behind his back, the door immediately began to open, and the third test began. And then our hero got out, but looking down at the rocks, he immediately saw a dragon flying up to him and said, That's right, he's new. And our hero, just by looking at the dragon, realized its insane power and whether it was possible that he was a dragon god. But he didn't think it was comparable to the dragons he had seen or the phoenixes. So he asked the newcomer again, What do you mean? To which the dragon said to the newcomer follower, do you understand? As soon as our hero answered that he understood, the dragon immediately told him to climb on him, for he would guide him to it, and immediately began to fly as soon as our hero was on the dragon's back.
and then he seemed to start lifting. Apparently, he can't answer because of the law of cause and effect. This is his third test, but he doesn't answer the questions or ask any questions himself, or the three questions are tests in themselves. Then you have to ask questions that will walk on the edge but not go over the edge. So our hero immediately asked who he was, to which the man replied that they thought the last question would be just that, and he was curious. So he immediately said that he had passed, and thus our hero successfully completed the third quest. After completing the Royal Terracotta War side quest and the Royal Palace hidden quest, as a reward, he gained the 72 Holy Techniques skill and the title King Mihu's Descendant. He then obtained an achievement that cannot be obtained easily, and additional achievements and rewards are provided. The title, Descendant of the King, after breaking the seal of King Mihu, who wanted to leave his inheritance on the mountain. He is not shown in the video, his own prison, but after spending 500 years in this place, he got used to it. In addition, he listened to the words of his mentor and decided that he should pass on the 72 holy techniques to his followers. By obtaining this title, he would have excellent concentration and mental strength in battle and would be able to use the all-seeing eye and King Mihu's powers at the same time. The man then said that he was only a shell of King Mihu. After all, he left him and immediately disappeared. It could be said that he was his skin. And also, this imaginary world is also created by him, and he doesn't know where he is now. At least someone would be able to find out after him. It's almost impossible to keep up, and it is unlikely that the words of others will make any difference to him. After all, he too is tired of being here. At last the newcomer came, so he dropped the subject. He only said to our hero, Catch! Our hero realized that he had a familiar feeling. After all, was it really a divine precious metal? It was the shard of Jui Bang that King Mihu wore on his head. In order to utilize its full power, he should gather the missing pieces. Immediately, the hidden quest began. King Mihu was concerned about the possibility of having too many successors, so to preserve his reputation, he decided to find the one true heir among all of them. So he divided Jui Bang into hundreds of pieces and scattered them all over the tower. The prerequisites for starting the quest include the rank of King Mihu's heir and a piece of Jui Bang. There's also no time limit. The man also said that the other pieces are scattered all over the tower, even he doesn't know where they are, and how many there actually are. Perhaps someone has already found them but doesn't realize their real meaning because it shows how many people want to be called great heirs, successors of heaven. If he doesn't want it, he should give up right now and wait for the real heir to appear. To which our hero said that he sees the point in refusing, for he will do anything. How much confidence does he have, newbie? For then he has nothing more to do here, and he can go through the portal. But our hero wanted to ask another question, showing the bracelet. He asked the man if he knew what kind of bracelet it was, because it felt like it was made of the same metal. The man, when he saw this bracelet, asked where he got it from and what it did, to which our hero said that he thought it could somehow influence the soul. And the man said that these are definitely divine objects. He thinks there are more of them on his neck, arm and legs, like objects for, to which our hero said he thought so, for ever since he had absorbed Astrope. But now he was sure, for sure, it was a divine weapon, to which the man said that if one meets his real body, they will show him this bracelet, for he fears he would gladly take it away. Asking if he knows why both gods and demons want to get their hands on the sacred iron, to which our hero could not answer. But the man said, not because they like it, but because they are afraid of it, for it is the only thing that can seal a god or demon. It's used for demons or gods who become too powerful, and he thinks this bracelet also served as such a tool. 
It is like shackles for a criminal. They became his property through his spiritual residue because criminals wore them for too long, and he thinks he had something to do with the doom. But that's all he could find out. About the Dark King, for he didn't think he could be afraid of anything either, to which he only thanked him for the story, and the man said goodbye. And at the same time the man pondered. After all, interesting man. And he even had the energy of a dragon, reminiscent of someone. To which the dragon said, Yes, because he is the old master. Well, here the man sensed something, turning to the dragon. He said something was wrong, for there was someone here. Standing up, they saw the portal and asked how dare he enter a world created by the king himself. And it was Kindred, asking for forgiveness, and saying that he was only another face of the great sky demon, and he had come for them. Kindred, coming through the portal, apologized, for he was only another face of the great sky demon, and immediately said he had come for them. And at the same time we are shown our hero, who hesitated, for he saw no trace of Khan and Victoria, and hoped that they had not just returned home. But then our hero noticed Rebecca, and he was sorry that everything turned out this way, because she was a good person, and he could have tried to take her soul, but the bracelet could only absorb those he struck personally. But maybe he could think of something else. So he immediately decided to take her body and decide there. And before he left, he thought for a while, because what should he do with this place? The man said he was another follower of the king, which meant he'd better get rid of any potential competitors, and he couldn't let others get their hands on the sacred iron, because it should be his alone. Lighting the fire behind him, he immediately began to burn the whole place down so that no one else would come here. And after a while in a village of unicorns, one of the unicorns turned around to see who was coming from behind, and immediately Pant jumped out, asking if he had managed to come back alive, to which our hero only wondered what he was. But turning around, out of uncertainty about the answer, he asked the other unicorn how the sacred beasts were doing, for it was time for them to hatch. The fellow replied that yes, they were already awake, and Pant at the same time got angry, for he had expected at least a normal conversation, and this was already too much. But our hero said, I only asked the guy to take me to the beast, to which the guy asked to follow him, and our hero went and Pant just thought about why he was even trying here. But the one who had hit on our hero turned around and said, You, and then said that he had heard that it was he who was connected with the sacred animal. For he too had wondered why they were so stupid, but now everything fell into place. Afterwards, turning around and walking away more simply, our hero didn't realize what was wrong with him. Pant, only looking at the guy, asked our hero if he remembered him, to which he received a questioning answer, should he? He immediately laughed, for he thought that this was self-confidence. After all, he does not even remember those whom he was able to defeat. But our hero still didn't realize who he was. Pant immediately said that he was John, and he had defeated him when he first came to the One-Horned Tribe. It seemed to take him a long time to recover from that, and apparently he was grinding a grudge against him. And it seems it was understandable why he might not recognize him, for he hadn't been himself lately, as if he was taking something. And as soon as our hero turned around, he immediately noticed the demonic energy. But he thought, why is it so strong around him? After all, he doesn't care about that. Muwan will figure it out our hero thinks, and went inside, talking about how finally their sunshine is moving and they should make him food faster, and more, and then ask where the scrolls are. After all, he changed the light again, and it had to be written down, because it is unforgettable. Their just scrolls are the diary of the baby. But as soon as our hero saw who was in front of him, he was surprised for they are griffins. After all, it's one of the best sacred animals, and they seem to be full of energy, he transmitted, which was excellent. 
Thus, our hero had successfully completed the hidden quest, Trial of the Abyss Tortoise. Our hero was able to achieve something that no one else could easily achieve. Additional achievements and rewards are provided. From now on, he can communicate with the Blue Spirit, understanding the art of the elemental. Still very low, he should turn the Blue Spirit into a higher art by learning the technique. And as a reward, he could get a turtle head shell fragment, 30 pieces, and snake tail scales. The turtle head shell fragment is a qualified artifact. This artifact is unique in the tower. There is only one, and not fully owned by the owner. It cannot be sold or transferred to another person. It was great for our hero, because he felt his defense was insufficient, and the shell and scales are strong and flexible enough at the same time. And it's definitely good stuff. But then our hero heard the dragon's voice asking what he wanted to restore the turtle of the abyss about. Kerrang? Our hero asked, for he had been sleeping in the philosopher's stone for half a year. And immediately he heard the little phoenix, who told him that he was here too. So he immediately asked how they were feeling. The little phoenix said that he was fine and that he wanted to fly, and the dragon was indignant because why he still called him that and didn't even pick up a normal name. To which our hero said that he couldn't think of anything better, but the dragon was outraged, and as soon as our hero laughed, the dragon thought for a bit and suggested the name Namesis. Now, how does he like that name? Namesis asked why he had summoned him. But our hero said that he himself knew for his rebirth, why were ancient dragons like Calatus alive? For he still didn't understand how it all worked. The dragon thought for a bit, talking about his rebirth. All this time he had been living in the void. The void was a place between worlds where nothing existed. He was only waiting for Chona to come and take him away. But our heroes wondered why he just went into the void. To which the dragon said that Calatus told him so. And that's what's weird. Calidus gave everything to Chon and died. He gave him the dragon heart, and he personally saw him die. But when the Chong Wado surrounded him, he couldn't avenge Chona, and he already thought he was going to die. Then he heard the roar of Kalatus. The dragon immediately told him to wait for him. After all, he might come back. And our hero began to realize what had happened. After all, he had always wondered who brought Chonu's body back to Earth, and was it possible that it was Kalatis? So our hero asked the dragon where he could be. To which he said that perhaps where it was most important for him to be was the tenth floor of the dragon temple. And our hero wondered about the fiftieth floor, for on that floor his brother had died, which meant that Kalatis could indeed be there. But still, our hero realized that it means that he will have to go to the 50th floor, except he's not able to do that yet, because his name is going to appear in the Hall of Fame. He'll have to go up to the 21st floor again. And the 21st floor is the Shadow Dojo. After flying to a certain building, he realized that this was it, because on the 21st floor you have to pass a training room with five doors inside, and the higher the door number, the more difficult the task. Immediately after entering the door, you need to start running forward and pass 33 sections, destroying the shadows in each of them. The shadows completely copy the features and attack styles used in the previous floors. Therefore, there are only 165 of the strongest players worthy of a place in the Hall of Fame. Most likely, all of these players will all become supreme world rankers later on in this place practicing their strengths and eliminating weaknesses. Numerous times they can also learn the weaknesses and strengths of their opponents and apply them later. Normally, passing this floor is very difficult, but not for our hero. In fact, except for the tenth floor where he was signed as anonymous, he used his name. He really came a long time ago from the day he first came to the tower. In front of him, a list of the best who had passed this floor appeared. After all, 
This was the ranking of the 21st floor, and his brother was in fourth place. Muan Palace. The master asked our hero about going to the 21st floor, because it is a shadow dojo, and that means he will fight Ava Illusion. But our hero said, yes, for he was on the second floor, and thinking of his brother being on the fourth, the master asked him if he was confident. But on receiving an answer, he asked, why should he have confidence, for he can beat him as it is. Muan immediately thought what an impertinent man he was, for he thought he was joking, and he had confidence in himself, to which our hero said that he could not joke and took everything literally. The master asked about the fact that by fighting his illusion he would finally realize his place. Our hero said that he was really sure that his illusion would have anything left at all after meeting him, because what a horror it would be to have a man like Sky being pummeled by an ordinary tower player. Pant, this kind of thing, was shocked, wondering if he could really defeat his father. Edora immediately jumped into their argument and talked about them stopping since they weren't children anymore, and furthermore, turning to her father, said that the elder was looking for him and he should go already. Muan also turned around and started grumbling about going, thinking he just had to. But then he turned around and told our hero that he hoped he would go up and take the first place. But our hero only said, okay, thinking that the first place only goes to the initiated, because even the mentor couldn't reach it. But he wondered who that person was. Turning around, our hero asked the girl, for she seemed to be going further up the tower. Idora immediately said that she was, because she wanted to take the griffins to the territory of the Turtle of the Abyss, and then go straight on their way because they had been here for too long already. Our hero suggested that they meet on the 23rd floor. The girl thought about the 23rd floor and realized that it meant he wanted to go up with them and beyond. So smiling, she only told him that she would be happy with this outcome. Pant asked our hero if he was going to climb further with them, to which our hero said that he still needs to prepare himself because the 21st floor holds the remains of many creatures and he needs to improve his skills and get items and materials. And also, as he approached the boat, he needed to apologize for he imagined how worried he was when he left the weapons of Shannon and Hanron and did not come, for he even came to the one Horn tribe. And as soon as our hero went to the door, he immediately heard a voice behind it saying that they were willing to give everything, for all he had to say was the price. And then someone began to say 50,000, then 100,000, and after 120, and our hero saw Hainov, who stood and held a sword in his hands. For someone thought it was his sword, and others only said not to sell the sword to the great five to just anyone. Our hero thought, why is he always like this? After all, this is the great sword of the great five, for which many are willing to give their souls. And after he heard someone offer 300,000, our hero also raised his hand and said 500,000, and everyone immediately turned around saying that this is the same person, but they don't understand why he is here. Although someone is saying that he is friends with Hanova, and one of the players raised his hand and said 660,000, to which the girl said he was crazy, because where did he get that kind of money? Our hero only managed to say a million, and so did the rest of the swords. Heneva even got a little upset at such a bet and asked if there were no more bids. Then they say that the guy won after all. But when everyone left, Heneva threw all the swords at our hero and asked why he was here. Our hero just said that he bought all his swords for a million and he should be kinder. But as soon as our hero pulled the sword out of its sheath, he was amazed, for it was amazing and almost perfect, considering its level. Heneva had spent many nights working on it, also making it two-handed and possible to use the ball for different purposes, but because of this ability it would contain the blessing of the wind and its curse. The blessing is a steady and strong wind that increases the speed and power of the wielder's attacks, 
When used on the right side of the ball, it can trap an opponent in a trap called Web of Swords. An opponent caught in the web is in a state of confusion and loses their power. The curse is a reverse flow of wind. When used on the left side, the sword can create up to 12 whirlwinds in a row, with his defense being lowered and the chance of taking damage from the opponent increasing. Depending on his skills, he can use both sides at the same time, increasing his power by 2300%. Immediately, the knights were shocked and asked why he didn't take this sword just now. After all, this sword was too good to be made in a few nights, not years. The other swords, too, definitely required all his time in crafting and creating. Our hero realized that he must have been working untruthfully, working all night. Immediately, he apologized, for he was sorry for coming so late and not even warning him. Heneva only said that he knows very well how hard it is for him to lose loved ones, and he doesn't want to go through that again. But still, our hero has to remember that. He then said that he found a lot of good material and he needs his help. Heneva even got a little interested and asked what he had. Our hero then revealed that he had gotten rewards from the Turtle of the Abyss and the Dragon of the Void. Heneva was very surprised and asked what he would do with them. Our hero said that he needed to update his equipment, as it had been a long time since he had done this and his skills had grown considerably. He needs to learn everything all over again for his new self. Heneva immediately asked our hero if he realized what he was doing, to which he received the answer that he does, because by upgrading his equipment, the player as if agrees to show all his strengths and weaknesses which means that his vulnerabilities will be known to all his opponents. If you are too weak, you can easily fly out of the tower. And after all, he had trusted him like a fool. Hanava still agreed to help, but she would need his help, because if he doesn't come, she will immediately tell everyone how weak he really is. To which our hero asked, Please believe in me. And the very next day, Heneva sat at work trying to find out information about the player. But as soon as he saw our hero's stats, he didn't understand why he was still on this floor with such abilities, because he could beat any ranker. And even though our hero hid the basic information, but he was still able to learn a lot about him. And most importantly, he is directly related to magic, which means that his items should be endowed with it as well. Thinking back on the subject of magic, it's possible that he's meant to be either its ruler or a mortal minion, and from the beginning he was closely connected to it, specifically. And holding the blade in his hands, Heneva realized that he was fine with his master, but it would also make him new friends, and already immediately he set to work in drawing layouts for the work. And already two weeks later, Heneva's artifact magic armor artifact magic gloves, and artifact magic boots were created. With that, they had created a complete magical armor. Our hero immediately reached for the armor, but the man slapped his arm and asked, how dare he? What did our hero realize that he didn't, for they were already full? To which the man said that it was necessary to wait a little longer. But then our hero noticed something. After all, he was the one who was surprised that the tower doesn't celebrate birthdays for everyone. It's a normal day, but the tower can't survive without cold heart, and he wanted to keep his human tradition alive somehow, so he gave him hell's tears. Our hero didn't understand why he also kept them and why he brought them now, and of course, why he hadn't used them yet. Hell's Tears are the last legacy of the Princess of Giants. She was often called the Mother of Hell. Her tears are considered by many to be the highest level material. Therefore, our hero asked if it was true that Hell's Tears. Heneva immediately said that yes, for he had never been able to figure out where to use them. But now he knew for sure, for he thought the attributes of fire and darkness would fit his equipment perfectly and thus our hero, together with Heneva, was able to create a unique equipment. Many gods and demons will envy him. 
magical armor created by Heneva, they were created perfectly for our hero, but became perfect thanks to Hell's tears. They are lightweight and transformed to suit his needs, as well as recovering quickly from damage. The tears add attributes of fire and darkness to his armor. The attributes are revealed differently depending on his skill. Dragon's Eye further increases his senses, including his psychic sense. The man then asks to put them on, for they should fit him perfectly. And as soon as our hero did so, he immediately put his hand to his chest, and the man asked him how he felt, to which our hero thought a little, and then said that it was comfortable, because it was like a parent's hug. Our hero, having created a dome, called the dragon and phoenix to him. They immediately asked him why he called them, and our hero thought that he still liked Karang and Charik better, saying, They had changed stats too, and he wanted to check them out. Dragon said, Checking their stats is a great idea. Phoenix added, saying, He'll be surprised to see their changes. Nemesis asked our hero if he wanted to check if they had any unique skills like Dragon Call and Quiet Sleep, to which our hero said that you could say that, because Dragon Call creates a huge hurricane, destroying everything in its path, and Quiet Sleep helps reduce my magic usage in a certain area. Nemesis said that his skills are not very different, but only to him to look, closing his eyes the dream disappears, and our hero realized that after so many years in darkness, he could get this power. Our hero had felt some limitations when he used the flaxen wings, but now those limitations were gone. Waving them, he immediately began to check how they worked. Now having climbed to a high enough altitude, he decided to go there, adding a kick and lunge as well as lightning to speed up considerably and, using his sword to deliver a powerful blow that sets everything around him on fire. And now it was clear to our hero why the attributes of fire were so high. After all, if he uses rain of fire and dragon's blood, something grand could happen, to which immediately the knight said that there would be utter chaos, for it was good that they didn't have to face it in their lifetime to which our hero asked that if they had met him when he was at the peak of his power, the knight said that he would have tried to destroy him as his enemy, but he wouldn't have been intimidated. After all, the main thing is to not give him time to attack, and attack first. Yes, and it is difficult to distinguish friend from foe, and one wonders what kind of relationship they are in now to which our hero realized that he needed to become much stronger, and that meant that it was left to check the Blue Spirit. The blessing of the Blue Spirit of the Abyss Turtle was provided by a family member in exchange for a thank you. The Blue Spirit is a creature born in the depths of the Abyss. Although it does not possess knowledge, it can help its master in various situations, in fact, it can protect divine beasts and prevent confusion between the attributes of various skills. In some cases, it could be improved in various ways by giving it different skills and attributes to learn. Our hero didn't understand what to do with the Blue Spirit yet, and he thought it was a good help. But it is still unclear what to do with it, because it is necessary to reunite it with someone and raise a worthy person. Hepburn is too loyal to Erd. Saul Luna is too suspicious. And our hero has only one candidate left. It's Rebecca. After all, her body is still alive, but her soul isn't in it, and perhaps he could merge her body and soul. Kernun was angry enough that our hero even considered such a thing. After all, demons look at him with suspicion, and some judge him behind his back. His attributes were changed from her level to 70%, and then our hero started using the black bracelet, and the girl woke up, asking where she was, to which our hero said that they are outside the tower. But she did not yet understand how this is possible, and why she is here after all she died. But she immediately realized what was the matter, and our hero confirmed, It is, it is, isn't it? But the girl immediately asked angrily why he had kept her body. 
Our hero said that he needed her powers. Rebecca got very angry asking if he was serious now. After all, she is following her God and doesn't want that kind of life. To which our hero said that doesn't she have feelings and memories. After all, what is so different from ordinary life? Then our hero offered to make a deal with her, because isn't it very profitable, because he could help her to correct her mistakes. But here the girl got a little quiet, and then, remembering about her mistakes, because when she was a little girl she saw a lot of terrible things, but despite the magnitude of the tragedy, she never thought she was frightened by such things. Even though the force had consumed her family and loved ones, she couldn't turn a blind eye to its power, and she wanted to become just as strong all along. But even after becoming an apostle, she couldn't come close to the power she desired. But who knew it would end like this? What if she refuses? He would return her to unconsciousness. And all the girl said was that he was a fool, to which he, the hero, said that maybe she always managed to achieve what she wanted. Rebecca immediately said that she would agree, but with one condition, she wants to make her own decisions, to which our hero said, sure, and immediately the spirits appeared, saying that their master was so smart. After all, they didn't think she should respect him anymore. Our hero said that there was freedom of choice in them too. And the girl, as soon as she looked at the wolf with teeth and Thomason, was shocked. But then she said one more thing. She wanted a strong body. But our hero said it's possible, but she would have to live as the spirit of the owner of the abyss turtle. But he doesn't have the final form yet, and he could give her parts of the souls of Apostle Erd and Soli Luna. They aren't perfect, but it would help her get her powers back. She would also need to call him Master. And the girl said as if she was going to do that. And as soon as she absorbed the souls, the process began. And she is now a lower-level blue spirit. Our hero managed to subdue her to the subject. Additionally glad to give continued service as an additional glad to create the abyss. Spirit art skill. Abyss spirit is one of the rarest types of spirit magic. In order to master it, it needs to learn more different skills. The more skills, the higher the power of the spirit art. Erd, on the other hand, got really angry. Erd was saying something to Kernun, but he was ignoring her. Kernun looked at our hero and continued to remain silent. Our hero realized that the demons and gods on the 98th floor had no way to pass, so they were unlikely to affect the player's skills. Besides, his dark bracelet would definitely take away their desire to mess with them. In addition, the demons are discussing our heroes and want to talk. On our hero, it was interesting who exactly wanted to do that. Our hero was already on the 21st floor at the gates of the Shadow Dojo, his trial beginning as soon as he steps inside. The Shadow Trials have always been his faithful companions, silently following him, but among them are those who sometimes want to leave to think and act on their own will. They always stand in the same place, trying to take the bodies of others. The Shadow Abodes are divided into five gates of 33 compartments, for each gate, he should now choose one door and go through more than twenty rooms, fighting the shadows that try to get in his way. The more shadows he can defeat, the more their ambitions will disappear. And our hero began to wonder, but then he heard a voice asking if it was him. Turning around, he didn't realize who it was. It was the Supreme Guardian, one of the twelve Zodiacs, Lupi. He looked weak, but he was actually quite strong. Our hero didn't understand why he was here, so he immediately asked why he was here, to which he got the answer that Laplace was here too. But the Guardian hoped Laplace hadn't come after all, and our hero didn't understand why not. Laplace is now under investigation, but he fears he may have escaped. Our hero was surprised that he was afraid of Laplace. After all, was it really because of the incident when he came to our hero and relayed the demon's words? But he was afraid of such a thing, for he did not think so. 
The guard immediately asked not to look at him like that, because in any case it is good that he is not here. Asking if he needed a guide on the twenty-second floor, to which our hero replied that no, and as soon as our hero opened the door he saw the other players in front of him, who thought it was the greedy devil but they didn't understand why he was here. After all, they thought he had been exploring the twentieth floor for a long time, but our hero hasn't seen Kang and Victoria. Or were they hiding from the devil's army? Though he thought it was unlikely, he thought. After all, it is strange, of course, that they do not follow him. They're basically laying low, but our hero approaching the door chose the fifth door. Shadows of players from 165 to 133 place, recorded in the Hall of Fame on the 21st floor, appear one after another. If he defeats the shadows or can last more than five minutes, he moves on to the next room. After defeating a total of 20 shadows, he will be able to pass the challenge. Walking through the door, our hero thought that he would try to clear it as fast as possible. But Creighton appeared in front of him, 165 place, and the battle began. Our hero was surprised to see what he looked like in his time for his skill in using invisible daggers. But then Rebecca suddenly appeared, asking if she should take care of them, and our hero saw her in spirit form. He realized that he could now share and take her power, but it was unlikely that her power was at the same level as when she was alive. He should learn more about the power of spirits, so he immediately said that no, he would straighten up on his own. After all, he needed practice anyway. Take out Karshan's dagger. Originally, it was a dagger that the monk liked to use. However, after passing through the hands of many people, it fell into the hands of an unknown player and changed dramatically. Only the basic structure of the passion-soaked sword remains, and the rest of the functions have almost forgotten their original appearance after several modifications. The player's passion for the weapon changes depending on spirituality, and this causes more changes depending on the user's skill level, such as attack speed and strength as well as the affection and skill of communicating with the weapon increases significantly. The Black Blade was specifically created for the despair of the Black King and was most suited for the Dark-type attribute. If our hero takes the Black attribute, his attack power will increase by 15 or 20 percent. Our hero realized that with Hinova's help, he could improve his dagger. Now the runic inscriptions complement his Dark attributes, so he needs to make the dark even darker, and the hot one even hotter. But as soon as our hero walked through the door, the other players didn't understand why he went to the fifth door specifically. After all, the greedy devil thought he would enter the first one, as it was considered the most difficult. Then why the fifth door? After all, perhaps he wants to go through all the doors from the first one. But one of the players didn't think so, because the shadows, even at the lowest levels, are strong, and it's unlikely that the devil would be able to pass them all. And what was the point of waiting so long on the twentieth floor anyway? After all, why did they think it was called that? This, Heidi asked the players, but they didn't know what she meant. But then, at some point, everything started collapsing, literally from the sky, and they didn't realize what it was. They thought it was an earthquake. But from what direction could it have come from in the dungeon? Then the players suddenly looked at the door, not understanding what was happening to it, because it was getting very strong blows. And just a few minutes later, there was an explosion on the ninth floor, which caused the door to catch fire. Heidi, seeing who stood in front of her, was very surprised and shocked, because in nine minutes and fifty-one seconds our hero was able to defeat everyone on his way. But unfortunately, the second door was closed, and it was necessary to wait for two hours. Our hero realized that it was long enough this time, thanks to the sacred transformations and some techniques he had learned a lot inside. Realizing that the first door was much more difficult and it was unlikely that he would be able to defeat the shadows just through luck, 
he was still going to keep going despite losing or winning. Therefore, he needed to try to defeat the one behind the first door. It was a top-level walled beach swordsman. Our hero immediately remembered his brother, for he was familiar with him from a long time ago. They were much stronger than him and over five meters tall, but they still helped him advance through the levels. Waldbeach and Viera Dune teamed up to form the Artia team. After Chonu's death, he disappeared somewhere, and our hero didn't know why. But for sure his brother's death was on his conscience, not directly, but he was also his enemy and he had to defeat him. After a while our hero entered the first door, the trial began, and a shadow appeared in front of him. Our hero immediately clashed with it in a duel, swords attacking him. The knights only said, There he is. He can't escape. Our hero was able to activate his magical defense and immediately rushed into the fight, using his sword to cut literally through the air to make attacks, and the shadow didn't understand how it was possible that the impact made him immediately fly away, and immediately 33 trials were stopped. And we have already been shown another place where a man asks another player if he is sure he knows nothing about this place. But the one who said yes begs him not to touch it, because it's been six months since he received the Queen of Summer's orders. How much time will he waste? He searched all of Bahal's acquaintances, but still no closer to a clue, wondering if this is really about Cain though he doesn't think a minor pawn would have played a part in the case. After all, the Queen of Summer believes that Jongwado and the Red Dragon Clan are being controlled by someone from outside, and he believes her. She may have weakened a bit, but Dragon Sense can't be written off, and he began to realize that he needed to check out the rest of Bahal's acquaintances. But suddenly he noticed the profile of Hainov's mentor, one of the top five masters of Hainov's Lord of Fire. And our hero kept going through the tests, and he was already on section 21. Behind the third door, he met the first of the nine kings of one of the eight great clans. Behind the fourth was Kindred, the right hand of the Bishop of the Devil's Army. And now he had already met Komusin, the great sword god, the owner of the eight extreme fists and the creator of his own technique, a genius master. Hanren had said that not even Muwan could defeat Komusin in a sword fight, and our hero understood that. But today, he knew only one thing. Only he would win. And just a short while later, the players realized that he was in fifth place. Looking at the 21-floor rankings, our hero was already in 8th place, even though he was recently in 15th place, and one of the players said that he might even be ranked number 1 on the 21st floor, but another player remarked that it was impossible since all Faron was ranked number 1. And everyone knows that his ranking can't be surpassed even by the most outstanding creatures, and immediately the guy asked Heidi what she thought about it to which she replied that she wasn't psychic and didn't understand why such questions would be asked. But then she looked at the door, and our hero's ordeal continued, and he already had a one nadir place in front of him, Nike turn. He realized that he did not know who it was, for he had not seen him during the battle. And our hero realized that this guy's energy was similar to his mentor's, for he said he was his third apprentice. I remember Mu Wan talking about congratulating him for passing the test, and now he is his third apprentice. The first was Kamusin, which means the second was this guy who is higher in ranking than Kamusin. But for now, our hero didn't realize how strong this guy was, because the aura around him felt very different. Anyway, he was very sorry that their first meeting went like this, but there was nothing he could do about it so he started attacking him. And after a while, our hero realized that even for the dragon heir, it was too much, because in front of him was the fifth-ranked Queen of Summer. After all, compared to her image on Jongwado, even though she is smaller and weaker, she is still the Queen of Summer. However, he needs to pass her and defeat her, 
so the Scarlet Dragon Dagger immediately began to emit fire, attacking our hero. But he was able to dodge such an attack and launch his own. Our hero has a 33-section test started. Since the opponent is strong, he was given an extra 30 minutes of time. For some unknown reason, our hero fell into a state of equanimity, and a shadow began to appear in front of him. But what he saw in front of him shocked him. It was his younger brother, and our hero could not even utter a word. But then, lowering his eyes, he heard the voice of the dragon, which said that he should not worry, because it is just a shadow of the real Chonu. And for some unknown reason, the state of equanimity disappeared, and the timer started counting down. Our hero apologized because he hated him and thought he had abandoned them. It was also when he left Korea, for his father had died and they had to learn to survive as children. He despised his life and wanted a fresh start elsewhere. True, he was nicknamed Cain at the time. Perhaps he wished for death rather than a new life, but there was no way he could achieve that. He immediately began to remember the words of his mother, who had told him that he should protect their home until his brother returned. Rebecca, who also appeared, said that he had the same face as the heavenly wing, and the knights had not understood his feelings before. They say that now everything became clear, because immediately the dragon began to tell him to gather his thoughts. But our hero realized that they must have been shocked now too, and he apologized to them. But the dragon noticed that it's definitely not as bad as he is already, and he is sure that everything will work out, and also they are always ready to help our hero. But our hero said that he could reveal a secret in front of them. On what the dragon asked about what kind of secret and, remembering the events, he said that there was one most important factor. He never lost to his brother. After all, he had never lost to his brother, and the time for preparation was over. The test of the 30th section began, and our hero looked at his brother who immediately began to have the strongest energy. Raising his wings, he used dragon pressure on our heroes. And that's why he couldn't resist thought our hero and said that there would be no shame in losing. But the dragon pointed out that they only counted on winning, but in no way on losing. After all, it was difficult for them to understand his feelings, but now it was much easier to do so. And suddenly, a white dragon appeared, and our hero's brother was already standing with his dragon, and they say, no way, M, he can't lose and immediately clashed in a duel, like our hero's dragon and his brother, like our hero and his brother. As they approached, our hero was confused. From the forest sword, he realized that here it was, a dragon duel, the tension of two huge monsters fighting each other. Now he seemed to realize that his dragon was nothing like his dragon at all, and still he was supposed to win, but our hero went into a state of stupor at some point and then fell out of the stupor state. The stupor state lasted, and his resistance to the dragon's pressure increased. Sword Purification The more enemies our hero encounters, the more the sword absorbs parts and their killing intent, strengthening his abilities. In turn, combat power increases depending on the strength of the enemy. Source of the goddess blessing of the goddess protects the body from invisible arrows and spears and crushes the will of the enemy by learning overwhelming energy. Our hero was able to use his power to flip his brother off, and the brother literally flew off, watching as our hero immediately began to attack him. But, unfortunately, the shadow realized that it could not provide anything in return, and our hero continued to attack because of which the shadow only managed to fly away. But then all of a sudden, our hero realized that it was shooting indiscriminately, simultaneously using attacking techniques like his brother. But our hero also realized that he had to destroy the main circle so that all the others would shut down, and thus the shadow would continue to attack. But then a lightning bolt suddenly appeared, and Chonu didn't realize what was happening or where his opponent disappeared to. At the same time, 
our hero was already behind his back, and as soon as the shadow turned around, our hero struck a crushing blow, and his dragon immediately began to accumulate more and more energy. But then suddenly his brother rose out of the smoke, and our hero realized that he recovered quickly, even after such attacks. Therefore, he couldn't be slowed down. His swordsmanship techniques were much stronger than his brother's, and he had to push him away. His eight extreme sword technique was certainly insane, and his equipment from the lower floors was not inferior to our hero. Especially the Dragon Slayer, Dragon Kalatus, had created this sword, and Henov's ribs hadn't gotten his hands on it for three months. Its characteristics were better than our hero's. In addition, he perfectly understood its features and strengths. After all, sometimes his fighting style resembled the technique of the eight extreme swords. But how did he learn to read his attacks? If it continued like this, it was unlikely that he would be able to defeat him. After all, he realized that he was much better in school, and this was the very result. After all, you can't give him a head start again. But our hero was able to reach his brother with his attack, and he suddenly began to wrap his wings around him, flying away. Our hero thought that the one decided to hide, but why would he do that? So suddenly he used the bow technique. But then suddenly the shadow began to do something, and our hero, noticing it, thought that, really, his opponent used the wave of light technique. Our hero immediately managed to put up a defense, because Wave of Light is a combination of magical power that destroys everything in its path. He practiced this skill on the 20th floor, but he used too much magic, absorbing it from the surrounding energy, and his real brother wouldn't do that, right? But then he started to realize because it was possible that he was copying him. When they were kids, they had been associates, and they would do what they wanted to do first and think later. That's why his brother cleaned up after him and constantly scolded him. Thanks to his nagging, he had developed the habit of thinking seven times before any action, and in Africa in the tower too they were, indeed, alike. And while he was thinking, the attack stopped. His shadow just stayed where it was, trying to strike again. Our hero didn't realize. How much longer would she keep trying to destroy him? But he still only wanted to go forward. After a while, our hero realized that he would probably have to fight like this. After all, you can't dodge his attack, even if he tries. Then it is necessary to respond with an equal measure, assistant counterattack. After all, he is so strong that he can use his powers even outside the tower. It turns out to be either a dark energy aura strike or awakened dragon blood. He didn't choose to test it now. After all, he needs to create a soul and break the shackles. Only then would he be able to surpass the wave of light. But he also realized that, using the soul, the most important thing for him was not to die himself. And our hero had no other way, and he still made this decision. After all, it was now or never and having struck a blow, there was the strongest flash, and then an explosion. Our hero did not expect that even the dragon's scales would burn because it is quite a high temperature, but he failed to realize, where is the shadow? And then Chonu literally flew out of the fire, trying to attack our heroes. Her sword was pointed at him, and she was advancing. Our hero was just now starting to realize that his opponent wanted them dead, and he wouldn't be able to avoid the blast. It was necessary to try and minimize the damage. The only way to do this was to utilize the area. He summoned Phoenix, who immediately said that he was expected. In this way, he was able to control the temperature of a certain area. Using his power, his level of control proved to be insufficient, and with each attempt at control, the damage grew more and more. Eventually, he would fall into a state of stupor. He then used dragon scales to cool his blood. This helped him overcome his stupor state. He gained resistance to fire and high temperatures due to his strong will.
He gained power over the attributes of light and fire in his territory, and the dragon scales strengthened his control over these attributes. He gained more knowledge of the attributes of fire and light and Lyrnet about dragon territory. He also gained dragon knowledge by discovering information about a new power, dragon pressure. And he realized that this could be called a victory since the damage in the territory was indeed reduced. But on the other hand, holding a sword with two hands was very difficult, especially under such circumstances. He thought he deployed his wings to survive the explosion, because the dragon scales and wings probably activated the third stage of dragon power, the contract with the elements. Many people were willing to die just to reach that level, and he still thought he might appear to be a show-off. But then suddenly he heard the voice of his knights, who told him that he would die, and they too could fight. After all, doesn't the black bracelet give any of his abilities? But our hero flatly rejected this suggestion, for he had already spoken of using his power. And further, he moved on to the second stage of awakening the dragon pressure skill, not wanting to do something he would regret later. Dragon Pressure The ancient dragon Calatus divided his powers into eight stages so that the air could quickly adapt to dragon power. This is the second step, the dragon's will is so powerful that it threatens even gods and demons. Under her control, he can establish complete control within the dragon's haven. Slaying dragons uses a colossal pressure reminiscent of arrogance, causing fear in enemies and increasing the sense of submission in alleys. The higher the level of dragon power, the deeper the understanding of power, the higher the effectiveness of the territory's application. Moreover, one could create a basic understanding of the world in Bin's enhanced dragon territory. Our hero could establish their power in a given territory, and their attributes would increase for a while. Using their power, they clashed in a duel. In an instant, Chekhov took damage and began to fall sharply. Chonu literally fell down, or rather, although the shadow remained, our hero stood in front of her. At some point, he walked over and also dropped to one of his knees, getting close enough to her. The trials of Hall 30 are complete, and our hero has gained new knowledge and improved attributes. This achievement is not given to everyone, and he gained unique skills, including Firewave. Looking at his brother in the form of a shadow, he began to realize that he was disappearing, but reaching out, he wanted to stay by his side for a little longer, but still began to disappear, and our hero stared intently at that shadow. Chonu smiled sharply, and our hero, seeing this smile, was literally transported back, where he told him that it was fun with his older brother and immediately began to disappear. After all, an illusion is created from the memory of a real person, and perhaps she had memories of him, but at the same time it seemed to him as if he and his brother had talked for the first time in a long time. Our hero was given extra time to clear sections, three hours, and looking at the time he didn't realize just how long their battle with Chonu had been going on. After all, if it was so difficult with him, what would the next battle be like, considering that there are equally strong players on the 21st floor? But anyway, it's worth a try. New skills had to be tried out and existing skills developed, especially the fire wave he created in the fight with his brother. The fire form was compressed to the limit by the complex blending of various energies centered on the fire rain skill. The consequence is that the explosive power and range of the resulting explosion upon release is proportional to the magnitude of your strength and skill. You get off a wave of light, but it is much more powerful, has more potential, and is more difficult to control. Fire lightning causes an intense blast equal to the mana expended, and occasionally pierces a defensive barrier, destroying everything around it. Upper opponents are terrorized by the boiling spark, ripping discharges across the land. The lightning spreads in this manner, moving the firepower to a separate location while simultaneously causing a chain explosion, 
destroying the area and leaving current corners to be extinguished. Our hero, up on reflection, realized that the recognition system considers this skillet to be special and the ways to develop the fire wave are unique, which meant that he needed to develop it as fast as possible. The more often he used it, the more it would be revealed to him. The fight against the third Huel is about to begin, and our hero should start preparing. Huel is the main bishop of the devil's army. He is close to the devil and even has a title. Nothing else our hero knew, but he would like to test something on him. And the duel began. But our hero realized that the fire wave was not fully amenable to him, and thus he was able to complete the test of Section 31. Everything around him turned into large ruins, but then he suddenly noticed something. It was the golden iron fragment that the devil army had hidden in Bishop's shadow. There were five golden rod fragments, and from an unknown source, he had obtained four new golden rod fragments. He should try to find all of them to complete it. By doing so, he realized that the fragments themselves were attracted to each other and it wouldn't be long before he would collect the remaining ones. Realize it's the devil's trap. The army has been taking fragments from the losing players and hiding them with the squad commanders all along, except no one took into account that the captain would turn out to be so weak. But then the test of Section 32 begins. And before our hero appeared Muan, who realized that it was his mentor in his youth. But he wondered what he was like when he was his age, and it felt as if he was a monster rather than a human being. He had heard that he liked to mischief, and apparently it was true, because his aura was different from those shadows, the influence of his mentor. After all, our hero realized that the dream of any student is to defeat his teacher, and then after the victory, to become even better than his mentor. But then suddenly, as soon as our hero began to attack, the latter immediately said that he was giving up. Rebecca stood up, remembering the words that said to watch out for this child in the future. After all, that was the instruction God Kernun had given her from the twentieth floor. She had asked what it meant, but had heard no answer. Now she knew it was clear, and she needed to keep an eye on Cain. This time she was worried, for King Muan was the strongest in the homogeneous tribe. But on the other hand, Cain wasn't weak either. And then abruptly she heard Muan saying that he was giving up. But she didn't understand what was going on, and neither did his other knights. But then one of the knights said that illusion expresses will. Then one of the onlookers said that this was definitely not his real mentor. In fact, our hero realized that it was not impossible, for his brother also recognized him. Muan immediately told our hero that he knew he was going to lose, but they should talk better. And the knight was shocked because, wow, he's also smart. But another of the knights asked our hero to be careful because the shadow might be planning an attack. And our hero realized that he was right, but still need to make sure of something, whether he is an ordinary copy of real people or still has self-awareness. After all, if the shadows can think, he could find his brother and talk to him on the 21st floor. Then Mu Wan asked that he should tell him what is going on outside because he doesn't know, he can't leave this place, and only memories are left. So he better tell him himself, and then he will send him on another trial, for it is quite a bargain for them. To which our hero said he agreed, and he should start asking questions one by one. Muwan immediately agreed, saying, Okay. But then our hero got thoughtful and started talking. As he spoke, spirits immediately began to appear and Muwan initially didn't realize what was happening, but our hero asked why he should believe him. The man immediately, letting out his fangs, said that he had got him anyway and he had no choice, and using his power, he immediately spat it out in rather large volumes. The knights immediately flew away under the effect of such energy in an instant. Our hero realized that he might be able to get his brother back, so he ordered all the shadows to attack. 
Immediately the army came out, and also Rebecca was preparing to attack, as well as the army from our hero. But the one didn't want to give up and immediately started using his fighting skills, attacking all the spirits that were coming in his direction. Its strength was huge enough to easily strike spirits. Our hero, watching it, realized that it was a devilish true monster, and it was definitely a martial art. It was when King Muwan was creating the Eight Extreme Fist technique, but he didn't understand what had happened, because it could have been an illusion, gain self-awareness, and refine his skills. Muwan immediately asked our hero about whether he knew the technique of the Eight Extreme Fists, realizing that he was connected to his real body, and this outcome makes him more and more curious as more and more questions arise. Yao. But our hero immediately began to use the possession of the territory. Thus, he advanced to the second stage of awakening by using the dragon pressure skill. All stats increased for a certain amount of time, defense increased for a certain amount of time, and attributes increased for a certain amount of time. Then our hero realized that he was apologizing to his mentor, but he would have to reach the end to win. And after a moment, he found himself behind him, but Muwan abruptly turned around. Our hero began to remember saying that he was confident in himself, answering Muwan, who immediately told him to try to beat him and take the first place. Muwan turned around sharply, looking at our hero. He was immediately able to repel the attack, and our hero didn't realize what that shadow was, no weaker than he thought. Is the difference between reality and illusion so great? After all, the day tries to become stronger, but the system rejects it. Now it was clear why he used eight extreme fists and couldn't develop other skills by focusing only on them. Muan flew up and tried to strike our hero using eight iron fists. By doing so, he was able to disorient and knock back our hero, and then began to concentrate his energy into a ball. But already at this time, our hero flew out of the smoke and began to use a wave of fire delivering a crushing blow. Immediately our knights heard how they could no longer help and asked if he could allow them to help, to which our hero replied, No, you should wait, for he is attacking. Muan was already quite angry with our heroes and our hero realized that the fire wave had seriously damaged him. He's afraid that if he uses it again, he'll lose, because with the help of Shenon or Hanrin, he wasn't satisfied with that. And that meant that he had to think of how to achieve a complete victory. Their strengths were about on the same level, but he'd been practicing eight extreme fists for years. Oh, and he's much more experienced in training and he understood the difference between our hero, Kamusine, and Nocturne. After all, Muan's students from the 21st and 24th editions had already found their path and perfected many skills throughout their lives, while he himself had never found his personal path. He wanted to achieve a lot, to become faster and stronger, and he would try and be able to find himself in martial arts, but at the same time, he wondered why he would do that. After all, he would follow someone else's path if he could blaze his own. Besides, there is something to learn, because their strengths and weaknesses are well known to him. Our hero has discovered a new option, synchronization, and his emergency perception skill has increased by 28.1%. Thus, our hero began to use the way of commusin the way of direct force, which is harder and scarier. Muan immediately didn't realize what was happening to him, because he had changed quite drastically, and our hero continued to use Nocturne's path, the path of Ares and intricate illusion. It was a sharp power hidden in luxury. Muan was shocked by this way, for he didn't understand what this nonsense was. After all, he was here alone, but it was as if he was fighting an entire army. Then using Quavol's secret technique, our hero was able to cut off one part, and Muan realized that he was stronger than anyone he had ever encountered. Then our hero used Muan's technique, 
and his opponent only said that he was mocking him because it was his strength. But our hero made the decision to repeat Muan's path, the path of a tyrant, a flamboyant force that presses from all sides. Muan only had time to shout that no, for if he loses. He immediately shouted out the first place name, Al Faron. And then our hero decided to use the last way, Wings of Heaven, Chonu's way. It was freedom, and thus he was able to literally chop up his opponent. And then suddenly, our hero realized his path, the path he would follow. It would be easy and fast for you, divine speed. The test of Section 32 was complete. He had made tremendous progress and thus obtained a rare achievement. Our hero realized that he was a shadow, not the real Muwin. He is strong, arrogant, and loves freedom like no one else in the world. It is only a shell that had to be defeated. But the knights immediately asked our hero if he had tried to test the illusion to find his brother's shadow. Our hero, after a little thought, said that he had not, because now he realized that they were not real people and he did not want to desecrate his memory. Yes, and besides, he will never meet again, because all this time he was chasing an unattainable dream. But now he realized that it's time to move on. He needs to close the twenty worst floor faster, and the last interesting thing has come. What will be the opponent, the one that even Mu Wan couldn't defeat, the strongest among all, All For Own? Thus, our hero's battle with All For Own is about to begin, and our hero should have prepared for the battle with All For Own's shadow, but a given one could not be created. No trials of the 33rd section found, completed automatically. All trials passed. Our hero did not understand how this was possible and what was happening. In the meantime, someone walks into the shop. It is said that he asked for forgiveness, but Heneva said that they were already closed, he should leave. But the man only looked at the items that were in that shop and did not even respond. Heneva immediately turned around. They say that he said that they were closed, and what was unclear from these words. But the man only asked, is he Heneva, holding a sword in his hand? To which the man said, yes. And then looking at the results, 21 floors were set with new records in the Hall of Fame. In first place was our hero and all for own. After all, he came to Heneva to make a deal. But this suspicious type. After all, he has great instincts. Not like Adora, but still he sensed danger from him. Who is he? The man only thought, he wouldn't want to get into trouble with the one-horned man. After all, there was something he needed to check out anyway. He never gets to do just one thing. And after a while, one of them was already lying down, and the man was telling him that if he answered his questions, he would let him live, to which the man just laughed and said that was nonsense. After all, he really thought he would agree to which the man said that it's worth a try. There's only one way out, and it's a shame to have to do that by summoning his snakes. He immediately ordered them to eat, and his perception is now clear. Why is the homogeneous tribe higher up in the war, and this man in the center is Cain? But on the other hand, it didn't matter who he was fighting, the nations or the Chonghuado. Let the homogeneous ones also take part in the war. To him, the goal is what matters, and he thought he was simple enough. But it seems there's a lot to look into. After all, he hopes things will only get more interesting as time goes on. Meanwhile, our hero was already on the 22nd floor, where the test began. This big city has a portal to the wide sea, and he should destroy the Kraken. Our hero, while he was in the attacking position, thought of only one thing, all for own. He realized that his illusion had been removed and he was most likely able to change the system to suit him, but he didn't understand how it was done, considering that even gods and demons are tied to the 98th floor. It was rather interesting what all of this meant for our hero. However, over time he managed to overpower the Kraken, 
When he was offered to write his name in the Hall of Fame, he immediately declined in favor of Rebecca, realizing that he had become nothing more than fried meat. Poseidon, the god of the sea, took an interest in our hero and thought about making him his apostle. Our hero wondered about Poseidon, for he did not expect to meet him again after Olympus. But anyway, he wasn't going to take another offer, and he couldn't stay here that long, as the night guard had said. Brahram had been spotted on the 23rd floor, but he hadn't been anywhere for days, so it was better to go at once to the 23rd floor. And as soon as our hero crossed the trial began on the 23rd floor, it was known that the ancestors of the demons were born in an unknown and abandoned world, unlike the current demons who have developed a civilization capable of resisting the gods. Their world is a place where the sky is always red due to lack of proper light, and the rivers and seas are dry and ugly due to lack of rain for hundreds of years. After all, no one was supposed to survive on this land, but life appeared and began to evolve. A devilish monster of unknown origin gives birth to its cubs from the energy of this world. Survive the attacks of the devil monsters and their cubs. The more the specialty could hit our hero, the greater his advantage would be. And our hero realized that this was what demons looked like in the initial stage, stupid creatures. On the 98th floor, the demons were much stronger and apparently through hunting and defeating others, they had developed their intelligence and created a hierarchy. And that meant that this was what they looked like before, and he needed to get the philosophical, demon flower and the ceratops of Lake Daroa here. But first, he must try to find Braham first. And as soon as our hero teleported to the 23rd floor, the knights immediately realized that the 23rd floor was like an amusement park because it was always so interesting. But another said that he thought it was all because of their changes, because over time they were able to absorb all the evil spirits in their path. But our hero didn't find the very place that the night guardian had talked about. Looking around, he saw people. Were they Elohim? After all, only the strongest descendants of the eight clans or the highest rankers could join the Elohim. Um, but why are they here? Don't they hate Braham? But then our hero noticed someone, for it is... Nah. The elder of Elikim is the Aether of Light. She used to be a member of Arda, after all. But our hero didn't understand why she was here. Was his group the protogenic supreme member of Elikim, unknown by its secrecy and lack of contact with others? But then our hero abruptly felt something. Turning around, he realized that in front of him was Galliard. Our hero was very much surprised as soon as he saw Galliard. And thinking back, he realized that he was already Brahm's friend. And apparently, he wants to stop Elohim from finding Brahm. Immediately, the elf aimed his arrow towards his opponent, and as soon as he released one of them, the elder immediately felt something coming towards them. He immediately realized it was an attack and warned his own to be at the ready, turning around. They realized that the attacker was standing on top of them, preparing already to launch his follow-up attack. The elder immediately shouted for them to catch him, for how dare he, a dark elf, attack them, and the minions immediately rushed to attack Gaillard. It is said that he is at the end and will not escape punishment. But then suddenly the dark elf began to disappear and literally in an instant found himself behind the backs of his opponents to draw the bowstring for a shot. The elder was sufficiently angered by this behavior, they say, that he is a scoundrel. Then, using his light arrow abilities, he also tried to attack Gaillar. As the arrows flew, he tried to use the blast. The arrows flying up immediately exploded and dealt maximum damage. But Galliard was still able to dodge such an attack by flying into the air, but immediately he saw one of the elders already quite close to him. Using his skills, he began to inflict holy punishment. Our hero, watching all this, wondered if Bram's shield could hold up. And after just a moment, looking at the shield and seeing it resolve, 
our hero realized that it looked like he wouldn't be able to hold out after all. And deciding to intervene in this fight to protect Gaillard, our hero delivered his crushing blow and was able to hit quite a few players who didn't expect such a thing, and neither did Gaillard. But he was still able to remember our hero, who, as he approached, said that he would explain everything later, but now they should retreat. After the attack, there was only one elder left amongst all of them, as the others had taken considerable damage. The elder was very angry, for he had interfered with him by watching our hero save Gaillard. Landing in separate areas, our hero thought they wouldn't be found here, greeted the elf and said they hadn't seen each other in a while. Gaillard was surprised enough, but he also said he's changed a lot. But he still did not understand how he had managed to find him, to which our hero said that it was by chance, for he was looking for Braham to ask a favor of him, but he saw Elohim and his attack on them. The elf began to realize what had happened and asked why he had just decided to help him, but at the same time if he wasn't afraid of becoming their enemy. To which our hero said that everyone knows Braham was kicked out of Elohim, and he's his friend, so he thought it was worth helping him out. Gaillard realized that he didn't think all his words were false, but it was hard enough to believe him. But then suddenly, Brahm contacted the elf, and our hero realized he was contacting him and said something. But at Gaillard's words, he was surprised by something. Turning around, the elf said Bram asked why he smelled like a dragon. And as soon as our hero heard this, he was even a little excited. The awakening of the dragon blessing hadn't fully activated yet, and how could he even understand it? How could Bram understand what the Queen of Summer couldn't? But after a little thought, our hero said he didn't know what it was all about, and the elf said he would ask then himself, for Bram had told him to bring him. So they should move out on the road, and after a moment, as soon as our hero and the elf stepped in a puddle, our hero thought about space, for it seems to be more than just a division into outer and inner. Higher level magic allows you to color the interior space with the caster's colors, and it was an illusion barrier. He could imagine how much time and effort it takes to create this place. Gaillard only told our hero not to tell anyone about what he would see, for he might have to stay here for a while if he didn't want to leave right now. And our hero began to realize that this meant it had something to do with Elohim, to which the elf replied that he understood correctly. Still, our hero wondered what was there to protect here from Elohim, and after a short period of time, our hero together with the elf were approaching the man, but then there was a girl with wings on her back who immediately hid behind Brahm, and our hero began to realize that this is a man who is proud of his exclusion from Elohim and values freedom above all else, the embodiment of the great god Brahm on earth. Bram turned around and looked at our hero and was displeased, but immediately muttered that he now seemed to realize who smelled so much like a dragon, to which our hero introduced as Cain. But lowering his eyes down, he saw this child. And despite the appearance, and the wings and tail, and of course the scales on the girl's arm, he began to realize it was a draconid. Draconids are heterogeneous beings that transcend the genus and are born from the union of a dragon and a human. After the ancient dragon Calatus died in the tower, there are only three dragon-related players left. The last dragon, Draconid Ananta, Queen of Summer, and of course, the ancient dragon Herchonu. Ananta has suddenly disappeared and he knows the reason, for the last person she met was her brother. But after a little thought, our hero realized that it was Ananta's child, Braham, who was the new Draconid. Tut asked if he knew her, for he had only heard her. The Queen of Summer refused to leave her follower, and Heaven's wings died. This means that only Ananta remains. To which our hero asked if this was the reason why Elohima was following him. After all, he may offer to make a deal. 
Her aura is much stronger than Ananta's. Perhaps she's only a quarter dragon, and he could try to uncover her dragon rights or dragon nature. Brahram replied, All right, but first he needs to see if he's worthy of making a deal with him. At these words, the elf turned around to look at our heroes, wondering who he was, for by all appearances he and Bram had just met for the first time today. Which means he lied to him when he said he'd met him before. To which our hero said that he only lied because he needed Shunpo's skills and Undine's cup, and he apologizes. For then, when he learned of him, to which our hero said that it was better not to call the familiar by name in the tower, for it is likely that Cain's answer is an incomplete truth, but also an impure lie. But who could have told him about Braham? To which our hero immediately used his dragon gaze, causing his arm to become covered in the same scales. From which even the girl was shocked, and our hero said that he didn't think he needed to give an answer to that question, because that would be enough. Brahm, turning around, said that was certainly enough, and he should follow him. And our hero has already entered the room, looking around at everything around him. But he also asked, for he was curious. He had heard that he was not interested in other people's affairs, but then why did he choose to look after Ananta's child? In fact, he realized that he was so serious about this rule that he didn't even dare to help his brother when he was dying. The only thing Brahm could say was that they made a deal, so he's asking him to fulfill his part as well, because he needs to share his knowledge of dragons with her, and he'll be a bodyguard in certain situations. To which our hero only said he understood, but he also wondered what her name was. Braham immediately said her name was Sasha. But now our hero was ready to say his condition, to which the man only said to speak, for he was listening attentively. And our hero said he wanted to study the Book of Mercury, which was written by a man. The Book of Mercury is not just a compiled memoir of when Braham was God, and one could say it is a book reflecting his entire life. Braham seemed a bit belligerent to our hero, but he agreed to sign the contract only after the deal was made on the condition that our hero would study only those subjects related to alchemy. And from then on, our hero began to listen to his lectures on alchemy for two hours every evening. Fortunately, knowledge of Heneva's alchemy was coming, so Braham learned some things from our hero as well. And that's how he studied alchemy in the evenings and babysat the girl during the day. But even the knight said he was a babysitter for her, and they imagined how difficult it was, for he had to see. She already disliked him. He asks what he will do next. After all, they were sure she would throw a tantrum if he tried to get any closer. But our hero asked the knights what they thought about him being a bad babysitter. And after a while, our hero told the girl to come over, because he made delicious pancakes. And Sasha, seeing all this, did not understand what it was, and our hero replied that they were pancakes. The knights were surprised that our hero knew how to cook. After all, the world could collapse at any moment, and they didn't expect this from him. The girl immediately sat down and had already prepared to eat, and just biting into that pancake made her very happy, to which our hero asked if she liked it. The girl said, yes, and I want more. No, nope. but our hero said he would certainly make more, but if she gobbled slower, but immediately thought about not doing that, because then she definitely gets spotted and she can't lose to players weaker than Elakim's Dragon Regeneration Project. More specifically, on the restoration of ancient creatures. They plan to restore ancient dragons and giants so that Elohim can use them. But to do that, they need to find that child, the last dragon heiress in the tower. After all, they had already lost one, so they weren't about to fail a second time. If the Chonu heavenly wings got to them, there would be no problem. But then suddenly, the elder heard a voice asking her what she would do now and the elder recognized the voice, 
turning around to look at it. It was a chimera. Such an exit from the portal was welcomed, but the elder didn't understand why she was here. The girl immediately said that it was unclear that she had come to help, no one knows, to which the elder only replied that she should not mix it up. The girl asked if it was a joke, for they hoped he could accomplish his goal with so many soldiers, and now he had to decide how much he could afford. The elder thought of help for him. It was ridiculous. She was just trying to embellish all of his accomplishments, and he wasn't going to pass up the opportunity. To which he said okay, and she could join in and split the reward in half. But this girl was really pissed off. After all, is he seriously expecting to beat Braham in this condition? To which the elder said that if she didn't want to, she should get out, because anyway, only he knows where Braham is. And they're left to go around in circles and droves. The girl realized that he was being blunt and likely to prove himself in battle, and immediately said that she agreed to ask where he was. And after a while the plate was empty, and the girl was sleeping next to our hero, holding his finger. Brahm, coming in, asked if she had fallen asleep, but our hero said she did, for he had made pancakes, and she ate a few portions and went to bed. Brahm immediately said that he would look after her next, for there was a task for him. He should gather purple demonic flowers, giving a basket to our hero. It was a hidden part of the purple demonic colors. Now in ancient times, dragons and demons were enemies. Dragons have always tried to figure out the nature of the world and maintain balance, while demons have always tried to destroy balance and create chaos. That's why the enmity between them was ineradicable, but at the same time, the more they hated each other, the more useful they could become. The dragons began to absorb demons and increase their mana. Demons also absorb dragons to develop their magic, and if one couldn't absorb demons, one could at least receive their blessing in the form of a purple, demonic flower, to which our hero said that he needed a purple demonic flower too. Braham immediately asked our hero if he needed the demon's blessing, and also told him that he shouldn't be surprised, because he needed it for the same thing too. To which our hero asked how he knew that, and the man immediately said that he should have noticed by now that Sasha was only a quarter dragon, so she doesn't have enough magic, that's why he needs that flower. He shouldn't have to worry, he won't get in the way and a flower with a concentration of four or higher will suffice. After all, he didn't need more than three. Too much concentration could be disastrous, and there were many more saturated colors. And our hero wondered, for he didn't understand what it was all about, infused with demonic power. Aren't they so rare that they are hard to find, even after walking 1,000 kilometers through the forest? to which the man asked if he didn't believe him. If so, he should go with Galar, and he will help him. Already after a while, our hero along with the elf came to the forest, and our hero asked what it meant, to which the elf said, Can't he see, for it is a garden of trees? And our hero asked, Could demonic flowers be cultivated in this way? Gaillard said yes, for Brahm had said that demons were born from plants, so if you grow them well, like real trees, with water, sunshine, and fertilizer, they'll do just fine. But the demons didn't like Braham's assertion, and one unnamed demon was very angry. But our hero didn't understand how that was possible. After all, it's so easy to grow purple demon flowers. Did that really mean he could cultivate demons too? Because then, looking immediately at the trees, our hero noticed magic circles, and he did realize he was right. After all, he is trying to cultivate demonic flowers and trees, as they affect the non-hostile demons from the trees, and make them devour each other, bringing the demons that grew so fast. They end up summoning stronger demons, and when those are, they use magic to catch. Our hero realized 
for it seems to be an amalgamation of alchemy and black magic, as well as a noticeable influence of holy iron. After all, did Braham really do these magic circles every day? Just then, our hero turned to Gaillard, asking if he wanted to start a war against all Braham players. The elf immediately asked why he thought that. But what did our hero ask in response? Why would he breed demons then? And the elf began to realize that he was about this demon cultivation. After all, that's not the end goal. He saw Sasha, didn't he? And maybe he hadn't realized it yet, but her life could be very short. Maybe it's because she's a half-breed. However, she was basically born very weak, and no matter how much medication she was given, she only got better for a while. And one day, the meds won't work at all. Our hero understood that he immediately sensed that her energy was very weak. Besides, a fourth of dragon blood doesn't really help a human weakness from birth. After all, not long ago, she couldn't even run. She was only getting better from the boost of demonic colors. But even to those, she's developing a resistance, to which our hero asked if they wanted to raise demons and feed them to Sasha, to which the elf replied that was correct, and it was amazing that such an unemotional Braham was willing to go that far. But immediately he wondered why Braham cared for her so much. After all, he hears that he is enough. Gylard immediately said he didn't know, for he hadn't said anything to him. But he was sure of only one thing. He was even willing to catch God if it would help Sasha. Our hero still managed to collect enough flowers, asking, Where is Sasha? Bram replied that she said she wanted to take a walk outside, but our hero noticed the drawings and wondered. After all, he thought he was only interested in science but he plays the role of loving daddy perfectly. And while our hero was thinking, Brahm, noticing our hero staring at him, asked what he was staring at, to which our hero said no such thing, asking translating the subject to what he was reading. The man said Mercury's book, checking to see if mistakes had been made, and then immediately asked if he understood their lesson from yesterday, and our hero said that if he was talking about equivalent exchange, he was still learning it. And after half a month since our hero began studying alchemy without rest, Braham is more open-minded in his studies than he realized. Oh, and Boo and Rebecca's advice helps our hero. Now he could decipher the emerald tablet. The first is the fact that everything stated here was true. The second is that to perform a true miracle, you have to realize that down and up are the same. Third, and since everything came from one meditation, everything is connected as one. Near our hero were Rebecca and Boo, speculating about what the girl was wondering, like a philosopher's stone. And here was Boo thinking about how that part didn't seem quite right, and our hero was realizing that over time he'd gone so crazy he should start over. And while our hero was exploring, suddenly the door opened and Sasha came in and asked if he was asleep, to which our hero said no, and, rising from the table, asked if she was hungry. And Sasha only smiled, laughed a little, and our hero immediately went to make pancakes, and the spirits did not understand, for it was a wonder to them, for he had worked so hard for the girl. But our hero turned around and asked how they even thought of him all this time, to which the knights immediately said they thought he was mean and insensitive. Our hero immediately turned around and called out to Sasha, asking that she not speak only to Brahm. Just then the girl turned around and our hero noticed that she was drawing on his sheets. Our hero told her not to worry, because he's not mad, and it didn't work out with those powers either anyway. He put the plate on the table and told the girl to eat until it got cold. But then our hero, coming to the table, noticed something incomprehensible and asked the girl, to which Sasha said that they were her drawings, for she had just finished them as Braham had taught her. And looking at it, our hero realized that at first he thought it was a simple scribble, but her drawing has a pattern, 
Looking closer, he realized exactly, and at the same time he didn't understand how he hadn't thought of it himself. After all, all along he had envisioned the Philosopher's Stone as a source of infinite energy. But if you think of it as a conductor that only magnifies it, the tablet says, the movements of the sun, and apparently the words about the movement of the sun can be interpreted as a scheme for the movement of magic. That's why Leonthe and Bild couldn't finish the Philosopher's Stone. It meant that the stone only lacked a power source. But the power source for the Philosopher's Stone can only come from a magical source, and perhaps he can harness the demon Bram and fill it with energy. It will definitely be enough. If you do that, it will have two sources of magic, and it can have infinite sources of magic. Realizing this, he was even a little shocked. Meanwhile, Pant was telling Edora to walk together, and then said that he seemed tired. After all, even the twelfth floor wasn't that awful, and she's not even listening and waiting to meet her lover. To which the girl said that he should find someone he liked then, though at the same time she realized that no one would agree. Pant hearing this only told her not to mix it up, for it was popular enough. But then the girl stopped abruptly, saying that it was all strange, since Kane had mentioned these very coordinates, but... And so, while our hero was playing with the girl, he was responded to. Turning around, he saw Pantha and Idora. Our hero was surprised that they came here, the girl immediately asked why he was so tired. Perhaps something had happened. To which our hero replied that everything happened, but they should not worry, because everything is fine. And then they saw the girl and asked who it was. Our hero introduced her as Sasha. Braham looked at it and told the elf that he had brought strangers, to which he said that they looked more or less trustworthy, and Sasha looked nice. Otherwise, she wouldn't be so joyful. And besides, looking at it, he realized how lonely Sasha really was. And doesn't he think she's been living outside the regular world for too long? Brahm even here thought about the elf's words, for he really had never seen her laugh as loudly as she did now, and perhaps this desire to protect her would make her unhappy. After a short period of time approaching the lawn where the girl Sasha was walking, our hero called out to Cain to come over to him. Our hero turned around and walked towards the man, and Adora only watched him walk away, thinking about why he's always like this, because at least he would have said he missed you or was happy to see you, but none of that happened. Sasha, looking at the girl, immediately asked if she liked Cain, Edora immediately asked why I decided there all of a sudden, and Sasha laughed and said that she kept her eyes on him, and the girl understood. After all, even a little girl like that understood, and he hadn't yet. Meanwhile, our hero was already talking to Braham, who in turn was telling him that he knew that the barrier and magic circles had already been completed, to which our hero said he did, and the man continued. For fortunately, Elohim and Ether have not been spotted nearby yet, and when the barrier is complete, even if they find them, they will no longer be able to interfere. <laughs> and our hero realized that if he successfully completed the illusory world, all his territories would be subject to Bram alone, and you could say it was his sacred home, albeit small and limited, but he will be able to use his powers as a god here. Bram immediately said he could go about his business and return when he was finished. He would have to focus on demon cultivation once the circles were completed. Galliard immediately interrupted him, telling him to just say he was on vacation. I mean, why go out of your way like that? Our hero realized that apparently he was asking to take a break from his studies. And after a while, our hero talked to Pant, who asked if he wanted to go on a raid with them, to which our hero said that if they didn't want to, he wouldn't go. And the guy immediately said of course they wanted to, because he thought they'd all go crazy with boredom here. Pant was just thinking about the fact that he seemed to have taken the top spot in the 21st floor rankings, and his father was upset, 
though he tried to hide it, but if he can win, he'll make him practice every day. Also, our hero was interested in what was going on with Adora. Pant responded to this by saying that he should know that girls always have some kind of problem in their heads, and he should just know that he is very popular. Turning around, Pant looked at our hero and asked why he was going in such a way, to which she got the answer that she didn't want to cause unnecessary trouble, but the guy immediately said that he was just afraid of damaging his face. The girl immediately told her brother that they should change their clothes too, for everyone knows that Cain walks with the same tribe. And having changed their clothes, they did embark on their journey. And as they walked along, Pont only complained that his beard itched him very badly. But the girl told him to shut up and move on. But as soon as our hero turned around to look at the guy, the guy asked what it was, to which the latter in turn said that it was a superimposed mask for it was a secret technique of their tribe, which was necessary to conceal identity. Sometimes, of course, they share this technique with other people. Didn't his father tell him about it? But it was some time later that they came to Lake DeRoy, and looking down they didn't understand why there were so many people here. After all, there were quite a few players. The guy didn't realize if there was something that important here. But our hero said they're trying to recover a demonic dinosaur, an ancient creature that can transform and upgrade its class. You could say he's like a chrysalis that has the potential to become a butterfly. Pant immediately upon hearing about the dinosaur inquired, Isn't there some hidden nuance being missed by accident? To which our hero said, Isn't that too obvious? After all, he can just destroy them all or he wants to defeat them like a true gentleman. And our hero added that, of course he was going to attack, but since they were here for the dinosaur, we should wait a bit. Therefore, he should not provoke anyone, or else if they were spotted, he would be the first to die. Pant immediately laughed and said she didn't understand why he was starting. After all, all he is saying is that they could be a problem in the future. He's the patience of the flesh. But then suddenly the room struck, and balls were immediately aimed at him. To which the guy only told them to attack, and our hero along with the girl only covered their face and laughed. After all, it is easy enough to understand the cause of the conflict that started it. Suddenly, a group of players appeared, pushing everyone away and trying to be the first to make their way to the dinosaur. Many wanted to object. But since there are ranchers in this strange group, many were afraid to do so, except for one person, of course. It was Pant. He immediately started provoking everyone, and the girl said she would stop him. But our hero asked us not to do that and just wait. I mean, it's even better this way. Blood Snake, I don't think they'll be rankers either. The Ice Poison Snake Lao, one of the eight clans, considers itself a true kingdom and the sole heir to an ancient state. Their goal is simple enough, to reclaim the promised lands. They have no territory or sovereignty, but they always zealously claim they will get their land back. For in a sense they can be called wandering people living in the vanished illusions of the past. However, they always lived with a sense of duty and did not neglect training. Plus, as a clan, they are great at fighting together, so not everyone wants to get in their way. But our heroes were wondering why they were here, on the 23rd floor, with Elohim. Just the two of us, in the same place at the same time? I mean, it's hardly a coincidence. They could send their spies to search for the dinosaur, but since they sent a whole group and a rancher, there was a problem in that he didn't know much about this Lao. Players were standing near Pant and started telling him that he was so hopeful of staying alive after something like this, because there's a bloody snake behind them. Pant immediately teasingly said that he was afraid, for behind him, by the way, was one dear tribe, and did they want to start a war? And since he didn't get any response, he immediately clenched his fists and said that if they wanted, they could attack right now. 
but then a voice was heard sharply behind the players, ordering them to stand back. Pant was already even excited, for the captain had finally shown up, for he thought it would be great to fight the rancor, but then all of a sudden he just walked past, and Pant didn't realize what was going on and where was he going. But suddenly the captain approached our hero, saying that he thought it was time to stop. Imagine that he is Mr. Lao, the emperor's right-hand man. For Brahm, as well as our hero, had been invited to meet the emperor. Well, our hero can be ever so slightly lost. He addressed it directly to him. Could he really find out, since he even knows that he and Brahm are working together? to which the man said that not everyone here knew who was who, and so he shouldn't worry, to which our hero only asked how many people knew he was related to Braham, and the man replied that he wasn't sure, since everyone was hiding like rats in burrows, and he was too busy to check it out. He could have said it was a secret unknown to anyone, and our hero realized that besides the red dragon, everyone would be interested in the little girl but he didn't think the other clans would be so determined to intervene. After all, he should be more secretive with his plans. But in any case, working with Bram, our hero cannot avoid the attention of other people's eyes, and there is nothing to do. So our hero immediately began to change his appearance to the real one in order to present himself in the right way. And even Pant was a little confused as to what the shifting plan was but our hero said he didn't want any unnecessary trouble. He asked only a few questions. How did he know he would be at Lake Deroy? To which the man said that it was all because of his peculiarities, for he wanted all the hidden objects, and of course it was obvious that this was where he would come. But still, our hero was also interested in how he was able to recognize his identity. After all, he thought he was good at hiding, and the man said it was all thanks to his skill, the Eye of Nine Serpents, a skill that allowed him to see through his opponent's characteristics and skills. And in all likelihood, that's why he did nothing when Pant tried to find him. For in any case, the emperor is interested in our hero, and the man asked if he would accept the offer. But our hero still had to think about the emperor. After all, the emperor is a glutton of rulers, greedy for everything he can grab. He always tries to go all the way for his goal, thus improving his skills. He also tried to devour even our hero's brother, calling him Yummy. And the reason why the emperor targeted Chona specifically was because he had never tasted dragon meat. And our hero realized that, in all likelihood, in order not to give up on such a goal, it was still necessary to learn. But also our hero wondered if he wanted to see Bram, though at the same time he decided to take his time. After all, he needed Sasha. But the man said not to worry about the emperor doing damage to him or his companions. It's all just a stupid rumor to destroy their reputation. He realized that all of this wasn't affecting them, the potential guests, very well, but he could see for himself. After all, is that such a bad suggestion? But our hero realized after a while of dialogue that he was getting pissed off about it, and he also thought that maybe he should at least pretend to agree. After all, it would be nice to destroy Elohim with their help. So our hero immediately said, Okay, so far he agrees, but he has some things to do first. But the man said he wanted ancient dinosaurs. If that's the case, he shouldn't worry. After all, they can wait and protect them from the rest of us. And our hero understood that there was a wait for him. This all meant he wanted to test his skills, and our hero was curious to see where this would all lead. And just a few seconds later, an ancient dinosaur appeared from the depths, and our hero, along with Pant and Adora, sharply began to attack the dragon itself, and the man decided to see how strong the one-horned tribes and him. But then suddenly our hero, along with his brother and sister, approached the mouth of the dragon, which suddenly opened it and immediately closed it, as if swallowed our hero, brother and sister. 
from what the man did not understand what had happened, for the dragon had simply eaten them. And already inside the mouth of the pant hit the slurry and, reaching her hand out, said, What a disgusting stench! And by the way, by the way, they're in a dinosaur's belly, but it feels like they're in another dimension. And he had heard that the ancient dinosaurs inside displayed the creation of demons. Then suddenly our hero came up from the back and asked what he was muttering. Pant immediately turned around and said he had come after all. He was interested in what he was holding. To which our hero said it was the heart of an ancient dinosaur. They just got here, and he's already got a heart somewhere. And our hero savvy that there are only five parts of the heart and we need to collect the other four. And they should all be careful, because the quest is about to begin. After years of observation, Lake de Roy researchers have discovered that demons living in the Devil's Forest gather on the shores of the lake to determine the superiority and wholesomeness of ancient dinosaurs have a rugged nature and a habit of striking all nearby creatures. In addition, even if he loses his heart due to depletion of vitality, he can regenerate it quickly, because it takes a lot of effort to completely hit a dinosaur, but they mustered up more courage to catch the ancient dinosaur, and his mental space is dodging brainstorming attacks. And we need to find all the hearts and destroy them, you need to find all five to safely leave spatial thought. Then, just moments later, new demonic creatures began to appear. They should have been careful, for they should have survived. Pant and Edora immediately prepared for battle, and our hero, from which Pant was shocked that he had not warned them. But our hero continued to absorb all the souls, turning around only told them to focus on the very important role ahead of them. There will be two dots next, and these are the hearts they should take. Pant immediately told him to rely on them, for they would definitely do well, and immediately started fighting the monsters and advanced to the two points. The knight wondered why he wouldn't use them, why he had to ask his brother and sister. But our hero said they had a very different mission. Then, standing in front of the void, he immediately just jumped inside, where words were heard that asked him who he was. As soon as our hero heard the question, who is he, he realized that he was apparently the creature of an ancient dinosaur. It was a great chance to gain more knowledge about demons. So he immediately asked, are you the demonic poison? After all, he had heard that ancient dinosaurs could produce it. But these dinosaurs have only recently become ancient. And do they already know how to create poison? After all, it felt like someone had helped him and he needed to get rid of it as quickly as possible. With that, he immediately used his area restriction skills. And then when the attacks continued, he had already used a fire wave to destroy everything around his hands. The man watching the dragon did not understand what was going on inside, for the dragon seemed to be snapping. And the man began to realize that, after all, the ancient dinosaur hadn't just eaten. Apparently, they're doing something inside. But then the man heard voices behind him saying that they didn't think Bloodland worked together with a homogeneous tribe. Turning around in front of him stood Elohim, with his army, and the two clans met. The man didn't understand why they had shown up now since apparently Cain had added to their problems by trying to catch Guyard. So they, also wanting to intervene, the man immediately muttered that they were not. After all, they are working together with Cain, not the tribe. To which the man, hearing that he was working with our hero, immediately got angry, readied his weapon, saying he was warning them, they should let go. For if they do not, Elohim will hold the bloody land responsible for the incident. To which the man, after listening, then said it was nonsense, for why should he? And as soon as he started talking, he immediately started using his ice-freezing power to freeze everyone standing near him. And after using his power, he said they shouldn't have come here. But as he looked at the ice blocks, 
He didn't understand what was happening, for he didn't see where the players he had frozen had gone. But then suddenly, a man appeared at his back, and as soon as he turned around, the man tried to give him a crushing blow, but he failed, and the man immediately started yelling that they should all retreat to the lake. The Elohim didn't want to just let them go, so they immediately rushed to attack them, for the man realized that he could destroy Cain and the dinosaurs and those bloody, bloody ones, so the end has come for them. And then suddenly the dinosaur opened its mouth, and both men immediately turned around at the event. Degtyaryov and they saw the dinosaur literally torn apart from the inside, and in an instant there were no more players left screaming to be rescued. But the man didn't realize what was going on. Trying to get out, the man didn't understand how this was possible. After all, he was a follower of the great Freya, and it was all because of one man who said that if he died, nothing would end, because the ether was surely on its way. But our hero said he knew, and then mouthed that they might not have imagined it was a trap, swinging his dagger at his rival. The man, as soon as he heard it and saw the sword, didn't realize what was happening. But we are shown the events earlier, where our hero came for a request to Brahm and Galliard in the room. Our hero offered to get rid of Elohim while they fought the dinosaur. After all, he has a very good plan. They should prepare a trap, using the situation to their advantage. Almost everyone in Elohim is a follower of the goddess, and they have sacred attributes dainty for demons. So they will offer them as bait. And already in the moment near the lake, the men did not understand why they were being attacked. After all, they wanted to help him. But our hero, when he heard this, said that for him this would be the answer. Take off your mask. The man, as soon as he saw the face, was very surprised, and then realized that he was just being used. But Elohim learns of this and hopes his master can eliminate him. But our hero was not swayed, so he immediately destroyed his opponent. Our hero continued to stand and look at his defeated opponent with an unapproachable gaze, for he had taken another revenge. And then, putting on his mask, he wondered how the others were doing. At the same time, Brahm and Guylard were watching our hero, realizing that they were really trying. After all, they have prepared thoroughly. Even the Chimera was there, and you can sense the desire between them to impress each other. But aren't they twins? Brahm had swept up that blood was valued above all else in this world, and he seriously thought such an important thing for a monster. After all, they are willing to destroy everyone in their path if they feel like it. Chimera will definitely try to hit Ether if given the chance. But the elf didn't understand. After all, they are brother and sister to which the man said the religious society they live in and it's a horrible world where you have to strike out to survive. But they don't care about blood or tears. They unite for a common goal. So he has to protect Sasha. The elf immediately said he understood, and it was nearing evening, taking Sasha's hands in his. He began to walk off in some direction, and Braham only watched them go, thinking of Sasha. For if they succeed in absorbing them, the disease will completely disappear, and this is the last gift to his mother, Ananta, and forgiveness with a person who is no longer with them. After opening the book, the man continued to go about his business, and the attackers had to be careful, for Braham used his magic. But then suddenly the players didn't understand where any of them were disappearing to, and the girl didn't understand what was going on either. But one of the players clued in that he couldn't see Habil and also Numfon had disappeared. And just after a while, one of the players, pointing his finger, started saying there was something there, to which the girl said they should group up immediately, and it was all weird, for she felt as if her saintly powers were expiring. And it wasn't just a feeling, for someone was definitely diminishing her powers.
But then suddenly the girl felt her sacred powers returning and immediately started using white light, illuminating everything around her. Players and others started saying that this is a great solution. Ms. Camara did everything perfectly. But then the devil's eyes appeared, and no one realized what it was. And then, in addition to the demons, more dinosaurs appeared and stood right in front of the girl and her army. The dinosaurs immediately began attacking, including the demons they were trying to destroy. But the girl resisted hard enough, and she realized it was all Bram's hand. But she didn't understand where he was coming from, for there were too many of them, and this way they would lose. They needed to run and get out of here, but something happened that the girl certainly didn't expect. Her brother literally stabbed her with a sword behind her back, to which the girl said that he had gone completely crazy, with five because without her he would definitely not survive, to which the man said he would be fine, thanks to her, sis. And then there was the symbol. After all, everything in this world belongs to the God who will one day come to them. Those who are not willing to admit it must perish. And then suddenly a portal appeared, from which several people began to emerge. The players who were still alive recognized them, for they were the devil's army. The man, as soon as he saw them, immediately bowed, greeting their bishop, to which those asked him what was wrong with the body. But the man said he didn't have time to check it out, and he apologizes for that. But three of them immediately said they were clear, and there was nothing more to be done. The dinosaurs behind them tried to attack them. But one of the army ordered that they should smite everyone, and the girl immediately felt that Bram was in danger. To which the elf didn't understand what he was talking about, and then after thinking about it, he realized that since Sasha was a dragon, she had developed psychic senses, and he couldn't ignore her words. Still, he immediately told Sasha that he didn't, because they were coming after them. The girl immediately started screaming that they can't, because they need to save Braham. Bram, looking into the orb and seeing the devil's army wiping out the dinosaurs, closed the book and realized there was nothing more to be done. He immediately turned around and tried to walk away, but he heard laughter behind his back. Turning around, someone muttered that the jokes were over. It was Kindred, and he was standing right in front of Braham. Recall the events that took place quite some time ago, when the girl came with the child and asked that he take care of the child, showing Bram this very child. But the man immediately started yelling that she was crazy, because it wasn't even his child. But the girl interrupted and said no, for it was her daughter. After all, she gave birth to her with her heart, not her body, so she asked that he look after her as a father. Bram, then he heard that word from her for the first and last time, for he thought she had hated him all her life. Therefore, when he heard such a thing, he could not refuse. Perhaps Sasha is a chance to right the wrongs of his past. From some period he had imbibed the girl's care, asked Sasha if she could wake up on her own, but the girl, smiling, always said yes, and he became her real grandfather. But then there was the reality of Kindred telling Bram that the jokes were over. He was literally tearing through space, and the man didn't understand how that was possible. For in a moment the kid was already right in front of him, and Bram realized that it was Kindred who had already started attacking the man in a moment. When Brahram was initially confused, he did not understand what was happening. How was that possible? He then used his magic, and it began to cast Kindred quite effectively, for his magic was very strong. At one point, he even managed to get out of the house, which was literally torn apart by the immense magic in just a matter of seconds. The man didn't understand why he was so strong. After all, he had no difficulty in attacking. And as he looked at the destroyed house, it struck him for a moment that Kindred was able to get out quietly, realizing it was the devil's magic. They were literally face to face, looking at each other, and the man couldn't understand how Kindred had managed to enter his space so easily. After all, 
he had a conspiracy with God that had something to do with the devils, and the devil's God is a one-time thing. A God that is not a God, a demon that is not a demon. Tower players call such a one a demonic God. He wants to destroy everything and build the world anew, but the devil's army calls him a demon fallen from heaven. Heavenly demons he couldn't defeat in this state. After all, he was no opponent for Kindred right now. Even the surrounding space is diet in the collars of the heavenly demon. He can't win now, and there's only one thing left for him to do. He needs to win with the help of invented worlds. Therefore, the man immediately began to attack the heavenly demon. But the one, in turn, became quite good at resisting all attacks that were aimed in his direction, and the man immediately began to split the dome while clutching it in his hand. He started throwing very different blows, and Kindred, seeing this, tried to put up a protective barrier to stop all the attacks. Bram so he could destroy the dome, and Kindred at one point didn't even realize how it happened. The man still continued to attack using his magic, though, and as soon as he flew away, immediately the bishop's assistants began to run to him, asking how he was, but an arrow flew in front of one of the party, and turning around, they saw that it was Gaillard, who was already aimed with another arrow, but the man only ordered them to leave it behind, unleashing his black magic. But suddenly the elf stood back, and the man began to realize, after all, this was inexplicable. And while the man fought the elf, Kindred was still able to recover and approach Brahm. The man was very angry. From this, he still continued to attack the kid, who in turn was quite adept at defending himself, and was even able to land his own blows on the man. One of the blows almost reached him, and the man realized that his holy powers were running out, and the illusory world could not stand. He couldn't last that long in such an unequal battle. After all, he didn't care if he died. But it's not life he's holding on to. After all, if he died, they would take Sasha, and he couldn't let that happen. So as he flew down, he made the decision to do something that could cause extreme destruction. For while he was flying, he immediately saw a silhouette in front of him. It was the girl Sasha, who was looking at him with beautiful eyes, and he realized that it was his poor child. But as he landed, he realized how hard it was for him, but he had a duty to protect her. Lowering his hand to the floor, he began to summon demons. Kindred, in response, began to throw the wind, but the gate resisted in front of him. And as soon as they started to open, the demon that was inside started laughing quietly as they came out. He was gaining strength, realizing that it was much easier here than downstairs, and he liked it that way. This was the second of the seventy-two demons of Le Infernal, the Grand Duke of the East, Lord of Destruction and Madness, Agares. Feeling on top, he only mumbled that it was better here than it was downstairs. But Kindred, who was looking at it, realized that it was impossible, for he should have been on the 98th floor. Why would a demon of such high rank answer his call? Getting angry, he realized that in all likelihood it was all because of the dragon, and it would be difficult to win here with magic alone. He's going to have to call on God. By doing so, the demonic magic is calling upon the god king Mihu. The kid was able to accumulate enough magic in his hands to make contact with it and get the strongest explosion. But once he did, he realized that Satan Yin Yang was a skill that combined two opposing forces to create a big bang. After all, even if he can't defeat Agaris, it will be enough to break him. But the demon only muttered that such battles. After all, did he really prepare for this? Still, he felt sorry for King Mi to have to do such a thing. From such words, Kindred was very much shocked. The demon immediately muttered for the one to disappear using his power. He began to absorb the kid, who literally in seconds was able to swallow him whole, then asked if this body was real, just like his always busy teacher. 
But then again, who cares? Because they should put aside the little things, and a man should say what he needs. Brahm immediately replied that he was thinking of summoning Villial or Dantalian, but I didn't understand why it was he who came, to which the demon said he didn't know yet. But if a man has a hunch about it, Bram seemed to begin to understand. After all, if he wants a dragon, he can get himself an ancient one, and that's a rare catch. Wouldn't that suit him? To which the demon only told him not to mix it up. After all, he thinks, he doesn't know he'll take the little dragon unless he has distinctive skills. After all, if she's the daughter of a sky wing, she'll be perfect for him. Braham, as soon as he heard this, was very much angered. They are far away, even Gayard was amazed. After all, Sasha turns out to be Chonu's daughter. Braham immediately turned to Agares, saying he would tell him his wish, and the demon said he was listening. Braham said he needed to protect Sasha at the cost of his life. Using magic, he was able to shroud Agares in shackles, and as he held the book in his hands, he realized that it was the remnants of his holy power. Now he's getting old, because he wanted so much to see Sasha grow up, but there's nothing he can do about it. After all, he's already willing to give his life for her. Meanwhile, our hero has mastered a new magic. He was able to get hold of the journal of the Deroy expedition. In doing so, he gained the skill of homology, a science that was born from the knowledge gained from exploring the world of Lake Deroy. Having studied demons throughout his life, he can use black magic borrowed from the power of the demon on the 98th floor. The deeper the mastery, the more powerful a contract with demons becomes possible. Demonic magic, for a price, allows him to produce a portion of black magic with the stipulation that he must find a separate skill book and study it. Pant, along with Edora, held the hearts in their hands, asking where they should put them, to which our hero poked his finger and indicated for them to put it here. But then something started to happen and Boo appeared in front of our hero, who was able to protect our hero from the strongest energy. He in turn didn't realize what it was, but then assumed it was demonic energy. Realizing everywhere that it could only be a garis, our hero was shocked. Our hero realized that something was going wrong, and it was urgent to go to Brahm. Agares was very obsessed with his brothers. His younger brother tried to master demon magic with the help of Agares, who taught him his magic through various crafts, occasionally offering to join the demon bath. But our hero's brother always refused such an offer. The refusals, however, made Agares more violent. After the rejection, Agaris made an effort to distance himself from Chonu, but a few years later, he suddenly returned with the same old offer, offering to take his hand and help his soul to calm down, for with his power he will be able to carry out his desired revenge. But our hero's brother, after thinking a little, immediately replied that his answer was the same as before, for he refuses. Agaris realized he was pretty stubborn, but he'd still have to agree at the end. Our hero didn't understand why he was showing up right now. After all, he could get what he wanted simply by controlling the lower demons, and apparently it was Cloud who created the illusory worlds. Has this world been shattered? Our hero didn't know what had happened yet, but in the illusory world you can always check what happened. And he immediately started projecting the events that had happened earlier, and he seemed to begin to realize what had happened there. Our hero felt Bram's excitement as if he were experiencing everything himself, but he didn't understand, yet, what had brought him out like that. But then the images from the conversation between the man and the demon showed up again, where the man said he was thinking of summoning Velial or Dantalion. But he didn't understand why it was he who had come. After all, does he really think he doesn't already know? After all, if she's the daughter of the King of Heaven, he's a perfect match for him. Hearing words like daughter and heavenly wing, he went into a state of shock. 
His equanimity was not working in this situation, for it was completely blocked for some unknown reason, and only now did our hero begin to realize that his brother had a daughter. Our hero was shocked to realize that the baby was his brother's. But was that what his diary was about? After all, he only loved Vieira Dune, but after her betrayal, he couldn't open his heart to anyone. However, there was a girl who fell in love with him, and that was Ananta. They were dragons by blood, so she liked him right away, but Chonu considered her his friend and nothing more. And I think the last time I saw her, she said something. You remember her saying that she would protect him at all costs, and our hero realized that was she really talking about Sasha. Our hero was able to see Bram's memories, where he said that it wasn't her child after all, and it seems that fragments of his mind are connected to it. After all, Ananta's existence was his mistake. He looked at the godlike world too easily and once decided to play with a dragon, but he didn't recognize her as his child and he was better off living and pretending she didn't exist. After all, it seems she found another dragon and fell in love, then called him father for the first time when she brought Vienna's baby to Dune and Chan. After all, she had managed to hide the existence of a child from Chonu for a long time. Ananta accidentally found her and kidnapped her from Walpurgis Night. She really thought of Sasha as her daughter. While Ananta was fighting the witches, Chonu was fighting the other clans, but he only had to protect Sasha, and our hero began to realize what it was all about. Agaris wanted to get her because she was Chonu's direct legacy, and that only meant one thing, that he needed to stop him. After all, our hero's brother can't be brought back, but he will protect his niece no matter what it takes. Then our hero immediately rushed into action, and Demon began to speak to the man, realizing that he was getting ready this time. But apologize, for he will fail, the illusionary world disappears, and with it his magic circles. Brahal, as soon as he began to realize this, realized there was nowhere else to go. The demon immediately showed Sasha, who was screaming and calling for Braham. But he began to realize what was left behind. After all, there was no point in him absorbing the small one, but it could make a good toy. The demon had already literally opened its maw and pointed it at Sasha. She was very scared, remembering the events when she was told by her mom that she had such a beautiful smile like her dad and she shouldn't cry just smile. For her, the girl also remembered Brahm, but then she immediately shouted Cain's name, who literally hugged the girl in an instant, and as soon as she started to open her eyes, she saw our hero. He literally put enough distance between himself and the demon in an instant, setting the girl down. She, looking at our hero, literally cried. In fact, Looking at him, our hero realized that they looked almost identical. The girl immediately grabbed his face with the palms of her hands and mouthed, crying, that he was her daddy. But our hero only hugged the girl and held her tightly and firmly against him. Bram also saw our hero without a mask and asked if it was him. But our hero, coming up, said he would explain everything later, for they should start with his treatment. Touching his hand, the man realized he had the same face, but it wasn't Chonu. Speaking of skills, stats, and habits, it was all very different, and he began to realize that perhaps they were brothers. They didn't understand how to fight, after all. They didn't call him a great demon for nothing. Agaris immediately said that he seemed to realize that they were brothers, for it was much more interesting to watch events from here than from below to which our hero said he wanted Sasha too, and the demon confirmed it. After all, his brother treated him badly and he needs compensation, but it doesn't suit the archdemon to threaten small pawns, so he'll give them a chance. After all, if he wants power, he'll give it, maybe even give him his niece, and he will make him the strongest. To which our hero only asked one question, what if I don't? 
and the demon immediately remembered the words of our hero's brother as he said he was refusing, angry. I mean, how dare he? Does the man know who is standing in front of him, trying to attack our hero? But our hero was facing an army of spirits that immediately rushed into battle and the demon said he didn't want to fight gnats like them. But once he was, there was nothing he could do. And then Agaris literally felt something. He didn't realize initially what the feeling was, for it was as if the creature was like him. But that couldn't be, and out of nowhere a strong illumination began to appear. Our hero began to urge someone to use the dragon eye. Agaris was very much surprised from such strength. For a moment before him he saw the golden door and knew what was about to happen. Our hero realized that he couldn't beat Agaris, given the fact that he was so strong that he could easily put Bram down, so he needed to invite a worthy one for him, for the enemy to overpower him. A golden door also appeared in front of our hero. Bram looked at it and realized that he would be able to summon a new door using a magic circle, but then a voice was heard from the door asking who had summoned him and what would be the fee for summoning him to which our hero immediately replied that the fee would be Aegis. Thus a deal was made between God and our hero, and snakes began to appear from the doors. Agaris continued to stare at this, for Hermes appeared before him. Thoth immediately told the demon that it had been a long time since they had seen each other, since it had been nine hundred years, it seemed, since Luciel had been sealed. Agares immediately said that he never interfered in the duel, but Hermes replied that he did, but he was offered a deal and, of course, he accepted, so he should choose to fight him or refuse. Agares only smiled at that, realizing that it wasn't so bad if the god and demon on the lower floors showed themselves in all their glory, and he immediately started attacking Hermes. But Hermes was no ordinary god, and what is there to talk about, he could fend off almost all attacks. The demons were trying to devour him, and Agaris was already beginning to take his initial form. But our hero realized that it was a real battle between God and demon, and it felt as if one could go crazy just looking at it, because the whole floor was being rebuilt and destroyed again and again. He didn't think he would have stayed alive if it wasn't for that light, for it was probably Athena's energy, and in all likelihood she had been summoned here because of Aegis. After all, she saves not only him, but Brahm and the others as well. And our hero didn't know why she was helping, but this was his chance, because it was necessary to help defeat Agaris somehow. And at some point, our hero hesitated, realizing that it would be critical to his body but he could try to summon demonic attributes using the purple flower. He immediately began to call out. With that, Athena looked calmly at our hero. She was pleased with his determination. By doing so, Athena was sending our hero a blessing. The awakening demonic attributes evolved and the demonic attributes became part of his body. Our hero realized that it seemed that his brother had also written about demonic dragons. For since ancient times demons and dragons had been at war with each other, and sometimes their influence on each other was so strong that they left their tribes and submitted to their opponents. This was how the demonic dragons that developed demonic attributes came into existence. They harnessed the power of both dragons and demons, opening up new possibilities. It was something unrealistic for dragons to leave their tribe. That was why the existence of demonic dragons was a stain on the entire dragon race. Therefore, even after learning the demonic attributes from Agarez, he should not forget that their agreement would be broken. Our hero's brother promised to keep his promise and was not trained in demonic attributes. Let him think about it, for how powerful he would become by unlocking this attribute that even some of the dragons couldn't resist. What new horizons might have opened up before him? But to our hero, demonic attributes and dragon attributes worked together, 
his body changed from the body of a dragon to the body of a demonic dragon. The black dragon, our hero, could gradually develop the attributes of dragons and demons. Dragon and Daemon territory, he will be able to unite it using his abilities within a certain range, depending on whether he uses the attributes of dragons and demons. The knowledge of dragons and demons reveals to him Hokma, the system of knowledge researched and systematized by the dragons, and also gives him insight into the system of knowledge created by the demons. Thus, our hero reached the limit of dragon attributes in his body, there was a change. He had reached the limit of demonic attributes, and there was also a change in his body. He revealed the third attribute. Our hero even has his wings changed to dragon wings, with blue blazing fire, because this is an attribute of the element contract. Even the scales were beginning to show, including our hero's cheeks. Our hero immediately summoned Nick and Nemesis, to which those wished only good luck to our hero. Blurry Dream pulling out his sword, our hero used Fire Wave, Fire Light, and 72 holy techniques, including iron, water, and earth to strike the demon. Also, the knights continued to attack the demon Agares. Rebecca also realized they needed God's blessing, and our hero continued to attack with the knights. Oh, and of course Hermes kept attacking, so he immediately ordered the snakes to attack, and they literally began to strike with their fangs in a matter of seconds. The demon realized that this was a lot of damage, and talked about how dare they do this to him. Our hero realized that the attacks were working, and they could defeat him. After all, it was necessary to use fire once more to strike the demon. He didn't know how to do it, but he realized he needed to save Sasha. Taking out his sword and seeing the demon on fire and the snakes attacking him, he immediately began to attack. The knights were asking him to move faster and he realized they needed to defeat Agaris. After all, he couldn't lose like he had lost his little brother. As he fell, he could only hear the knight asking him how he was feeling, for he should say something. Our hero was lying down, and immediately he heard the voices of his spirits asking him how he was feeling. For it seemed to them that he had lost all his strength. Apparently, even for him, it was too much. But our hero also kept saying Sasha's name and that he needed to save her at all costs. The defense was still going on, though, and the snakes tried to attack the demon as he screamed for them to let him go and not do such a thing again. Hermes also realized that he wouldn't be able to defeat him, and he realized that it would be much faster to close the door on the 98th floor than to simply defeat him. The demon kept saying that she was his and she would only be his. To which Hermes asked Agaris to give up and go back from whence he came, but the demon was angry, realizing that they couldn't just shut him there, and he couldn't let her go once again. And as soon as the demon saw our video of our hero lying down, the knights immediately tried to capture him. And as soon as he realized that now the snake will help our hero, but the snake did not have time because the demon grabbed our hero and already began to pull him to himself. And as soon as he could bring our hero close to him, he immediately laughed, lifted him up in front of him, and they kept their eyes on each other. Our hero couldn't do anything, but the look in the demon's eyes said that this time he would go with him, otherwise there was no way. To which our hero, of course, did not wish to do so. So immediately, using his dragon abilities, his eyes seemed to sparkle. Because he was able to touch a demon with his hand, activating Bathory's vampiric sword ability, and began siphoning life force and souls, thus acquiring the attributes of a demon. Agaris, at this point, seemed to begin to realize what was happening, for his demonic attributes were being taken away by our hero, and he was developing this ability faster than usual. The balance of the dragon's attributes was not maintained, for the demonic dragon's body was in danger. Our hero continued to take souls from the demon without letting go. 
Agaris, for his part, wanted to see how he could pull it off. The knights, seeing this, realized that our hero was in danger and something had to be done. But our hero showed no hope and still tried to take all the souls from the demon without stopping for a second. It was certainly funny, and he wanted to watch it for as long as possible. But here still someone helped our hero, and the demon did release his grip, starting to shout that, no, because he belongs only to him. But the gate was ruthless, and it immediately began to suck him back to the 98th floor. The demon only had time to yell that he wasn't going to let him go, but the gate still closed, along with the demon. And then our hero heard voices that began to say that they were sorry to see a man obsessed with something, for it was true. He made a mess, as usual, and left. But since he's gone, they should continue the challenge. Our hero understood that these are the twelve zodiacs, for they lead the top class. Goblin, looking at our hero's stats, realized they were good enough. I thought they could give him the reward right away without hesitation, and he immediately delivered a finial told our hero to take it and drink it, which he in turn did. And as soon as he began to take the first sip, some reactions began in the body of our hero, to which the goblin said that it was an elixir nectar, and one could consider it his gift to the main award. But when all the reactions passed, our hero began to realize that it wasn't demonic mana at all, transformed into a core specially created from the demonic mana absorbed from the great Agares. Because of the rapid transformation, if used carelessly, the core can disappear. And our hero began to realize that the core had enough energy to heal Sasha, but its form was unstable enough that he could not, unfortunately, extract it from the body. And he realized he couldn't do that, because he wouldn't be able to save her. While our hero was thinking about this, Hermes approached our hero and said that he understood what was troubling him, but he still had to say that he didn't need to rush or he would miss out on what he already had, because he wasn't that kind of person. He's completely different. And while Hermes was speaking near our hero, a dome of golden glow appeared, and Hermes seemed to realize it immediately. Turning around, he saw Athena, realized that she's apparently paying attention to him too, and he can even imagine the expression on her face right now. And as soon as Hermes was sure that everything was in order, he immediately began to go to his gate, because he still had a lot of things to do, and they should all take care of everything, to which the goblin said not to worry Hermes, for he could leave in peace, and the gate immediately closed after Hermes left. But by doing so, the goblin uh, complimented that it was really time for him to clean up. After a few days, our hero began to regain consciousness, and the first thing he saw was Edora standing beside him. Opening her eyes, the girl said that he was finally awake and she was very happy about it. But our hero got out of bed a little and asked where he was, to which the girl immediately said that it was the 24th floor because the air in the demonic forest had a bad effect on his condition, so they moved here. And so far he hasn't fully realized what's going on by grabbing his face. But he seemed to begin to realize that something was wrong, because usually the feeling is different. And of course, he realized that his mask was not on his face. He literally froze in place. But then he heard the girl's voice asking if he was looking for it. And when he came back, he saw Edora holding his mask in her hands and holding it out to him, telling him he could have it. And now he realized that he was completely unmasked and the girl could see his face. The girl was finally able to see the real face of our hero, but he began to realize that he needed to be more careful, for he didn't know how many people had seen his real face, and for that matter, Idora was certainly not the only one who had seen him, for he realized that Pant had probably seen his face too, and then the thought crept in as to how he could keep them quiet. But could he have done it at all? After all, no one had ever seen his face before. But either way, he couldn't risk so much with everything he had, 
and he realized he needed to decide here and now. While our hero was thinking about all of this, speculating on the right thing to do, Idora immediately reached out her arms to our hero and hugged him. The girl just said it was okay, because everything was going to be okay now. And sure enough, they were side by side together, and our hero immediately lowered his dagger and hugged the girl too, realizing that he was safe and all was well. And after a while, when the guy was hugging the girl, pulling away a bit, the girl looked at our hero and said she didn't think he knew how to embarrass himself, to which our hero also asked who she thought he was, and the girl laughed, but also assured our hero that Pant had not yet seen his face. So, if he dared to show, he would certainly look forward to it, for she was in agreement with him. But she was curious as to what our hero looked like and what lurked in his soul behind that mask. After all, she didn't understand, was the desire to find out all that bad. And our hero only looked at the beautiful girl and realized that everything was fine. After all, he thought, if it's her, everything will surely be all right. Putting his hand on his mask, he didn't even want to put it on in front of her. He then immediately said he would one day tell it like it really is. The girl only smiled back and said, okay, she wouldn't wait. Our hero came to Bram, who, looking at our heroes, realized that they looked like his brother, but they had a very different aura, to which the latter in turn said that it was not the first time he had heard of it. The goblin brought Sasha in and said he thought they had a lot to talk about, so he didn't want to disturb her and would leave, but they would still meet soon. Brahm immediately told our hero whether he knew that he disliked that face very much for it was because of him that his daughter had suffered. Our hero only smiled and said that the owner of that face was a real bad boy. He also advised Braham to go on with his life, as he doesn't want to let the likes of Chona do wrong. On top of that, he needs to cure Sasha so he can see Ananta. Bram, as soon as he heard such words, he began to realize that he really needed to do this. After all, looking at the girl, he couldn't leave her. She had once told him not to go away crying. It is said that he was once called God. And now he's going to be someone else. But his life isn't bad either. His hand literally started to drop, letting go. The girl immediately started looking at our hero and screaming, to which our hero said that she should wait, and he immediately began using his abilities, pulling out her soul. But Sasha only shouted for him to wait, showing him the vial. She said this elixir could save him, and as soon as our hero saw it, he began to realize that this was the homunculus elixir, the raw material of artificial life forms created by Braham. All of his alchemical knowledge and magical essence is embedded in it. However, he was unable to create a soul, leave the elixir unfinished. Upon picking up the vial, our hero began to realize that the homunculus elixir was one of Braham's treasures. Sasha, looking at our hero, said he should definitely succeed. And our hero smiled, realizing that he really had no margin for error to do his best in his hands and get the divine essence. And literally, Bram's whole body began to blossom. A new body for a great soul, our hero has found a new way to use the control area of the power of darkness, which has become much wider. After all, the various gods and demons of the 98th floor were observing the situation and were in astonishment. But some of the gods were displeased with our hero's actions, especially Dev's participants. At the same time, Hermes was keeping a close eye on our hero, and Athena was supporting him. Of course, Poseidon hesitated, for he thought he did not deserve divine detachment. Ares was in indecision as he wished to offer him the position of apostle. But on the other hand, many demons were very vigorously discussing our hero as many demon communities turned their eyes on our heroes. The demon community of hell has taken an interest in him, and our hero realized that both demons and gods were reacting rather violently to his appearance.
Bram lived on the lower floors and was wounded by Agares, but he was not just any god, but the highest. Such a great god was not a rancor, but had become like a mere mortal, and of course it was quite shocking. Sasha, as soon as she saw the man stand up, immediately took offense at him. Braham initially could only utter the name Sasha while hugging the girl. She immediately asked him why he was so cold and yet so hard. But since he was now his subordinate, it was necessary to end their conversation. Asking how he could cure Sasha and go to Ananta, our hero showed two magic circles and asked the man to look at them. The man took a look and after a bit of thought, realized that on the left side it was the demon seal that he had made, and on the right side he didn't understand yet, but he assumed it was probably the philosopher's stone. However, he didn't understand how it was possible. Cain immediately said that Vera Dune had only brought out the basis and he didn't know the details yet. After all, he got it by accident, so for now he's trying to learn how to use it but he wondered what the man might have proposed to do with them. Bram only replied that they should make themselves perfect and then create a magic circle to catch the demon and save Sasha, despite any cost. But he still didn't understand how to find Ananta next. After all, she's fighting Valpurgisnacht. But our hero said they could use the auction by putting up the Philosopher's Stone. However, at the same time, they will, of course, remove all the important attributes, leaving only the name. The man understood and imagined what kind of commotion this would cause inside the tower, especially for the Red Dragon, for the Dragon Queen of Lethe's Dragon Heart was almost destroyed, so she'll definitely want to get her hands on the Philosopher's Stone. Our hero confirmed this, saying that yes because the Red Dragon and other clans would definitely try to get to the essence of the stone. And the man asked how he would try to shift his focus to Walpurgis Knight, said they'd start a witch hunt from now on. By doing so, they will be able to get their attention. And after a while, our hero returned to the goblin, who asked if he had finished talking. If so, he can enter the portal and move. The goblin remarked that it was much more comfortable to talk with the mask and suggested our hero to sit down because it was tea from elite varieties of leaves and he should taste this perfectly exquisite flavor, to which our hero replied that they should get to the heart of the matter, as this was clearly not what they wanted to talk about. And the goblin, smiling, said he didn't have time to chat at all. As he sat down, our hero saw that a great many gods and demons were looking at him, but as yet he did not understand what it all meant. His bling initially asked what he thought, but then said they were all very interested in him. For while our hero did not understand what it all meant, he was a bit puzzled, but the goblin said they were all very interested in him, as forty-one gods and fifty-five demons wanted him as an apostle. Our hero should have learned that you have to be a ranker to do this, but apparently they decided not to wait until he reached the 50th floor, given the circumstances. Also, many offer to share their power once the contract is finalized. I such words, our hero thought a bit, because he really wanted to get the dragon awakening faster, but he was not going to rely on others, and he immediately uttered that he refused for he did not want the apostle's place. But after a little more thought, he decided to stop a little. Can't you do otherwise? Toth said that since he was refusing, he would reject all offers. But our hero went on, for he didn't mind getting powers without a contract. He was interested to see what they had to offer if they wanted to appropriate. Some demons or gods were happy about our hero's choices, and some were outraged. But our hero realized that hubris is inherent in both demons and gods, so they were unlikely to take back their gifts. The goblin only laughed at this, for he is a very special person. And one more thing, as he sees it, the battle between Hermes and Agares was quite destructive, and the floor area was greatly damaged. 
A lot of players who were there died immediately on the spot, so they get a lot of complaints and the Bureau administration understands the situation. But other players may hold a grudge against our heroes. At this point, everything Goblin wanted to say has been said, only wishing him luck on his future journey. Our hero realized that Goblin was right, so he plans that many players will try to take revenge. So he and Brahm and Sasha should not stay here on the 24th floor. So our hero went to a village of a homogeneous tribe. But the girl, watching everything that was going on, noticed that a very large number of people had crowded together and did not realize what was happening. I mean, it was pretty weird. But out of the crowd, the girl saw her father and turned to him, and he immediately turned around. Pant and Idora ran up and asked what was going on, to which Muan said that Janu had died. The girl was shocked as soon as she heard this, for the bow god of Jungwado had defeated him. So they sent scouts after them. The white demon king and elder Karam were also struck, and the other nine people returned in critical condition. Pant furiously asked his father what they were going to do about it, and our hero didn't understand why the Boguks would touch off a tribe from the people. Muan said that they need to catch him, if they are allowing themselves to be looked down upon by him. They should not be allowed to be treated like this. Muan's gaze was very fierce and angry. Muan turned around and ordered his army to get ready. And our hero realized that a real ruckus was rising in the tower, and he had better find Hinov at this point. That's what he did right away. Coming to the bench to the man sitting in front of him, he asked if he knew about the Philosopher's Stone. Heneva immediately interrogated our hero about what kind of stupid questions these were, but I needed to know the answer, yes or no. After all, remembering how Brahm said he only knew the basics of this stone, and perhaps Hanova could get to the bottom of it. So, basically, he needed to know. And the man began to tell everything he knew about the Philosopher's Stone. So after listening to all the information, our hero asked if he would help him. Heneva turned around and asked what other help was needed, since he was just interested in working with such material. And it was heard, our hero immediately smiled, realizing he was always like this. But then Brahm walked into the shop and said they hadn't seen Heneva in a while. Heneva swept up that it's been twenty years, and what is he even doing with that face? After all, he's very happy to see him anyway. And also came another elder who apologized for ruining things for them with his old age. But also Heneva saw the spirits of Rebecca and B.U. and didn't realize what strange company had gathered. But our hero said they could start, and their goal was to complete the Philosopher's Stone. Put the blueprints on the table and they all started thinking at once about what to do and how to do it. After all, everyone started working on the formula. Of course, Heneva was the most active and tried to solve it, but despite their great desire, they had some problems. After all, after a month of trying, they failed again. Braham, sitting in front of the shards, realized that they were close enough, but at the same time quite far from a clue. And our hero realized that they had determined the way the Philosopher's Stone and the Magic Core worked, but they had not yet succeeded in connecting them together. Rebecca immediately suggested that our hero call someone else, because maybe they could give us a clue. But our hero only said no, for he could only trust these people who had gathered inside. And besides, Sasha could be in danger. Rebecca went on to say that she thought she knew someone she could trust, and our hero just asked it who it was, and the girl said it was Victoria. It was incomprehensible to our hero, for did she know how to contact her? The girl said no, but she knows a place to meet her. And as soon as our hero heard this, he immediately asked where this place was, for he would go right away. And the girl still said the place and went along with him, of course. And already our hero, together with Adora and Rebecca, 
have entered some room, and the girl said that she does not believe that there is a famous person in such a place. But Rebecca's clued in that Victoria was trained by a famous shaman, so there's a chance they might be able to find her. Here our hero wondered if the shaman himself was here or if he wasn't. On the same token, he hoped he could get out of here as soon as possible because he didn't like this environment. But then one of the players responded sharply to our hero, approaching them. Our hero asked what about their request, and the player immediately said that they were just in the process of following him. They should follow him. Approaching one addition, the player said they needed a man on the eighth floor. And entering the building, our hero felt some strange odor, not realizing what it was. But going up to the eighth floor and opening the door, he immediately stepped inside and saw several people in front of him. And in the center was a girl who didn't know what was going on, because she didn't call out to anyone. Our hero immediately walked over to the bed, pushed back the curtain, and asked if she was Anastasia. The girl was immediately surprised, for he knows who she is. Anastasia was interesting in how he knows who she is, and thanks to our hero's powers of equanimity, he's kept his sanity, and he has a defense of immunity to dark magic and shamanism. Our hero realized that maybe she was supposed to be a witch, but also Anastasia was worried about why he came here, and our hero replied that he wanted Victoria. And as soon as Anastasia heard Victoria's name, she literally lost her temper. Getting angry, there was a huge explosion in the building, but our hero was not affected by this. As he flew off, he saw Anastasia approaching him, holding an orb of magic in her hand. Our hero saw Kumihi's form, and besides, her magic is very similar. Anastasia immediately tried to attack our hero, but he, in turn, drew his sword and prepared for defense, and then a voice was heard that asked to stop both of them. Our hero turned around and saw that it was Victoria, and she was rather weak. Rebecca, as soon as she saw her, immediately spoke to her by name, and the girl, seeing Rebecca, was shocked for she did not understand how such a thing was possible, for she had protected her then. Rebecca walked over to her and asked if she was okay. And after a while, our hero, along with Rebecca and Anastasia and Victoria, were sitting at the table. Victoria, thanks to the help of our hero, was able to escape from the palace of King Mihi, and immediately someone began to chase them. Rebecca asked if she could tell who it was, to which Victoria replied that she couldn't, but she was sure it wasn't a small clan. Perhaps it was the Devil's Army, thought our hero, and Victoria said it had been several days. Khan decided to negotiate with them, but disappeared. The girl tried to find him everywhere, but still couldn't find any memories of the guy. Anastasia immediately saw how upset Victoria was, put her arm around her and told her that she didn't know why they had come to them in the first place, but he had better leave because Victoria wouldn't be able to help in such a state. Our hero took the words to heart and immediately started walking. However, Rebecca began to tell our hero that she had lived with her for a long time on the five mountains, but this was the first time she had ever seen such a condition in her. Because Victoria, as she knew her, was always proud and confident, and she was stronger than everyone else. But why did the responsibility for Kana throw her off so much? But here, while our hero was pondering over the words of the girl, a book suddenly appeared, which literally instantly flew up to our hero. The girl didn't realize what it was, but after looking a little closer, she heard words that told them she couldn't help but she asked to pass it on and didn't know why she should. They should not, however, show their faces in public anymore. Rebecca began to realize that Victoria wanted to publish this book through the scholars of the Magic Tower. It was her life's work, but she didn't yet understand how she was able to give it up so easily. Our hero thought for a moment. However, he also realized that this book could be useful in the study of the Philosopher's Stone for Victoria's knowledge was able to amaze even Brahm, 
and they started a new study and did more and more research, and eventually they did succeed. With the help of the book that Victoria gave, our hero and his friends finally managed to finally achieve the result that they had not been able to achieve during the month of experimentation. Despite the time it took, they were still able to decipher the formula for the Philosopher's Stone, but they were sorry because they felt that they shouldn't do it right now, since it required using so many innocent souls as an ingredient. If they do it right, the mold could completely fall apart. Brahm at one time still thought they should give it a try, though, and our hero hesitated between two options, to wait and study everything properly or to try it after all. But he still made a decision and began to absorb all the energy, because he realized that they only had one chance, and if he made a mistake, he would immediately die without the slightest chance. So our hero immediately began trying to create a mold, and eventually he did succeed in doing so. He realized that this was good enough, for the form was ready, and now he needed to combine the Philosopher's Stone and the core of Agares. The Philosopher's Stone in the world of the human soul is created after the soul has been purified. According to the instructions on the Emerald Tablet, he is filled with fear. So special measures are required so that the emotions in the stone receive the energy of the demon Agaris and slowly grow. Due to the energy studied by the demonic core of Agaris, the grievances residing in the Philosopher's Stone can be amplified through magic. However, the caster must also have the attributes of a demon. The unique artifact in the tower exists in a single copy and cannot be sold or transferred to another person. But they should also be more careful, for the artifact carries a powerful curse. The artifact can be used multiple times, but the user can be cursed, so special measures are required for this. Still, the artifact was completed, but was not yet available for use, and it was necessary to connect the existing magical organs. The artifact carries a powerful curse, and special care is required when connecting it to an existing magical organ. Our hero realized that he could now unite with the stones, thanks to the demonic dragon body, and the unification with the stone goes rather quickly. And our hero did begin to unite the two stones. And what started to happen? Magic storm. It was strong enough, and everyone realized that barriers had to be created, for his energy couldn't be allowed to escape. The elder immediately realized this and began to create a barrier to secure everything in the area. But the association with our hero's stone still went on, and even the knights looking on were delighted with the Philosopher's Stone. Rebecca also said that her soul shined so much. After all, she felt as if she could become a divine spirit. Still, our hero has been able to handle this insane power so far. He thought of what might be resentments imprisoned in the Philosopher's Stone, for he realized that being distracted was dangerous enough for him. And just moments before, he heard a voice ordering him to wake up and open his eyes. He was able to do it after all. This is when our hero said he was fine, but he doesn't remember what happened during that time. Bram immediately noticed that he looked as if he was unaware of what was happening outside, for there was real chaos here. And the elder, who was behind the man and looking out, asked how the philosopher's stone was and if it was useful. Our hero hesitated a bit, looked at the elder and smiled, and said they could check it out. Meanwhile, Sasha was talking about her uncle not playing with her because he was doing something important, and Bram doesn't visit her either. Talking about uncle being bad, asked Chirik, but Phoenix immediately interrupted and told Sasha that he wasn't Chirik, but Nick. But it was like Sasha got really pissed off and was saying, no. He's Chirik, and Phoenix realized that uncle and niece were alike, but Sasha was interested in what uncle was doing now. Phoenix said he thinks her uncle is having fun with his friends right now, and he imagines them having fun. 
and our hero at that time tried the philosopher's stone on his subordinates. His strength increased a lot, just as his wings soared and the energy that came out of him changed. The anger and resentment built up inside our hero turned into madness. His attack power will increase as much as insanity, but his defense will also increase. Thinking long and hard about what it is, and whether it is the philosopher's stone that it is. For it was a power that is even scary to talk about. After all, he was only a young swordsman when they first met, and he didn't understand how he had managed to become so strong in such a short period of time. The knight was even very much annoyed by this. And at the same time, it pissed him off, because he couldn't change anything, since he fought him always and helped him. And while the knight was in his thoughts, he immediately began to transform. The strong will awakened another blessing of the devil. The knight was congratulated, for with the effort of blessing the devil as a foundation, he had gotten that one step closer. In doing so, the knight underwent a change. His previous level increased by one. He gained influence in the title, One Who Commands Death. Even the knight's form had changed a great deal, and the energy that was coming out of him. After all, he was able to successfully develop into an aristocrat. An aristocrat is a knight who died an unfaithful death, cannot go beyond this world, and only a few such knights are able to gain power and position under the Lord of Hell. Wherever they go, they are followed everywhere. And as their position increases, the powers they can use increase. The greater the strength, the higher the position. So they can form squads of soldiers. Rebecca, seeing this, immediately thought of Shannon, and the video was very much on her mind. Maybe, at least now. But immediately she realized from the look in his eyes that he probably wanted to attack our hero, which he in turn did, preparing his sword. He also prepared to attack, and immediately began to run at our hero, who did not realize what was happening. Brahram, coming out of the smoke, thought that there was indeed an incredible resemblance in character and manner between master and subordinates. Approaching our hero and asking if he felt better, they then said that the philosopher's stone is really great, but our hero said he's even sorry, because he doesn't know that the power of these three won't stop there. Neither Hanrin nor Rebecca have yet been able to reach their former level after their deaths, although they were very well-known and strong players. And also our hero realized that Braham should also regain his holiness, to which the man said that these were the right words, but of course it was not so easy to do. After all, no player has been able to become a god yet. Of course, there were many rumors that this required defeating the host. Braham, as soon as he realized this, immediately looked at our heroes and asked, Is he? But everything was already obvious by the look in our hero's eyes and the way he looked at the man. Then he said, For they have tested the stone, and they can move on. The man was very shocked and did not understand what was going on or how to interpret this information correctly. Our hero then offered to destroy the witches and find his daughter, so he immediately went to the Kellett auction house. As he walked through the crowd, he thought, Why are there so many people here? After all, today is the most ordinary day. Our hero put on a homogenous tribe mask that changes appearance, and he realized that this place, somewhere around here, walking over to the sign, he still found West Wind Association. This is where his younger brother did his deals. They were a big enough and influential enough organization that if he sold something here, it would go away easily and the deal would go away fairly quickly. As he entered the premises, he heard someone say, Thank you very much, dear customer. You should come to us again. Our hero recognized that voice. After all, isn't that the magical merchant of learning? He remembered meeting him in the tutorial. He immediately turned to our hero, asking why he was here, dear customer. But our hero said he was here to sell something. The man realized he could easily take all certain dogs from him, 
but also asked if this was the first time he was trading from them, to which our hero replied that he did. The man immediately said that he had come to the right place, for their West Wind Union was the most conscientious and honest of all trade associations. Then he should show what he brought today. Our hero immediately began pulling things out of his backpack, setting them on the table, but the man looked at them and realized that they were all high-end items. But I don't see how such a man could have something so valuable, he thought. However, he said, or what? That everything looks just fine. You see, he will certainly be able to bargain a better price for himself. So he immediately started pointing out the flaws, saying that there are runes on the surface of the sword that were hidden by corrosion due to poor maintenance, and now they aren't that durable, and that reduces the price by about a quarter. After all, in such a case, the price will be much less. Our hero only asked if it was true, but the man realized that he seemed to be too upset and needed to grab him faster, saying that despite the downsides, he thinks they can work out a deal. After all, since he only brought so many things, he can offer that much. And what does our hero think, to which he immediately agreed, saying it suited him, and that's great, thinking that it was great because he was able to fool another fool, but our hero turned around and said he had something else and could he sell it. The man was also immediately interested in what he would be offered, and as soon as he saw the leaf our hero put down, he didn't realize what it was. Many of the runes didn't count, but as he unfolded it, he realized they were records of top-level alchemy. After all, he'd never met one. If he could restore them, he could make a fortune from it and he realized he had to take it back now. They say he'll buy it, of course. They should discuss the details. And once they talked it over, the salesman thanked the healthy customer and told him to come back for more. And our hero was glad it went so quickly and easily. Because, of course, there is information about the philosopher's stone in there. But the most important thing was written on the emerald plaque, the family has been abandoned and all that's left is to wait for the sprouts. Etran carefully divided the worn copy into three parts and auctioned it off under the name of the great alchemist Trismegistus tablet. Therefore, as soon as the auction house opened its doors, many mages from the eight great clans came, interested in this item, as both players and regular buyers participated in the auction. The auction lasted for the first year and its buyer was Mr. Croy, one of the wealthiest men in the Tower of Steel, who immediately began producing the items specified in it in his clan's laboratory. He couldn't even imagine how valuable this item was when he bought it, so rumors of it spread throughout the tower. And sure enough, the second auction attracted even more attention than the first, and another piece was sold to a magical tower that bid as if it wanted to ruin everyone in attendance. And in one of the clans, a girl sees video dreams in which our hero's brother appeared in front of her. They say she is poor and miserable. You could see from her look that these dreams were tormenting her, but the guy also said that she was the last dragon. The girl immediately jumped up in horror at such words. She realized that this guy kept coming into her dreams over and over again, and she couldn't sleep well after he died. Getting up from her bed, she started to walk out to another room, but she realized that the dragon heart would die very soon, and she was already at her limit, because her magic power was leaking faster and faster, and there wasn't much time left, and it was all because of the heavenly wing. But then the messenger appeared in front of the girl, saying that he apologized for disturbing her, but something unforeseen had happened. The girl immediately asked what had happened, but the guy said she had to see for herself and showed her the stone. Saying that they had discovered the philosopher's stone, the girl was shocked, but the man went on to say that it was not yet perfect and not fit for use. However, everything converged with the working principles and formulas they knew about before. The queen immediately asked where they got it from and how they managed to get it, 
to which the man replied that the magic tower had created it thanks to a fragment bought at an auction. The third auction will sell the last piece, asked what they were going to do about it. The girl thought about it for a bit and said they should buy it no matter what. And then, after thinking it over once more, it literally hit her and she immediately said they should bring her all the fragments at any cost. And a new day of the auction began. Looking at the doors, everyone was shocked, for even the personalities of the eight great clans, even the fourth and fifth bishops were here. And there were many famous faces rarely heard of in public, for even the Marquis of Nagalin and Duke Ardbad of Bloodsnake were here. And also men were pointing their fingers and telling them to look, for there was a red dragon there. But looking a little closer, they also saw the son of the Queen of Summer, and they didn't expect him to arrive in person, for the nine dragon children that the Queen of Summer is said to have brought to them with her dragon blood, they are the leaders of the group of eighty-one-eyed men, and their strength is immense. Just then, a vendor came out, thanking everyone for coming to the event and said they were starting their auction, showing a bundle. He welcomed the third part of the ordinance and then asked what the initial bid would be. The guy immediately raised his hand and said that the first bid was an elixir. But then a man jumped up and asked the red dragon what he was doing, for the elixir was a divine medicine that all the gold in the world could not buy. This thing, which even a grievously wounded man could not get his hands on, has as high a price as the philosopher's stone, they say. But here someone asked if they could offer an item in exchange. How can you do that? But the merchant said you could, since the first bid was elixir. Does anyone want to raise that rate? If not, they'll start counting down. The man proceeded to yell at the red dragon, saying that they thought they could buy it back and that they shouldn't act like the thing already belonged to them. But the guy stood up and said, it seems like they got it wrong. Not only do they want him, but they also want to get their hands on all three of the others. And everyone in the audience was shocked by such a statement. They didn't understand what was going on and why the red dragon cared so much about this precept and all the others. Just then the men began to report that they had attacked the lab, but also something had happened to the tower, for they had stolen the ordinance. They all didn't realize what they were letting themselves in for, and how dare they give a magic tower a meaning, for the red dragon has gone mad. They planned a fight against the tower. The guy broke the glass and reached out for the note. As he picked it up, he realized that he had finally done it. After all, he will help his mom heal, after which he will fix the entire tower to the red dragon. And our hero only imagined what it would be like. That's probably what he thought. And that even Brahal started laughing, saying that it must be hot in the auction house now. After all, they don't even realize it's all rigged. In the tablet, they encrypted the formula for the devil's poison, deadly to demons and dragons, his natural enemies and the philosopher's stone, the Queen of Summer, will realize that something is wrong. But by then, she will have been poisoned and her body will have been completely destroyed, and the Queen will want revenge on the one who sent her, and learns that the creator of the Emerald Tablet is Walpurgis Knight. Brahal realized that this would be the end for all witches, and he said it just struck him. And then our hero took to Roy's research logs and, summoning a portal, said that everything was going according to plan and they should move on. In the realm of the Queen of Summer, the girl looked at the three notes and realized that she was quite excited, for she thought it was a philosopher's stone. The Queen of Summer is not just the head of the clan. Tower fears the Red Dragon, and under her power she shares her power with the clan members, strengthening them. The Queen of Summer is the foundation of both the Red Dragon and its core. However, what if something happens to her? Something irreparable. Then we were shown her room, where the players, looking at her queen, just screamed at what was happening to her. She was lying on the floor, and she also wasn't taking it herself. What's going on with her? I hold my head, 
but her gaze immediately flicked to the rock she was using. And after a while, the guy asked, did they find the original seller? To which one of the players replied that no, but it is said that in the past, Leontes and Walpurgis Knight stole something from the ruins. In fact, someone even saw Walpurgis Knight during the auction. The kid, hearing this, got very angry, clenched his teeth, and said, What do you mean they dared to do that? But our hero, in a remote location, started burning all the magazines. In this way, he was able to destroy first the first journal of DeRoy's research, and then the subsequent ones. In addition, his hidden part was unlocked and his homology skill increased. But our hero realized that this is not all, because getting these research journals is not so easy, because then there will be leftovers. And our hero immediately started summoning demons using the third spirit. Monsters and demons can indoctrinate souls and use them at will. Sometimes they can take over their bodies to control them like puppets. Hundreds of night ghosts move in droves. They have natural instincts to reclaim their lives, so they consume life, barely taking over the territory. Where the parade of souls passes, lifelessness remains. So our hero gave only one order, disperse, and the souls immediately began to disperse in their own directions. They were quite vicious, and their intentions were destructive. By ordering, our hero made them move on. The demons immediately started attacking each other, devouring each other in a fierce battle. They fought, and Brahal realized it was terrible, for he would not have done it as our hero did. Even the dinosaurs started fighting amongst themselves. I'm trying to win, and the guys who were watching, it was like a game to them. They marveled at everything going on around them. And as soon as it was over, Brahal came out and said they should start getting ready. A man appeared in the middle of the dinosaurs, talking about how he felt the refreshing air. He managed to artificially create a younger demon. He was able to find a new way to control it, and the range of his dark influence became wider. The ghost control ability had strengthened, and the third spirit skill level had increased significantly. He also received the dark ODS trait. Our hero has achieved a great achievement that is not easily attained. As additional rewards, he was granted improved demonism. There is a calculation of characteristics and abilities for selecting a new skill. The Dark Lord attribute affects our heroes, and the highest skill, demonism, was created. Demonism is a form of magic that has been raised a few levels higher. Even though this demon is of the lowest level and unable to enter the demon realm, it is still a demon and possesses their power. Because of this, his black magic and other skills had spread far beyond the existing limits. Watching this, the demon society tried to intervene, and some demons discussed their successes. Agares continued to show her greed for our hero, and Demon Tse showed interest in him. The demon also said that he was grateful to them for allowing him to get out of the long sleep. And as soon as the demon started saying his eternal devotion, our hero immediately told him to shut up, and immediately magic circles appeared. The demon was enveloped by the chain, and he started screaming that he shouldn't do this. Our hero also only uttered a single word, enough, and Brahal immediately began to use his power of magic. And Pant noticed that, since the demon's appearance, our hero had only used the word, shut up. Thinking about what kind of character he has, our hero managed to get the stone. Brahal immediately came over to hand the stone to our hero, saying here it is, thinking that now they can cure Sasha and they will succeed. But suddenly a large crowd appeared, asking, what's that? Turning around, our hero saw a man who immediately turned to him, saying, what's the matter with him? Did they make an appointment? But our hero, after looking a little more closely, realized that it was the Marcius Caliburn of Bloodland, for it was one of the twelve magical artifacts that the Emperor of Gluttony treasures most. 
but our hero asked if he had anything to do with Baron Lau, to which the man replied that yes, he was one of his cronies and had sent him to invite our hero. But without waiting for an answer, our hero recalled the events of how he completely destroyed Baron Lau. The man was also interested in what happened last time, for all he knew was that Elohim had something to do with it. Our hero, after a bit of thought, realized that he would have to lie a bit, as the players of Bloodlands are too devoted to loyalty. He immediately began to say that he had accepted the invitation, but suddenly Elohim interfered with them, and they had a great difference in strength with Elohim. So Lao said that he couldn't put their emperor guests in danger and ordered them to flee while they would stall. But fortunately, they were able to survive. And what were Baron Lao's last moments? He was a true knight. The man, hearing this, closed his eyes and said only, I see, for now he understood everything. So he immediately asked. His answer still stands. And our hero said that, of course, the members of his country saved them. Adora, watching all of this, realized how well the kid was lying. The man said that, of course, Lao had accepted him, and he would henceforth be considered a knight of the Bloodlands. He vows here and now, according to Lao's will, to protect him to the end, no matter the danger, and he will make Elohim pay for what he has done. Our hero realized that he now had both Elohim and the Bloody Land. Smiling, our hero realized that would be enough for him for now. And after a while, the man would return to his base, wondering how this was possible. And then a man appeared, who said he was here. It was the Duke. He immediately asked the man not to make a fuss, but the man asked what was going on here. To which he received the answer that the Red Dragon had gone completely insane, and the magical tower of the Bureau of Control they apparently lacked enemies, in their face. So now they, as well as he, heard about what had happened to Elohim. I mean, they're completely out of their minds. The man immediately turned to the other, and the latter in turn bowed and said that he was listening to his duke. The man said it was time for them to raise an army, for Elohim or the Red Dragon would destroy all enemies who interfered with the Emperor's will. The man immediately heard the order and said that there was, and he would follow his order, declaring war on Blood Earth. The world has been stopped by a common enemy, Artia, and it will soon be destroyed. Our hero, approaching the building, saw a very bad mess and he immediately summoned the spirit of Boo, told him to show him what had happened here, and the spirit immediately began to conjure. Bram was very much surprised, for it was amazing, and where he had only found it. But our hero did not yet understand what it was all about, and the man asked if he didn't know. After all, even though he was Ilyich, such skills were not given to everyone, and most likely he had a known name when he was alive and he thought that his strength was comparable to that of the Nine Kings, from which our hero was very much surprised, for he did not understand how the power of Boo and the Nine Kings could be connected. After all, he was on par with the Queen of Summer, perhaps. Then he didn't realize how he had lost and was just a spirit. Boo, for his part, was ready already to show what he was seeing, and he immediately showed the very son of the Queen of Summer who held the note. And then two girls who didn't understand why the emerald plaque was there. After all, how is this possible and who dared to do it? They needed to get out of here as fast as possible. But our hero knew these two from his younger brother's recollections. After all, it was Dark and Margaret, Viera Dune's right and left hands the first witch created by the mother of all witches, Night. Also, Boo was able to find where they were alone now, and he immediately opened a portal. And our hero began to go into it, realizing that they needed to find information about Ananta, so they should focus on that and their safety, because it can be very dangerous out there. Our hero felt like he was back on a military operation in Africa. Despite this, he still decided they could go forward. 
and our hero entered the infinite world of night, its private land. They need to get permission from the owner of this world because trespassing can lead to unpleasant consequences. What happened here is not recorded in the tower's achievements. Our hero, along with Pantadora, and the spirits went in. Braham realized it was a ghost world, a special barrier made of ghosts designed to extract energy from uninvited guests. Our hero immediately asked if they could remove it, to which the man said it would be difficult to do so completely, but they could change the way it worked. Braham immediately applied the curse protection blessing to his allies. They also got two surprise assignments. The first is field arrest. The Bureau recently decided to impose sanctions against the Red Dragon for attacking the Kalat Auction House for personal gain. However, the office is limited in what they can do and they need help. They should capture or destroy Red Dragon players within a certain time limit, and they can take some of the skills or artifacts of those they can defeat. But there is a time limit of only three days. The second assignment is Field Ares No. 2. The Red Dragon demanded an explanation from Walperger Knight after what happened, as Knight denies all accusations. The Queen of Summer and the Shift have decided to destroy anyone who has anything to do with the Knight from now on, and take away all their rewards. Only those players and clans that participate will receive rewards, and a third extra player will be given a Dragonkin. I don't and our hero was pleasantly surprised to see all this. He realized that the Bureau had finally decided to intervene, and the Red Dragon would not be envied now. After all, they're really trying to turn the tables on Walpulia Knight, and that was great, as you can destroy two clans at once. Since they don't have time to rush, they should. Walking deep inside, our hero stopped and said that everyone should be careful for he didn't realize what was happening, as if he turned around he saw the girl calling out to him. The girl immediately said what a blessing it was for her that he was right here. Our hero realized what was happening and immediately delivered a crushing blow in one easy motion, realizing that the girl herself wasn't real. He immediately heard, Um, uh, how does she say he's really mean? I swung my sword at a weak girl. I didn't realize I was that sneaky. And then there was his clone, speaking some frustration, and our hero began to realize it was the doppelgangers. This is only part of the Vera Dunin's project. Summoning Shannon's spirit, he immediately ordered him to deal with it. They've got so much going on here, and he doesn't want to be distracted by it. And the knight immediately started attacking the copy. But the man didn't understand what was going on, and the knight said, As strong as he is, he's still clinging to his life, but he's not going to make it. Our hero thought about the fact that Shannon hadn't been this violent before. Had his character really changed that much? After all, the doppelganger's body continued to recover, and the knight continued to defeat him. The doppelganger had to tell everything he knew to finally be released. Here's the structure of the gorge, its weaknesses in Ghost World, and even some information related to Vospilier Knight. Our hero began to realize that this meant they could destroy the Ghost World formation. The territory is most likely run by Pattaya, so he doesn't know either. Immediately, our hero asked, where is Pattaya? To which the doppelganger said it's right next door, by the fortress. Our hero said they could hand it over to Sashi later, so he should tie it up nicely. The doppelganger replied that of course he would do it, and even with a knot. But the doppelganger immediately said that they had promised that they would let him go, and our hero pretended that they understood what they were talking about and what he had promised, turning around. The knight tied up the doppelganger, who tried to shout that he would definitely destroy him and send him to hell. But our hero says he's not going to heaven, so he doesn't care about that. And summoning Rebecca, he asked her to help others. After all, if his words were to be believed, they would need help. But the girl asked if he would go further on his own, 
for first-class witches were no weaker than ranchers, and surely he could handle it. To which our hero said that they have first-class magics, but they are good warriors. And besides, he's not a wuss. And after a while, our hero was able to defeat the witch, who did not understand how it was possible and how he was able to get into her fortress, because she should have noticed that there was someone here. But our hero said he had a lot of questions, but she was unlikely to answer all of them. But the girl said that she would certainly not tell him anything, and our hero replied that she might not answer. And the girl didn't understand what was going on, but our hero started using absorption, and he was still able to find out that Ananta was in the basement of the fortress. And apparently, that's why Brahm couldn't contact her, because it's sealed at Vera Dune, so he knew he had to get it now. So he immediately started searching the basement of the fortress. Elsewhere, the man realized that he had narrowly escaped, for the one horns of the tribe. They do scare him, especially King Muwan. After all, he gives me goosebumps. He's a true monster, even among the nine kings. And when pursued, a creature like that becomes a lot more fun. After all, of course, you can't live in peace and tranquility being a ranker. It felt like he was back on Earth where it had always been dangerous. Thinking back to his sister, he realized that his path to her was too far away for now. But while he kept thinking about it, he immediately caught a leaf that had a recruitment advertisement for mercenaries who were willing to join the West Wind Union. The goal and assignments are a battle against the Pooler Knight. Payment for fulfillment is separate. A man, after reading that someone was looking for mercenaries, heard that the Red Dragon had attacked the Kellett Trading House and attacked in the night. But besides, after thinking about it, because if he accepts this quest, wouldn't he then be able to attack the one Horn tribe as well? After all, it's a good idea for him, and he's already made up his mind thinking about singles. Hopefully, that is where he will be located as well. And at the same time, the witch attacked the Red Dragon, and the witches were happy about it, saying that they could attack it. They have a good enough defense, but the Red Dragon didn't understand how they dared to do such a thing. But the guy also realized that something was going wrong. After all, he knew there would be entry-level witches here, but they couldn't use such spells. They definitely used the Philosopher's Stone. Also, the kids started getting reports that one in three were hit by it and needed to retreat. But the kid told him to shut up because his mom needed that medicine. But then, turning around, he did not realize what happened, because there was a huge explosion from which the witches immediately began to fall, and the guy did not understand what this black smoke thought about maybe it was the philosopher's stone that had exploded, but didn't know for sure, and needed to take that chance, ordering them to flee immediately, for they need to get ahead of Elohim. And we are shown the events in the broken castle, where the witches didn't realize how a breach in the demon realm had been opened. After all, all five defense barriers to protect this world and the underworld had been activated. The girl didn't understand how the barrier could be sustained or who did it in the first place. To which the other began to shout that the enemy was close, he must be stopped immediately. The girl realized after thinking for a bit that something had to be done, and rather quickly. After all, even though it may not be finished, they only have this chance. Taking out the philosopher's stone, she realized that it was a real one that was no match for the other fakes. And so, the girl ordered everyone to get ready to attack, but then suddenly our hero appeared behind her back. The girl and I both smelled the scent, but turning around, she took significant damage from our hero. I don't understand what's going on, or how she could have even missed it, and the other witches didn't notice it either. The girl realized that she needed to use the stone now and warn Vera. But as he reached out, our hero spotted a rock, and the girl didn't understand what was going on or why it wasn't working, to which our hero said there was nothing she could do. 
grabbing the girl he added as he went on. But the girl didn't understand regarding the foolish witches, and our hero, me, was able to absorb it, thinking about the fact that he was able to get forty stones already. Turning around, he thanked the spirit, telling him it was a good job, to which the spirit in turn replied that it was an honor to serve him, and he was glad. Our hero's stone does not improve, but there is one weakness in the Valpulier nightstain since the philosopher's stone is complete. It does not require the intervention of other magical powers. Using this, Boo was able to isolate the external flow of mana from the witch's stones, turning them into ordinary pebbles. Thus, the consumption of the stone was complete, and our hero said they could go on their way. And in the castle, the witches would turn to Dune, talking about all the explosions and asking what they should do, asking her to do something. But the girl didn't answer. She could see the West Wind mercenaries already approaching the Trafalgar clan at the southern gate. With them, the Rancor, as well as the Elohim, attempt to destroy the northern gate. The girls watching this were shocked at what was happening. After all, also the one-horned tribe is already in the ghost world formation. The defense barriers of that world and the underworld are broken. The spirit world's defense formations were also broken, and it was impossible. They couldn't destroy them so quickly. And also Muan, the king, was going after them personally, and their clan would not be well at all soon, because it was impossible. The girl also continued to think about something, and then opened her eyes and said that she had talked to her mother. Other witches were shocked, asking if it was true, and some asked what she had said. And the girl immediately stood up and said that they needed to go to the lab, because that's where the answers would be. They should hold out a little longer, for it won't be long before their mother will help them, her weak daughters. Our hero saw the gate being destroyed, and one of the clans immediately ran forward. He realized that it was the Elohim who had destroyed the very gate, for which he was very grateful to them for sparing him the extra work. However, he could not concede to them in the race to Dune, and our hero needed to take some action to get there first. With that, he immediately awakened the dragon body of the third stage and used his skills to release a wave of fire, 72 Bana, heat, wave, truth. But then one of the members of Elohim immediately noticed that this was not right. As they turned around, they saw lightning literally destroying a passageway in the building. They immediately started shouting for everyone to save themselves and flee immediately. But our hero realized that he was going to find Ananta, and he had no time for the others. Therefore, he immediately ordered his spirit boo to deal with everyone in the basement, to which the spirit immediately said that he certainly would. Meanwhile, our hero had already entered the room to find the girl, but as he approached, he noticed a fair number of capsules. After all, that was how he thought they were doing the same thing as the Arrington group. Looking at all these pods, our hero didn't realize where the girl was yet, but he absolutely had to find her, and after going through several pods, he was still able to find her, stopping in front of her and looking up, he saw Ananta in the capsule, and looking at the girl, he realized that he had to get her as soon as possible, for she was in a sleeping state and was quite weak. And now we are shown a flashback where, at the sight of Jeonu, the girl immediately asked who brought this boy, because he looks like a perfect corn kernel, looking at the kid. But he, in turn, for the first time heard such an insult in his address, and his friends, who were nearby, immediately laughed. But after looking at the girl, Chonu thought about it for a moment, and after just a moment of looking closer, he thought she was interesting enough that he wanted to get close to her, even if Braham wasn't talking about it. And after a while, the girl asked Chonu if he liked her, to which the kid immediately replied that he didn't, and in fact, he had a girlfriend, but at the same time, Ananta didn't understand why he was always following her. 
and the guy said he just wanted to have fun with her together, but the girl didn't understand why, and to that the guy said he felt like joking around with her, despite her perpetual grumbling and her looking like a little puppy. After all, she should be grateful to him. Where else would she find a friend like him? But the girl immediately got angry, taking her sword and also started swinging at the guy, but the guy only shouted for her not to hit him with her sword. Then Dune, grabbing the girl, asked where VH-71 sample questions VH-71 was, to which the girl didn't understand what sample we were talking about or why exactly she was asking the question. Dune immediately told her not to pretend and asks where the dragon child they took is, for she is the vessel that will bring their mother back home. Ananta just laughed it off, saying they are complete idiots and they should tell their mothers how profane it is to be called a kind of model. Well, and besides, she's sure to find her and smite her for saying such things. Our hero was able to shatter the glass and immediately picked up the girl who was unconscious. He realized, holding her in his arms, that it was as if she had become a toy and seemed to be paralyzed. If Ananta is in such a state, then the others must be just like the girl, and it's going to be quite difficult to deal with. Still decided to send the girl into the portal so she wouldn't get in the way, and then using his powers he realized it was better to let them go and leave this pain behind. And after some time, when our hero finished, he began to get out of the room, where his spirit appeared, who immediately turned to our hero, saying that he had brought all the other philosopher's stones, treasure chests, and other things from the basement. Our hero just said, he's a great guy. And after the hero's knife said his spirit was good, he immediately heard voices asking what happened and why the guardhouse wasn't protected. After all, all their treasures are gone, even the emerald tablet. And of course he should run to his lab, for it was in danger. But then suddenly the girl stopped beside Dune, asking if she was all right and why she stopped like that. But she, in turn, couldn't believe how this could all happen, for her materials were missing, the very vessels for her mother. And she gave her instruction. The girl immediately heard a voice telling her that if she couldn't create her own body, she should prepare a suitable vessel, and when she got it, she would destroy everyone who stood in her way. The girl was very much annoyed at such words. She didn't understand how this was possible, or what they were doing. Turning around and using her powers, snakes began to appear from her hair, which literally took over the girls and wouldn't let go. Dune immediately told them to listen to her carefully, for they should find Ananta before the other invaders arrived. Even if they all had to die, letting the girls go, she only asked again if they understood her, and hearing the answer calmed her down a bit. Dune believed she could clearly see evidence of tampering with the system, but she didn't see how that was possible. Looking a little closer, she saw something wrong, but she couldn't figure it out yet, for it was a magical structure that seemed familiar to her and resembled a dragon structure. But after thinking about it for a bit, she realized that it was definitely magic similar to this guy's magic. And as soon as she realized this, there was an explosion of blue glowing lightning behind her back that began to destroy the room. And all the witches flew some distance away from such an explosion, for it was quite strong. Out of the breach, our hero immediately appeared, looking at the girl. Dune immediately took a closer look at the guy who had appeared, and looking closer into his eyes, she recognized, with just the word, you, spoken, she remembered Chona, thinking back to Chona and their moments of holding hands, or the guy just standing nearby and looking at her. The girl didn't understand how that was possible. She was very shocked, but our hero immediately raised his sword arm and prepared to attack. Seeing the guy in front of her, she was very scared, and looking closely at his eyes, she immediately remembered him. Leonti and Bahal turned their backs on Chan. For their own benefit, they received greater power and honors, taking higher ranks in Red Dragon and Jonghuado 
than during their stay in Artia. But Viera Dune got nothing of the sort, for she had become the head of the Valpulier of the night, but she herself was well aware that Chonu would understand her if she wanted to leave Artia. Yet she betrayed him, only to then use their shared child. But no one understood what made her so heartless. Or was she always like this and just pretending to be good? Chonu never managed to recognize this and died. But as it was, it didn't concern our hero who only made the decision to attack. Remembering those very eyes and looking closely between the masks, the girl immediately jumped up and started asking the witch to tell them that he was already dead. After all, she had struck him with her hands. But the girl didn't know what she was talking about, to which Dune literally shouted for her to say, Yes, and the girl immediately repeated. Letting the girl go, she gave her a little look and immediately apologized. After all, she realized that she was too angry when her head was blown off, and he was supposed to protect her from danger after all. But she realized that if he was able to stop the philosopher's stone, how far had his research on the stone gone? And apparently, perhaps, the other witches were struck by it as well. For surely Ananta must be supporting him, and it was necessary to stop this man as soon as possible. Therefore, she immediately prepared to defend the castle. But then one of the girls turned around in a fight, shocked and not realizing what was going on. She immediately asked Dune to be careful, but the girl didn't know what she was talking about and turned around a bit to see the very same guy. It was our hero who was already standing literally behind her back. Where was she going to run to? And he immediately repeated what little he had. His eyes seemed to burn with fire. And also, using his powers, he was able to destroy the nearest witches that were nearby. But the girl immediately found herself in another body, fell off the table and did not realize what was happening. Taken aback, she wondered where she was, and our hero was already behind her back. Also preparing to strike, he was able to get close fast enough that the girl only had time to turn around and scream. And a moment later, just like that, the girl was running away, while behind her back, our hero continued to attack. The girl only managed to constantly turn around but could not oppose our hero. And at the ultimate moment, the girl stopped and asked the man to stop. But our hero immediately told her not to build herself a saint because Ananta was much more hurt, and besides, Sasha cannot die so easily after what happened to them. But the girl continued to scream, for she did not understand who he was at all, and our hero, taking her by the mask, laughed. Everyone says he's all masks, that's why he's already bored. After removing the mask, our hero said that he hoped she would keep moving her body and he would then smite her over and over again. And while he was saying that, he immediately sensed the danger, jumping back some distance. There was an explosion in front of him, quite strong, and our hero didn't realize what had happened yet. But then a voice came out of the smoke and said that it wasn't bad. After all, he was able to spot him. A normal ranker would have no head left by now, and his senses became much sharper than they were then on the Five Mountains. And as soon as our hero saw Kindred, he became very angry, for he did not understand why he was here. But the kid just asked how Bram was doing, and our hero said he was dead. But the guy just laughed, saying he thought he didn't know that. I mean, sure, he died, but wasn't he alone? But still, it was unclear to our hero how the devil's army knew about him. After all, that meant that someone was watching him, and he couldn't let them know much about him. And he should be careful. The kid went on to talk about how he had waited a long time for the one to come this very place. But our hero didn't yet understand why he was expecting it. Kindred immediately said that it was, of course, because of the heavenly demon. After all, he should join them. The heavenly demon desires it, and our hero realized that it was all because of Sasha, but he didn't understand why he needed her. 
and the guy said he doesn't know himself because he doesn't discuss his will. He simply listens to revelation and obeys. But our hero, in spite of this, realized that this was utter nonsense. After all, the heavenly demon's will was ridiculous to hear such a thing. After all, they haven't had a revelation in a long time. Kindred said enough of this gossip, because he'd be here soon and probably, so he'd better get out quick. But our hero, after giving it some thought, made the decision to tell him he didn't want to. Kindred's face immediately changed and he was angry enough from such an answer, talking about how he dares to reject the heavenly demon's will because he thinks he has the right to choose. And our hero immediately said that he could, of course, make his choice. And as soon as our hero uttered this, immediately the kid felt something, a little hesitated. He immediately began to feel the castle literally crumbling. He became more mobile and the girl also realized that the lock was broken, but she didn't understand what he was doing and our hero smilingly made the decision that they could start, giving orders to Braham and Gayard. Immediately, everyone began to comply with our hero's admonition for them to get started. And the first arrow went into action, thus Galliard was able to completely destroy the entire palace's defenses. And she realized that they didn't understand what to do next, for wasn't the fee for using this magic too high? Braham immediately replied that of course he it was high. So he prepared himself, pulling out of his pocket what he believed. The witches could not have dreamed that the philosopher's stone, which was supposed to protect them, would become the sword that would defeat everyone. And then suddenly large bloody balls of fire began to rain down from space onto the castle itself. It was Braham's meteor strike ability. The orbs were moving fast enough towards the castle itself to destroy it completely. Meteor strike, a spell that even a dragonkin species needs to use more than half of the magic from a dragon's heart to activate. And no one realized who was doing it. Some thought it was the work of ranchers. Some thought it was S-class mercenaries. But either way, there is nothing they can do in the face of the great catastrophe. They don't stand a chance. And our hero was able to take off and only watched everything that was happening. The only thing he was doing was collecting the souls he was able to destroy. Realizing she had a body left to carry, after all, could he go down and find the girl's body? So, of course, after thinking about it for a while, the guy still decided to go down and find that very body. But as soon as our hero landed in a certain area of the tower, Antosha felt someone behind her back. Turning around, she saw Kendra. Even though he looked shabby, he still posed a danger. Not understanding how he even dared to do such a thing, Gathering black energy in his hand, he immediately attacked our heroes, trying to destroy them. Our hero realized that Kindred is amazing. He managed to survive even in this environment, and he wondered what would happen next. But the guy didn't get the point, and our hero replied that he shouldn't have thought he had only prepared one meteor strike. And as soon as the guy heard this, he was immediately very much frightened because he realized that perhaps trouble was waiting for him in the next few seconds. And our hero, while showing the magic circle, noticed that he had a few more left. Kindred was quite angry upon hearing this, for he didn't understand how such a thing was possible, but he still decided to try and attack. But in just an instant, one of the balls landed exactly on the kid, destroying him. But our hero realized that it was just his doppelganger and understood that he liked to cause trouble, but such an attack still had to do mental damage. Moving across the roof, our hero noticed a rock and a girl underneath it. Thinking about how she had lost everything very easily, he needed to inflict a lot more pain on her by remembering Sasha or Ananta. But our hero still made the decision to absorb.
By doing so, our hero's strength increased, and he was also able to successfully collect souls, and all magical weapons associated with souls were sanitized into artifacts that would be given to the Master of Souls. Thus, the sinister Philosopher's Stone was obtained. Our hero immediately summoned Boo's spirit and handed her the stone. It is said that he thanked our hero for what Boo did for her and also our hero was able to gain the skill of body transfer, and this power caused the owner of this power to be displeased with the fact that her apostle was struck by a mysterious entity and took the power back. In exchange, our heroes received a new skill on the VC that was a replacement for a lost one. They were also influenced by the dragon demonic body trait, as well as the title of Doom Guide. Thus, a new regeneration skill was created. Seeing this, he was very shocked. After all, the skill obtained to replace the lost body transfer ability increased his self-repair speed when he was injured. With the damage boost, he could recover even a severed arm. In some cases, it is possible to repair a damaged heart, but there was a prerequisite. The brain must be alive. Our hero realized that regeneration is another skill at the all frown level, and yet many players wanted the third all frown skill the most, and it was immortality. Of course, this means that doom is impossible, but without all frown's death, akin to ordinary immortality in the eyes of men. After all, the power of regeneration, even in the case of a shattered head and soul, allows you to regenerate from the dead again and again. Because of her, no player can defeat an opponent named All Frown, and our hero realizes that if he can master the regeneration skill and fulfill other conditions, he can get closer to All Frown, whom even Queen Lethe and King Muwan couldn't defeat, and then he'll have everything he needs. So our hero made the decision that he had to leave before they came to their senses. But then suddenly, our hero's Field Arrest 2 mission unexpectedly ran out. Our hero was able to successfully complete the task with a stunning result, and as a reward he received the discovery of Entrenian. He also fulfilled the hidden conditions of destroying Viera Dune, and was rewarded with Dragon Blood and Dragon Blood Serum. The Blood Serum of the Red Dragon, the last dragon of the Summer Queen, perified its blood to become serum after the shift. By drinking it, our hero increased his characteristics. In some cases, it is possible to awaken as a dragon warrior. Upon realizing that he had dragon blood, he was a bit confused and shocked by this turn of events, but pleasantly surprised. After all, all dragons are extinct, so this item was impossible to get which means that Queen Lethe was going to create a new dragon soldier. Our hero realized that it was a valuable elixir, but he wasn't sure exactly how it should be used. And while he was contemplating the elixir itself, he also suddenly felt something. Turning around, he began to feel that very energy. It was the Queen of Lethe who literally burst out of the ruin screaming for the Philosopher's Stone and asking where her Philosopher's Stone was. And our hero should have returned the stone, but he realized she had appeared when Vera Dune's demise was confirmed. And that was our hero's mistake. Meeting the dragon's eyes, the dragon in turn began shouting that he had defeated Vera Dune and taken the Philosopher's Stone. I mean, he needs to give it back to her immediately. Our hero realizes that he could have died from even the slightest mistake. More specifically, his chance of survival was 10%. Standing in front of the dragon, he realized as he picked up his sword that, even so, he was going to fight her no matter what. But then suddenly he felt someone's hand on his shoulder. Turning around, he didn't understand at first. But then he exhaled, for it was Muan, his mentor. But then one of the players bowed down, only listening to the girl say they should respond. I mean, did I really have to come here myself? The boy immediately apologized to his mother. But the girl said right away that she was giving them one last chance, and after all, 
There won't be a next time like that. Looking at the mountain where the fire was, the girl realized that the philosopher's stone was located there. After all, the poison had gotten into her bones, and it needed to be dealt with quickly. Using her power, she immediately began to concentrate a rather strong field of energy and magic around her, and then a red dragon suddenly appeared, which immediately began to growl furiously, affecting the entire neighborhood. But the girl realizes that she is using the remnants of her magic, and now, even if she transforms into her real body, she will do it as the last dragon and representative of this species, because there is no way she can die here. The dragon, in turn, literally bursts with rage and roars more powerfully. Our hero stood behind Muwan, who was staring intently at the dragon that was approaching him. The one, in turn, only asked that the king stay out of the way and give the kid away, literally ordering him to give the guy up since she really needs the philosopher's stone. Muwan smiled wryly, for he didn't even know what the lady was talking about. What did she have to give? But then, in a sudden thought, he did realize what she wanted. The same girl lowered her hands and then pointed. He asked if she was looking for something, to which even our hero was surprised. After all, making such pranks in front of the dragon was only in Muwan's spirit. But then suddenly the dragon got angry enough from such a gesture and was ready to start a fight. And the man only asked his student to look closely at the splendor of his mentor, to which our hero jokingly told him to just not cry after being beaten. And then a fight broke out between the dragon and the king, for the man was sure to finish him off this time. And our hero, watching this, realized that his mentor must definitely win this battle. In just a second, the two greatest representatives of the two clans clashed in battle. Muan was able to stop the dragon attack by teasing that it might be time for the lady to go on a diet. He thought that it was surprising that he had decided to participate in this war because of his disciple, for he simply couldn't stay away. The two previous apprentices had disappointed the man so much, and he no longer wanted to put his heart and soul into anyone else. But as he looked at our hero, he realized that he could not pretend, for he could see the glow in his eyes. He realized that the mentor couldn't embarrass himself in front of his disciple. So using all his strength, he immediately pounced on the dragon to destroy it. The man put quite a bit of force into the battle with the dragon, but he couldn't even move the dragon. The players who were watching all of this, including the girl's son, only shouted. After all, they didn't understand how it was possible that the man was able to push the dragon away by force alone. And at the same time, the guy thought that maybe this was his chance maybe even his last chance, to get a legitimate spot. So he immediately vowed to fight. And the girl, seeing this, asked where he was going. Thinking that she didn't think he would let him take her place, she immediately ordered the players not to stand aside but to go on the attack. The players immediately began to follow their mentor's orders, trying to attack the man in various ways, both with swords, arrows, and magic. The girl realized that even King Muwan wouldn't be able to resist such power. But suddenly, a piercing lightning bolt flashed, and a voice was heard asking, how dare they interfere with him, the king? Immediately, quite a large number of players were struck by the strongest lightning. And where there was a blow, a man appeared. The girl, upon seeing who appeared, apparently recognized him for it was the bloody philosopher, the same elder from the peerless clan. But it pleased him, for someone else remembered such an old man. Bloody philosopher, and even though he has now retired as a ranker, and is now the chief elder, but he is just as powerful as King Muwan, and also the one who reached the very top of the tower. After all, it was amazing that an old man like him was still recognized, and he was very much amazed. It is also said that he believes it will be much easier to explain if they continue to arise in the way of their king 
they will immediately perish instantly, and he promises them this. So the man also began to strike his lightning bolt at the players who were trying to attack the king, but the players, seeing the lightning bolt, immediately began to shout, telling each other to dodge. But the girl, looking at all those lightning bolts, immediately felt her body begin to change. Her eyes also began to change. It was like she was turning. She immediately grew wings and a tail. The girl flew up and was able to dodge the lightning charges. It is said that he said they would die, but she returned those words against him. It was Bissy Waltz, the eldest daughter of the Queen of Summer, and she promised to show what would happen when confronting the Red Dragon. Also, three separate players began to change appearance and transform into separate creatures. After all, they needed to hit everyone who had annoyed their mother, and they immediately followed orders, attacking anyone who attacked them. After all, they had to protect the queen at all costs. But they also realized that they hadn't had as much fun as they were having right now in a long time, and it brought them joy. So they immediately attacked anyone who stood in their way. And the man, watching the girl try to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat with him, was very surprised. After all, he immediately thought she was a fool. The king himself avoided engaging in close combat with him, as his martial arts were excellent. But then all of a sudden, the girl, throwing her fist in, launched an attack at the man, though he managed to dodge. But he was shocked because he didn't understand how she had a technique like 100 fists. So how does a member of the Red Dragon know their clan's heritage? Nevertheless, the battle continued. The lone players were trying to attack the single monster that was trying to protect the queen while the girl kept attacking the elder. In turn, the elder practically dodged all attacks aimed in his direction. The man realized that hitting like the flow of water so deeply required an understanding of technique. After all, she had seen her and practiced for a long time. Even King Muan had created a new martial arts technique, and Queen Summer had reached the top of the magic world. The man was surprised. Could it be that in order to defeat King Muan, the girl created such a creature. But the man asked if she was from the same tribe and whose daughter she was, but the girl answered nothing. She continued to attack the man, to which he said that apparently she wasn't going to respond and jumped up. He said then he'd have to get rid of her until she spoke up. The man also recognized that the Queen of Summer was able to raise a frightening creature that was frightening even to the man himself. But it's done too sloppily because even if you combine magic and technique, there will be a limit in that connection, like a stone bridge that could collapse at any moment. However, that was not the case with this child. After all, combining magic and martial arts can look like this. However, the path he follows is in fact the true path. Therefore, the man, gathering all his energy, was already ready to strike the girl. She saw this attack and was startled enough to put up a shield in front of her. She thought it would save her, but the man was ready to fight to the very end and attack the girl, and she realized she was very much frightened. But then suddenly the red dragon began to fall, and both the players from the homogeneous tribe and the red dragon saw this. They were shocked. After all, they had seen the dragon fall, and the man had just waved his arms and chuckled, teasing about how it wasn't serious and that she had fallen easily. The red dragon players immediately started shouting, Hey, queen! while the members of the peer tribe laughed and exclaimed the king's name. After all, it was amazing. His strength was not easily defeated. Are Pant and Adora going to have another sibling now? But then suddenly the dragon opened its eye and began to emit incredible energy. Players who were affected by this energy immediately shut their mouths, but so far no one understood why. The red dragon also stood up, preparing to fight and shouting that she would defeat him at any cost. I mean, she couldn't just give up. The man only laughed, saying he agreed. 
he was still curious to see who would strike this all for own. After all, he wanted to see who would do it. Here and now, using all his strength, he was preparing for battle. The kid watching Black Skull was supposed to attack the Queen of Summer, but for some reason his plans immediately changed and he started attacking the man. So the guy crouched down, only looking at the picture that was going on around him, because looking at the dragon and the way the king was fighting her, he began to realize that he was indeed a monster. And while the guy was watching the fight behind his back, I recognized the man who was also intently watching the fight between the king and the dragon. He watched as the man even managed to climb onto the back of the dragon itself. However, such beasts realize their power and are lost in their own arrogance. I believe they become untouchable because of this kind of self-delusion. They don't think anyone would dare stab them in the back and don't even realize how dangerous it could be under those circumstances. So the man immediately drew a new bowstring to attack, for he hadn't felt like this in a long time, good as it is now. But he realized that he had the same possible condition as he had then with Capt. But still he continued to draw his bowstring, and suddenly the arrow changed color to blue, the same color as the man's energy was. He immediately said, Farewell, King, looking at his back. But then suddenly he did not realize what was happening, for he felt something incomprehensible. The man realized that someone was here. Looking around, he didn't realize where. Peering into various corners of part of one of the mountains, he saw a black silhouette and thought he was caught after all. But for now, he didn't understand who he was, and why was he standing so intently in a remote area, watching the fight without interfering? But it was our hero who held his fist. He realized that this battle was originally supposed to be his. After all, the Queen of Summer had injured Chona badly. Being poisoned by demonic venom isn't all it's cracked up to be. He had to pay her back in full, and then he heard a voice telling him that he did. He liked the idea, for he should hurry, soon, for his prey was here, as it was in the palm of his hand. Our hero realized that demonism only activated at times like this, but he didn't have time to listen. So he decided to see what rewards were available to him for the quest with the Queen of Summer. Looking closer, the awards pleased him, but few things would be of use to him at the moment. But here, taking a closer look, he still found what he would have to. Immediately, he was offered the choice of a Yaltabao gold bar as a reward. And while our hero was choosing the reward, the kid who was standing with the staff realized that he was finished and there was nothing he could do. And while he was thinking about it, our hero immediately instantly flew up to the guy himself, to which the guy even unexpectedly recoiled a bit and was startled. And two of the players raised their swords at our hero, and one stood in front of him while the kid sat. Our hero regarded the merchant with such intense scrutiny that he stood up and got behind the back of one of the players and asked what he was doing here, to which our hero replied that it had been a long time since they had seen each other. And after he said that, the merchant realized that this voice was familiar to him. Remembering how some kid had come to him to sell those very notes, he realized it was him after all. After all, He's the one who sold him the fake copy, to which our hero only said that he was surprised that the man was a quick thinker. But the merchant also asked why he had come again to deceive him, or had he come to see the defeated mercenaries. But then suddenly the kid who was protecting the merchant was looking very intently at our hero. The one, in turn, also took a closer look at the guy and said that they would talk a little later, night turn. Our hero then said that the merchant need not be so wary, for he had come to make a bargain. But what kind of deal are we talking about? After all, he will only think about what he has done and can't expect anything good because of it. To which our hero said that perhaps this item would be good enough. Showing the merchant a gold bar, 
and the merchant, once in the merchant's hands, realized that it was Yalta Bao's gold bar, a gold bar that was rumored to have been made by the mysterious merchant Yalta Bao many years ago. It is much more efficient than most other materials and is highly conductive of magical power, so it is popular as an artifact processing product. The merchant understood, for it was a gold bar, and such an item could not be obtained. I don't know why merchants go crazy over them, but he didn't realize where he got the bullion from. But after a little thought, he decided that it wouldn't be enough. So our hero immediately showed four more additional ingots and asked how about five at once. The merchant immediately said that he should say what the dear customer needed, for he might be looking for something specific. But our hero, without even thinking, just looking at the palace, said that he needs a dragon slayer, and they must give him at any cost, because he needs him very badly. Players who were mercenaries, upon hearing about such a weapon, were very shocked. Our hero immediately stepped onto the field, taking one look at the fire that was burning with his knights and headed towards the duel. But then suddenly one of the knights hesitated. He immediately recalled the moment he had bowed to the queen when he was still one of the members of the Red Dragon. Our hero immediately noticed this fact, turning around and calling out to Shannon, saying that he was now his master and he should remember that, for there was no longer any doubt about it. The knight, hearing such words, thought for a moment, then bowed and said that he had shown a side of himself that he shouldn't have, and he apologized. Then our hero said they could start by using their force and equipment on the right territory. Then the stigmata of the goddess and the third spirit, Senshin Isha's enhancement, were activated. After that, our hero made the decision to melt the soul in his own magical power. At this moment, the black power began to consume our hero, manifesting a very strong energy. Even his ease changed their color to red and fangs and scales appeared on his face. Braham and Boo then said that now they too could start tapping into their powers of runes and magic, literally circling our hero. Bram, looking at our hero, was very surprised at what was happening. Strengthening his muscles, increasing his magical power, increasing his aura, creating an explosion in gravity, all of these things had to become so much more, and he didn't understand how our hero was dealing with it. His body began to collapse due to the immense pressure, and he was warned that his body was at its limit and if continued, it might suffer unrecoverable damage. But our hero activated the skill to regenerate and restore to the state stored in his cells. The regeneration level has increased a lot. Our hero's body was then strengthened, and he reached the limit of his body. For a moment, our hero thought this was it standing up and holding a new weapon, the Demon King's poison, created by his demonic art. He immediately made the decision to take out the masses first and then start on everyone else. His appearance has changed a lot, both the energy around him and his wings. But then one of the dragons began to prepare for his new attack. They say they are stupid and homogeneous. Immediately they started yelling for everyone to get ready for he had decided to use a long breath. They should back off. The dragon immediately began to open its mouth, concentrating its energy to strike. But suddenly, a sacred star appeared above him, which immediately pierced the dragon with a single blow. And the unicorns didn't realize what had happened at this point. But our hero, using a wave of fire, 72, Bianya Thunder, rolled out the thunder and that power literally struck the dragon with a single blow, and that one went down in front of some players from the same tribe too. But then our hero appeared, landing next to the dragon himself. After all, he was able to hit the chimmy player, and thus our hero partially completed the chimmy hunt task, which is accounted for in the task completion check. One of the dragons immediately started screaming, and the Red Dragon players didn't realize what the spear was. They should have ducked. The dragon, looking at our hero, immediately started screaming, 
saying that he would avenge his friend, but our hero immediately summoned his knights, as well as the girl Rebecca, who also tried to attack the dragon itself to divert attention from our hero, but suddenly our hero flew up and started throwing punches to disorient the dragon. Immediately he grabbed that very spear in his hands and was about to throw it, but suddenly one of the dragons picked up another, carrying it away, and our hero realized that it was Tom. The knights were upset that they missed it, but our hero immediately told them not to chase them, because it's important to keep anyone out. They have an entirely different goal and they're going after the Queen of Summer now. After a while, one of the guys was carrying the other on his back, and the latter in turn was thanking him for saving him. He was actually grateful, thinking about the fact that even though he was messing with him, he still saved him. After all, maybe he really does think of them as brothers. Lowering his eyes, the boy said merely, You're welcome but he hardly realized what Tom was implying. The kid didn't understand why all of a sudden, to which Tom replied that he was sure their mom would be going today. But the guy didn't know what he meant. Tom immediately explained that King Mu Wan was able to rip her wings off, and now dragons will be completely extinct, as will giants. But the kid just asked the guy to shut up. Tom only asked what would be left after her. After all, they are half-dragons with her blood flowing in them, and they will become a new dragon race. Smiling and looking at the boy, he added that they needed more dragon blood for that. The guy, hearing this, immediately asked that he stay away from him, but Tom only said goodbye. After all, he had already made his decision final. Immediately, the chain of the red dragon and the girl was broken, already by two chains, and the girl immediately felt her chain being broken, and the dragon also felt the feeling. Muan, looking at the dragon, realized that she had driven everyone crazy, but he really liked it. Therefore, he immediately concentrated strong energy in his fist to deliver the strongest blow. I his attack, he immediately threw himself at the dragon, instantly hitting it with his famous technique. Watching the dragon who couldn't do anything to the man, he realized it was really bad and annoyed him. After all, other than all Faron, she was the only one who could give him a good fight. And now she's just dying because she's gotten too weak. Muan felt the discomfort of not being able to experience the adrenaline of battle. He realized he didn't like it. He immediately flew away from the dragon, preparing for the next attack and the red dragon players began to call out to the queen, telling her that she needed to dodge. But Muan had already begun to concentrate the powerful energy in his hands for his attack, which he hoped would be his last. The players were just yelling that the queen should just run away. But there's no way he can understand the loneliness that overwhelms him to the brim, because they'll just close their eyes and that will be the end of it. But the dragon wouldn't stop shouting that he must give up the heavenly wing immediately. Muan, upon hearing this, was initially shocked, but then smiled, for he realized that it was not him she was seeing before her death, but the same boy, and it was unfortunate for him. So the man decided to end it once and for all. Gathering his energy, he only said goodbye to the Queen of Summer, trying to make his strike. But then suddenly the man heard the voice of our hero saying that it was up to him to destroy her once and for all, asking for his teacher. Muan, as soon as he heard this, was a little confused at first, but when he turned around, he noticed our hero literally glowing in front of him. Our hero looked at the dragon and drew his sword and delivered a crushing blow to the dragon, miraculously not hitting Muan. The dragon immediately began to buckle from the blows it received, glaring at our hero. The dragon only mouthed heaven wing, and even the unicorns who were watching this were shocked. And of course, the red dragon players watching Paul's dragon couldn't believe it, because the last dragon was the Lord of the Tower, 
the legendary ruler in whose hands was the power over the entire tower for thousands of years, and no one could believe that she had closed her eyes forever, or rather, no one could believe it, thinking it was a dream. No one believed it to the end. Muan only stared at it with his intense gaze, and also the girl's daughter was shocked at what happened. The girl started yelling in a rage that she didn't believe it. The strongest energy literally began to emanate from her, and Horn suddenly appeared. The girl immediately said that Muan had taken everything from her, and she would never forgive him for that, for she would destroy the king. Muan looked at her in surprise, for he realized that this was a native of his own tribe, and also suddenly, rather large portals began to appear above the king, from which various players immediately began to appear in huge numbers. Muan, looking at this, couldn't believe his eyes. He didn't understand what they were forgetting in this place. It was the Blood Earth Clan. Behind the players stood a man of whom it was said, What a pity! for they thought that if they came now they would have a banquet waiting for them. Muan only changed in his face. What's the hog doing here? But then, out of the smoke, a man asked, Who dares to address him in such a derogatory manner? Then he asked whom he saw. Is it Muan, his dear friend? It was the emperor of gluttony. Therefore the man realized that it was better not to engage against him. Muan merely asked if he was here for a rematch, to which the man, laughing, said that he was thinking of fighting him, for he was here to help his close friend. Muan, as soon as he heard it, was a little confused, asking what it was about, but the man immediately pointed his finger, saying, There he is, pointing his finger exactly at our hero. It is also said that it must have gotten easier for him because he has a very wise disciple, could he share a secret? Muan only now realized what had happened. From Valpol's night to Bloodland, all the strongest clans in the tower had danced to the tune of his apprentice. But the emperor immediately said he was joking, just kidding, and behind the man's back an orchestra also appeared and began to play some obscure tune. The man as soon as they started playing this song, immediately literally changed in his appearance. They say they had a feast today, and they should have enjoyed it, for they could drink and eat. But the girl, upon hearing this song, realized that the Blood Army had sung a battle song, and their minds had joined together, giving them greatness and battle power. Their aura changed the Emperor's body. He became taller, thinner, and his gaze emptied, and the man thought about the fact that he would finally get a taste of the dragon, so his knights immediately started attacking everyone who was left, and the guy ran up to the girl, telling her that she should run away, because this was not the time for revenge. The girl realizes that she wanted to avenge her mother, but she needed to protect her younger brothers and subordinates, so she immediately ordered everyone to retreat. Our hero was able to gain a large amount of karma by completing an unexpected task and also made a great contribution by slaying a red dragon. The clan has suffered irreparable losses. Our hero was able to successfully complete the task and received a high achievement. However, all of a sudden, while our hero was reading everything that was written about his accomplishments and awards, the bracelet started asking the question, who is he? And literally burst out asking how dare he do this. Our hero realized it was the soul of the Queen of Summer. So he took off his mask and said that was the answer to her question. But then suddenly there was a girl who couldn't understand how this was possible. But as soon as she tried to continue the conversation, our hero realized that the dragon's soul would be hard to digest and decided to leave her here. Suddenly, some of the players who were standing next to the merchant began to scatter. His gait and the aura he emitted let everyone know that he was very much pissed off, despite his angry face. It was obvious from his gait that he was expecting someone specific. The man immediately swung around, concentrating energy in his fist, and lunged at our hero, trying to hit him. 
The players who were standing around were very shocked to see such a thing, for Muan swung his fist at our hero, thus striking a blow. Our hero only said, Ouch! Muan, hearing this, turned around angrily and looked at our hero, saying he ate everything his teacher created, and the only thing he can say is, Ouch! because he should bring him to his senses by beating him up like the Queen of Summer. But our hero started to say that he just wanted to make it easier for his teacher. But then suddenly, another blow was heard, and our hero already sat up, not understanding why his mentor hit him again. Muan, you said she's one of the people he's taking revenge on, right? said our hero. But Muan interrupted him. They say it's already done anyway, so he should clean up after himself. Turning around, the man made the decision to leave, along with everyone else who remained nearby. And our hero wondered why no king or former king is ever true to his feelings. After all, is it really that hard to be supportive? And he wondered as he realized the reason why he had destroyed the Queen of Summer, Muan. Approaching one of the players and hearing the player say that they haven't seen each other for a long time because the student looks so much like the teacher to which the man said, Is that praise or profanity? But then suddenly a man began to walk past another player. They literally stared at each other with intense gazes, but at the same time the king did not even look at the player, and the latter, in turn, closed his eyes. The man said they were leaving. But our hero did not understand, for he had been King Muan's apprentice for some time, but he treated it as if Nocturne didn't exist, and that's what happens to former students. Apparently, there was also a lot of chaos going on, but still realized that compared to the size of the tower it was still a small thing. But then suddenly, Edora appeared in front of our hero, who looked at the guy very surprised. Our hero didn't understand what was going on, and the girl said he had a very big bump on his head. When our hero felt the lump, he realized what had happened after all, even laughing a little. After all, the defeat of Walperger Knight and the death of the Queen of Summer is the kind of war that lasted a few days. Our hero received the world of endless night as his final reward, and thus ended this period of great change for our hero and the entire tower. Another reward was the outer space, the endless world of night. Although the place was completely destroyed by the war in order to use it, it had to be rebuilt from scratch first, and then it could only be used in one way, to create a clan base. After all, up to this point our hero has tried to do everything himself, but now he will need people and a place that can help and protect if necessary. And as soon as thinking like this, our hero immediately remembered his brother, who stood in the center of his friends, thinking that they were his friends after all and considering them a true clan. But after a while, our hero, first arriving in the vicinity of a village of a homogeneous tribe, where a man told our hero, holding his hand, that they would not necessarily meet again, and he was grateful to him for all that had happened, because he was very amused by it all. But then suddenly our hero, turning around and looking at the very same merchant, say that he has a request for him. He's looking to tie him up with a feint. But a feast is an alliance that only the greatest of mystery merchants can enter into, and clients are best of the best. The kid didn't understand how he knew, saying that they were, after all, quite busy people, and he couldn't guarantee he'd arrange for him to meet them. To which our hero said that he should just help him get in touch, and then he would do the rest himself. Our hero also showed five more gold bars, asking, Will it be enough? But the salesman immediately said he adores his best customer. Then our hero arrived at the village of the new tribe, passing through. He thought about the village being rather quiet, but what was there to be surprised about, for he realized that everyone had gone in pursuit of the god of bows. But our hero was wondering who the guy was and who he was, since he raised a whole tribe on the ears. After all, 
if he is skillful enough to fight King Muan, then his level is also comparable to that of the Nine Kings. Still, our hero realized that despite his best efforts, his mentor would quickly catch up with him. Our hero should stop worrying, but then suddenly a spirit appeared in front of him, addressing him, telling him that all the preparations had been completed. It was Boo, who grew up rather quickly, having absorbed the philosopher's stone and most souls. Apparently his mind is slowly coming around. Maybe that's what made me crave my own lab. So, our hero left the Boo in Trenian, which he received as a reward. But the spirit immediately asked that our hero follow him, for he had completely forgotten, and the transmission through the portal. Our hero, seeing this, was very surprised, for he realized that it was becoming like a real dungeon. And the knight immediately said that his master was also here, for he didn't order him to do such a thing anymore as the knights were ordered to help Boo. The knights said that this lich is so picky, though he looks malleable, and he imagines how devious he is on the inside. But then suddenly Boo only said to his master while looking at the knight, Our hero wondered, for he thought that in the hierarchy, Shannon and Hanran interacted at the top, although now it seems that Boo has taken charge. Then he called out to the spirit. He asked him to take it, there was silver, and these rings opened the other two in Trinian. Will he be able to fuse all three together? To which the spirit said it was definitely possible for our hero realized that the higher they went, the more he would receive, so it is mandatory to complete the dungeon first. But then abruptly our hero looked at the spirit and asked him if he knew what he meant, and the knight replied that there was nothing for him, and our hero only said they could go. The knight only wondered what that sigh was, for he didn't realize what had happened. Our hero went into the dungeon and Boo said that this was the very place he had prepared as our hero had requested. Despite this, our hero knew it would be enough, realizing it was time to summon her. And then suddenly a girl appeared. Seeing our hero, she was very surprised and shocked. But then she only said no, for she became very angry, shouting at the sky wing and trying to attack our hero. The girl was very angry, trying to attack our hero. But then Boo appeared in front of our hero, who immediately clutched the girl, who kept yelling at our hero, asking how dare he. But our hero realized that the girl was wrong. Taking off his mask, he decided to show her face, telling her that heaven wing and that he wasn't who she said he was. Walking up to the girl, he took her face, calling her name, only looking at the girl directly in the eyes. The girl was shocked that Heaven Wing had a brother, to which our hero said that was correct, and the girl continued, After all, you should have torn him apart the first time you met him, to which our hero apologized and said that it would all happen to her, all because he was the one who brought her to despair, and only then will he eat her. But the girl laughed and said they could try it, for she thought he would at least wiggle his eyebrows. But our hero smiled, pointing his finger, and said they'd know when they checked. And Boo immediately began to conjure, and already behind the back of our hero appeared a large dome where there was the body of the dragon. The girl looking at it realized that it was her body, but she couldn't understand how this was possible, and if it was really true and our hero said that the dragon's entire body could be used for something, and he was going to strip it right in front of her. The girl only asked that he stop, but our hero continued to narrate. Eyes, he said, could be used as a source of magical power, scales and skin could be used as material for making things, and bones could be used as strong weapons. But you'll have to spend a lot of time because the body is solid. He's not worried about that, though, because he intends to show that a bone dragon can be created from these parts, or maybe even bones. The girl kept screaming, asking him to stop and asking him what he really wanted. Our hero says he wants to know the reason for the destruction of his brother, Chonu. But as soon as the girl heard this, she became very excited, for she had not expected such a thing. 
Our hero realized that his little brother's diary had all the information about what happened to him, but there were still questions. One of them that they never could find an answer to was, why was Chona betrayed? Even though many were making sure that Chonu became stronger than the Nine Kings, Artia was not so easy to destroy. And it's not exactly clear why Nine Kings suddenly decided to band together to overthrow just one Chonu. Our hero realized that there was definitely something he didn't know, and it was worth asking, why did the Nine Kings unite against Chonu? But the girl only asked that if she told him the answer to his question, he would stop doing all this. To which our hero said he would decide when he heard the answer. And the girl thought for a moment, and then said, It was all because of the soul stone. What are we talking about? And what's the soul stone? The girl immediately said he had Luciel's soul stone. Our hero, as soon as he heard this, was very surprised, for Luciel, the Lightbringer, he is better known as Lucifer. Although he was a supernatural being, he belonged to neither gods nor demons, neither light nor darkness. A thousand years ago, his wings were tattered by gods and demons, and he fell. Our hero realized that they were being greedy, because if you use Luciel's soul stone correctly, the player could become a supernatural being. But why Chonu hadn't told his older brother anything about him, he didn't understand. Why? Then our hero asked the girl where the soul stone was, for where had it gone? To which the girl said that she didn't know, and that if she had known, she would have taken it and used it long ago. But our hero said she must remember every little thing, and then he would let her calm down and go in peace, as she wished. But the girl said that wasn't what they had agreed on, and our hero turned around and only called out to Boo. When our hero was leaving, he kept pestering the girl to find out all the information. Meanwhile, he heard Bram talking about how the 98th floor had fallen into chaos, and now not only the giants but also the Dregen Rickkrinkt. Our hero asked if he had finished sorting out the archives, to which the man said there was nothing to do, Everything was neatly laid out, so the archive was clean. Nevertheless, it's a real gold mine. As he exited and entered another room, the man asked if he could set up a dungeon or laboratory. It is said that he is not jealous of Boo, but they have gotten a lot of things recently, and new experiments need to be done. It'll also be good for Chura, to which our hero only laughed a little. Here the man started yelling, asking if it was okay to laugh like that, because he wasn't doing it for himself, he was doing it to help in the future. So our hero transferred the power over the outer space of the infinite world of night to Braham, which surprised him very much, for he did not understand why it was done. But our hero said Intrinian will stay with Boo, but can help clean up the place. I mean, it's almost destroyed now, but if he can rebuild it, the lab will be even bigger than Boo's. While Boo is responsible for external matters such as raising and strengthening troops, Braham is responsible for internally creating and maintaining the illusory barrier. How does he look at it? To which the man said that since he was offering, he would try to stop the endless world of the night, but the outside space is huge and would come out very expensive for him to do so. Is he comfortable with that? To which our hero said that then, why would he have asked to meet the feast? Brahm immediately asked our hero if this meant that he wanted to show everyone the truth about his identity. And our hero was taking off his mask, only to be told that this was exactly what it meant. But the man said it would be easy, as it would attract everyone's attention ahead. To which our hero said it was fine, and if they attacked him, he would just destroy them. 